A thunder of jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. Hurry, Bullwinkle! The show's about to start! I'm coming as fast as I can! Wave to the people! Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph! The Steve John Meese. But your name is Bullwinkle! I know, but that's hard to spell. Sure, there's always room for one more. Our story opens today in the typical American community of Frostbite Falls, Minnesota. Like all small American towns, Frostbite Falls has a city hall, a church, a bowling alley, and a movie house. The only difference is that in Frostbite Falls, they're all in the same building. But the other downtown building holds the town's newspaper, the Frostbite Falls Picayune Intelligence, and its editor, Colonel McCornbone. Stop the presses! Stop the presses! What's up, Colonel? A big scoop? Nope. Election results? Nope. Cat up a tree? Nope. Then how come you want me to stop the presses? Because we're broke, that's why. Broke? How come? We print 50,000 copies a day. Yeah, but we only sell 25 of them. It was true. At that moment, the stacks of unsold Picayune intelligences reached as high as the building itself. I need something to boost my circulation, Mokesby. How about a shot of adrenaline? Not my personal circulation, the papers. What can we do to boost our sales? Well, how about sponsoring a buried treasure hunt? I've got it, Mokesby. We'll sponsor a buried treasure hunt. How do you like that? I couldn't like it better if it was my own idea. So in a short while, Frostbite Falls was plastered with posters telling about the great event. And two of the first citizens to read about it were our heroes, Rocky the Flying Squirrel and his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Look at that, Rock. Find the Picayune pot containing a million dollars and win a genuine reconditioned Stearns Night runabout. Did you really bury a million dollars in a pot, Colonel McCornpone? You bet I did, Rocky boy. Of course, it's Confederate money. But that flashy car is really real, huh? Absolutely, Bullwinkle. It looks a little old-fashioned. Of course, it's the 1910 model. They don't build them like that anymore. I can see why. Now, be sure to read the Picayune Intelligence for clues. We sure will, Colonel. And they did, and so did everybody else. For the first time in years, the paper sold every copy as soon as it appeared on the streets. Art Street, got your paper. Latest clues and treasure hunt. Well, let me have a paper. No, you don't. This one's mine. It's a great success, Rocky. The paper's selling like hotcakes, eh, Mokesby? It sure. That's what I'm printing it on. You mean... Yep, Colonel. We've run plumb out of paper. But this is awful, Mokesby. Yeah, I'm running out of hotcakes, too. What do we do, Rocky? Our first chance to really sell papers, and we don't have any. Now, wait a minute, Colonel. You have a whole stack of papers right in the back of the building, don't you? Of course, but they're old newspapers. Look here. Some of them go back five years. Yeah, but look at the headlines, Colonel. International tension increases. Cost of living up again. Big traffic accident. Local dog chases local cat over a local fence. Say. You see? They're the same headlines that are in today's papers. Then we can sell these papers today. Sure. You can print the contest rules around the edges. Rocky, you're an authentic phenomenon. No, I'm more of a squirrel. And following Rocky's suggestion, the colonel reissued his newspapers with great success. But our three friends were unaware that a short distance away, a group of very undesirable characters were preparing to destroy their peace and quiet. Everybody in his work clothes? Yes, yes boss. boss. Everybody got it implements? Right, right boss. boss. 
Then let's go. Well, who are these sinister figures? Maybe we'll find out next time. Not if I can help it. When we see a tisk at a casket or the berry box. And now it's time for... Time for the dancing fool, Bullwinkle. Again? And now for one of our special fairy tales. Yeah. Many years ago, there was a year that was a mighty bad year for witches. They were everywhere, big ones, little ones, ugly ones, and uglier ones. In fact, there were so many that there just weren't enough people to go around to cast spells upon. Let go! I want to put him to sleep for a hundred years! You let go! I'm going to change him into a chicken! But I saw him first! <laughs> you did not! It got so bad that even the witches couldn't tell which witch was which. Then one day, as a little witch was searching the forest for a victim... If I don't find somebody to cast a spell on pretty soon, I'll... Then suddenly, the witch saw a little frog sitting on a log near a pond. Well, well, what have we here? We have a frog. What have we there? I'm a witch. That figures. And I'm going to cast a spell on you. Oh, come now. I'm already a frog. What else could you do to me? But the witch was desperate, and with a wave of her hand, she changed the frog into a handsome young prince. <laughs> oh, oh, boy, that felt good. Hey, what's the big idea? I don't want to be a handsome prince. I was happy as a frog. Well, uh, I admit it isn't the kind of a spell we usually cast, but times are hard. Ta-ta, dearie. <laughs> the young prince went back to the log and squatted down where he used to sit as a frog and dreamed of catching flies, but somehow... It just wasn't the same. He even tried a few croaks. Me, 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 me. Uh, chug a rump. Uh, chug a rump. But it was no use. He knew that if he was ever to be happy again, he must find the witch and make her change him back into a frog. Well, it's like they say you can take the frog out of the pond, but you can't take the pond out of the frog. So the young man set off in search of the witch, and after several hours of stumbling through the woods, he stumbled into a castle. This particular castle was owned by a king who had a very beautiful but unmarried daughter. Why don't you get a husband? They're all frogs or something these days. This young man who just walked through our wall doesn't look like a frog. Oh, are you a handsome young prince? No, I'm a handsome young frog. See? No, 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 the boy is just a little mixed up. What he needs is a wife, say, uh, like you. So, despite the young prince's protests, they were married. They were very happy and had everything except a home. But, dearest, do all brides have to live in a pond? They do if their husband is a frog, and where are those flies I asked you to catch me? But if I don't get a real house of my own pretty soon, I'll just die. The young frog prince finally gave in and built her a beautiful cottage. Then one day, when he was in the yard casing a June bug, a witch came by. Oh! A handsome young prince. Probably the last one left in the kingdom and he's all mine. <laughs> I'll change him into a... Uh... <laughs> frog? Good idea. A frog it will be. That night, at the dinner table... You know, honey, you've insisted that you're a frog for so long that you're even beginning to look like one. But I keep telling you I am a frog, and if we don't move back to the pond, I'll just die. Just then, the little witch, who had originally cast a spell upon him, came by and was amazed to see that he'd returned to a frog. Mighty strange. Usually when I prince them, they stay princed. Well, I'll try again. Only this time, he was changed into a chicken. Well, that did it. And deciding that it was time to call a halt to such nonsense, he angrily stormed into the witch's union where he confronted the head witch. Now, look, first I was a frog, then a prince, and now I'm a chicken. I've had enough Kings's ex. Okay, I'll change you back to whatever you say. What would you like to be? Be a prince, honey. Yeah, a prince. So be it. 
Here, Prince. Nice Prince. Not that kind of a Prince. Oh, sorry. But try as she would, the old witch couldn't change him into a prince, so she finally returned him to a frog. Whew. I'm sorry, dearie, but uh, you've been bewitched so much that I just can't make a prince out of you. The poor frog was confused and very sad. He turned to his wife and said, Will you still love me even though I'm just a frog? Well... <laughs> Chug the rump. Yes. And with that, they both hopped back to the pond where they sat on a mossy rock and exclaimed, If, if we, we have, have to stay, stay frogs, frogs for, for the, the rest, rest of our lives, we'll just die. die. Of course, they didn't die, but you can rest assured that they croaked every night. Today's lesson is mighty important, remember? That lesson. <laughs> this lesson. Hello, you poetry and snow lovers. Today's poem begins this here way. Over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house we go. The horse knows the way to carry the sleigh. That horse knows the way. To grandma's, please, and don't spare the horse. See what I mean? Over the river and through the woods. Oh, how the snow. You sure he knows the way? Of course, Rock. Looky there. Over the river and through the woods, now grandmother's cap I spy. Hoorah for the fun. Is the pudding done? Hoorah for the pumpkin pie. Hey, you don't look like no grandma to me. You're no red riding hood yourself, Jack. Bullwinkle, are you sure this is the right house? Oh, it's the right house. It's just the wrong story. Well, how is that possible? Easy. It's a two-story house. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But... See? <laughs> Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. And now it's time to meet Mr. Peabody. <laughs> Peabody here, along with Sherman and a handful of lemons. Why the lemons, Mr. Peabody? Because we're going to England, and I prefer lemon in my tea. The year will be 1880, and the place, that bulwark of British justice, Scotland Yard. And you and I, Sherman, will help them solve their most baffling case. The Wayback Machine whisked us, lemons and all, directly to London, and there, almost completely enshrouded with fog, stood Scotland Yard. We went to the Chief Inspector's office and heard the bad news. Gentlemen, I'm afraid we have a bad show on our hands. Does he mean ours? Oh, no, no. He's referring to a crime. Now, you all know what the crown jewels look like. They consist of 4,000 diamonds, 3,000 pearls, 43 rubies, and one little orphan Annie's secret whistle. I beg your pardon, sir, but are we to understand the crown jewels have been stolen? They have, sir, and we'll need all the assistance we can get in recovering them. Where were they stolen from? The Tower of London. Then may I suggest you start by searching it for clues? Impossible. Why? The thief took the tower, too. We went out into the fog and checked, and sure enough, the tower was gone. Clever chap, this thief, eh? Do you think it was an inside job? I should think so. Too foggy outside. Chief Inspector dispatched his men to all parts of the city with instructions to bring in every known fence. You see, the thief will have to sell the jewels to a fence. Unfortunately, the only fences his men brought in were of the white picket variety. Good work, chaps. We'll grill them in the morning. Should look nice, white picket fence with the grill, eh? Inspector, if you don't mind, Sherman and I will do some investigating on our own. Capital. I'll go with you. I had a hunch that anyone who stole the crown jewels would attempt to smuggle them out of the country. That was the reason why I insisted upon searching the banks of the Thames River. There's a boat now! Sherman's youthful eyes had spotted a small motor launch speeding along the far side of the river. Can't we stop them, Mr. Peabody? With Sherman and the inspector hot on my heels, I ran along the bank, turned right at London Bridge, ran directly to the center of that glorious structure, and prepared to leap from the rail. Wait! Don't do it, old fellow! It isn't that bad! 
I'm going to jump into the boat, Inspector. Oh, I thought you were going to... <laughs> have a nice trip. Unfortunately, the person steering the launch saw me standing on the rail and turned at a 90-degree angle, but he didn't know I was a master parachutist, and even though I had no parachute, I did have wind. I said the word Geronimo and simply stepped off into the ozone. Utilizing my ears as flaps, I was able to guide my flight and landed not only on the boat, but on the skipper as well. It took but a moment to steer the launch into shore. Good work, Mr. Peabody! Magnificent! Well, thank you, thank you. I only wish that results had been more favorable. You see, this gentleman didn't steal the crown jewels. He was merely attempting to sneak out of England to get away from his mother-in-law. Just one second. I recognize you, sir, and I say you're a desperate criminal. We shall take him to the yard. But, Inspector... It was no use. His mind was made up. The rest of the evening was spent in questioning the poor skipper. Don't try to fool me, you bounder. I know you. Of course you know him, Inspector. He's your brother. That's right. He's my... Brother? Brother. Well, I knew him somewhere. I made the proper apologies while Sherman made tea. As for the inspector, he was making everything but progress. We shall search Westminster Abbey and even the House of Parliament. But we must find those crown jewels and the Tower of London. Inspector, if you'll just wait until the sun rises, I'm sure I can clear this case up. You can, Mr. Peabody? Cream in your tea? Lemon, Sherman. Remember, we brought our own? Yes, at precisely 7.15, I can vouch for the recovery of not only the jewels, but the tower itself. Preposterous. It may have seemed so, but at precisely 7.15, the sun rose, its heat burned away the fog, and presto, there stood the Tower of London. You mean to say it was hidden by the fog all this time? I do. Astounding. Positively astounding. Excuse me, won't you? I must drill those fences. By the way, Mr. Peabody, that English policeman over there, why does he wear such a high hat? Watch and you'll see. There. It's because he has so much hair. The hat keeps it out of his eyes. The hat and a strategically placed hairpin. English policemen wear hairpins? Bobby pin, Sherman. Uh, that's why they call them, uh, bobbies. Last time you remember, Colonel McCornpone, editor of the Frostbite Falls Picayune Intelligence, sponsored a treasure hunt to boost sales of his newspaper. Gee, a pack containing a million dollars. In Confederate money, of course. Plus a genuine Stearns Knight runabout. The 1910 model, completely renovated. Renovated? Two new inner tubes, and we polished the brass. And here's our first clue, Bullwinkle. The Picayune pot can now be found buried six foot underground. But Colonel McCornpone? <laughs> That's the puzzle, Rocky. So our heroes set to work to dig in all the likely places, only to find that everybody else in town had the same idea. How about digging right here, Bullwinkle? A good guess, buddy, but I was here first. How about right over here? Right over where, Jack? It's no use, Bullwinkle. Everybody else is digging in the most likely spot. Well, then I'm going to dig in the most unlikely spots. But that's ridiculous, Bullwinkle. I know, but that's all there is left. So Bullwinkle sought out the least likely spots in town to dig a hole. He dug in the Frostbite Falls City Park. <coughs> he dug under the Possum Trot Memorial Highway. <coughs> he even dug in Scully's Swamp. Rocky, I hit it! I hit it! The treasure? No, water. But Bullwinkle's most sensational digging was done in an open field outside of town where suddenly... Break! Gone the goo, Rocky! I've struck oil! Hokey smoke! I'm rich! Rich! Yes, it really was oil, flowing out in a great gusher. And small wonder, for Bullwinkle had been digging right outside the Ponsford Oil Company refinery and had broken one of their main lines. Boy, you know what I'm gonna get first, Rocky? Yeah, 30 days! Sure enough, the moose was lodged in the town calaboose until... Hey, Bullwinkle! The sheriff says you can go now. I can? Yeah, Mr. Ponsford won't press charges on one condition. He, what is it? That you won't dig no more of them holes looking for the Picayune pot. You mean I'm out of the contest? Looks that way, Bullwinkle. But I got my right. You also got 30 days. Yeah. 
Funny how that works out. So in the interest of public safety, Bullwinkle was ordered not to dig any more holes. Shucking Dan Cobbs. If it'll make you feel better, Bullwinkle, I won't dig any either. So Rocky and Bullwinkle became the only two people in town who weren't digging for the Picayune pot. Matter of fact, people came from as far away as Tadpole Center and Possum Trot just to dig in Frostbite Falls. Some even seemed to have come from farther away than that. Hey, buddy, is this where they digging for a million bucks in Confederate money? That's right, mister. Okay, boys, this is the spot. Let's get started. And as our heroes watched, the sinister-looking gang began to dig right through the pavement. Why didn't I think of that? You know, Bullwinkle, I think I've seen that face somewhere before. Oh, if Rocky had only remembered, that face was displayed prominently just a few scenes ago on the wall of the Frostbite Falls Sheriff Station, for it belonged to Babyface Braunschweiger. But that's really Boris Badenoff, notorious forger, thief, bank robber, gunman, and litterbug. Well, gee whiz, Nick, nobody's perfect. And now here he is in Frostbite Falls with a brand new gang of cutthroats. Yeah, the light-fingered five minus two. Which way do we dig now, boss? Let me check map. But but but, but that's a map of the town bank. You, you're not... That's right, Junior. We're going to rob the bank. You were thinking maybe of squealing on us, yes? Why, why, why no, I... Uh... Uh, uh, be sure to be with us next time for Bank Busters or the Great Vaults! Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Just enough left to tell them who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop! We're late again, Bullwinkle. Right. Bye now. See you next time. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The thief, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. We're going to have a lot of fun. Come on and join us. Sure. There's always room for one more. the Frostbite Falls Daily Paper, the Picayune Intelligence, really started something when it buried a pot containing a million dollars in Confederate money. As a sales booster, the idea was a smash. People stood in lines to get the latest edition with clues as to where the pot could be found. But it wasn't a very good idea for the town, for treasure hunters had soon dug Frostbite Falls full of deep holes and tunnels. Of course, nobody minded when the statue of General Bumble fell from sight, or when a string of light poles suddenly dropped ten feet. Makes the light better for reading. But they began to change their minds when a whole housing tract called Mountain View Homes sank to roof level. But the citizens really got up in arms when the crumbling surface began to affect the baseball scores. Strike! 
But that bitch was on the ground, Dump. I don't care. It came across right at your belt buckle. Boo! Soon an angry crowd collected at the newspaper office demanding the pot be dug up and the contest called off. I'd be happy to oblige good people, only... Only what, McCornpone? I can't remember where I buried it. And so the search went on. The only two people in town who weren't concerned were Rocky Squirrel and his pal Bullwinkle, for the moose had been ordered not to dig anymore. I just can't stand it, Rock. I know I could find that pot. Maybe you better go visit your relatives in Ponca City, Bullwinkle. That'll take your mind off the treasure. Yeah, guess maybe you're right. And the despondent moose packed his straw valise and started out of town on his bicycle. On the way, he passed what seemed to be a very earnest group of diggers. Find anything, fellas? Not yet, but it won't be long now. Well, good luck. And Bullwinkle pedaled away, little realizing that those diggers were in reality an evil gang called the Light-Fingered Five Minus Two. Their leader was that all-round thief and safecracker Boris Badenov. Please, Babyface Braunschweiger, the Minnesota monster. Well, Bo uh, uh, Babyface was really digging beneath the Farmers and Swineherds National Bank in order to rob it. How much farther we got to go, Babyface? Should be there now, Spike. Swing pickaxe one more time. Didn't I told you? Get the dynamite ready. Meanwhile, back in his little cottage, Rocky was already getting lonesome for Bullwinkle. Gee, I sent him off all by himself. Suppose he gets lost. I better follow him. And the soft-hearted squirrel started off to find his friend. Unfortunately, the first place he stopped was the hole being dug by Bo uh, a Babyface's gang. Hey, any of you fellas see a moose go by here? Hey, Babyface, you know who that is? Do I know who that is? Oh, boy, do I know who it is. That's Rocky the Flying Squirrel. He's rough on rats. We better get out of here. Nonsense, Nick. Invite the little chappy into the hall, Three Finger. The boss wants you should come into the hall with us. I'm sorry, but I can't whoop. The boss wants you should come into the hall. Oh. And in a twinkling, our hero was bound and blindfolded. Now, Slog, if you will be so kindly to light the fuse, we will be on our way. Gee, you're going to use the same dynamite to break into the bank and blow up the squirrel? Well, you know, he's a low-budget show. That voice. Where have I heard that voice? Well, it looks as if Rocky has only a few seconds to remember, for the fuse leading to the dynamite is growing shorter and shorter. And so, unfortunately, is our time. Be sure to see our next episode, Sweet Violence or The Yeg and I. <laughs> Having fun, son? Oh, uh, hi, Pop. How do you like Plato's watermelons? Watermelon? Oh, this. Yes, that. We have watermelons at home, you know. But they're not as good as these. That's the old, old story. Stolen sweets are sweeter. I'm going to teach you a lesson, Junior. And I suppose the best way is to relate a fable. Yeah, I suppose so. Uh, this is the fable of the fox and the owl. In a certain village in a certain forest, there was a certain fox who continually broke the law. That's a pretty nice pane of glass you got there. Thank you. You're welcome. Ordinarily, I'd sentence you to a week in the pillory. But seeing as it's be kind to foxes week... Nice pane of glass you got there. You again. You learned your lesson? I sure have. Are you looking for trouble, fox? Not me, Your Honor. I've got a good mind to give you two weeks in the pillory. However, it happens to be Be Kind to Window Breakers Weekend. Well, well. Fox, you get out of here. Oh, come now. Twice burned, one shy. You mean you cured? Hopelessly. This isn't Be Kind to Anything Week. Therefore, I sentence you to one month in the pillory. Gee, thanks, Judge. No doubt by now you're wondering why the fox sought imprisonment in the pillory. The answer was simple. He liked the food. Oh, there's the fox! Oh, 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 come on, let's go! Oh, oh. Here, the citizens tossed all sorts of goodies, and the fox waited until they departed, and then he ate like a king. However, one day, something strange happened. Hey, what gives with the rock? 
For some strange reason, the citizens threw rocks instead of food. You can't eat rocks. That does it. I'll find my sustenance elsewhere. And so he departed. In the middle of the forest, there dwelled an old owl. Not a wise old owl, just an old owl. However, he had one special talent. Cooking googleberry pies. Is my stomach deceiving me? Or is that a googleberry pie yarn owl is fondling? Mercy me, someone's at the door. Well, I'm here. You can go to the movie now. Who are you? I'm your pie sitter, that's who. I'll sit and mind the pie while you take in a show. Fine. I'll try not to be too late. You just make yourself at home and... Wait just a cotton-picking minute. Didn't fool you, did I, Pop? You never heard of pie sitting, did you? Oh, I heard of pie sitting all right, but I went to the movie last night. Undaunted and dedicated to getting that Googleberry pie, the fox tried another plan. Ho, ho, ho. It is I, Santa. Ho, ho, ho. That's funny. Here I'm getting ready to celebrate Fourth of July and Santa's coming down the chimney. Happy New Year. I mean, Merry Christmas. Well, bless my soul, it's Santa Claus. Deck the halls with hawks of holly. You, you got a present for me, Santa? This year we're gonna do it different. You give me a present. Anything specific in mind? How about a googleberry pie? All righty, and I'll tell you what, we'll even put a candle in it. Here, you hold the candle, and I'll light it. I got a funny feeling I'll be home for Christmas. Oh, no, not the pie sitter again. Quick, let me in. There's thousands of engines out there. We're hopelessly surrounded. Engines? Where? Thousands of them, maybe hundreds. Whew. I've been fighting them off all day. Say, you don't have a bite of food for a hungry soldier, do you? Just that Googleberry pie over there. Mind if I take a bite or two? Help yourself. I'll get my rifle and keep a lookout for redskins. You do that. <laughs> what the devil's going on? Engines, they're attacking. Oh, come on, Big Pop. You know there ain't no engines out there. Giving up the cause is hopeless, the fox returned to the village. But it was there in the square that he saw an organ grinder and his monkey. That's a boy. Go get a loot. The fox watched in amazement as the little monkey obeyed and climbed all over the square, returning with the kind offerings. I'll give you 50 bucks for King Kong there. It's a deal. With the little monkey under his arm, the fox returned to a spot just a stone throw from the owl's thatched hut. Okay, boy. You run into that hut and bring back the gooberry pie. The monkey took off while the fox held on to his leash. Moments later, he felt the leash stiff. He got it! He got it! He reeled in with all he had. Unfortunately, it wasn't the monkey with the pie at the other end. It was the owl with a gun. And that ended the fox. Some fable, Dad. And I hope it taught you a lesson, Junior. Just remember the moral. Stolen sweets are sweeter. I got a better moral, Pop. A fool and his monkey are soon parted. Eeny, meeny, chilly beeny, these spirits are about to speak. Are they friendly spirits? Friendly? Just listen. And now, here's that man with a master touch, Mr. Know-it-all. Thank you, and hello, lovers of the touched. Today, we take up the contents of my set of books on how to take your covered wagon through the west while being attacked by over 2,000 savages. They uh, had to put my name on the back. No room. This wagon, as you can see, is covered with a special material that is absolutely resistant to all the weapons Indians use. It resists arrows, tommyhawks, spears, in short, everything the Indian ever employs. Well, just about everything. Next, we have the disguise your wagon method. For this, you simply need a wagon and an old used racing car. And you go safely through the Indian territory with no one knowing you have a covered wagon. You mean I won? Last, but the most foolproof, is the balloon method. One simply takes off from the east and floats gently over the Wild West in a balloon filled with non-inflammable helium. Or was it inflammable hydrogen? I know, I look at this little teeny label on the balloon and... Gee, Mr. Nordahl, your book sure sounds exciting. 
Can I get a reservation for one of them? Hop in here with me, Rock, and I know we'll get a reservation. Hello out there, Peabody here. Today, Sherman and I are going back to the year 1900. What was happening then, Mr. Peabody? Oh, quite a number of things, Sherman, but we shall concentrate on a gentleman named John Holland, who invented one of the first submarines. We entered the Wayback Machine and were immediately transported to a dock just off Long Island Sound. At the end of the pier floated an ungainly looking object. As we neared it, a hatch suddenly popped open and up came John Holland. If you're from the Navy Department, you may as well go home. My submarine is a failure. What do you mean, a failure? Won't it run? Oh, it runs all right, but not like a submarine. Watch. Reaching below, Holland started the engine, then pulled the lever which caused the submarine to dive underwater. However, this submarine did just the opposite. Golly, Mr. Peabody, he's got a helicopter. Turning off the power, Holland returned to the surface. That's my problem. I'm supposed to test this ship for the Navy, but they'll never buy it if it won't go underwater. What time is the Navy supposed to be here? Two. Then we haven't much time. Quickly, we'll search for rocks. Rocks? Ballast, Mr. Holland. If we can get enough weight into your helicopter... Submarine. Oh, so sorry. Why, then it will descend. Thanks to the rock-bound Atlantic coast, we procured all the ballast we needed. The submarine went under. And so did the pier, and so did Sherman and I. Heavy rocks they have in these parts. Holland surfaced his craft, took us aboard, and drove into shore. And who should be standing there but two admirals from the Navy Department? Ahoy there, Holland. Get ready for a trial run. Keep underwater for exactly one hour and we'll buy your ship. John Holland insisted that Sherman and I go with him, and we agreed, knowing, of course, it would make a better story. I'm all set to pull the descent lever. Hope she goes down and not up. She will. And she did. We reached 30 fathoms in nothing flat. Oh, Mr. Holland, is your sub always as wet as this? Oh, gracious me, I must have left the tub running. What he really did was leave the hatch open. By the time I closed it, we were practically waterlogged. Never fear, I'll have this water out of here in a jiffy. With that, Holland rushed to the nearest porthole, opened it, and began bailing at a breakneck pace. Mr. Holland, sir, I think more water's coming in than out. Sherman was right. It was up to me to solve the problem. In the sub's galley, I came across 14 old tea kettles. I didn't bother to question their value, but instead set them to curtain on the stove. Are we having tea, Mr. Peabody? No, we are having steam. Inside of 30 minutes, I had boiled away every drop of ocean in the sub. It's getting late. We better surface or else we'll miss the Navy's deadline. Sherman and I both agreed, but the submarine didn't. It wouldn't budge. I'm giving her all she's got. You'd think that something was sitting on us. A most accurate assumption. Something was using us for a chair. The largest and most ferocious-looking octopus I'd ever seen. Let's face it, we're trapped. Don't you worry, Mr. Holland. Mr. Peabody will get rid of that octopus. What do you think I am, Sherman? Marine land? I puzzled over the problem for what must have been a good three seconds and then acted without hesitation. I need a fishbowl and a fountain pen. Well, the fishbowl I can understand, but a fountain pen? You got to write underwater? Something like that. I inverted the fishbowl, wore it over my head like a diver's helmet. Then, with the fountain pen in hand, I opened the hatch, climbed out, and marched forward to meet my adversary. Be careful, Mr. Peabody! Yes, that's the only pen I've got! The octopus glowered and came at me. Then, instead of attacking, he produced eight tennis balls and proceeded to juggle. I knew that in order for us to get away, I must prove myself superior to him in every way. I borrowed the tennis balls, added three clams and a lobster, and juggled right back at him. Needless to say, he became quite infuriated. Now, an infuriated octopus invariably blinds his victims with an inky fluid. Then he attacks. Before he could do so, I aimed my fountain pen and let him have a one-week supply of indelible ink right between the eyes. I had beaten him to the draw. Congratulations, Mr. Holland. You surfaced at exactly the prescribed time. The Navy will buy your submarine. And so, as Sherman and I watched from the shore, the Admiral sailed the submarine away. As for John Holland, he wasted no time in moving to a beach in New Jersey where he constructed a submarine 9,000 feet long. 9,000 feet long? He must have sunk. It did. And so he merely cut off both ends and made a tunnel out of it. Really, Mr. Peabody? Well, of course. You've heard of the Holland Tunnel. 
Haven't you? Things looked bad for our hero last time, didn't they? You said it! Rocky has been blindfolded and tied up in a hole under the Farmers and Swineherds National Bank right next to a charge of dynamite with a burning fuse. You said it! And the fiend behind all this is Boris Badenoff, alias Babyface Braunschweiger, the Minnesota monster. You said it! Come on, fellas. Last one out of the hole is a dead squirrel. Quickly, the gang scrambled to safety, leaving Rocky alone with the dynamite. Shh! Gee, if I can just get to the fuse, maybe I can put it out. And the fearless squirrel inched his way toward the sound of the sizzling fuse. First, he tried sitting on it. Shh! Ow! That'll never do. He even tried to pull the fuse out of the dynamite, only to find that it was a lot longer than he thought. Gee, I guess I'm really a goner this time. Help! Help! But the wily babyface Badenoff had roped off the area above and no one could get near enough to hear Rocky's cries. Meanwhile, on his way to Ponca City, Bullwinkle was pedaling slowly up the slopes of George Washington Hill. Boy, this is quite a grade. Mm, needs a little more moose muscle. But just as Bullwinkle stood up to push hard on the pedal, his bicycle chain snapped. <laughs> and Bullwinkle's bike began to rush backward down the hill at frightening speed. Of course, still facing forward, he had no idea where he was going. Sure I do. I'm going down. But you can't see where you're heading. On the other hand, I get a grand view of where I've been. Meanwhile, in the hole under the bank, Rocky watched in desperation as even the now lengthened fuse grew shorter and shorter. Shh. Hey, baby face. That fuse is taking an awful long time. Somebody might go down and rescue that squall. Nonsense. Nobody but idiot would go near hole with those signs around it. But at that moment... Gangway! Look out wherever you are! And Bullwinkle's speeding bicycle crashed through the guardrail and right down into the hole. Who is it? Who's there? Oh, I'm not sure, but I think it's me. Well, who's me? Who's you? You was a Rocky the Flying Squirrel. Bullwinkle, you've come to save me! I have? I mean, I have! In a twinkling, Bullwinkle had freed Rocky, and our two friends scrambled wildly up the ladder as the fuse burned shorter and shorter. So nobody but an idiot would go down there, eh, baby face? Well, look at him. Yeah, I guess you're right. They must have put out fuse. Come on, remember, he who hesitates is lost. And the gang climbed into the hole again. You got any other bright sayings, baby face? Of course. You can't keep a good crook down. Golly, Bullwinkle, those fellas are gonna rob the bank. Oh, that's terrible. You know what we gotta do, don't you? Sure, we gotta withdraw our money quick. No, we gotta warn them. Why? They know they're gonna rob the bank. No, we have to warn the people in the bank. Come on. Oh, that's very astute of you, Rocky. You mean astute, Bullwinkle. You may be astute. I am astute. Well, that was certainly true enough, for Bullwinkle's way of warning the bank was to rush in and shout, Hey, everybody! It's a stick-up! Instantly, the bank guards began firing at our friend. That was the wrong thing to say, Bullwinkle! Boy, some people are sure touchy. And as our heroes crouched under a hail of lead, in the basement below, the light-fingered five minus two was once again hard at work carrying off bag after bag of greenbacks. Correction, that's green box. Be sure to be with us next time for many a thousand gone or the Hall of Fame. Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Just enough left to tell him who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. <laughs> A thunder of 
jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... <laughs> a loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. Hurry, Bullwinkle! The show's about to start! I'm coming as fast as I can! Wave to the people! Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph! The Steve John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle! I know, but that's hard to spell. Sure, there's always room for one more. the peace and quiet of Frostbite Falls has been pretty well shattered these last few days. First, Colonel McCornphone, editor of the Picayune Intelligence, sponsored a treasure hunt to find a buried pot containing a million dollars in Confederate money. Plus a 1910 Stearns Night Roadster recondition. Then the good citizens of Frostbite Falls tried so hard to find the Picayune pot that they riddled the town with holes and tunnels. Here's a spot where nobody's dug yet. Hey, where'd you come from? I'm digging from the bottom up. Next, a gang of bank robbers led by Babyface Braunschweiger... Alias Boris Bedenov, folks. ...took advantage of the hole-digging spree to burrow under the town bank in order to rob it. And finally, when Rocky and Bullwinkle tried to warn the bank, Bullwinkle said the wrong thing... Hey, it's a stick-up! ...and the bank guards immediately opened fire on our friends. Hey, wait a minute! It's me! Hold your fire! I recognize that helmet. That's our boy, Rocky. And his boy, Bullwinkle. What's this all about, Rocky? Robbers, crooks, thieves! Oh, come, come. There's no need to call names. Not you, Mr. Frimley. You have bandits in your basement. Safe crackers in my cellar? You, yeah, and villains in your vault. Come on, man. And our friends dash for the basement of the bank, only to find it empty. Hot diggies, they're gone. Yes, there's only one thing. What's that? The money's gone with them. After them, Bullwinkle! They can't have gone far. True enough, for at that moment, Boris and the light-fingered five minus two were just pulling away from the bank in their getaway car. Give me a hand, Bullwinkle. I gotta catch him. Right, Rock. And the mighty moose seized his friend and tossed him high into the air. In a moment, Rocky was flying after the retreating car and slowly overtaking it. But the cunning crook was prepared for even this eventuality. Okay, three-finger, fire. Fortunately for our hero, the shell burst fell short of him. He's too high, baby face. Raskalnikov. Here, use special high power shell. Okay, baby face. And the robber loaded his terrible weapon, aimed carefully, and fired. The recoil blew open the gun barrel and drove the getaway car into a wall. But it had done its dreadful work well. The shell burst right in front of our hero, and dazed and shaken, he spun toward the ground. I finally got that meddlesome squirrel. Oh boy, it's a black leather day. But where do we get another car? Where did we get this one? We stole it. So steal another one. But where? Sure enough, Boris had forgotten that there were very few cars in Frostbite Falls. You mean we gotta make our getaway by hitchhiking? Baby face, we're disappointed in you. Come, come, fellas. Do you think I'll let you down? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Where is your fate? Where is your trust? Where is the car? Indeed, Babyface Braunschweiger might have met a sorry fate right then if he hadn't spotted something in a nearby window. Look! There's the car! Sure enough, they were standing right before the office of the Picayune Intelligence, and there in the window was the Stern's Night Runabout. That's a getaway car? Blackguards can be choosers. Come on! And in a jiffy, the gang had driven the old auto right through the window and were on their way out of town. But they're getting away, Bullwinkle. Tut, 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 and may I add, tut! Mr. Fremley, remember Rocky Squirrel is on their trail. They haven't got a chance. Little did Bullwinkle know that directly above him, the unconscious form of our hero, our hero, mind you, was hurtling nearer and nearer to the ground. 
Be with us next time for Down to Earth or Me and My Shatter. There was once a man who had three sons. The first son was very handsome and very talented, for he could play the fiddle with his feet. The boy will make a fortune doing that someday. The second son was very strong mm -hmm. and very wise, and he could recite clever verse while holding huge weights above his head. Out of the blue, a cockatoo flew. Boop, boop, beep, doo. Beautiful. Boy, I'll be famous someday. But the third son was not a bit like his brothers, for he was a dullard and he was very lazy. I'm in out of the rain, son. Yeah, what for? For a while. A boy will never amount to a hill of beans. Thank goodness. Who wants to be an old hill of beans? Then one day, the old man decided that it was time for his sons to go out into the world and make their fortunes. So he gave each of them some sour cheese, stale bread and a cookie, and bid them farewell. The first son paused by a shady tree for his midday meal. He was about to eat his sour cheese, stale bread, and the cookie when a funny Shoo. little man with a long beard and a crooked nose came up to him and said, I am very hungry, young man. Would you share your meal with me? No. I need this food to keep up my strength so that I can play the fiddle with my feet. And so saying, he gobbled his food mm -hmm. and set off down the road. A short time later, the second son paused by the tree to eat his midday meal when... Pardon me, young man, but... No! I need this food to keep up my strength so I can hold heavy weights over my head while reciting clever verse. Then the third son came up to the shade of the old tree. Ah, this resembles a fine spot to rest and have my midday meal. Gee, <laughs> what a mess. Pardon me, young man, but I am very hungry and... You are? Good. Then you eat this. You mean you'll let me have your sour cheese, stale bread, and cookie? Sure. I may be dull, but I'm not crazy enough to eat that stuff, you know. The funny little man was delighted, and he gave the young man an axe and instructed him to cut down the old tree. Then he scurried away. The dullard did as the funny little man had told him and chopped down the tree. Timber! Ooh, that's smart. And there, to the amazement of the young man, was a golden goose in the stump of the tree. I'm rich! He tied a string around the golden goose's neck and quickly headed for the village. He'd gone but a short distance when he met a wealthy merchant. Well, I see you have a golden goose there. Yeah, you'll have to admit, it's something you don't see every day. Hmm, I should like to have one of its golden feathers. Uh, would you sell one to me for, say, uh, a nickel? A nickel? Certainly. Then a strange thing happened, for when the merchant touched the goose's tail to pluck a feather, his hand stuck tight and he couldn't let go. Don't some of the darndest things happen in fairy tales? And the lad continued on his way with the hapless merchant stuck behind. They'd not gone far where they met a robber who waved his sword and shouted, So, you've got a golden goose, which is something you don't see every day, and I'm going to steal it. Be my guest. But when the robber grabbed the merchant to pull him away from the goose, his hand stuck tight, and the young man went on his way. When they reached the village, the sheriff saw the robber who was stuck to the merchant who was stuck to the goose, and he also stuck tight. And so it went until an hour later, no less than 206 people were stuck behind the boy and his goose. Now it so happened that the king had a beautiful daughter that never laughed. But when she looked out of the castle window and saw the long procession stuck behind the goose, she broke into gales of laughter. <laughs> Upon seeing this, the king rushed to the young man with the goose and happily proclaimed, You've, you've made my daughter laugh, and, and therefore you shall marry her. Well, now, that is a good idea, but it's going to be a little crowded, isn't it? So the king called the castle wise man to solve the problem. Do not worry, your highness. I can make them all let go with the 17 magic words. Now, 
everybody who doesn't want to spend the rest of his life in the dungeon raise his hand. The problem was solved, and so they were married. Now, ordinarily, any young man who has a golden goose and is lucky enough to marry a princess would surely live happily ever after. But such was not the case in this case. Oh, ho, 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 oh, no. <laughs> because of that dratted goose, I'll be handpacked for the rest of my life, and that's for the birds. So remember, dear friends, if you ever meet a funny little man with a long beard and a crooked nose, don't give him your sour cheese, stale bread, and a cookie, or your goose is kicked. <laughs> Bullwinkle, sir, with a message. Just in time. Is it important? Is it? Just look. The meeting will now come to order. Everybody take their seats. Let's have a little quiet there. Order. Sergeant at arms, clear those aisles. Order. Bullwinkle? What, Rock? Aren't you overdoing it a little? Yeah. Guess I got sort of carried away. I second the motion. Okay, let's start with the Bullwinkle and Rocky fan club cheer. Ready? Cheer? How does it go? How should I know? I haven't heard it yet. Hmm. Uh, hooray for Rock! Hooray for Rock! Greatest kid on any block! Hooray for Bullwinkle! Hooray for Bullwinkle! Uh, he's so suave and handsome? Hey, that doesn't rhyme. I know. Maybe I ought to change my name so it rhymes with handsome. Why not? It's fantasy show. Now, what's the first order of business? May I have the floor? If you promise to give it back. We gotta think of a way of enlarging our membership. Maybe we could eat more, Rocky. I mean, we ought to have more members. Or less auditorium. I got it. Everybody bring a friend next time. Hooray! Hooray! It's discrimination. You know I don't got any friends. Well, did everybody bring a friend? Natasha? Mine escaped, darling. Captain Peach Fuzz? Uh, I forgot. Boris? I didn't bring a friend, but how about some enemies? <laughs> I got a million of them. <laughs> Sunset, that time of day when the tired Mountie sits down to dinner and gets his just desserts. And just what does the tired Mountie do after dinner? Well, if he's anything like Dudley Do-Right, champion of the oppressed and all-around goody two-shoes, he goes for a swim in the river. Last one in is a rotten egg! Which is just what he had eaten for dinner. The rest of his fellow Mounties remained in the dining hall, however. For you see, this was the middle of winter, and the river was anything but swimmable. By the time they got him out, Dudley's warm outlook on life had cooled considerably. That ice is certainly thick. So is your head, Dudley. The vision of loveliness administering first aid to our hero is the haunting and ever-popular Nell Fenwick. She and Dudley have been engaged for 22 years. You need someone to take care of you. I have my horse. You need a woman. What is a woman? I am a woman, Dudley, and I have decided to let you marry me. Ten minutes later, they stood before the preacher. And if there is anyone present who objects to this union, let him speak now. The gentleman about to object is Dudley's lifelong enemy, the malevolent Snidely Whiplash. I don't know what it means, but I object. Whiplash, you cur, so you would ruin my wedding, eh? As a starter, yes. Dudley picked up the thing nearest to him, which happened to be hell, and threw it. Aha! I have her, and you shall never get her back, or any other part of her. Quick, do right. Give chase. What? And miss all this swell food? Far above Cayuga's waters sat Snidely Whiplash's sawmill, scene of many a tragedy. Why are you doing this, you devil? Because, Miss Fenwick, beneath this black exterior, there lies a mustard plaster. And over the mustard plaster, there hangs an asafetida bag. On it, imprinted in pica, are the words, Whippy loves Nelly. What I'm trying to say is, I love you. Well, let's say I like you a lot. But I despise you. You won't be mine? Never. But if I can't have you, neither can do right. He tied Nell to a log, pulled a lever, 
and studded her on her way to the teeth of a giant saw. Fortunately, the conveyor belt was in need of oiling, and the trip was a slow one. I must get word to Dudley. Nell was in luck, for as Whiplash stepped out of the back door, a mailman stepped through the front. One of them new weight-reducing machines, ma'am? Quick, sir. Are you en route to the Mountie Post? No, but I'm a-going there. Taking a pencil, she scrawled the word help on a sheet of paper, stuffed it into an envelope, addressed the envelope to Dudley do -right, then fainted from the exertion. Two days later at the post, Nell's father, Inspector Fenwick, chatted with our hero. I haven't seen Nell lately. Come to think of it, I haven't either. Perhaps she's visiting a sister. Does she have a sister? No, but Nell's a strange girl. At that moment... I, I ran all the way from Whiplash's sawmill. I have an urgent letter for Constable Do-Right. It's from Nell. I'd know her penmanship anywhere. Yes, it's from Nell, all right. Well, aren't you going to open it? That would be against the law, sir. You see, there isn't a stamp on the envelope. And there you have the reason why Dudley rode to the sawmill, dashed inside when Nell was still on her way to the saw, talked her into sticking a stamp on the envelope, dashed outside the sawmill, rode all the way back to the post and said to the inspector... It's from Nell, sir. She needs help. Well, stand there, do right. Don't just do something. It took them an hour and a half to straighten out that last line, but eventually Dudley was on his way to the rescue. Would he make it in time? Oh, save me, save me! Somebody save me! Don't go all to pieces, Nell. Wait about five seconds. It looked like Nell Fenwick's wick was about to be extinguished when... The jig is up, Whiplash! Dudley, the saw! Pull the lever! He pulled the lever all right, but the one that said free wheeling. The saw rotated madly, broke free of its moorings, and ate its way around the mill. Free to the Frankenstein! Within five minutes, the saw mill had been reduced to sawdust. As for Whiplash, he was last seen heading in the general direction of downtown Toronto, closely followed by the saw. Oh, Dudley, my hero! Nell, my heroine! At approximately 11.10 the following morning, every available Mountie gathered on the post parade grounds. Constable Dewright was to receive the Canadian Pretty Good Conduct Medal. Uh, before I pin this on you, Do-Right, when are you and my daughter going to be married? Oh, I'd say in about ten years, sir, unless she gets out before that for good behavior. You see, I had to arrest her for mail fraud. The stamp she stuck on the envelope? Blue chip, sir. Against all regulations. While well, babyface Boris Badanov and his gang, the light-fingered five minus two, have successfully plundered the Frostbite Falls Bank and are making their getaway in a 1910 Stern's Night Runabout. This is a getaway car, babyface. It's pretty slow, boss. Don't worry, boys. This was fastest car in Frostbite Falls. How do you know? Was only car in Frostbite Falls. And back in town, Bullwinkle and the bank president wait for Rocky to return, unaware that he has been knocked out while flying and is directly above them hurtling toward the ground unconscious. But Bullwinkle, suppose those crooks try to hurt Rocky. Deal with my own two hands, I'll... Oh. You what, Bullwinkle? Rocky! It's not like you to drop in so unexpected. Uh-oh, he's hurt, Bullwinkle. We better get him to a hospital. And in a little while, Rocky was being examined at the Kuchiching County Hospital. How is he, Doc? What's the matter? Well, your friend has a frontal tumescent edema with capillary suffusion. That does it! They can't do that to my buddy. I'm personally going to tear them crooks from limb to limb. And the Furious Moose dashed out of the hospital on his mission of revenge. What was it you said I had, Doctor? Well, in non-medical terms, you've got a bump on the head. Hokey smoke! Bullwinkle! But it was too late. Bullwinkle was already on his bicycle, heading out of town and after Babyface and his mob. Fortunately for his efforts, the Stern's Night runabout was very easy to follow, for it dropped a constant trail of nuts and bolts behind it. As a result, when one of the thugs chanced to look back... Hey, Babyface, somebody's following us on a sickle. Motorcycle. Bicycle. Impossible. But no, Bullwinkle was pumping furiously and actually gaining on the car as it roared over a twisting mountain road. Faster, Spike, faster! It won't go no faster, baby face. Then quick, give me my book. Your book? This is no time to catch up on your reading. It's time for this reading. Look. The golden treasury of fiendish plans. <laughs> right. And here is plan number one. And Boris began to sprinkle carpet tacks and razor blades out of the back of the speeding car. Bullwinkle's tires were instantly punctured and torn to shreds. <laughs> 
But he never faltered. In a few seconds, he was running on the rims and coming closer than ever. In desperation, Boris piled up every bit of loose trash in the getaway car and shoved the pile out the back. Uh-oh! Looks like a second-hand store coming at me. Fortunately for Bullwinkle, the first thing he hit was the rear seat. Instantly, he took off, flew clear over the rest of the trash, and landed even closer to the car. Oh, boy, some book this is. And the disappointed Boris tossed out his copy of The Golden Treasury of Fiendish Plan. Oop! In a second, Bullwinkle's bike skidded off the road and down a mountainside. Great work, boss. Oh, it was nothing any cold-blooded American gangster wouldn't have done. But at that moment, Bullwinkle's bike came out on a lower level of the mountain road, and when Boris's car turned a corner... baby face, look! He's a hell of us! Oh, boy! Gee, I must be going faster than I thought. I passed them without even seeing them. Well, now what, babyface? Wait till I figure out who's chasing who. But Boris's problem was soon solved, for at that moment, a tiny chipmunk scurried out on the road ahead of Bullwinkle's bike. Of course, the soft-headed, soft-hearted moose jammed on the brakes and skidded to a halt. There you are, little belly. Go ahead. Look out! <laughs> it pays to be courteous because... Ooh! Well, what will be the outcome of this horrendous smash-up? We'll see you next time in Hop, Skip, and Junk, or Bullwinkle's Big Toe. Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Just enough left to tell him who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty-bitty card. Ooh. We're late again, Bullwinkle. Right. Bye now. See you next time. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The Steve John Smith. But your name is Bowwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. One more. Well, Colonel McCornpone didn't know what he was starting when he sponsored a treasure hunt for a pot containing a million dollars in Confederate money. Not only did the citizens of Frostbite Falls dig the streets full of holes, but the light-fingered five minus two took advantage of the situation to rob the town bank. Bullwinkle was pursuing them closely, but when he took a shortcut down a mountainside, he wound up in front of the car he was chasing. Of course, when he stopped suddenly to let an elderly chipmunk cross the road, a collision was inevitable. In the bull? Uh, that means it was bound to happen. Hey, you right! The leader of the gang, Babyface Braunschweiger... Alias you-know-who... Uh, ...was just picking himself up when Bullwinkle approached. Oh, for Daisy's sake, let me help you! You? You're helping me? Of course! 
You mean you don't remember what happened? Certainly. Let's see. Uh, you don't remember what you were doing before the accident? Well, of course. I was, uh, I was looking for this very treasure is what? Babyface. He's forgotten why he's chasing us. Uh, yeah, fella. You, you was really pleased. Let's not look a gift moose in the mouth. Can I help you with your thing? Sure enough, crashing into that tree branch had driven all memory of the bank robbery out of Bullwinkle's mind. That's no drive, more of a short pot. And in a few moments, the robbers were on their way again in the battered Stern's Night runabout. You got the loot, baby face? Right here in this valley, Spike. A hundred thousand delicious dollars. Little did Boris know that he had taken Bullwinkle's valise by mistake and that he... Hey, you! What are you whispering about it? Uh, oh, 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 nothing. Well, stop it. Uh, yes, sir. But meanwhile, back at the moose, an identical valise lay at Bullwinkle's feet as he waved bye-bye to the departing thug. So long. Have a nice trip. And Bullwinkle sat down on the suitcase to ponder the possible position of the buried treasure. Now, let's see. Where would I hide a million dollars in Confederate money? At that moment, in the Cochichin County Hospital, his pal Rocky was saying... But I just gotta follow Bullwinkle. I'm sorry, Mr. Squirrel. Doctor's orders are to keep you under observation. But that's easy. And a few moments later, Rocky zoomed out of the hospital window while inside he was still under close observation on television. That's nice. No temperature. Bullwinkle, meantime, was puzzling out the latest clue to the hidden Confederate money. The Picayune pot is not obese. It's about the size of a straw valise. Hmm. Must be the same size as this here suitcase. And sure enough, as he picked up the valise, it fell open, and the astonished Bullwinkle was up to his moose hocks in money. Oh, boy! Of course, his adult brain didn't recognize it as the stolen bank money. To him, it was only... The Picayune pot! I found it! Oh, boy! But then, as he looked at the bills more closely, Bullwinkle <laughs> became a little puzzled. Hmm, this doesn't look like real Confederate money to me. At last, light was dawning in Bullwinkle's brain. He realized at last what he really held in his hand. Yes, it's counterfeit Confederate money. Oh, dear. And Bullwinkle scraped the money together. Well, most of it anyway, and started off down the road, leaving a trail of perfectly good $10 bills behind him. Well, easy come, easy go. <laughs> oh, the waste. And what will Boris do when he finds that the suitcase he holds contains four pairs of socks and a couple of peanut butter sandwiches? You're whispering again. Speak up or uh, uh, be with us next time for a box for Boris. Or the green paper caper. <laughs> That's better. And now it's time for... for five or six baritone solos in the key of E. But... If not... Ooh. Now for another of our special features. Should have tried E flat. Once a very long time ago, in a forest, there was a tree, which is a very nice thing to have in a forest. Now, in this tree, there happened to live a funny little man in a green suit with a pointed cap. He didn't live there alone, for he had a son, who was also a funny little man in a green suit with a pointed cap. Then one day, the son came to his father with a question that he had been wondering about for 50 years. How come we got to live in a tree? Because we're not ordinary folks, boy. How so? We're magic. Magic? Yep. How uh, so? Well, you know how sometimes folks get into trouble, and then they meet a funny little man who makes a deal to help them out, and he does a little magic, and then later on they write a fairy tale about it? Yeah. Funny little man, that's us. And being that it was his son's 600th birthday, the little man went on to say... And now, sonny boy, it's time for you to go out into the world and make a name for yourself. If I do real good, will they write a fairy tale about me? Without a doubt. The son was very excited about this prospect, and bidding his father farewell, he skipped happily out of the forest and set out to make a name for himself. In the village nearby, there was a miller who was very poor, but as luck would have it, he had a very beautiful daughter. Now, it so happened that one day, the miller had occasion to speak to the king. Uh, I got a daughter who can spin gold out of straw. Spin gold out of straw? Yep. Bring this girl to my castle tomorrow, and if she can do as you say, I shall take her for my bride. Good day. 
father. What did you tell him a thing like that for? So that he'll marry you. We can live in a palace in comfort. But I can't spin gold out of straw. You know that. Yeah, I know it. And you know it. But the king doesn't know it. <laughs> and we sure won't tell him. The next morning, the king placed the unfortunate miller's daughter in a room of the castle with a spinning wheel and a stack of straw. Now spin that straw to gold or else. Thereupon, he carefully locked the door and she remained alone. I don't want to be or else. No! She began to softly weep. Now, the funny little man in the green suit with the pointed cap had heard about the young girl's plight, and he knew that this was the chance that he had been waiting for, so into the room he hopped. How do you do? Who are you? I'm a funny little man in a green suit. Mm, you could say that again. I'm a funny little man. Never mind. What do you want? I will spin that straw to gold for you if you will give me your first child after you become queen. My first child? Why that? Who knows? Makes the plot better. It was agreed. And the little man jumped to the wheel and in no time at all had spun a room full of gold. When in the morning the king found everything as he had wished... Wow! I'm rich! Er... They were married and the miller's daughter became queen. About two years afterwards, a beautiful child was born and the little man appeared once again. Hi, I came for the kid. But you can't have my child. What will you do with him? Dress him in a green suit, make a funny little old man out of him. What else? Go! No, no, I tell you what, I'll make a deal. If you can discover what my name is within two days, you can keep the child. Boy, won't this make a keen fairy tale someday? And with that, the queen called to mind all of the names that she could think of. Henry, Clyde, Newton, George, Marmaduke, Sidney, Frank. Nah. Then on the next day, she desperately tried once more. Ning Toy, Running Mouse, Cherry Nose, Charlie Brown. No, you have failed. <laughs> well, what is your name then? It's, um... Oh. Oh, then a horrible realization came to the little man. He didn't know what his name was. Wait here. I'll be right back. He dashed into the kingdom to see if he could find anybody who could tell him what his name was. Do you know me? No, I can't say I do. And with any luck, I never will. He asked everyone he chanced to meet, but nobody could tell him who he was. Finally, out of desperation, he went to an old wise man who lived in a hole in the ground. No, I don't know your name, but I know how you can find out. Tell me, quick. Get yourself a mailbox. Sooner or later, somebody will send you a letter. Then all you have to do is see what name is on the envelope. That was it. He was truly a wise man. Oh, I don't know. If I had any brains, I wouldn't be living in a hole in the ground. Now, would I? The little man did as he was instructed, and before long, he did receive a letter. He eagerly looked at the envelope, but when I saw what his name was, he was shocked. Mouthful still Stillskin? What kind of a name is that? I can't go back to the queen and tell her that my name is Rumpel Steelskin. I'd be the laughing stock of the kingdom. And so the queen and her child lived happily ever after, for she never saw the funny little man in the green suit again. In fact, nobody ever saw the little man again because he was so ashamed that he changed his name to Louis Smith. And we all know that there's never been a fairy tale about Louis Smith. That is, until just now. Look, Bullwinkle, a message in a bottle. Fan mail from some flounder? No, this is what I really call a message. Hello there, poetry lovers. Today's little gem is called Sing a Song of Sixpence. Sing a song of sixpence, a pocket full of rye, four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. Everything okay in there? When the pie was opened, the birds began to sing. Wasn't that a dainty dish to set before the king? Hold it, Baker. There's only 23 birds here. 23? Your contract definitely says 24. And? Fine print says if you are short one bird, you short one head. Uh-oh. Wait, look here. It's just an egg. But something's inside. Look, it's the 24th blackbird. Hmm, pretty clever, Moose. Not at all, Your Majesty. I'm always delighted to give you the bird. Hey, Rocky, 
Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Not enough must leave. Presto! <laughs> no doubt about it. I gotta get another hat. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. <laughs> Peabody here. The dictionary defines the word Louis as a gold coin or an officer in the army. However, today Sherman and I are going to come in contact with another Louis, the 16th, the King of France. The way back's all set, Mr. Peabody. For France, Sherman? Yes, sir. For the year 1788? Yes, sir. Then we're off. In its usual flawless manner, the Wayback Machine teleported us to the Palace at Versailles. It was a scene of wild disorder. Soaked everywhere! He must be found! I don't like the looks of this. Gee, you don't suppose someone tried to assassinate King Louis? The answer to that question lay in the royal kitchen. It was there we came across the king's <laughs> lovely wife, Marie Antoinette, who was mixing up a batch of French dressing. Why are you crying, Mrs. Antoinette? It is Louis. He has been gone since last week, and I fear he has met with foul play. We joined in the search for the king. You are wasting your time, monsieur. There is not so much as a clue in this palace. Well, the guard was mistaken, for Sherman uncovered one. Look at this, Mr. Peabody. The word steel is scratched into the top of the grand piano. Shouldn't it be wood? I moved a tall decanter off the lid and further uncovered the word bass. That don't mean nothing. There is a steel company in Paris named Bass. There is also a prison in Paris with the name of Bass Steel. Come, Sherman, we're off. I tell you, you are wasting your time. Within an hour, we reached France's most notorious prison. I am most sorry, monsieur, but the prisoners in the Bastille are not allowed visitors. But I'm certain the king is somewhere in here. Ridiculous! How could the king be in here? Let us in and we'll find out. No! The only way you can enter is with a pass signed by the minister of prison. Where does he live? Cell 433. He's a prisoner, too, and he's not allowed visitors either. Bonsoir. But just around the corner from the Bastille, a balloon salesman had set up shop. Balloons for sale. Get your balloons here. Fifteen balloons, please, and one pin. What are you going to do with fifteen balloons, Mr. Peabody? I would like to know what he's going to do with the one pin. I instructed the balloon salesman to tie the balloons together and then hand them to Sherman and me. We grabbed hold and immediately soared up into the sky. At a point directly over the Bastille, I brought the pin into play. We're dropping, Mr. Peabody. Indeed we were, right into the Bastille. And once inside, we examined every cell, searching for Louis the Sixteenth. It was on the third floor that we found him. Louis? Oui? Who are you? That doesn't matter. What does matter is that we get you out of here. Your Majesty, why did you scrawl the word Bastille on your piano? I did not scrawl it. The piano was made here in the Bastille. Then why did you come here? To get a stool. What good is a piano without a stool? Unfortunately, a guard thought I was a prisoner trying to escape and put me in the cell. Did you tell him you're the king? Oui, and he told me he is the queen. Suddenly, a guard appeared with a tray of food and slid it under the cell door. Hmm, that gives me an idea. Come, Sherman, by breakfast, King Louis will be free. Sherman and I applied for a job as prison cooks. But how will peeling potatoes get the king free? You'll see, my boy, you'll see. Good morning, Monsieur Cook. What are you feeding the prisoners for breakfast? Slop? Ugh. No, of course. Pancakes. Very well. I take the prisoner who thinks he is king is hot cakes. Put them on this plate. One, two, three, four. 110, 111. Hey, Monsieur Cook, it is piled so high with food I cannot sleep it under the cell door. Well, I can't help that. Cut down the size of the door. As I had it figured, the door would have to be greatly widened to allow this plate to go through. Quick, Your Majesty, sir. Follow us. With King Louis bringing up the rear, we ran through the Bastille and made our exit through a side door. We better not stop, Mr. Peabody. Those guards are sure to try to catch up with us. There's no hurry. You see, instead of using baking powder and those hot cakes, I used... Blasting powder. Oh, how can I thank you, Monsieur Peabody? You have saved me. Oh, think nothing of it, Your Majesty. Well, there goes the King of France. Yes, and look who's coming. It's an executioner, and he's entering the Bastille. He came all the way from Ireland, Sherman, and he'll turn out to be France's most awesome executioner. An Irishman, Mr. Peabody? That's right. 
His name is Oteen, Gilbert Oteen. I never heard of him. You never heard of Gil Oteen? The search for the Picayune pot containing a million dollars in Confederate money had some unexpected complications, didn't it? The bank was robbed, Rocky was sent to the hospital, and Bullwinkle was chasing the bandits on his bicycle. He had a slight controversy with a tree trunk, though, and forgot why he was following Babyface Braunschweiger and his light-fingered five minus two. As a result, when he opened the rubber suitcase instead of his own and found it stuffed with greenbacks, he could only find one reason for it. It's counterfeit Confederate money. And Bullwinkle carelessly began to lug the suitcase back to town, little realizing that those $10 bills fluttering in the breeze were real, honest-to-goodness U.S. money. Meanwhile, Babyface Braunschweiger had reached his hideout and was preparing to divide the loot. He didn't know that he had Bullwinkle's suitcase containing three pairs of socks and a peanut butter sandwich. Come on, Babyface, quit stalling. Yeah, come across what I share before we get annoyed. Tot, tot, fellows. Do I look like Double Crosser? Yes. yes. Just asking. <laughs> well, we'll just open. Ooh. What's the matter? On second thought, why don't we wait till later to the wide end? How much later? How about next Groundhog's Day? If I see my shadow, we open suitcase. And if you don't? Well, there's other Groundhog Days. Baby face, it sounds like you're welching on our deal. You know what we do to welchers? Let's get him, guys. Things really looked bad for Boris until he said, Gentlemen, if I'm welching on you, may lightning strike me this minute. But amazing though it may seem, when the air cleared, the only man left unharmed was Boris Badenov himself. Not so amazing, Gluck. Good heavens, a lightning rod. Certainly. With my reputation, I can't afford to take chances. Of course, it didn't take Boris long to figure out what had happened. Hmm. If I got peanut butter sandwich, moose must have money. And Boris prepared to leave. Oh, what will he do to our friend Bullwinkle? Don't do it. Meanwhile, Rocky had left the hospital and was zooming through the air searching for his pal. Gee, I can't see him anywhere. Hey, Bullwinkle! Of course, the plucky squirrel's voice would not carry far enough, but Rocky was equal to the occasion. He pulled out a genuine Frostbite Falls mother moose call. <coughs> far away, Bullwinkle was amusing himself and breaking a federal law by cutting out pictures of the president. They look keen in my scrapbook. Suddenly, a strange sound came floating through the air. <coughs> Yes, it was a blast from the Mother Moose call. Bullwinkle's response was instantaneous. Coming, Mother. <laughs> Drawn by the irresistible appeal of the Moose call, Bullwinkle drew nearer and nearer to his friend. But unfortunately for our heroes, somebody else had heard that Moose call. <laughs> somebody who wished no good for our friends. Somebody who... Stop with the somebody who already. Give the name. Very well, Boris Badenov. <laughs> Ta-da! Had also heard the sound and whipped out a small but invaluable anthology... The Pocketbook of Fiendish Plan. Oh, boy. And just a short distance away... <laughs> you called? Hokey Smoke, who are you? Allow me to introduce myself, Yankee. On a child, Moose Moors. Pride from the Everglades. Honey child, Moose Moors. Yep, just arrived from below the Moose and Dixon line. Well, I'm pleased to meet you, Miss Honey Child. And so Rocky's gallantry and good manners take him close to fearful jeopardy. Is that fearful J jeopardy? Don't miss our next episode when Moose meets Moose or Two's a Crowd. <laughs> Just enough left to tell him who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop.
A thunder of jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. Hurry, Bullwinkle! The show's about to start! I'm coming as fast as I can! Wave to the people! Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph! The seed, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. We're gonna have a lot of fun. Come on and join us. Sure, there's always room for one more. Well, Bullwinkle has been having a wonderful time with that trunk full of Confederate money he found. He's been sailing paper airplanes made of $50 bills, even cutting out paper dolls of $10 each. Little does he know that it isn't Confederate money at all, but real United States currency stolen from the town bank. Boy, look at that one go! Rocky has been searching for him frantically and finally resorts to using a Frostbite Falls Mother Moose call. The sound of it reached Bullwinkle as he was flying a kite made of $100 bills. <laughs> Coming, Mubby. But when Rocky blew again, <coughs> it wasn't Bullwinkle who showed up at all. You called? Pokey Smoke, who are you? Allow me to introduce myself. Honey Child Moose Moss from way below the Moose and Dixon line. Gee, welcome to Minnesota, Miss Moose Moss. Rocky behaved like a little gentleman, but Honey Child didn't act like a lady at all. Fortunately, she was stopped by a strange sound. <laughs> well, how did you do do? Did you find the bank robbers and the money? How about introducing me to your bank robbers? Now I remember. Yes, it seemed that Bullwinkle's period of amnesia was over. Did I find the money? Boy, have I got a surprise for you, Rock. And Bullwinkle grabbed the straw valise and flung it open. Well? Well, aren't you surprised at what's in there? Three pairs of socks and a peanut butter sandwich. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, indeed. Honey Child Moose Moss, alias Babyface Braunschweiger... Alias Boris Bedenoff... ...had traded suitcases with Bullwinkle and now had possession of the valise full of money. And now it's bye-bye, Boris. But as the disguised villain started off... Hey, what's your hurry, little missy? Well, I gotta go way down upon the Swanee River. To see the old folks at home, huh? Hey, Bullwinkle, that valise looks just like yours. How about that? Small world, isn't it, Miss? Her name's Honey Child Moose Moss. Of the Florida Moose Mosses. I just knew you were from the South on account of your Southern fried accent. Um, no offense, Miss Moose Moss, but could we see inside your suitcase? Sir, no Southern gentleman ever peeking inside ladies' pocketbook. That's a pocketbook? Large economy size. Gee. Maybe I didn't have the money after all, Rock. Yeah. Maybe I dreamed it. Yeah. Maybe I'm just a stupid lame brain. Yeah. Couldn't you hesitate a little on that one? Well, I really must be going, y'all. Yeah. Well, it was a clear-cut victory for Boris until a strange object floated down near our friends. Bullwinkle, it's a kite made a hundred dollar bills. Must be the Deluxe model, and that ain't... Hey, that's my kite. Right. You did have the money, Bullwinkle. I think I hear my dear old mammy calling Caroline. But your name's Honey Child. That's my maiden name. Well, so long, Yankees. Grab that suitcase, Bullwinkle. And as Boris sped away, Bullwinkle seized the valise. Good work. Yeah. Open it up. Right. What's in it? Three pairs of socks and a peanut butter sandwich. Bullwinkle, she tricked us. Yeah, them southern meese are pretty slick. After her, Bullwinkle. <laughs> It's a pleasure. But in a few steps, Bullwinkle stopped short. Look there, Rock! Sure enough, on a nearby bush was Boris's false wig and antlers. You know what that means, Bullwinkle? Yeah, she's been scalped. No, no. Confound them Apaches anyway. Listen, it. We'll head him off at the pass. Bullwinkle, mm -hmm. it's a wig. 
She wasn't a real blonde. She wasn't a real moose. She wasn't even a real she. Well, will Boris make it to the train station and escape unscathed? On what? Uh, we'll find out next time in the Midnight Choo Choo or This Gum for Hire. <laughs> Keep that up, young fella, and you'll wake the whole neighborhood. Watch out, Pop. He's liable to sink his teeth in you. Junior, apparently you've forgotten one of my most frequently quoted proverbs. Which one is that, Pop? Barking dogs seldom bite. <laughs> well, barking big dogs seldom bite, which paves the way very nicely to my fable entitled The Hound and the Wolf. Once there was a pasture filled with the most edible grass you ever saw. And when you have a pasture with edible grass, you usually have a flock of sheep. Unfortunately, the sheep are also edible, especially to a pack of wolves. What's today, Gus? Wednesday. That's what I thought. We have mutton on Wednesday, do we not? Usually. Then let us have at them edible sheep. And just like that, the wicked scavengers trotted up to the flock. Although this particular flock had no shepherd to guard them, they did have a sheepdog. Mauler was his name, and for a very good reason. <laughs> Cotton picking wolves. Now, this entire scene had been witnessed by another wolf who had a reputation for being the craftiest in the world. I think I will decimate yonder sheepdog and then partake of a lamb dinner. As you can see, this wolf was not the slightest bit afraid of sheepdogs. And why should he be? He never fought them tooth and claw, he used a fencing foil. On guard, sheepdog! Ordinarily, that was enough to send the guardian of the flock to greener fire hydrants. But Mauler had a row of molars that didn't know the meaning of the word fear. Without his foil, the wolf was helpless. Cotton-picking wolves. Cotton-picking fencing wolves. Mauler returned to his chores, and at sundown, after he had locked up the flock, headed for home. Unknown to him, he had a shadow. No sheepdog can do what he did to me and get away with it. Inside his split-level thatched hut, Mauler sat down to a plate of bone, hard bone at that. Hmm, I, I guess I'll have to gum my way through. So saying, he removed that formidable row of molars. Hey, they're store boughten That was all the wolf needed to know. He would swipe the teeth and the sheep would be defenseless. <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. I'd like to get your opinion on a new soft drink. What's it called? Sheepdog Cola. Actually, it was nothing more than a concentrated dose of knockout drops. Don't listen to him, baby. Go ahead, take a slug, and let me know what you think. Well? Uh, well, which? How do you feel? I feel fine. You don't feel sick? No, my gums itch. How about sleep? You feel sleepy? Not the least. Hmm, must be something wrong. <laughs> Two nights later, after sleeping it off in Battle Creek, Michigan, the wolf returned to the thatched hut. Quick, quick, there's a starving tiger out there with a T-bone steak, and it's so tough he can't chew it. That's awful. Those were my words exactly. What could I do to help? Have you got any false teeth he can chew with? Just those over on the table. They'll do fine. Hey, wait a minute. You said I was a tiger out there. There are no tigers around here. Did I say tiger? I meant a three-toed sloth. No, three-toed sloth is around here either. That's sleeve. Plural of sloth is sleep. Now, what do you have around here? Uh, just sheep, dogs, and wolf. Well, one of them is out there with a tough T-bone. Then give him my brand new steak knife. Yeah. You know, you got tolerance. That's what you got. And you know something? That wolf was so overcome with the dog's generosity, he actually believed his story was true. Hold on! I'm coming! One week later, the wolf gave it another try. Christmas, sheepdog! Santa Claus. He knows me. Oh, uh, what are you gonna give me, sheepdog? Give you? You usually do the giving. Well, it's been a tough winter, kid. Well, I'd be happy to give you something, Santa. Anything in particular you would like? Yeah, false teeth. But if I give you my false teeth, I would not be able to protect the sheep. Yeah, well, that's the way Christmas is sometimes. The crafty wolf was about to grab the teeth when a noise came from the fireplace and... Merry 
Merry Christmas! Santa Claus! A ringer. But if you are Santa, then who is... Needless to say, the wolf beat a hasty retreat. But not so hasty that he didn't take the time to swipe the teeth. Bright and early the next day, the wolf boldly approached the flock. Sheep, you and I are having lunch together. <laughs> Don't damn me, sheepdog. You ain't got no teeth, so you can't bite me. I'm taking this fat little lamb. True, Mauler couldn't bite, but the fat little lamb could. <laughs> and the wolf took off, never to be seen again. Oh, I didn't know lambs had teeth like that, Pop. Well, you see, son, this particular flock was owned by a dentist. He had fitted them all with false teeth. So that's why I say barking dogs seldom bite. I got a better one. Nothing dentured, nothing gained. Nothing just... Uh, how about a glass of sheepdog cola, son, hmm? And now, here's that man with the wisdom of the ages, Mr. Know-it-all. Hello there, friends. Today's wisdom comes from the ages of three through five and a half, going on six. Today, we are going to learn how to sell the encyclopedia door to door. First one simply goes for the direct approach. You just knock on the door. Hello, kindly sir. I would like you to use this handsome volume of the encyclopedia absolutely free of charge. Go ahead. I insist you use it with no obligation whatsoever. Next, of course, you impress the potential buyer with the sheer size of the entire set. Hello again, knowledge-hungry kind man. Would you believe it, sir? There are over 350 pounds of these beautifully bound books standing here. And... Then, naturally, there is the play-on-his-ignorance method. Hello again, dear customer. I now open volume one, and I see here aardvark. Now admit it, sir, you are totally ignorant on the subject of aardvarks. <whistles> Baseball? <whistles> Cream kumquats? <whistles> Mousetrap? <whistles> Muskmelons? <whistles> pies? Plumbing? Steam boilers? <whistles> xylophones? <whistles> zithers? Gosh, Bullwinkle, you didn't sell a set. What are you gonna do now? I don't know yet, Rock, but there's one whole volume here that tells you how to give them away. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up must leave. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. I take a seven and a half. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. <laughs> Hello out there. Peabody and Sherman here. How would you like a trip to the mountains, Sherman? The Rockies, Mr. Peabody? No, the Andes, to a tiny village high atop those lofty peaks called Cusco. Who lived there? The Incas, a tribe of noble Indians who ruled Peru centuries ago. Set the Wayback Machine for the year 1532. And we shall be eyewitnesses when the Incas are conquered by that noted explorer and soldier, Francisco Pizarro. We enter the way back and we're immediately hurtled back through time and space. In 1532, Cusco was nothing more than a small village and a seemingly deserted village at that. Where is everyone? Before I could answer, we were ringed in by a cage of spears. Make one false move and you goners. Uh, one moment, Chief. I believe you're mistaking us for someone else. You're not Pizarro. Right, I'm not Pizarro. Little boy Pizarro? No, I'm Sherman. Then you must be Pizarro. I'm your wife. We were taken inside the Chief's hut and given a tall, refreshing glass of llama milk. I must say, Chief, I am quite surprised to see you only have one or two hundred men in Cusco. Most of Incas have gone to India. India? Incas, Mr. Peabody? Drink your milk, Sherman. We hear a rumor that Francisco Pizarro is on way up here to conquer us. I'm afraid you're right, Chief. It's in history that way. Well, we got him planned for Pizarro. When he get him here, we're gonna let him have it. But you can't. According to history books, Pizarro conquered you. Then we make him liar out of books. We gotta warn Mr. Pizarro, Mr. Peabody. I heartily agree, my boy. Well, it was the custom of the Incas to dally away their afternoons playing mahjong. And while they were so occupied, Sherman and I took the opportunity of leaving. We were almost out of the village when who should appear but Francisco Pizarro and two lieutenants. In the name of His Majesty, I claim this village as mine. 
What you gonna name this place, Francisco? I gonna name it after me. Let me see. Hmm. The soil here is sandy. That's it. I gonna call it Sandy Francisco. Crazy. Uh, Senor Pizarro, I don't know whether you're aware of this or not, but 200 Incas are waiting to ambush you. Oh, <laughs> don't be silly. Most of the Incas are over in India. Uh, and if this little boy make that bad gag again, I'm gonna throw him over the cliff. Try as I may, I couldn't convince the great explorer that he was walking into a trap. In fact, you can imagine my consternation when Pizarro and his men suddenly curled up in the very heart of the city. It's time for a nap. Well, naturally, the Mahjong tournament had to break up sometime, and... Oh, my gosh! Here comes the chief and his men. It was too late to awaken Pizarro, so we did the next best thing. We disguised him. What is it you got there? Uh, these, uh, these are llamas. I never see llamas like that before. Well, well, well th these are from Tibet. They're, they're high llamas. These look like llamas to you? Not to me. Me neither. What they look like to you? Donkeys. Unfortunately, Pizarro was a man who required very little sleep, for he chose that moment to crawl out from under the skins. It is donkey. No, it is a man. In the name of His Majesty, you are all under arrest. Well, needless to say, this didn't meet with the chief's approval. It wasn't long before Pizarro, his men, and Sherman and I were facing a firing squad of spear throwers. You can't do this to me. I am only an observer from the UN. You are Pizarro, and you and your fellow conquerors shall perish. Golly, Mr. Peabody, they're going to throw spears at us. You mean they'll try to throw them, Sherman? Spear throwers, get ready. Get set. Aim, fire! With all their might, the firing squad tossed their spears. However, halfway to the targets, the spears suddenly slowed to a slow drift and practically crept toward us. It's magic! No, atmosphere. You see, up here at 20,000 feet, things don't behave in a general manner, and those spears lose all their resiliency at this altitude. Hmm, here they come now. It was a simple task to catch the spears and send them back where they came from. Of course, even though they returned just as slowly as they came, they nonetheless managed to pin each and every Inca facing us, including the chief. We give them up! You conquer us! Well, that did it, Mr. Peabody. Now maybe everyone can live in peace together. Only time will decide that. Oh, my, this is a glorious view up here. I'll say. The Andes are really something to see. Some of those mountains just across the way, Sherman. Uh, those are called the Amos Mountains. They are brothers to the Andes. I never heard of them. You never heard of the Amos and Andes? got awfully close to the missing bank money last time. Close, but not near enough, for Boris Badenov, disguised as a lady moose, made off with a satchel full of swag, leaving our two heroes with an identical valise containing three pairs of socks and a peanut butter sandwich. Well, I only got one thing to say. What's that? Halfies on the sandwich. Little did our friends know that as they munched the sandwich, they were the target of three pairs of sinister eyes belonging to the light-fingered five minus two. Is that the, uh, satchel three-finger? Yeah, but where's a double cross some baby face? These guys must have knocked him off. Well, let's swipe the suitcase and then blast them. Uh, how about blasting them first and then swiping the suitcase? Meanwhile, babyface Braunschweiger, alias Boris Badenov, had reached the Frostbite Falls Railroad Station. Quick, what time leaves the next train for Skinny Epolis? He should be along about half past. Good, I'll wait. You want to buy a ticket? You are it, kiddo. And I'll pay for it with this. I, 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 of course. Here you are. Just a minute, chum. You forgot to give me my change. And under the menace of Boris's weapon, the clerk had to hand over the entire receipts for the day. Mm, not bad. Here's a tip for crooks and bandits everywhere. Next time, try the train. Meanwhile, a short distance away, the three hoodlums were creeping nearer and nearer our friends. Hmm, that was mighty tasty, Rocky. Any seconds on the peanut butter sandwiches? I don't think so, but let's look. And Rocky opened the straw valise. Nothing left but three pairs of socks, Bullwinkle. I'd rather have a sandwich. Well, 
Let's get back to town, Bullwinkle. You see that slug? The money's gone. Yeah, that means Babyface has pulled a triple cross. Well, do I blast them? Of course not. They don't have the money. Oh, I could use a pair of socks. Never mind. We gotta find Babyface. But back at the train station, Babyface was gazing up the track, waiting for the next train out of town. I thought you said train was due half past. Jeez. Half past four or half past five? Half past October. October? Raskalnikov. But it'll be right on time, give or take a week. A week? Oh, boy. I could run to Skinneapolis quicker than that. And grabbing his suitcase full of loot, Boris started off down the tracks. But in a moment, he had spotted something that brought him to a halt. For there on the siding was a small handcar. In a few seconds, Boris was pumping the handcar toward the big city and safety. Yeah, he sort of do-it-myself railroad. Little did he know that just ahead was a grade crossing where Rocky and Bullwinkle were just preparing to pass over the tracks. Just a second, Rocky. What is it, Bullwinkle? Can't be too careful crossing railroad tracks, you know. You always stop, look, and... Listen. Bullwinkle, are you all right? I'm not making book on it, but I think so. Yes, Bullwinkle's mighty frame had survived the impact. Not so the handcar. Gee, Bullwinkle, it's a total loss. And here's the fellow that was on it. It's that gangster. He's unconscious. You know, I'll bet his first words when he comes to will be, where am I? How come? That's what I always say. But just then, Boris's eyes opened and he said, Stick him up. Well, that's different, Bullwinkle. Yeah, but it's not much of an improvement. But we haven't done anything, Mr... Braunschweiger, Babyface Braunschweiger. Haven't we met before, Mr. Babyface? Have we met before? Oh, boy. But we're not going to meet again. How can you be sure? It's such a small world. Yeah, but you won't be in it. Well, is Boris really going to finish off our heroes? And if so, what will happen to our show? Be with us next time for Boris Medinov and his friends. <laughs> as if our time has just about run out. Just enough left to tell him who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The thief, John Smith. But your name is Bowwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. in their efforts to return the stolen money to the Farmers and Swineherds National Bank, our heroes have run across an unexpected development, or rather, it ran across them. The man
man on the hand car was, of course, Boris Badenov, alias Babyface Braunschweiger, who was escaping with the satchel full of loot. You busy bodies have busied your last body. Things look bad for our friends till a voice spoke up behind Boris. All right, Babyface, drop the cat. It's, it's my game. Right, Babyface, till I think at five minus two. You wouldn't be taking a little run-out powder, would you, boss? Okay, Babyface, up my valise. Look, let's split the swag right down the middle, huh? Even Steven, ain't it twenty? But when Boris opened the satchel, the thugs seemed disappointed in the contents. You can have my share, baby face. I can? Sure, what's one sock, more or less? A sock? Sure enough, all there was inside the valise were three pairs of socks. Some no good, no good, they sweet suitcases on me. But who? Who else? Them. Them who? Those damn who, 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 boy, they're gone. Yes, our quick-witted heroes had switched suitcases, vanished from the scene, and at that moment were zooming toward town on Boris's own handcar. Faster, Bullwinkle! We gotta get this money back to the bank! Of course, Babyface and his gang weren't idle. They steered their Stern's Night Roadster onto the tracks and took off after the fleeing handcar. But the thieves had reckoned without Bullwinkle's reserves of mighty moose muscle. With a final burst of speed, he reached the station, went right through it, left the railroad tracks, and crashed directly into the wall of the Farmers and Swineherd's bank. Well, we made it, Rocky. I'm not so sure, Bullwinkle. Look there. Sure enough, the hands of a nearby clock pointed to exactly 3 p.m. Uh-oh. Hey, let us in, Mr. Frembley. Sorry, Rocky. It's after three banks closed. But we got this money. No deposits after three o'clock. But it's your money. Banking hours start at 10 tomorrow. I always wondered why banks were called institutions. Now I know. Now we gotta figure out how to get rid of this money, Bullwinkle. Funny, I never had this trouble before. Hey, let's take it to the sheriff's office. Maybe he can help. But Rocky was doomed to disappointment. So we thought you might keep this money in a nice, safe cell. Sorry, boys. I can't arrest a satchel full of money. I just arrest people. Yeah. Of course, I could arrest one of you. And if you just happen to have a satchel with you... Swell! Go ahead! Nope. First, you have to do something wrong. Wrong? Sir, you are speaking of a couple of genuine TV-type heroes. Can't do anything wrong, eh? It's in our contract. But at that moment, the handle of the worrisome suitcase broke and it fell on Bullwinkle's foot. Oh! That does it. And in a twinkling, Bullwinkle found himself and the money safely behind bars in a basement cell. How come? How come? Disturbing the peace. Whose? Mine. Who? Good work, Bullwinkle. Oh, don't thank me. Thank my sensitive type Tootsie. Little did our friends know that just outside the barred window, that archfiend Boris Badenov had overheard everything. Well, gang, is only one way to get money. Don't tell me we gotta... Exactly. We're going to break into jail. Into jail? Are you out of your mind, baby face? Leave us not defy against nature, boss. Besides, how do we do it? Easy. I got plan right here. Well, that's a plan for breaking out of jail. Of course. We just follow plan backward. But what do we do about the moose? In a word, gentlemen. And the villains prepared to carry out their nefarious scheme. Oh, this bodes no good for our friends. This bodes ill for the bank, too. It bodes... Hey, you. Uh, yes? Sit down. You're rocking the boat. Be with us next time for Bars of Steel or The Hard Sell. <laughs> Once an old shoemaker who was very poor, for though he had worked very hard making shoes for over 30 years, he had never sold a single pair. Either I'm in the wrong business or the location of my shop is wrong. Reasoning that it couldn't be the wrong business. Well, I hate to leave this spot. No competition, you know. But maybe if I moved into the village where the people are, I'd sell some shoes. His mind made up, the old man went ahead with the move, which was quite a simple matter. A slight push, and in no time at all, he was in the village below, ready for business. Don't laugh. <laughs> it beats walking, I think. On that very day, the king, who was very fond of walking in the woods, was on his daily outing when he chanced to pass the shoemaker's small shop. Looking down at his shoes, he remarked to himself, Hmm, it looks as if the royal feet might use a new pair of shoes. And so saying, he entered the shop. Who are you? Drat it, man, I'm a royal customer. Royal customer? What's that? I came in here to buy a pair of shoes. Oh, forgive me, sire. It's been so long I've forgotten. The king tried on a pair of shoes to his liking, paid the old shoemaker, and was off for his hike in the woods. 
The little man was delighted and was certain that now he was on his way to making his fortune. However, several hours later, the king again entered the shop and he was purple with rage. What kind of shoes did you sell me? Beats me. Oxfords, I think. Look at my feet! Oops, <laughs> I got off on the wrong foot. Declaring that he was a menace to the feet of the kingdom, the king ordered the shoemaker to get rid of all of his shoes and never make another pair under threat of losing his head. And I shall check every day to make sure that you do as I say. Oh, dear, the old man was terrified, and he quickly set about the task of getting rid of all of his shoes. All day he dug a big hole, and it wasn't until that evening that he had buried every last one. Thank goodness. Now, when a king checks tomorrow, I'll be safe. Completely exhausted, he fell into bed and went sound asleep. Late that night, as they always do, elves came out to dance and skip through the kingdom looking for quaint things to do. They finally came to the shoemaker's shop and peeked in the window. Oh, look, a shoemaker. He must be very poor. See, he has no shoes in there to sell. Then come. We shall fill his shop with shoes. So for the rest of the night, the little elves worked making shoes, hundreds of shoes. Early the next morning, when the old man awoke, he could not believe his eyes. Oh, no! Where did all his shoes come from? Knowing that the king was due to arrive at any moment, he did the only thing he should think to do on such short notice and quickly painted a sign. So you've gone into the bagel business, have you? And you've baked them into the shape of shoes? Oh, what a novel idea. Ugh. It tastes like an old shoe. Funny you should say that. I order you never to bake another bagel or... I know, sire. Don't say it. The king stormed off for his castle, and once more the old shoemaker spent the day digging a hole and burying the shoes. Then, late that night... Oh, look! The shoes are gone! He must have sold them all! Let's make more so we can be happy again. And the little elves went to work making shoes by the score. In the next room, the old shoemaker was unable to sleep because of worry. I still can't figure out where all those shoes came from. When suddenly, he heard the sound of tiny hammers in his workshop. Upon investigating, he was shocked to find the elves hard at work and the room again full of shoes. So, you're the wise guys. See all of the shoes we've made? I'll bet you're pleased. Out, out, out! Well, in all my years of being an elf, I've never seen anything like that. He must not have read the book. For the rest of the night, the old man desperately dug holes and buried shoes, but in the morning, when the king arrived, he found one left shoe that the shoemaker had overlooked. So, a shoe! I'm cooked. Then the king happened to notice that the shoe was like none that he'd ever seen before. The workmanship was perfect, and he tried it on. Oh, my, now, this is fine. Bring the mate of the shoe to the castle in one hour, and I shall make you my royal cobbler. The little shoemaker happily dug up all the shoes he had buried, but then made a horrible discovery, for every shoe the elves had made was a left shoe. Oh, never mind, shoemaker. Forget it. It feels so good. I think I'll just keep it this way. And from that day forward, the king took his walks, wearing only a left shoe. Before long, it became a fad, and there was a great demand by all of the people in the kingdom to buy one left shoe. The old shoemaker sold all he had and, of course, became very rich, which only proves what the old man had always said, which is... There's no business like shoe business. <laughs> That's a pretty strange-looking painting, Bullwinkle. I just paint what I see. Well, what do you see? This is what I see. Today, we will have a demonstration on how to sell Bullwinkle and Rocky Fan Club cookies. But we don't have any cookies, Bullwinkle. Hmm, hadn't thought of that. Anybody have any suggestions as to where we could get some cookies? We could steal them from the Girl Scouts. What a depraved, monstrous idea. Stop it. You're turning my head. How about you, Natasha? Could you make some Toll House cookies or something? I could make some Jailhouse cookies. Jailhouse cookies? Sure. They got tiny little files in them. 
Any other ideas? Well, one of us could join the Navy. Someone would be sure to send him cookies sooner or later. But, Captain Peach Fuzz, you are in the Navy. Oh, yes, I am, aren't I? Does anyone ever send you cookies? As a matter of fact, everybody sends me cookies, and I'm getting tired of it. Then we're in business. Now I'll show you some first class cookie selling. Good day, madam. I'm from the Bullwinkle and Rocky Fan Club, and we're selling these tasty, delicious cookies to raise money. To raise money for what? Well, that depends on how much we raise. Hmm. <laughs> Gotta polish up my sales pitch a bit. Let me try. Good day, madam. I'm from the Bullwinkle and Rocky Fan Club, and we're selling these lousy, stale cookies to raise money. For what? For hospital. What else? A hospital? Who for? For people who eat our cookies. Well, why didn't you say so? I just love lousy, stale cookies. Here. Boris, you are dishonest, crooked, shifty, deceitful, underhanded, and loathsome. You left out vile. You're vile. Well, don't just stand there. Give me a merit badge. <laughs> Hello again, Peabody here. You're just in time to accompany Sherman and me as we journey back into the year 1778. What's our destination, Mr. Peabody? Kentucky, where we'll spend one or two exciting moments with that legendary frontiersman, Daniel Boone. My Wayback Machine, ingenious invention that it is, reacted instantaneously, teleporting us to the banks of the Kentucky River, and there stood a fort which was later to become known as Boonesboro. Did Daniel Boone build this fort, Mr. Peabody? I sure would like to meet him. Sherman's wish was granted. <whistles> Unexpectedly so. And you stay out of here, Daniel Boone. We don't want you. Daniel Boone? That's me. Golly, Mr. Boone, how come you were thrown out of your own fort? Don't rightly know, sonny. Used to was that folks cotton to me. Now they just can't stand me. The wind suddenly changed its direction, bringing with it a highly unsavory aroma. Wow, something smells awful. I'll say it does. Wonder what it is. That hat of yours, Daniel, how long have you had it? My coonskin cap. Just got it last Tuesday. Would that be the day your friends began taking a, a dislike to you? Now that you mention it, yeah. Say, you don't suppose it's my coonskin cap that smells? Skunk skin, Daniel. Skunk skin. We buried Boone's pungent chapeau and then talked him into an elongated session in the waters of the Kentucky River. Do you think the folks in the fort will accept Mr. Boone now? I'm certain of it, Chairman. Well, suppose we take him in his towel. We walked to the river's edge, but strangely enough, Daniel was nowhere to be seen. Well, his clothes are still on the bank, so he must be somewhere nearby. It wasn't until we examined the opposite shore that we discovered what had happened. Footprints! The tracks were easy to follow, and by late afternoon, we found where they were heading. An Indian village! Utilizing a small tree as camouflage, we were able to ferret out Daniel Boone's whereabouts. Psst! Mr. Boone, it's us! Oh, hi there, Sonny! Quick, get behind our tree and we'll help you escape. There's not an Indian anywhere near this tent. Can't do it, boy. Why not? No clothes. Them engines captured me raw. We couldn't leave him. Therefore, we had no alternative but to make our presence known to the Indian chief and try to win Daniel Boone's freedom. Let me get him straight. You challenge my best warrior to contest? That's right. I'll race him in a canoe, shoot arrows at a target, and send up smoke signals faster than he can. Mm. Sound them like Olympics. Okay, you got them, deal. Two out of three win. If Warrior loses, Boone goes free. If you lose, you get them scalped. Hmm. The first event was a canoe race. Both got them canoe. Both paddle across river. First man to reach other side is winner. On the word go. Go! We launched our canoes. Or at least the Warrior did. Well, get going, Mr. Peabody. He's halfway across already. Patient, Chairman. The tide is due to go out any moment. And it did. <laughs> Carrying me across the river in nothing flat. Peabody one up. Now you try them test number two. We were handed bows and arrows. Forty feet away atop a tree stump stood two apples, one large, one small. Having lost the first event, my opponent received the opportunity of shooting first. He not only chose to shoot at the large apple, <laughs> he hit it. My turn was next. That small apple contained a worm with a large appetite. So large that he consumed my target before I could draw a bead. Well, ha <laughs> ha, guess warrior win him. You both tied. That's not fair. 
there. Mr. Peabody didn't even shoot. Well, that's the way Cookie crumbles. Now we have a smoke signal contest. One who sent message up fastest is final winner. While the warrior encouraged his fire, I adjourned to a nearby tent and by using rocks, pieces of flint, and wood, managed to construct a somewhat makeshift typewriter. Of course, by this time, my adversary was sending puffs of smoke skyward. What are you gonna do with a typewriter, Mr. Peabody? You'll see, Sherman. I connected a rubber tube from the typewriter to a small fire, and then I went to work. Without the slightest doubt, I was the winner. Indian no go home back on word. You, boy, and Boone go free. That's wonderful, isn't it, Mr. Peabody? Yes, it is. However, Daniel still couldn't make a move without clothing. Here, Sherman, give the chief this dollar and buy that shirt and pants for Daniel. For a dollar? Is that all they cost? Certainly. That's why they call them buckskins. it all started with a newspaper publicity stunt. The Frostbite Falls Picayune Intelligence buried a million dollars in Confederate money and offered a prize to the person who could find it. The town was soon full of holes, one of which was dug right under the town bank by Babyface Braunschweiger and his gang. When they escaped with their stolen loot, Rocky and Bullwinkle tracked them down and got it back. Now Bullwinkle is sitting in a basement cell in the sheriff's station, waiting for the bank to open. Outside, Babyface... Or as we know him, Boris Bedinov... ...is planning to break into the jail and get the loot back again. But that's a plan for breaking out of jail, Babyface. Of course, we just follow plan backward. Well, at Mike, you seen one jail break, you seen them all. First, we crashed through gate in East Wall. Come on! But Boris's brilliant plan failed in just one detail. There was no gate in the East Wall. I got better idea. We get Sheriff to invite us into jail. Invite us? How? Easy. All we gotta do is get arrested. Of course. You've done it again, Chief. Now, here is plan. We find Policeman A. Then Spike, you break streetlight. B. Three Finger, you take big stick and hit little old lady C. And Slug, you draw a mustache and picture of pretty girl D. And what do you do, baby face? Shoot slingshot at Policeman A. Then we're all arrested and wind up in jail next to suitcase money. Okay? Baby face, you're a cotton pick and jewel. You sad, kiddo. Now everybody ready? Right. You bet. Three, two, one, zero. And Boris let fly with a slingshot at Policeman A. Unfortunately, he missed and hit Spike, whose rock then flew past Streetlight B and struck Three Finger in the head. As a result, he missed the little old lady C and caught his slug, who dropped his chalk before defacing the pretty girl D. The effect on Boris was immediate. He fainted. Now, that's the way I like to see things. Nice and quiet. But the wily villain couldn't be kept down for long. You bet. Now I start from bottom up. And furiously began to dig a tunnel under the jailhouse wall. Meanwhile, in his small cell in the basement, Bullwinkle was sitting on the suitcase full of cash while Rocky stood guard right outside. I'd just like to see anybody get this money now. Yeah. It's as safe as if it was in the bank of Oop. The bank of Oop? Where's that for... What happened, Bullwinkle? Must be Termite's Rock. They'd have to be awful big ones. They are. One of them's trying to grab the suitcase away from me. Well, hang on, Bullwinkle. I'll bring the sheriff. Yeah. But as you can guess, it wasn't Termite's under the floor at all, but that arch-fiend Boris Badenov. Give me that suitcase. Uh-oh, a talking termite. Let go of suitcase, you big boob. In dialect yet. Let go yourself, you thieving scoundrelly insect. Flattery will get you nowhere. Let go. Never. Then I must resort to secret weapon number 237. What's that? This. And Boris produced a large feather and began to tickle Bullwinkle's feet. <laughs> oh, 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 stop it, stop it, oh no, hey, stop. Drop suitcase. <laughs> I'll die first. <laughs> then you'll die laughing. Kitsy, kitsy, kitsy. Oh, no. <laughs> and at last, weakened by laughter, Bullwinkle's grip loosened and Boris dashed off with a suitcase full of stolen mo money. Will Boris escape with his ill-gotten gains? We'll find out in our next laugh-filled episode. <laughs> Who's tickling you? A subway finish or an underground round? <laughs> If 
our time has just about run out. Just enough left to tell them who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. <laughs> Right. Bye now. See you next time. A thunder of jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A whirl and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. Hurry, Bullwinkle! The show's about to start! I'm coming as fast as I can! Wave to the people! Sign an autograph. The Steve John Miss. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. We're gonna have a lot of fun. Come on and join us. Sure, there's always room for one more. <laughs> Last time you remember, Bullwinkle was gutting the suitcase full of stolen bank money when suddenly the bottom dropped out of the plot. Oop! Termites! But no, frantically tugging on the suitcase was our old nemesis, Boris Bedinoff. Let go, you stupid moose! I'm not giving up to no talking termites! Fortunately, the sheriff was outside Bullwinkle's cell and heard the commotion. He immediately went to the moose's aid. But unfortunately, Boris's gang also arrived on the scene. Fortunately, Rocky zoomed in looking for the sheriff, but unfortunately... Make up your mind, will you? Get him in it! Oh, Alice, get it going! Hey, baby face! Baby face, I got it! I got the suitcase! Then let's get out of here! And led by Boris, the light-fingered five minus two dashed out of the hole, dragging the suitcase with them. They were quickly followed by our friends who gained rapidly on the fleeing thieves. Quick, pass me the loot! And the thieves tossed the suitcase to Boris just before they were brought down by our friends. Good work, Rocky. We've captured everybody except the ringleader. Oh, we can always track him down, Sheriff. How do you know that? Look, he's leaving a trail of hundred-dollar bills. And it was true. The flimsy straw valise had sprung a leak, and Boris was leaving a trail of money behind him as he fled. Hmm, seems to be getting lighter. I must be catching my second win. Well, that's certainly a break for us, Rocky. I don't think so, Sheriff. Look there. Sure enough, a slight breeze had come up and the money was being blown all over town. Of course, this didn't go unnoticed by the citizens. Now, there's something you don't see every day, Chauncey. What's that, Edgar? The wind blowing money down the street. Oh, I don't know, Edgar. We always get a little breeze in the afternoon. We gotta get those green bags. Don't you have one too many backs in there? How can we get them, Rocky? They're blowing all over. You leave it to me, Sheriff. Sure. And the brainy squirrel dashed into a nearby appliance store and returned with a super-powered vacuum cleaner. Rocky, this is no time to worry about being neat. But in a few seconds, Rocky had strapped the cleaner to his back. Now, give me a boost up, Bullwinkle. I've got some cleanup work to do. So Bullwinkle seized Rocky and tossed him into the air like a small gray javelin. Rocky turned on the vacuum, and in a dazzling display of aerial acrobatics, gathered in bill after bill. You know, for someone who lives on a diet of nuts, he's pretty smart. And he's my friend. Well, he can't be all smart. Then, after gathering all the loose bills, Rocky zoomed off on Boris's trail, scooping up the money as he went. Back at the jail, the sheriff was giving Bullwinkle his instructions. Put these three guys in the cooler, Bullwinkle. I'm going to help Rocky. Okay, Sheriff. 
Come on, you fellas. And Bullwinkle marched the three desperados right through the jail to a large ice house behind it. Hey, what's the idea, buddy? The sheriff wants you in the cooler, and that's where you're going. Hey, what'll we do, Slug? Yeah, it's freezing in here. It's as cold as ice. It is ice. Oh, yeah. Now, listen, you guys, I got an idea. Hey! Hey, Moose, it's dark in here. What do you mean, dark? There's a light in there. Yeah, but when you close the door, it goes out. It does? I always wondered about that. Sure. Look for yourself. Okay. And while Bullwinkle stared at the light bulb, the three hoodlums closed the door on him. Uh-oh. I've been flim-flam. That's right. By the flimsiest kind of a flam. That's right. Them fellers tricked me. That's right. Look, it didn't go off at all. And while the icicles slowly formed on the mighty moose, the light-fingered five minus two dashed off free as birds. What an ending to a simple little newspaper publicity stunt. Don't miss our next episode, the last edition, or Five Scar Final. And now it's time... Time for that jolly juggler, Bullwinkle. Oh, dear. Three at once. One, two... And now here's a feature you're sure to like. Three. Once upon a time, there was a witch who, out of all the witches that ever lived, was the worst witch of all. She was a very ugly old hag, and because of that, she hated everything that was beautiful. Every time she came to a thing of beauty... How dare you sit there and smell good? She'd cast a spell upon it. Turn the seed, be a weed. Day after day, she would wander around the countryside casting her evil spells. Then one morning, as she was changing cute little white rabbits into bats... Wait till your little pink nose at me, will you? How do you like those apples? <laughs> la, 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 la. <gasps> oh, that song. It's beautiful. Well, I'll fix that. Following the sound of the voice, she soon came to a castle, and there, mm -hmm. sitting in the garden, was a young princess, the most beautiful princess in the kingdom. La, 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 la. So! Lee! A witch! Good heavens, where, where? Don't be silly, I meant you. Me? Oh, yes, me. <laughs> and I'm going to cast a spell on you. A spell? What for? For being beautiful. Is that bad? Well, you look like me, it is, honey. And with that, the witch cast a spell upon the poor little girl, changing her into a horse. Now you'll have to stay that way until a handsome prince comes along and kisses you, which will be never spilled, dear, because no handsome prince in his right mind will ever kiss a horse. <laughs> oh, darn. I hate days that start out this way. Alas, being a horse was quite a new experience for the girl, but she made the best of it by spending the next six months grazing in a nearby meadow and switching flies with her tail. Then... One day, as she was romping in a field, feeling her oats, a young prince and his lackey chanced to pass, and... Look, Clyde, a wild horse. Yes, sire, and isn't she a beauty? Oh, I'll say. Look at those forelegs. Fresh. Uh, what do you say, Clyde? Nothing, sire. I'll bet a fine animal like this can run like 60. I'll capture her and enter her in the big race next Saturday. This was just the break Beauty had been waiting for. Now, if she could just think of some way to make the handsome prince kiss her, she would change back into a beautiful princess, which would make her very happy. The following Saturday, Beauty found herself at the track. But her mind wasn't on the race she was about to run. It was on the prince. I wonder what makes her pucker up like that. Uh, must have eaten something sour, sire. <laughs> And then it was time for the race to start. Beauty was lined up at the starting gate with all the other horses and... Hey, off! Beauty was off like the wind and in no time at all had left the other horses far behind. Come on, Beauty! Come on! Beauty flashed around the far turn, thundered down the home stretch. She seemed certain to win when suddenly, to the amazement of all, she slammed to a stop five feet in front of the finish line. Cuddled up on the ground, 
and went sound asleep. The other horses thundered past, and she lost the race. I hate to say this, sire, but I'm afraid that you got a sleeping beauty on your hands. Yes, I noticed that. The prince raced sleeping beauty again and again, but it was always the same. She would fall asleep just before crossing the finish line. I'll just have to take her to Merlin Leroy, the wise guy. He'll know what to do. Merlin Leroy was the wisest man in the kingdom, and when the prince explained the problem to him... Oh, uh, don't worry, young man. You just leave beauty with me for a few days. I'm certain I can get to the bottom of this sleeping business. And Merlin went to work. Now then, uh, just relax and think back as far as you can. Several days later, Merlin returned beauty to the prince and assured him that he had solved the big problem. Uh, it's very simple, lad. Beauty has a kiss complex. What? Tomorrow is the last big race of the season. And her beauty, and if she goes to sleep again, uh... Just kind of, you know, kiss her on the nose. Needless to say, the prince was quite confused, but he did as Merlin had instructed, and Beauty was in the big race the following day. Hey, off! Beauty was never in better form, and she ran like the wind. The other horses didn't have a chance, or so it seemed, but then, five feet in front of the finish line. Seeing this, the prince dashed onto the track and kissed Beauty on the nose, and before his startled eyes, the horse changed into a beautiful princess. Of course, he lost the race again, but the prince didn't care. He was delighted with the beauty of the princess and quickly fell in love with her. And so, they were married, and the prince lived unhappily ever after. Yes, that's right, unhappily. For you see, even though beauty was no longer a horse, she was still an awful nag. Ready, Rock? You sure you know how to work that thing? No. Anyways, here's what it was supposed to look like. Hello there. Today's poem is called... Hey, Moose, how come you always read poetry? Well, it's my part of you the You think you are the only one with soul? Uh, you want to read a poem? Certainly. Today's poem got the title, How to be happy though miserable. But... Are you almost disgusted with life, little man? But... I'll tell you a wonderful trick. I... That brings you contentment, if anything can. Give me... Do something to somebody quick. Oh! Though it rains like the rain of the flood, little man, and the clouds are forbidding and thick, you can make the sun shine on your soul, little man. Do something to somebody quick. Oh! But you got the words wrong. It says do something for somebody, not to them. <laughs> well, after all, in poetry is not the word so much. It's the thought that counts. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up must leave. Presto! <laughs> Ooh, don't know my own strength. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. Gold. Some Canadians had it in their watches, others had it in their teeth. One Canadian had it on his mind. The pride of the mounted police, Dudley Do-Right. Now our hero is digging for two reasons. One, he received a new shovel on his birthday. And two, only gold and the wealth it brings will win him the fickle but beautiful heart of the fair Nell Fenwick. Nell is the daughter of the post commander, and it is for her that Dudley tries to do right, but seldom does. Look what I have found, sweet Nell. That's not gold, Dudley. That is a tin can. Yes, but all that glitters is not gold. What does that mean? I'm not sure. I shall give it some thought whilst working in the mine. Farewell, Nell. And with that thought in mind, Dudley dug as he had never dug before, toiling day and night until three weeks later, he emerged from the bowels of the earth holding two large sacks filled with gold. Why, Rika? That's Eureka. 
But Dudley knew what he meant, and off he dashed to his beloved. I have done it. I can now wed the fair Nell. Ah, but Dudley's horse had been through this before. He knew that the path to success was paved with low-grade asphalt. Speaking of low-grade, here is the villain of our melodrama, Snidely Whiplash. <laughs> Egad, that dullard has struck it rich. Now I must strike while the dullard is hot. His servant like mine quickly hit upon an evil plan. Oh, Dudley, have you given any thought to what would happen to me if anything should happen to you? Why, no, I haven't. I thought not. Here, sign this. And the unsuspecting Dudley signed a will that left his mind to whiplash in the event that he should meet with an untimely accident, which is precisely what Snidely had in mind. Up to now, no one had thought it odd that Dudley had discovered gold that had already been poured into sacks. The reason for this was Dudley had not dug his way into a mine, but into the post commander's office where the payroll was usually kept. One potato, two potato, three potato, four. What's this? Two potatoes are missing. Yes, Inspector Fenwick was nobody's fool. He knew that somebody was robbing the post payroll. Send do right in here. You sent for me, sir. Here are your orders, do right. Bring in the thief who's robbing the payroll. Five minutes later, Constable Dudley Do-Right was on the trail to Quebec in search of clues. Little did he know he was playing right into Snidely Whiplash's evil hand. One well-placed shot and I'm rich. But Whiplash was not only a poor marksman, but a poor judge of firearms. For this rifle had a kaleidoscope instead of a telescope. Looks more like a test pattern than a target. Take this, Do-Right. <laughs> A mile down the trail, he tried again, this time with an insidious weapon called a blowgun. But again, his knowledge was lacking, for the gun didn't blow darts, it blew bubbles. Oh, look, horse, Lawrence Welk must be on a road tour. It wasn't until Dudley stopped for water that Whiplash finally succeeded in getting the upper hand. From out of nowhere, a stout rope encircled Dudley. Aha! I have you in my clutches! Oh, Whiplash, you devil, what are you up to? No good, you can bet on that. I shall throw you over the cliff. Then your mind will be mine mind. But I can swim. With a stick of dynamite in your mouth. Whiplash jammed a burning stick of TNT into our hero's big mouth and pushed him over. <coughs> down, 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 he plummeted into the raging torrent below. It was true that he couldn't swim with a stick of dynamite in his mouth. But his horse could. Moments later, he and his master stood safely on shore. Or almost safely, for the stick of dynamite was still clutched between his teeth, and it was still burning. Dudley realized that only water would extinguish the fuse. But having his fill of the river, he decided to head back to the post and to the inspector's office where a bucket of water was kept for just such emergencies. By now, Whiplash was in the process of exploring his mind. Groping his way through the inky blackness of the tunnel, he came up in the inspector's office and clutched to his bosom the remaining sacks of gold. Why, Rika, I am rich! Just then, the door burst open. <laughs> Dudley dashed in, doused the TNT in the bucket of water, then turned to his arch enemy. So you are the payroll thief! Whiplash was caught in the web of his own evil scheme. He got 30 days. Dudley got seven, a week's vacation as a reward for getting his man. But where are you off to, dear Dudley? I am off to find another mine so I can make the mine. 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 Yes, Dudley Do-Right went back to digging for gold. And although we cannot be certain, we feel he will soon find wealth beyond his wildest dreams. <laughs> Frostbite Falls newspaper really started something when it buried a potful of Confederate money as a promotional stunt. Within a week, the town was dug full of holes, the bank was robbed, and Bullwinkle was locked up by a gang of thieves. Meanwhile, the gang leader, Boris Badenov, was heading for the hills, toting a valise that leaked $100 bills. Close behind, Rocky was scooping them up with a powerful vacuum cleaner. Unfortunately, the machine was a little too powerful. Excuse me, Mr. Braunschweiger. I thought you were a hundred dollar bill. Name is Babyface, not Bill. But then Boris spotted his empty suitcase. Raskolnikov, I've been hijacked by carpet sweeper. And he started off after the fleeing Rocky. Uh-oh, I gotta find some place to hide this money. But where? Then Rocky's sharp eye spotted a small building on a back street. That's it, the old ice house. Nobody'd ever think to go in there. Gee, Rock, I thought you'd never show up. Far as I can tell, I'm freezing to death. Come on, we gotta hide this vacuum cleaner full of money. How 
how about putting it under this loose board? Yeah, but that board isn't loose. <laughs> no, it is. Good. I'll just put... Uh-oh. There's something here already. Something to do with the plot, I'll bet. I'll say. Look. Oh, it's just an ordinary pot full of Confederate money. Bowwinkle, it's the Picayune pot. Isn't it, though? I all... The Picayune pot. Then we win the prize. Yeah. Now we've only got one problem. What's that? Staying alive to collect it. What's so tough about that? Well, I'll tell you, buddy. Yike! Yike, indeed, for there in the room with them stood Boris Badenov. Okay, Squirrel, hand over that vacuum cleaner. Never. Here, catch, Bullwinkle. Got it, Rock. The money flew out. Boris seized it and headed for the door. No, sir, Mr. Babyface Braunschweiger. You won't get by me. <laughs> Watch carefully. <laughs> Prime marches on. And Boris dashed out through the doorway. Rocky, he got away. We're gonna have another unhappy ending. I don't think so, Bowwinkle. How come? Well, you see, that's not the door to outside. It's not. I tricked him. Read the sign. Ice making room, keep out danger. Rocky, you have did it again. So a short time later, our friend stood with the sheriff outside the ice house. Well, we've got three of the crooks in the clink, Rocky. But what happened to the bank's money? Just watch. What do you know? Frozen assets. But what about Babyface Braunschweiger? Coming right up, Sheriff. <laughs> and that was as near as the Archfiend ever again came to the bank's money. The next day, he was shipped, ice and all, to the state Huskow. And our boys, heroes to the end, collected the prize for finding the Picayune pot, a genuine reconditioned Stern's Night runabout. There's only one thing wrong, boys. What's that? There's so many holes dug in the street, there's no place to drive it. But a little thing like that didn't bother our friends, and soon Bullwinkle was thoroughly enjoying driving his new old car, even though he wasn't going anywhere. Hold it right there, Rocky. How come, Bullwinkle? I like to watch the sunset. Look out! It's tipping over! And so as the sun slowly sets over Bullwinkle, we take leave of our heroes. Be with us next time for the further adventures of Rocky the Flying Squirrel. Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Just enough left to tell them who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel, and his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Likewise. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started.
Well, it looks as if Frostbite Falls is really on the way to becoming a big town. For the tiny Minnesota hamlet can now claim its own movie theater, the Frostbite Falls Bijou Theater and Pet Shop. And here coming out of the lobby and past the white mice are our two heroes, Rocket Squirrel and Bullwinkle Moose. Keen pictures, eh, Bullwinkle? Yeah, all except that last one. You mean a trolley named Tallulah starring March Marlowe in his ultra-sultry look? Yeah, too much mushy stuff. Well, he sure had an ultra-sultry look, though. Oh, well, anybody can look like that. Can you? Just watch. Well, look at here, Stella. Things are gonna be done my way, I'm not at all. You understand, Stella? That didn't look very ultra sultry to me. But as fate would have it, Bullwinkle had inadvertently opened a cage full of white mice, and at that instant, they were spotted by two nearby girls. Oh! What, what, what? Gee, you just looked at them and they fainted. I told you I got an ultra sultry look. Boy, try it again. Okay. Well, they got a thing here they call it a Napoleonic code, Stella, and... <laughs> That's pretty sensational, Rock. I didn't know you had it in you, Bullwinkle. Me neither. It just sort of oozed out. You're as good as March Marlowe. Who's he? Try it one more time, just to make sure. Well, I hate to give it away for free, but okay. It's gonna be you and me all the way, Stella, honey. But by this time, the mice were all gone, and this lady's reaction was different. <laughs> Hey, hey, looky there, Rock. She's hysterical with love. Sure looks like it. But when Bullwinkle had passed on, the lady recovered enough to gasp. <laughs> the most ridiculous thing I ever saw in my life. But it was too late. By the time he got home, Bullwinkle was already convinced that he was the greatest actor who ever lived. Oh, come now, I'm not big-headed. No? I'm just the greatest actor since Elmo Lincoln. Elmo Lincoln? And there's only one place where I can give of my talents. The annual moose picnic? No, Hollywood. Hollywood? No, no, Hollywood, with three or four L's. And Bullwinkle swiftly packed the suitcase and flung his mattress over his shoulder. Why the mattress, Bullwinkle? Well, looky here, it's stuffed full of money I earned on my paper route. It's my life saving. In a mattress? Why don't you use a safe deposit box? My feet hang over the edge. Not to sleep on, to keep your money in. Because when you put it in a bank, you can't take it with you, and I'm going. Well, I think it's just silly. You go on if you want to. I'm going to stay here. Tut, tut, <laughs> Rock and Jay Squirrel. Who are you? I'm your conscience. You can't let Bullwinkle go. Why not? Think of your friendship. Well... Think of your years together. Well, think of the plot. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I'll do it. I'll go along to keep him out of trouble. You should live so long. And so a short while later, Rocky and Bullwinkle stood together at the railroad ticket counter. That'll be 9160, Bullwinkle. Right. Got it right here. My gunnies, that's the biggest wallet I ever did see. And in a short while, our heroes were on a train headed toward the setting sun and perhaps Bullwinkle's rising star, all unaware that a few seats away, two pairs of sinister eyes were staring wickedly at Bullwinkle's mattress full of money. Don't miss our next episode of Punch in the Snoot or The Nose Tattoo. <laughs> What's up, son? Oh, it's this darn gumdrop machine, Pop. I keep putting pennies in it, but nothing comes out. <laughs> well, I shouldn't wonder you've been putting pennies in a parking meter. No wonder. Well, don't feel too bad, Junior. It happens to all of us. Remember, a fool and his money are soon parted. And that brings us to today's fable, which I call The Fox and the Winking Horse. What hell, Dobbin? Eating your breakfast, I see. Instead of answering, Dobbin, or Harold, which was his real name, he looked up at the fox and slyly winked. Now, this had an unusual effect. My goodness! When Dobbin winks, he doesn't fool about. Anxious to get as far away from the animal as possible, the fox slinked off into the underbrush. However, every time he looked around, there was the horse winking. 
The fox even tried to hide, but to no avail. In final desperation, the poor fox wandered into a nearby village and purchased a pair of sunglasses. Now, if this doesn't do the trick, nothing will. Turning a corner, he ran smack dab into the horse, who promptly winked. Eureka! It worked! Yes, the sunglasses prevented the wink from having its dire effect. Unfortunately, the horse chose to wink in every direction, and in a matter of minutes, the populace of the small village were all bouncing on their heads. Stop it, Dobbin! Stop it, I say! Look what you're doing! Of course, people bouncing on their heads not only lose their equilibrium, but the contents of their pockets as well. Money? Watches? Wilkie buttons? The temptation was too great. In one fell swoop, the fox swept up the loot and skulked his way out of town. Later, at an inconvenient hideout... I'm rich! Rich, do you hear? Rich! You're also under arrest. I say, who are you? Sheriff of that small village you just robbed. We all know foxes are fast. Before the sheriff could act, he bolted out of the cave and was off to freedom. A freedom which lasted approximately two seconds. Confound you, Dobbin. Why did I have to run into you? It was a mighty sad fox who viewed the outside world from the inside of a county jail. Drat that winking horse. If it hadn't been for him, I would never have gotten into this mess. Hey, Fox, you got a visitor. What? Say she's your mother. You want to see her? Oh, yes, yes, of course. My mother's living in Toledo, Ohio. You got just two minutes. The fox was about to embrace the hooded figure when the aroma of new-mown hay assailed his nostrils. It's you. Suddenly, a plan formed in the fox's agile but warped mind. Quickly, horse. Start winking, and the sheriff will never be able to stop us. No, 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 not at me. Wink at the sheriff. Thus, a daring escape took place. Naturally, the incensed citizens of this village formed a posse and gave chase, only to return empty-handed. I see you caught up with that winking horse. Well, we didn't get this way eaten upside down, Kate. One hour later, the first in a series of unparalleled robberies began. I say, stop, Choo Choo. Get off of the tracks, Fox, or I'll run you over. Don't make me laugh. This is a holdup. Don't make me laugh. How can one little fox rob this big train? It was simple. The horse winked, and lo, the entire train inverted itself, <laughs> spilling the contents of the passengers' pockets all over the tracks. Stagecoaches, Pony Express riders, they all fell prey to the winking horse. You know something, Dobbin? I've almost enough money to retire. All I need is $50,000 more. Which happened to be the exact amount in the coffers of the last national bank. However, the president was no ordinary fool. Gentlemen, the reason I've given you guns instead of fountain pens to work with today is that I suspect an attempted robbery. The reason he suspected it was mainly due to the fact that the fox had a gun pointing at his back. All right, sir. Hand over the money. Oh, don't be a fool, fox. You can't possibly outshoot all my employees. I won't have to. Give him the works, Dobbin. Dobbin hastened to obey, but something was wrong. Try as he may, he couldn't wink. I say, what's wrong, old paint, as the expression goes? Come on, wink. But old paint couldn't. Needless to say, the holdup was a distinguished flop, and the fox and the winking horse found themselves securely behind bars. Which only goes to prove, son, a fool and his money are soon parted. Oh, I don't think it proves that at all, Pop. You don't, huh? No, I think it proves this. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him wink. Care for a gum <laughs> friend today we take up the problem of how to wash a window all you need is a sponge a bucket and a dirty window like this one <laughs> which brings up the point of always checking to see that there is a window then of course there's the window on the tall building such as this one it's essential that you don't frighten the office workers by suddenly appearing 70 stories above the street outside their window so naturally you tap gently Oh, kind sir, I don't wish to distract or frighten you, so would you mind lowering your blind? 
The blinds! Undo the cord to the blind! Then there is the safety belt method. This method keeps you from falling by simply hooking one end of your belt to this side of the window and the other end of your belt to this side. Hmm. No belt. Oh well, I'll just use my suspenders. Gee, Mr. Nordall, you didn't show us how to wash many windows. What have you got to say for yourself? Just, where's my bucket? Thanks, loads. Peabody here, and for you poetry lovers, today's excursion into yesteryear will be a highly informative one. Are we going to visit Ogden Nash, Mr. Peabody? No, Sherman. The poetic personality we will tete-a-tete -tete with is none other than William Shakespeare. We set the Wayback Machine for Warwickshire, England, in the year 1611, and in its customary ingenious manner, the Wayback deposited us before a small neighborhood theater, the Stratford-on-Avon. Now playing a new play by Will Shakespeare, Romeo and Zelda. Romeo and Zelda? Must be a misprint. But it wasn't, for inside the play was in rehearsal and... Zelda, wherefore art thou Zelda? Instead of appearing on the balcony, Juliet, or rather Zelda, came marching out of the wings, carrying a large flower pot. She left the stage and went directly to a familiar figure who was sitting all alone in the front row. That must be William Shakespeare, Mr. Peabody. And look, she's going to present him with a flower. She presented him with a flower, all right. Pot and all. That'll teach you to steal my play. It's a man. Francis Bacon, if I'm not mistaken, and I never am. Bacon, you'll fry for this. Ushers, throw this pretender out. You haven't seen the last of me, Shakespeare. I'll be back. Are you all right, Mr. Shakespeare? Quite, my lad. But this comes at a most inopportune time. The play opens tonight. Uh, by the by, would you care to witness the initial performance? It would be an honor, sir. However, there's just one thing. Oh? Uh, don't you think Juliet would sound better than Zelda? Juliet, Juliet, Juliet. Uds Bodkin, sir, I like it. Juliet, it shall be. So that evening saw the auspicious debut of a new play entitled Sam and Juliet. Sam? We'll work on him, Sherman. The play progressed smoothly, and the audience was very enthusiastic, all three of them. But during the balcony scene, things went suddenly awry. Juliet, wherefore art thou, Juliet? Poor Sam never found out, because without a warning, the ladder he was on unexpectedly gave way and... The play is ruined, irretrievably and hopelessly ruined. Why do you say that, Mr. Shakespeare? Because there isn't another actor who knows Sam's role. I do. A quick change of clothing, a new ladder, me, and the play resumed. Oh, hark, what hollow light in yonder patio. Egad, the lads in ad libber. Verily, I shall ascend as yon balcony and meet my beloved. Easy with your big toe, Sherman. You're crushing my collarbone. Zelda! I mean, Juliet! Thou art wherefore, Juliet? You can well imagine Sherman's dismay when, instead of a lovely young maiden, a lovely young lion appeared. In one prodigious leap, a huge cat left the balcony and proceeded to empty the theater. He then turned on us. Run for your lives. The performance is canceled. Quick, Mr. Peabody. No need to panic. We'll simply ring the curtain down. Oh, the tragedy of it all, that this should happen to me if I ever found the rogue who owned that beast. That beast is mine. Bacon. With eggs. That did it. That terraced the sheet. We shall settle our grievances with a duel. Fountain pens at 40 paces. Fountain pens, my eye tooth. We shall settle it with pistols. Mr. Shakespeare, you can't fight a duel. I must. Mr. Peabody, you will act as my second, and you, young man, you shall be my third. At dawn the following day, the participants met on a misty common. You will each take ten paces, turn and fire. Go. Bacon and Shakespeare set off, but it was so misty that by the tenth step they were no longer visible. You've got to stop them, Mr. Peabody. They're liable to get hurt. Don't worry, Sherman. I have a plan. He dashed out into the mist to where a pile of bricks and a wheelbarrow of cement stood. What's this doing here? I put it here during the night. Now, the world record for erecting a brick wall is three seconds. I shall eclipse that. But Mr. Shakespeare and Mr. Bacon are going to fire. They did. I completed the wall in nine-tenths of a second. 
just in time to stop the bullets. Well, that should settle Bacon's hash. And that should take care of Shakespeare. Bacon. The good police of Avon arrived at that moment and carted the duelist off to jail. Boy, am I glad that's over. Yes, a few days in the quiet confines of a cell should cool them off. Well, there's one thing that puzzles me, Mr. Peabody. How did William Shakespeare get the name Bard of Avon? A misnomer, Sherman. William Shakespeare was not called the Bard of Avon. He was Bard in Avon. <laughs> Last time you remember, Bullwinkle tried out his ultra sultry look on a couple of young ladies who promptly fainted dead away. Oh! Bullwinkle didn't know that the girls had really fainted because they saw a mouse. Yeah, now he's convinced he's the greatest actor in the world. Oh, I am not. You're not? I'm just one of the greatest. But you can't go to Hollywood, Bullwinkle. I don't want to go rock, but they need me. You ought to be in pictures. Oh, isn't that terrible? You were born to be kissed. Come on now, Bullwinkle, you're not serious. Just watch me. And snatching up a mattress full of money earned from his paper route, the movie-struck moose had left the cottage. Wait up, Bullwinkle. You're my buddy. I gotta go along with you. Yeah, no blessed oblige, eh, Rock? What's that mean? I don't know. I just made it up. Now our boys are on their way to California, unaware that Bullwinkle's mattress full of money is the target of two pairs of sinister eyes belonging to... Oh, no, it isn't... Oh, it can't be. Say the name. Boris and Natasha. Ta-da! Ta then we steal mattress, Boris. No time like the president, Natasha. Look, we're coming to tunnel. When it gets dark, we grab mattress and make our own for it, okay? Okay. And as our heroes sat unsuspecting, the train plunged into a dark tunnel. Now, Natasha. Hey, what's going on? Yeah, who are you? I'm Bullwinkle. Not you, you. I'm still Bullwinkle. I got it, Natasha. Let's go. But Boris... Don't argue. Let's get out of here. And as the train emerged from the tunnel, Boris chuckled gleefully. <laughs> well, here it is, Natasha, right over my shoulder. I certainly am. Natasha, is you? Boris, how could you mistake me for a mattress? Can I help it if you put on weight? Boris, we missed our chance. Silly girl. Remember old Pottsylvanian proverb. We have only begun to fight. Darling, that was said by American John Paul Jones. We invented John Paul Jones. Oh. Well, our boys weren't bothered for the rest of the trip and finally arrived safe and sound in the movie capital of the world. Hollywood, here I am. Nobody seems to care very much, Bullwinkle. Ah, but Rocky was wrong. Somebody cared a lot. Welcome. Welcome to Hollywood, stranger. Well, that's Betty. We greet you with open hearts, darling. What would you like to buy? Buy? I thought you were greeting us with open hearts. It's 50-50 deal. We open hearts, you open mattress. Buy a souvenir of Hollywood, darling. Sure. Postcards, oranges, cemetery lots, battle smug, all kind tourist attraction. Tourist? I'll have you know I'm a bona fide actor. An actor! Oh, boy, are you in luck? Sometimes, why? Do you know who I am? Come to think of it, you do look familiar. And that voice! Of course! Allow me to introduce myself. D.W. Grifter at your service. Not D.W. Grifter, the famous talent scout. Who else? Stick with me, booby. I'll make you a star. Cross your heart? Of oh, course, doll baby. Just place your matri if your fate in my hands. Yeah, hands. And the world will be at your feet. Yeah, hands and feet. Your salad, sweetie. Now, why should Boris stand there patting Bullwinkle on the back? <laughs> Looking for soft spot for the night. Hmm, better not miss our next episode, Fun on the Freeway, or The Quick and the Dead. <laughs> Well, I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first... 
Here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Likewise. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. Bullwinkle arrived in Hollywood to take the movie capital by storm. But so far, he hasn't even drizzled. With his mattress full of money, though, he was an immediate target for a talent scout named D.W. Grifter, who looked a lot like you-know-who. Stick with me, booby, and your name will be in lights. Oh, I can see it now. Me too. Bullwinkle J. Moose. Bullwinkle J. Moose. No, 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 no. We need name with more zing. Bullwinkle J. Zing? No, wait. It's coming, it's coming. What's coming, darling? Christmas, maybe? Possibly St. Swithin's Day. No, the name, the name. Yes, I got it. Lay it on me. Craig Antler. Take it off me again. Craig Antler? Yes, can't you just see that name in light? Yeah, and it's got bigger bulbs, too. There's no time to lose. We got to get you in school right away. School? I knew there was a catch in this acting business. But first, let's settle my little fee. Yes, I take 10%. Of my salary? No, of your mattress. Well, the next day, a poorer but no wiser Bullwinkle... Please, Craig. Uh, Craig enrolled in the Thimmelrig School of Drama and Dance and awaited the appearance of his dramatic coach. I'm all a Twitter, Ross. Shh, I think he's coming. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, me to introducing myself. Gregory Rat at your service. Well, let's get to work. You mean I got to go to school to learn how to act? Of course, it makes big difference. Look, here is picture of actor before and after lessons. Quite a difference, Bullwinkle. Yeah, this after picture looks great. You are not or something? That's the before picture. You mean he looks like this on purpose? Believe me, is the only way to crack showbiz. You've heard of the method school of acting? I think so. This is the shortcut version of the method. I call it the system. And the disguised Boris began to teach Bullwinkle the system. He took courses in elementary slouching, advanced slouching, t-shirt tearing, 
contemporary beards and how they grew, and theoretical and applied mumbling, all at the rate of $20 an hour. <laughs> Boris was very happy. <laughs> Look at that pile of frog skins, Natasha. Don't moose catch on eventually, Boris. Catch on? Look at that face, Natasha. Yes, I guess you're right. But the villains hadn't counted on the intelligence of Bullwinkle's buddy, our hero, Rocket J. Squirrel. Bullwinkle, you look terrible. Yeah, isn't it great? When I get to be a complete mess, I graduate. But you're not learning anything. Not learning anything? Listen. <laughs> what was that? That was my mumbling lesson for today. Pretty good, huh? Gee, Bet I... Bet you couldn't understand a word, could you? No, and neither will anybody else. Nobody will ever give you an acting job. But at that moment, the door burst open and in strode a commanding figure. Hold it! Don't move a muscle. Can I tremble a little? Marvelous. Sensational. He's just what I want. And who are you? You don't know me, you peasant. <laughs> who is he, Miss Fitz? Is the famous movie director, Alfred Hitchhike. Alfred, Alfred Hitchhike? Hitchhike? Yes. And Moose uh, Uncle Alfred wants uh, you. Well, is this Bullwinkle's big break? We'll find out next time in Bullwinkle Makes a Movie or The Feature from Outer Space. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But that trick never works. This time for sure. Resto! Well, I'm getting close. And now it's time for another special feature. <laughs> A long, long time ago, there was a little kingdom which perched on the top of a high mountain. The king of this little kingdom was constantly trying to find new ways to raise money to buy the things he thought the country needed. Like, uh, well, a new robe for the king, for instance. How much is it? Five hundred pezuzas, your majesty. Hmm. Well, I'll have to levy another tax on the little people. But we already have a tax on everything, Majesty. What can you tax them for? Easy. I'll just tax them for being little people. Hear ye, all people under four foot six will be taxed accordingly. Well, there weren't very many people that little. Matter of fact, only one family in the kingdom was under four foot six, the goblins, and they didn't like it a bit. Maybe we don't have height, but we've got heart. If you're gonna live on this mountain, you gotta pay the tax. Then we won't live on the mountain. We'll live in the mountain. Come on, all you goblins. <laughs> and the whole goblin family entered a hole in the side of the mountain and shut the door. And you better be careful from now on, or the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. But, as we said, that was a long, long time ago. Since then, many kings had come and gone, tall, short, and medium, but the goblins still lived inside of the mountain from where they would sally forth on moonlight nights to try to get people. Hey, Sam. Huh? What do we do with the people when we get them? Don't ask me. We never got one yet. But sneaky though they were, the goblins had two weaknesses. First, they had very, very tender feet. Oh, 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 Sam, Sam, on my foot, my foot, take it off. It's killing me. What's on it? A feather. Oh, I bet that hurt. The goblin's second weakness was poetry. Yeah, we hate it. And that's one of the reasons they never got anybody. For all a person had to do was to say, One, two, buckle my shoe. Three, Four, shut the door. Oh, don't, the don't. Let's get out of here. Now, one day, the king decided to tell his daughter, Irene, the facts of life. And remember, the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. Have you ever seen a goblin? No, but... Uh... Well, how do you know there are such things? Is that a goblin? Of course not. Is that a goblin? No. Is that a goblin? Why, yes, I believe it is. It is a goblin, a goblin. And the princess ran for her life with a goblin close behind her. I told you they'd get you. But I don't want to be got. Help, help. The king summoned his knights, but their swords made no impression on the goblins at all. Things looked bad for the princess until she stumbled across a young miner named Curdy. And he was so struck by the princess beauty 
that he was moved to poetry. Oh, Princess Fair, your golden hair, upon your head, I see it there. And, of course, that stopped the goblin in his tracks, for he just couldn't stand poetry. You saved me with your poem. Are you a handsome prince in disguise? No, I'm just a handsome minor boy. Brave, courageous. Couldn't you go somewhere and learn to be a prince? Like where? How about Princeton? Isn't that awful? Little did the princess know that the goblin who had chased her was the prince of goblins himself, that he was determined to make her his bride. Are we almost there? This is a spot, Gov. Unfortunately for the goblins, they had chosen to come up in the middle of the royal croquet court. Four! Not the right spot, huh? A little more this way, I think. Yeah, there she is. Grab her. But the goblins had guessed wrong again and got Curdy instead. Uh, you fellows are making a terrible mistake. I'm Curdy. You sure are, hun. Well, I'll just recite a rhyme and, uh, uh, um... But without the princess to inspire him, Curdy couldn't think of a thing. And in just no time, Curdy found himself in a very embarrassing position. Do you take this earthling for your wife? She sure looks different. Could I take it out in the daylight and look at it? And so the goblins came out of the mountain with Curdy still closely guarded. But who should he see just outside the hole but the princess herself? Again inspired, Curdy burst into verse. What a gladsome fine surprise, now to see you with my eyes. Oh, 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 oh. I love you more, my lovely princess, than pies of apples or of minces. Well, the guards just couldn't stand that. I really can't blame them. Stamp on their toes! Stamp on their toes! And the goblins fled back into the mountain forever. See? I told you the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. But you were wrong. I was? Sure. It's the love bug that gets you if you don't watch out. It's guest speaker time at the Bullwinkle and Rocky Fan Club. And here to discuss how to get elected is that well-known political expert, me. Oh, boy, if that's political expert, I'm Little Miss Moffat. The first step in getting elected is to get nominated. We're now open for nomination. I nominate Captain Peach Fuzz. Thank you, Rocky, and I nominate you, too. It's regular mutual nomination society. Any more? Queen Marie. But she doesn't belong to our club. So we lower our standards a little and let her join. Any more nominations? So far, it's Rocky, Captain Peach Fuzz, and Queen Marie. Bullwinkle? Thank you, Rock. I accept the nomination. Nominations are now closed. Now the rugged campaign starts. Speeches, rallies. And so, my friends, I ask you, do you want honest leadership? Yes! Do you want intelligent leadership? Yes! Do you want Bullwinkle Moose? No! Funny, it says yes here. How am I ever going to win this election? Bullwinkle and Rocky Fan Club. Bullwinkle, did you vote yet? Yeah, I'm the first one here. Congratulations, you win by landslide. How's that again? Look out the window. A landslide is won only road to clubhouse. Nobody can vote but you. Then you mean Rocky won by a landslide. I voted for him. <laughs> Canada, where men were men, unless they were horses. And it was here in this secluded valley that Canada's most valiant steeds roamed wild and unfettered. It was from this vast herd the Canadian Mounted Police selected their mounts. Well, do right, I see you got yours. Yes, Inspector, he's a beauty. Palomino, I think. Tell me, what is that hanging down from underneath? Uh, an extra saddle, Inspector. The Mountie sitting on the cow is our indefatigable hero, Dudley Do-Right, decathlon champion of the 1904 Olympics. 
which were not held that year. Well, sir, if you'll excuse me, I think I'll take Whirlwind here back to the post and give him a brushing down. You do that, do right. For two weeks, Dudley put his noble steed through a rigorous training course, jumping, trotting, saluting, everything that was required of a mounty horse. It wasn't until the animal gave 14 pints of milk that Dudley became suspicious. Inspector? What is it, do right? I think my horse is sick. Luckily for all concerned, one of the Monty's was an ex-veterinarian. It was he who labeled the horse a cow. Do right? We are in trouble. Colonel Crimcrammer is due here tomorrow. As usual, he wants his mounties to be mounted. Don't you worry, sir. I'll be on a horse. Colonel Ogden Crimcrammer was at that very moment aboard the Saskatchewan Express. On a vacation, Colonel? No, no. Going up to inspect the mounty post. Got a few changes to make. This is where our plot sickens. For directly in back of the Colonel sat that black-hearted rascal Snidely Whiplash. Again, this situation is positively rampant with evil ramifications. <clears throat> I, uh... I beg your pardon, Colonel Crimcrammer, but the engineer would like to have a word with you. Oh, really? Where is he? In the last car. The Colonel was already in the last car, therefore, when he left it, he left the train. Whiplash, posing as Colonel Crimcrammer, appeared at the post the following morning. Good to see you again, Fenwick. You've changed, Colonel. Last year, you were six foot three. Whiplash was about to come up with a reason why he had shrunk when his beady eyes ran down the line of men and focused on Dudley. I must be seeing things. There's a Mountie sitting on a rocking horse. Do right. It was the only horse I could find, Inspector. Steady, boy. You'll have to excuse him, Colonel. He's just getting over a case of hoof and mouth. Get off the rocket, do right. Do right is the only man here who anticipated my new regulation. What new regulation is that? This one. And Whiplash hastily scribbled an order stating that henceforth all Mounties would ride rocking horses. Naturally, when the criminal element heard of this, they ran wild. Inside of a week, Canada was in the grip of an unprecedented crime wave. Do right, the Canadian National Bank has just been robbed. Go get him. But it was a little difficult to go get him when your horse Millie rocked back and forth. Hours passed, and the situation grew more tense. Any sign of the bank robbers do right? Not yet, Inspector, but I'm on their trail. At that rate, the only way a criminal would be caught was if he happened to come to the post, which is exactly what happened. The bank robbers, loaded with Canadian clubs and carrying sacks of money, darted inside the gate, hoping to use the post as a hideout. Luckily for them, they blundered into Dudley. You men see any bank robbers? They were too shocked to answer. Never mind. I'll get them anyway. Onward, boy! Onward! The gang proceeded to take the post over. They overpowered every Mountie they saw, including Inspector Fenwick. It is getting dark, faithful steed. We must return to the post and report. The bank robbers, having bound and gagged everyone, were contemplating passing the time with torture. I say, let's make them watch television. Yeah, turn on some commercials. Before they could carry out their fiendish designs, they were interrupted. Would you mind telling the inspector that my horse and I are still looking for the bank robbers? Oh, there's the inspector. Pardon me, sir, but... Yes, I agree, sir. It is cool in here. I'll throw some wood on the fire. But in the dim light, our dim wit threw not firewood, but firearms. Seconds later... It's the compass! And when the smoke of battle cleared, Dudley stood alone, victorious. Hmm, it's a lot warmer in here now. The gang was carted off to prison. As for the Mounties, they had no time to relax, for the real Colonel Crimcrammer arrived and proceeded with his inspection. Well, Colonel, as you can see, every one of my men is groomed to mount his specification. Yes, yes, but there are some changes I'd like to make. Oh, what did you have in mind? Well, to start with... Last time you remember, Bullwinkle was discovered by the famous movie director Alfred Hitchhike. He's sensational. He's got a certain something that no other movie actor has. What certain something? A pair of antlers. That's good. You mean you're really going to put Bullwinkle in a movie? We start shooting in the morning. Oh, boy, a western. No, no. It's a stark and soul-searing tragedy. A picture to tear at your purse strings. Uh, heart strings. What's the name of this picture? The Last Angry Moose, starring Craig Antler. That's me. Directed by Alfred Hitchhike. That's you. Produced by Bullwinkle Moose. Hey, that's me, too. What does 
does a producer produce? <laughs> he produces money. And so Bullwinkle's mattress got lighter and lighter as the moose paid for a studio, a spotlight, a camera, and even a chair for Bora. I mean, uh, Alfred Hitchhike. Okay, quiet on set. Roll em. You can't do it, Commander. It's murder to send up an orange in a crate like that. Cut, cut. Oh, boy. Easy, darling. Remember, he's paying you $1,000 a week. It's not enough, Natasha. Okay, next scene. You heard me, T. Texas. This here town ain't big enough for the both of us. Well, I'm a fixin' to do something about that right now. You gonna draw? Yes, sir. I'm gonna draw up plans for a bigger town. Oh, Natasha, there must be easier way to steal money. But then one day, the last Angry Moose was finished, and our heroes prepared to attend the big gala premiere of their picture. Harry Bullwinkle! Rocky, it's gone! My money mattress is gone! Oh, who could have taken it? Who, indeed, but your fiend and my fiend, Boris Badenov, who was at that moment heading for the border. But, darling, why did we steal mattress? Moose was giving us the money. I just couldn't face another day of watching him act. Meanwhile, our heroes rumpled and dejected. That's Rocky and Bullwinkle. Oh, well. Anyway, they arrived late at the theater just as the picture was ending. Don't get too close, Rock. You'll get your feet wet. What do you mean? It's a pretty tragic tragedy, you know. So? So when these doors open, there's going to be a flood of tears. But when Bullwinkle opened the theater doors, he heard... <laughs> Rocky! Rocky, they're laughing at the ending. And that's the saddest part. Yes, even the sight of Bullwinkle's plane being shot down in flames by a band of marauding Apaches... Even this didn't make the audience cry. Instead... <laughs> well, it seems that Bowwinkle had inadvertently produced the greatest laugh hit since Tilly's punctured romance. Last Angry Moose smash hit! At Laurentic's Buffo at box office! And here's my latest exclusive. To coin a phrase, a star is born. Yes, Bowwinkle's picture caused a sensation, all right. Almost as big as the sensation when its star, Crag Antler, disappeared. X3, Crag Antler disappears! Movie! star in quick fade out. And here's my latest exclusive. To coin a phrase, a star is gone. Meanwhile, back in Frostbite Falls, Rocky was speaking to his pal who reposed on a brand new mattress full of brand new money. But gee, Craig... The name is Bullwinkle. Don't you want to be a famous comedian and make hilarious movies? Nope, it's just not fitting. What's not fitting? Well, you go to all that work and then people laugh at you. And so as the sun sinks slowly behind our threadbare plot, we leave our heroes. Be with us next time for the further adventures of Rocky the Flying Squirrel. <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A uh, bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Likewise. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. Beep, <laughs> beep,
For many years, all the men who go down to the sea in ships, sailors, fishermen, garbage scow captains, have heard and repeated the story of the legendary whaling whale, Maybe Dick. Maybe Dick was supposed to be big enough to swallow a whole ship. Maybe. He could swim faster than any vessel in the sea. Maybe. And he had been seen by sailors whose reputations for sobriety were beyond reproach. Maybe. Yes, for centuries, Maybe Dick has been a, a shadowy, shadowy terror for, for all seafaring men. men. Pretty exciting, eh, Rock? Oh, that's just an old wives' tale, Bullwinkle. Old wives with whiskers? I mean, it's just make-believe. Make-believe? Sure. There's no such thing as a wailing whale. Well, if you can't believe what you read in the comic books, what can you believe? Oh, Bullwinkle. It's enough to destroy a young moose's faith. Oh, come on. There just couldn't be such a thing. You did sure make a good premise for a story, though. And it might at that, because at that moment, 3,000 miles away from Frostbite Falls, a Navy scout plane was flying over the Atlantic Ocean. Hey, come Commander, there's a raft. A raft of what? A life raft down there. Sure enough, far below, a tiny figure was waving violently. A Navy vessel dashed to the rescue, and in a little while, the white-haired survivor was telling his story to a group of officers. It was terrible, terrible. Look what it's done to me. I'm a wreck. I think you survived pretty well for a man your age, sir. My age? I'm 22 years old. And the castaway told his horrifying story. It seems that just a few days ago, he had been the young, vigorous captain of a fishing boat. Then one afternoon, he suddenly heard heard a strange sound. Hey, Cap, what's that noise? What noise? That mournful wail. Maybe it's a mournful wail. <laughs> but the captain had guessed far better than he knew, for at that moment, a huge shape hove into view. Cap, he's going to swallow us. And as the frantic seaman leaped overboard, the gargantuan whale did swallow the entire boat in one bite. Or at any rate, that was the castaway's story. What do you think we ought to do, Commander Binnacle? I think we ought to give this story the same consideration we do to any new idea. Yes, sir. And so in a short time, the unfortunate castaway was safely ensconced in the happy hatch. But I tell you, there was a wailing whale. Why won't they believe me? Ha! They won't even believe me. And you know I never lie. Why, who are you? George Washington. That might have been the end of the whole episode if it weren't that the next day, three more ships disappeared. Liners lost as whale whales. Maybe Dick strikes again. The Navy immediately sent out a fleet of destroyers. They disappeared without a trace. That did it. People by the thousands canceled their sailing plans. So did the ship's crews. The shipping industry was on the verge of ruin. Then that great shipping magnate, Pericles Parnassus, came up with his great idea. American people are loving fishing, right? Yes, yes sir. sir. They were fishing for anything, right? Yes, yes sir. sir. Then we offer it free boat and tackle to anyone who will fish for maybe dick. Uh, come, come, sir. Do you think there's a nitwit anywhere in the world stupid enough to take you up on that offer? Gentlemen, as old philosopher once said, the gustibus non disputandum. What does that mean? There's a soccer born every minute. Of course, Pericles Parnassus published his fabulous fishing offer, and of course, there was no one in the country stupid enough to take him up on such a harebrained scheme. Except... Oh, no. Will Rocky and Bullwinkle really try to go after maybe Dick all by themselves? We'll find out next time in Vagabond Voyage or the Castoff's Castoff. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a handsome prince who one day, while riding through the woods on his white charger, saw a very strange sight. For there, in a clearing, was a most beautiful maiden in a glass coffin, surrounded by seven funny-looking little men. Dwarfs, I believe they're called. The prince quickly rode to the spot and kissed the beautiful maiden. She immediately awoke. 
the dwarfs rejoiced. Hooray! Hooray is right. Now we could go home and get some sleep. And the young girl, whose name just happened to be Snow White, and the prince were married. Soon after, the prince was made king, and they lived happily for many years. Then one day, the king's wife presented him with a beautiful son. <coughs> at 5 a.m. in the morning. Here, you walk the floor with him this time. And the king did. Night after night, year after year, the king walked the floor with his son, until finally, 21 years later... <coughs> oh, stop that! You are now a young prince, just as I once was. It's time you quit blubbering and go out to find yourself a bride. <laughs> bride? How do I do that? Well, do like I did. Wander around the country till you find a beauty under a spell, then you kiss her. That's the way I met your father, son. That's right. Poison apple, wasn't it, Whitey? <laughs> With that, the king promised his son a kingdom of his own when he found a bride, then sent the boy into the world to seek his true love. The young prince wandered about for several years with no luck. <coughs> then, one day, he chanced to learn of a beautiful maiden who was being kept in a high tower by a wicked witch. Her name was Rapunzel. Rapunzel? She? What a name! Seeking out the tower, he found it to be very high, with the only entrance being a tiny window near the very top. As he watched from the cover of a thorn tree, the wicked witch suddenly appeared and called out in a loud voice, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair, so that I may climb the golden stair. The prince was startled to see shafts of golden hair tumble from the window, so long that it reached the ground, and the witch climbed up them. Soon after, the witch clambered down and was gone, and the prince approached the tower and called out just as the witch had done. Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair so that I may climb the golden stair. He climbed the hair and found it attached to the most beautiful maiden he had ever seen, and he immediately fell in love with her. Beautiful hairy one, let me take you away from all this. I'm with you, but how do we get out of here? Easy. We'll climb down your hair together. But at that moment, the witch flew in on her broom. So! Which was just as well, for both of them, climbing down Rapunzel's hair wouldn't have worked anyway. Furious, the witch flung the prince from the window yeah. and turned to the frightened girl. I warned you about this. No cooking, no pets, and no visitors. With that, the witch pulled out some shears and cut off all of Rapunzel's lovely hair, then turned and sped away on her broom. <laughs> Undaunted by this minor setback, the prince gathered himself together and called up to his true love. Don't worry, dear. I'll think of some way to get a rope to you. Finding a rope, he then bent down a springy tree to its limit, forming a catapult. Climbing on, he released it. And it flung him high into the air and towards the tower. But his aim was a tiny bit off and he missed the window ever so slightly. Next, he tied some strong bed springs to his feet and began to bounce higher, higher, and higher, and higher. But again, his aim was slightly off. You'd better skip the whole thing, dear. The only way you'll ever get up here is to fly. Fly? That's it. I'll fly up. Oh, don't be cuckoo. You don't know how to fly. Not now, but I'll learn. The prince dashed off, and for the next six months, he closely watched the birds in the woods, copying every move they made. Then finally, after much practice and perseverance, by flapping his arms wildly, he was able to fly. Yahoo! Hang on, sweetie, I'm coming. He quickly flew back to the tower, but when he arrived, he found the one thing he hadn't thought of, leaning up against the tower, a ladder. And Rapunzel was gone. Dear John, I have gone off with a prince named Charming, and he is too. Love, Rapunzel. Oh, the poor prince was broken-hearted, and he could be seen forever after crying. <laughs> <laughs> and flying around and around the empty tower. And, of course, the moral to this story is that if you laugh, the world laughs with you, but fly, and you fly alone. What's the matter? Bullwinkle? The Bullwinkle Fan Club got challenged to a softball game by the Shirley Temple Fan Club. Well, did you accept? Yup. 
but I forgot we don't have enough members for a softball team. Well, we better get some more. But how? By hiring me, that's how. Who are you? Jim Morensky, world's greatest publicity man. My card. Publicity? You sell it. And for first publicity stunt, you go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. Isn't this getting publicity the hard way? It's okay, kid. I don't mind a little work. Good luck. Extra! Jim Moransky saves foolish most! Look, we make headlines first time out. I don't see my name. Look, that's you, Foolish Moose. Yeah, that's me, all right. What are we going to do this time? We? You're going to jump into Fireman's Net down there. Nice crowd, huh, kid? I'm supposed to hit that teensy weensy little net? That's the Fireman's worry. You just got to jump. Rest is up to them. Well, I'll make it easier for them. How? I'm going to get down and jump from the first floor. But... Stand back, I'm coming in. <laughs> Coaxes Moose off ledge. How come you get your name and picture in the papers and all I ever get is Moose? And where's all the new members? Right here. You want to join the Bullwinkle fan club? No, we want to join the Moransky fan club. Sorry, kid. That's fan club B. Again, Peabody and Sherman here. Today we are going to visit Rocky. And his friends? Mountains. Specifically an elevated summit of the Rocky Mountains, 14,134 feet high. What date shall I set the Wayback Machine for, Mr. Peabody? The year 186, Sherman. The year the noted soldier and explorer General Zebulon Pike discovered Pike's Peak. The way back took us to the base of the Rockies where Pike's expedition was encamped. We arrived at a highly dramatic moment. You heard me climb down off those rocks or I'll start shooting. Look, General, we came with you to help discover Pike's Peak. The only thing we discovered so far is that you're a coward. Right. We've been here six months and you ain't climbed the Rockies yet. Don't get uppity with me. I said I'll climb and I'll climb. Yeah, but when? I'll climb tomorrow. Zebulon Pike went into his tent and we followed. Inside, we saw the General talking to a table. All right, you Pike's Peak, you. Now you hold still and I'm gonna climb you. I gotta make it. I did. I did it! You all right, General? Oh, yeah. You suffer from acrophobia, don't you? Fear of heights. You bet I do. Well, I get a nosebleed just wearing high-heeled boots. Then how will you ever climb Pike's Peak? I don't know, boy, I don't know. Right now, there isn't anything that would get me up that mountain. We put the general to bed, a four-poster affair with no legs. You've got to help him, Mr. Peabody. According to history books, Pike climbed Pike's Peak. He'll climb, Sherman. He'll climb. The following day, General Pike emerged from his tent to find his expedition engaged in a baseball game. What's going on here? It's the big game, General, and I'm afraid your team is going to lose. Why'd you say that? We don't have an outfielder. I bet the General could play the outfield, couldn't you, General? You bet I can. Good. Here's your glove. Take your position up there. That's the outfield? It's a tough league. Anxious to play and without the slightest realization that he was climbing, General Pike took his position approximately 100 feet up the mountain. Let me know when it's my turn at bat. A highly irregular game then took place, one in which the opposing teams kept moving the playing field in a heavenly direction. By the third inning, home plate was where the outfield had been. <clears throat> you can't play your position behind home plate, General. You'll have to move back. Back? Up. Mr. Peabody, we just lost second base. What happened to it? The last time I saw it, it was falling towards Denver. Now that's the way the base bounces, Sherman. The game continued, and so did the playing field. We kept inching our way up the towering cliffs. Unfortunately, at the halfway point, the game was called on account of darkness. You know something? I've done an awful lot of moving around in that outfield, and I haven't caught one ball. You'll have better luck tomorrow, General. You mean the game isn't over? Our side hasn't even been up to bat. Thanks to the darkness, General Pike had no idea that he was 7,000 feet in the air. We slept well. That is all but Sherman. Energetic boy that he is, he tossed and turned all night much to the concern of the general. That boy's keeping me awake. I better sleep somewhere else. 
So saying, he and his blanket migrated to the brink of a yawning chasm. Man's got to get a good night's sleep if he wants to play heads up ball. And wouldn't you know that dawn would break just then? <sighs> yep, ain't nothing like a good heavens. What am I doing up here? Oh! Being a light sleeper, I awoke just in time to rush over and grab him before he toppled over the edge. You tricked me! This was all a scheme to get me to climb Pike's Peak. There was no other way. Well, you got me halfway up. Now what are you gonna do? I'm too scared to go any further. Well, it took but a moment to solve that problem, and four hours later, Zebulon Pike had scaled Pike's Peak. How did you do it, Mr. Peabody? How did you get him to climb? He never knew he was climbing, Sherman. Take a close look at those glasses he's wearing. Somebody painted a picture on the lens. Not somebody. Peabody. It's a picture of Death Valley, which is situated 280 feet below sea level. I get it. No matter where he looks, he thinks he's in Death Valley. Water. Water. Get the general some water, Sherman. Oh, and while you're at it, buy some food for us from the men. Buy some food? Won't they share some with us? The general and his men are notorious for being stingy. Uh, come to think of it, that's how the word was coined. What word, Mr. Peabody? Pikers. Last time, you remember, the world shipping industry was being destroyed by that whaling whale, Maybe Dick, who engulfed whole ocean liners in one big bite. A fleet of Navy destroyers was sent to destroy him, but disappeared without a trace, except... <coughs> of course, people canceled their sailing plans, crews deserted their ships, even the rats got off. Things looked very black. Everyone was worried. <laughs> Not everyone. Who are you? I'm president of an airline. Boom! <laughs> As a last-ditch measure, the famous shipping tycoon, Pericles Parnassus, offered a free fishing boat and fishing tackle to anyone who would go after Maybe Dick. Of course, there was no one stupid enough to fall for that. Of course not. No one dim-witted enough to take him up on such a crafty scheme. He can't fool me. No. He's got to supply the bait, too. Oh, dear. A week later, Rocky was surprised when two burly men knocked at his door. You Rocket J. Squirrel? Yeah. You Bullwinkle Moose? Me Bullwinkle who? You? Me come. Uh, I mean, I'm from Panas. Mighty pretty country around there once they was that's pericles parnassus and this is frostbite falls minnesota it's a dead standoff all right oh you're gonna play it cozy are you a chicken and out benson who's chicken who's chicken then you will go fishing for maybe dick huh Hey, you better tell your story to Mr. Parnassus, bud. Rocky! Rocky. And so a few days later, Rocky and Bullwinkle stood before the most powerful shipping magnet in the world. But you already signed the application. You got it to go. No, we don't got it to go. You got it to go. For a powerful magnet, you don't pick up things very fast. Look at it this way. It's for the good of your country. My country? It's for freedom of the seas. Freedom? For the little people everywhere. All the midgets, huh? It's for home and mother. Mother, count me in. Well, plus big reward. Sold. And in a little while, our heroes were aboard the good ship Athabasco. You feeling seasick, Bullwinkle? No, I always turn green this time of year. Well, if you think this is bad, Bullwinkle, yeah. just wait till we cast off. Goodbye, Rocky. Goodbye, Rocky. Bye, Bye, I'll be seeing you. I'll be seeing you. Who are you? I'm from the By the Wee Funeral Parlor. Say, who's the captain of this fishing boat, Mr. Parnassus? Well, Rocky, by baby boy Keith, you're in luck. We got a genuine retired ex-Navy captain to steer boats for you. I'd sure like to meet him. I don't was understood it. He should be up on the bridge right now. Maybe he's late. Well, good luck and don't worry. If anything goes wrong, you both got big insurance policies made out to me personally. Sure is nice of you to take such an interest, Mr. Parnassus. Well, what are friends for if you can't make a couple of bucks? You said it! Sheik! But just as Bullwinkle took the tycoon's hand, the boat moved away from the dock. Uh-oh! We're underway! 
Hey! Have a good trip, dear Moose. Same to you, Mr. Parnassus. But I'm not going it anywhere. But he was, for when Bowwinkle let go of his hand, Pericles Parnassus dropped into the water. Quickly, Rocky seized a life preserver, zoomed through the air, and made a perfect ringer around the plundering man's head. You saved him, Rock! Not quite, for Pericles Parnassus refused to let go of his gloves and walking stick to take hold of the life preserver, and so disappeared from view. Stand back, stand back! I'll save him! But Bowwinkle! You're not the only hero on this show, you know. I'm the only one can swim. Yeah, that's right. Well, it looks like a short trip after all. Be with us next time for Fear on the Pier or What's Up, Doc? <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say. A uh, bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel, and his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. This sumptuous hall is the boardroom of the World Shipping Council. These sad-faced men are the biggest men in the shipping industry. And this chart is the reason they look so glum. Here is the level of world shipping just a few weeks ago. Here is the date on which the whaling whale, maybe Dick, began to swallow boats in one gulp. And here is the level of shipping today. He used an old nautical term, gentlemen. We're sunk. But a short distance away, Rocky and Bullwinkle have taken on the fearsome job of fishing for maybe Dick in a boat supplied by Pericles Parnassus, the great shipping potentate. Unfortunately, as they were saying goodbye, the boat moved away from the dock and Pericles fell into the water. Rocky made a bullseye on him with a life preserver, but he refused to to let go of his cane and gloves to take it and sank immediately. Bullwinkle went to his rescue, forgetting in his haste that he couldn't swim. Bullwinkle! Downward the moose plunged, and as luck would have it, plummeted right through the center of the life preserver, or almost right through. Actually, he stuck halfway. <laughs> Desperately, Bullwinkle wigwagged with his feet. While on board the ship, Rocky wrote down what he said. S-A-V-E-M-E. Savim? That doesn't make sense. And Rocky tore the message in half. Fortunately, he happened to glance down at it again before throwing it away. Say, 
leave me. Aha, that's the message. And in a trice, the quick-witted squirrel zoomed from the boat to a nearby crane. Grabbing the hook, he flashed back to Bullwinkle and lassoed his legs. In just a moment, the waterlogged moose was being drawn slowly out of the water. Did you get Mr. Parnassus, Bullwinkle? No. I got his walking stick, though. Sure is a heavy thing, too. Small wonder, for as the other end of the walking stick came into view, Pericles Parnassus was still hanging on to it. Bullwinkle, you saved him. How about that, no? Gee, how did you ever manage to get into that little ring? What bothers me is, how am I going to manage to get out of it? Meanwhile, back at the boardroom... Then it's settled, gentlemen. Next week, we all become television producers. I thought we were all going to commit suicide together. It's the same thing, what? But the fleet owners were spared that terrible fate. Hold your heads, gentlemen people, I got it good news tonight. What is it, Tell us, tell us what it is. I just sent Rocky and Bullwinkle to catch maybe Dick. Oh. oh. What's so good newsy about that? They'll just be swallowed up like all the rest. But look at the boat I sent them on. Looks like any other boat to me. Maybe Dick will swallow it, too. Of course, and look what he swallowed. I say, the ship's full of TNT. You said it, sport. So when the whale swallows it, the boat, kaboom! No Eve sends or maybe Dick's. What about the squirrel and the moose? Gentlemen, to get rid of maybe Dick, no price is too high to pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially if somebody else pays it. All unaware that their ship was a regular living bomb, our heroes stood at the rail waving farewell to the Statue of Liberty as they passed Bedloe's Island. Hmm, she's not waving back. You wouldn't want her to drop the torch, would you? Yeah, that's right. Gee, Bullwinkle, I wonder when we'll see her again. Well, if you'll just look on the other side of the boat, you'll get a nice view. Sure enough, the boat had swung in a full circle and was heading back where they came from. What's the matter with that captain anyway? Maybe he forgot his driver's license. I don't think he even has one, Bullwinkle. Yes, the good ship Athabasco weaved in a strange manner and at last headed straight for the Statue of Liberty. We're gonna crash, Rocky! Full speed astern, Captain! Yeah, wherever you are! But even our heroes didn't know the full extent of their trouble, for that boat, remember, is chock full of high explosive. Don't miss our next episode, TNT for two, or Freight Cargo. Today's lesson is mighty important, remember? Bullwinkle is a... Not that lesson. <laughs> this lesson. Well, on to the ball game. Finishing practicing your harp, Junior? Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, Pop. Good. Now, because you've been such a good boy, I'm going to treat you to another fable. But what about the Little League? My boy, I'm thinking of the Big League. Life. The biggest game of all. Do you want to be tagged out at home plate when by giving a few minutes attention you could slide in safely? When they pitch you that fastball trouble, don't you want to take a full, easy swing and knock old trouble out okay, of life? Okay, okay, Pop. <laughs> Stop with the metaphors. I'll listen. I knew you'd see it my way, son. Well, the moral of our fable is new solutions bring new problems. Clear as mud, Pop. What's the fable? The title is The Sick Lion. I know just how he felt. Now, it's a well-known fact that the grandest thing about any lion is his roar. <laughs> But this particular lion had a problem. Every time he roared, he sneezed. Oh, dear, there I go again. Quick, my nose drops, my aspirin, my hot water bottle. Yes, although this lion was kingly, handsome, and brave, he was always imagining that he was sick. A splendid roar, your majesty. Oh, what's the use? Every time I get off a good roar, I come down with a cold. It's always the same. You know why this happens, don't you, King? No, oh, no, tell me, please. Why does it happen? Because you're sick. Of course I'm sick. I got this nasty cold in my nose. That's not what I mean. I mean, you're sick, sick, sick. You need help, Leo, baby. You are a hypochondriac. Is it catchy? No, no, I mean, you think you're sick, so you are sick. Now, just lie down and tell me, do you ever have the same dream, night after night? Well, now that you mention it, yes. I have this one dream where I'm giving a concert in Carnegie Hall. It gives me great pleasure to present that superb baritone, Leo DeLion. 
Many brave hearts are asleep in the deep, so beware, be <laughs> Humans sing, lions roar. 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 That's true. A very interesting case. Somewhere deep in your mind, you have a mad desire to be a baritone. You're crazy or something? Only humans are singers. That's what my daddy told me. Humans sing, lions roar. <laughs> when did he first tell you that? Well, it happened one day. There was this human lost in the jungle. I think he said he was an opera singer. La, 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 la. 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 I'm gonna tell you this once and once only. Humans sing, lions roar. Get that and get it straight. But Daddy, I like to sing. Listen, la 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 la. When I say humans sing and lions roar, I mean just that. Now roar. Roar. <laughs> and it was then I started getting these nasty colds in the. Say, do you think... Of course I do. Your mind has been fighting against Roaring since you were a child. What you really want to do is sing. But who ever heard of a singing lion? I just did. Now let's hear a few bars of Genie. You mean sing it? Sing it. I dream of Genie with the light brown hair. Why, that's funny. I've completely lost my cold. Of course you have. Now, if you just sign right here... Certainly. What is it? It's a contract, Leo, baby. We're gonna make a fortune. I can see the albums now. Leo the Lion sings Gershwin. Leo goes Latin, swinging down the lion. And then, your big opening in Las Vegas. Your name in ten-foot letters. The crowds jam the place. The spotlight hits you, and you sing. Many brave hearts are asleep in the deep, so beware, beware. Leo, baby, you're made. You're a great success. But am I happy? Are you happy? You got money, haven't you? That's right. You're famous, aren't you? That's right. You don't have to roar anymore? That's right. So you don't have any more colds? That's right. Well, then what's not to be happy? Well, every time I sing, I get a pain in my leg. And so the lion still went on thinking he was sick. Now, you remember the moral, Junior? Sure, Pop. Psychoanalysis is good, I'm told, but it never cures the common cold. Yeah. Why don't you go play ball, Junior? I knew you'd see it my way, Pop. Uh, uh, yes. Hi there, culture lovers. Today's poem is called The Wind. <coughs> Wind machine, please. I saw you toss the kites on high and blow the birds about the sky. And all day long I heard you pass like ladies' skirts across the grass. Oh, wind a blowing all day long. Oh, wind that sings so loud. Uh oh. Oh, you that are so strong and cold! Ding dong, hurricane is what? Oh, blower, are you young? Well, there goes the poem. Turn it off! Turn it off! Boy, what kind of wind machine was that? Your kind, Moose. My kind? Sure. Big blowhard. <laughs> Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But... See? <laughs> Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. And now it's time to meet Mr. Peabody. Hello out there, Peabody here. Tell me, Sherman, in what sport is the term putt utilized? Motorboat racing. Motorboat racing? Sure, you know, putt, 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 putt.
1870, the world's first golf match was played, and today Sherman, his outboard motor, and I will not only witness this historic event, but will participate in it. Set the way back for St. Andrews, Scotland, Sherman. I set the way back controls myself, and in a matter of seconds, we were standing on Scotland's only golf course. Two gentlemen were in the midst of teeing off. That's your 30th stroke, Angus. And you've yet to tee off. Oh, I'm teed off, all right. How can that man expect to play golf, Mr. Peabody? His hands are all bandaged. Uh, pardon me, sir, but have you had an accident? That was no accident. McSnide here sent me flowers. Then you go blaming me for catching poison ivy. It's a grudge match we're playing. If McSnide wins, then Scotland has to play the game of golf according to McSnide's rules. That's 51 strokes. We can't let him get away with that, Mr. Peabody. Sherman was right. I substituted for the ailing Angus and prepared to tee off with a deficit of 51 strokes. You'd best be wary, Mr. Peabody. McSnide is a tricky rascal. A gross understatement. For while I was taking a practice swing, McSnide replaced my round ball with a square one. I drove exactly 250... Yards? Inches. Fortunately, McSnide's clubs were as crooked as he, and he drove his first into the rough. Good luck to you, and watch McSnide. This wasn't easy to do, for I had my hands full trying to approach the green. Hacking my way up the fairway, I looked more like a frustrated dice player than a golfer. While I was so engaged, McSnide used the rough to good advantage. I'm taking no chances, McPherson. Go to the ninth hole and build a trap so that just in case my opponent gets lucky, he'll fall in and forfeit the match. Hey, McSnide. I'll build the deepest trap you ever saw. I finished the first hole with a bogey 84. McSnide was three under par. Give up? A Peabody never gives up. Sherman, I'll use a round ball from now on. The second hole was 400 yards away, and due to a sudden shifting of the wind, my drive fell short of the cup, three feet short. Hoot, mon, that's the longest drive I've ever seen. You think that was long? Wait till the next hole. By the time we reached the ninth green, I was practically even with McSnide. The ninth, you'll recall, was the green McPherson had booby-trapped. You put first, Peabody, and uh, lots of luck. <laughs> He'll step on that green and fall halfway to China. I stepped on the green all right and promptly putted my ball into the cup. What a shot, Mr. Peabody. One more like that and you'll be in front. We left the green and approached the tenth tee. McSnide stayed behind. I can't understand it. I told McPherson to dig a trap under this green. And if there's anything I can't stand, it's a man who disobeys orders. Wait till I see that McPherson. I'll give him a piece of my mind. It wasn't until the 18th hole that McSnide caught up with us. Where have you been, Mr. McSnide? I had to replace a divot. What's the score? Mr. Peabody is 20 under par. Oh? How are you doing? I've had troubles, lad. I'm only 30 under par. He's still in front of you, Mr. Peabody, with only this hole left to play. What are you going to do? Beat him, of course. Hand me my number one wood. It was then that Sherman discovered we were short on clubs. Somebody swiped everything but the putter. Looks like you'll have to forfeit. Not as long as I have a putter. You can't putt here, Mr. Peabody. There's a lake that sits in front of the green. Hmm. This will require timing. I studied the grass carefully. Shoot, man, shoot, or else you lose. I shot. The ball rolled gently down the fairway, hit the rock, bounded into the air, landed on a duck's back. The duck took off across the lake, became airborne, and while directly over the green, lost the ball. And of course, as I had figured, the ball fell exactly into the very center of the cup. You did it, Mr. Peabody! You win! Doesn't he, Mr. McSnide? McSnide was in no condition to answer. The only thing I don't understand is why Mr. McSnide wanted to change the rules of golf. Well, you see, McSnide objected to the use of a golf ball. What did he expect to play with? Potatoes. He owned a potato farm and hoped to make a fortune selling them to golfers. But who ever heard of hitting a potato with a golf club? Oh, come now, Sherman. Surely you've heard of... <laughs> mashy potatoes? Pass the gravy.
When we left our heroes last time, their boat was headed straight for the Statue of Liberty, and unknown to them, that boat was full of high explosives. Captain, Captain! Whoever you are! Full steam astern, or fast and below, and all that stuff! And while you're about it, stop the boat, too! No use shouting anymore, Bullwinkle. We don't even know where he is. But let's look on the bright side, Rob. What's that? We know where he isn't. Come on, we only got a few seconds. And as the boat drew nearer and nearer the Statue of Liberty, our heroes looked all over the main deck and the bridge. He's not here, Rock! You don't suppose he's below, do you? Below what? Follow me. And Rocky and Bullwinkle dashed down to the engine room just in time to hear... Sailing, sailing over the Marjorie Main. Bullwinkle, do you hear what I hear? Of course, we're on the same channel, Rock. That sounds like Captain Peter Wrongway Peach Fuzz. And what more it is. Bless my stars and goddess, it's Rocky Squirrel. How did There's no you... time to talk now, Captain. Shove those controls to full speed ahead. You out of your mind, Rocky. We'll bash into the Statue of Liberty for sure and all. Yes, the Athabasco was right on the verge of disaster as Captain Peach Fuzz grabbed for the engine controls and then... <laughs> With a fearsome sound, the ship reversed direction and began to travel backwards. But you said full speed ahead, Rocky. Sure, I know we do just the opposite. Well, Rocky, what are you doing up here on the bridge? The bridge? This here room is below the water line. Hmm, a sunken bridge. These new vessels are pretty modern. Captain, you haven't changed an iota. Yeah, and you're supposed to change him every thousand miles. Well, it wasn't long before Rocky and Bowwinkle had Captain Peach Fuzz straightened out and in the right place. Well, you're the boss, Rocky. Where to? Well, any place we can fish for maybe Dick. Maybe Dick? You know about him, I take it. Yes, and I have only one thing to say to you boys. What's that? Abandon ship! Grab him, Bullwinkle! Got him! Now, don't be silly, Rocky. Nobody goes fishing for the whaling whale. Let's go back. All right, Captain. You can set our course for home. Rocky, we gonna give up already? Shh! Remember what happened earlier in the episode? You're not gonna repeat the same joke. If they liked it once, they'll love it twice. Yo-ho, lads! We're homeward bound. And giving the wheel a hearty spin, the adult brain skipper headed directly out to sea. Well, we might as well get started, Bullwinkle. Break out the fishing tackle. In a few minutes, Bullwinkle had assembled their special whale gear. A telephone pole and two miles of cable with an anchor for a hook. What's a rowboat for, Bullwinkle? Well, maybe Dick likes to swallow ships, you know. So? This is bait. And the good ship Athabasco plowed ahead as our boys trolled for the whaling whale. Only one thing bothered me, Rob. What's that? If maybe Dick grabs that anchor, do we have him or does he have us? Never fear, Bullwinkle. Remember, it's for home and mother. Personally, my mother never cared for fish. She was more of a... Bullwinkle! Where? Oh, that's me! Bullwinkle, I got the strangest feeling that somebody's watching me. Of course, it's me! No, somebody else. In the middle of the ocean? Pish tush, Rocky, and may I say, fie, there's nobody here but us and the captain. Yeah, I guess you're right. But at that moment, a strange single eye was watching Rocky carefully, not from on board, but from the ocean itself. Who is this strange intruder, and what does he want? We'll find out next time in Underwater Eyeball or The Deep Blue Sea. <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible.
adventures of Ruffy and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel, and his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Likewise. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. Well, things are certainly in a mess since the return of the legendary Maybe Dick. For Maybe Dick is a wailing whale with a taste for the liner things of life. But all is not lost, for our heroes, Rocky and Bullwinkle, are all at sea, angling for the monster with a telephone pole as a fishing rod. Above them, Captain Peter Wrongway Peach Fuzz is keeping a sharp lookout. Never saw such a fog in all my life. Captain, that's the bulkhead you're staring at. Hmm. I thought something was amiss. It's the first fog I ever saw with rivets on it. And the good captain began to scan the ocean for any sign of maybe Dick. Meanwhile, our heroes were trolling tensely from the stern of the ship. Don't worry, Bullwinkle. We're sure to get a bite. That's what I'm worried about. Huh? What's a good remedy for whale bite? You know, Bullwinkle, I got a funny feeling we're being watched. By who? Whom? Whom is watching us? That's what I want to know. We're being watched by whom? Yeah, by whom? By me, too. But then suddenly the sharp-eyed squirrel spotted an object some distance from the ship. Hokey smoke, Bullwinkle, look there. What is it, Brock? It, it looks like a big shiny eye. Well, I'll be jiggered. I've looked at the ocean lots of times, but this is the first time it ever looked back. Rocky, Bullwinkle, there's a peeping Tom off the port bow. We see it, Captain Peach Fuzz. What is it? Just looks like a big eye floating by itself, way out in the middle of the ocean. Maybe it's a private eye. <laughs> Perhaps it was Bullwinkle's bad joke, we'll never know, but the eye suddenly disappeared. And in its place, a strange-looking metal tube emerged from the sea and pointed at our friend. Look out, Rocky! It may be loaded! And loaded it was, for a huge jet of water shot out of the tube and swept our heroes off their feet. Gee, this is terrible, Bullwinkle! Yeah, I got nothing against bears, mind you, but it ain't Saturday yet. Rocky, Bullwinkle, the boat is filling with water. We're foundering. Floundering? Foundering, Bullwinkle. He means all that water sinking our boat. Well, then there's only one thing to do. What's that? I wish I knew. We gotta think of something in a hurry. Yeah, or else take to the boats. That's it, Bullwinkle. You got it. Yeah, I know. What is it? Well, take to the boat. And desert a sinking ship? That's a ratty thing to do. No, we'll row out in a lifeboat and try to turn that thing off. Good idea, Rock. Come on. But just as our heroes were about to launch the lifeboat, Rocky saw a strange sight in the wheelhouse. Bullwinkle, look! Yes, the wheelhouse had been filled with water, and Captain Peach Fuzz was inside it, wigwagging frantically. You go ahead, Bullwinkle. I gotta save Captain Peach Fuzz. And Rocky dashed to the wheelhouse door and flung it open. Now, what did you go and do that for, Rocky? The wheelhouse was full of water. I know it. Didn't you signal open the door? Of course not. I signaled, hand me the soap. Meanwhile, Bullwinkle had rowed out to the source of all their trouble. That is the biggest water pistol I ever did see. Now, where does it turn off? But try as he might, Bullwinkle couldn't find a nozzle or a valve anywhere. Guess I'll have to make my own. And with a bulge of mighty moose muscle, Bullwinkle tied the metal tube in a knot. Nice going, Bullwinkle. But Bullwinkle's action had a strange result, for suddenly... It's that blinking eye again. Well, this time you won't get off so easy, Mr. Peeker. Gotcha! Be careful, Bullwinkle! Don't worry, Rock. I'll hold on to him till you... <laughs> and a hapless Bullwinkle was dragged beneath the surface with only an ominous trail of bubbles to mark his passing. Don't miss our next watery episode, Underwater Moose or the Aqualunk. <laughs>
Once upon a time in a faraway kingdom, there lived a little princess. Her father was a king, because that's how those things are. He loved his little princess, and so did all the people of the kingdom. Huzzah, Huzzah for, the for the little princess! Huzzah? Well, that's fairy tale for hooray! Oh. The little princess was very happy and small wonder. She had everything and anything she wanted. Beautiful little jewels to wear, a lovely little garden to play in, a little mechanical horse to ride, even her own little castle to live in. All went well until one awful day when the princess began to grow. She grew and she grew and she grew. The people of the kingdom were greatly disturbed. Uh, what's all the fuss? The little princess has grown. So? All princesses grow. Like that? Oh. The king was very upset. My little girl is all grown up. But he made the best of it. Nothing will change. You're still my little girl. You'll have everything just as before. So the king summoned the royal jeweler and ordered him to make some special jewelry. It was huge. He commanded the royal gardener to grow some special flowers. They were enormous. He ordered the royal engineer to make a special mechanical horse. It was tremendous. He even told the royal architect to build a special castle right next to his own. After all that, you'd think everything would be fine. But no. No? Uh, no, your highness. Uh, we're broke. Broke? Shattered. There's not a pazooza left in the treasury. Jewelry, garden, horse, castle, in that order. They all add up to broke. Well, what do you suggest? Uh, you know, to get some pazoozas. What else? Taxes. And so the people of the kingdom were taxed and taxed and taxed. There was a tax on fences. 100 pickets, 100 pazoozas. There was a tax on trash. Three cans, three pazoozas. On doors. One door, one pazooza. Two doors, two pazoozas. There was even a tax on smoke. Seven puffs? I know, seven pazoozas. And a tax on children. Eight, nine, ten, ten and a half pazoozas. As a result of the taxes, the people of the kingdom became angry. And you know who they blamed? It's her fault. Look at those jewels. Rocks from the mountains would have done. Look at that horse. It must have cost a million pazoozas a day to run that thing. Small wonder we got high taxes. Yeah, small wonder. Why don't you get a job? Yeah, you're big enough now. <laughs> <laughs> Upon hearing this ridicule from the people who had once loved her, the princess became very sad. <laughs> Look at that. We'll be flooded out. You mark my word, next year we're going to have a tax on umbrellas. In his castle nearby, the king was feeling very worried and sad and wet. You know, she isn't the same happy princess. So he summoned his royal cabinet for advice. The royal accountant, the royal lawyer, the royal writer, the royal efficiency expert, each of them gave their advice. More taxes. Tougher laws. More publicity. Get rid of her. Get rid of her? But how? Marry her off. Brilliant! I shall give a golden slipper to the suitor who wins my daughter's hand. A golden slipper? Isn't that rather a small prize? If it's one of her slippers, it's big enough. So a proclamation was made throughout the kingdom, and one by one, the suitors arrived at the castle to ask for the princess' hand. When they actually saw it, though, they soon changed their minds. The princess became sadder and sadder. King, you gotta do something. She'll wash out the crops. So the king began to send the princess for long walks in the woods. One day, on one of her walks, she met a strange little man. Hello, strange little man. Hiya, princess. Aren't you going to run away because I'm so big? Of course not. Aren't you going to laugh because I'm so funny looking? Of course not. So they quickly became friends. Every day they would talk together about all kinds of things. They would laugh together. They even took long walks together. Then one day the princess said, Perhaps you're an enchanted prince. Maybe if I kissed you, you would grow as big as I am. Well, <laughs> what do we got to lose? So the princess kissed the funny-looking little man. He didn't change a bit. I guess I'm, you know, just not the enchanted type. Ah, oh, but something began to happen to the princess. She grew smaller and smaller and smaller, until she was even smaller than the strange little man. Oh, this is just the right size to be. So the funny little man won the princess' hand, which was just the right size now. And he lived happily ever after, and she lived happily ever after, and the king lived happily ever after. But what about the taxes? Yeah, what about the taxes? Oh, don't be silly. We can't have everybody living happily ever after.
off there in TV land. Welcome to the big Bullwinkle and Rocky Fan Club Benefit Telethon. Yes, sir, you're going to see such names as Bob Hope, Marlon Brando, Jane Mansfield, and Perry Como. But that's all you're going to see their names. For guests, we've got Rocket J. Squirrel, Boris Spedanov. It's going to be really big shoe. And our telephone girl, Natasha Fatal. The number to call with your donations is Sucker 92222. Or if that's busy, call Shakedown 56565. That's the Chinese restaurant downstairs. They'll take a message. But now, here's our first performer. Good evening, fans. What are you going to do for us today, Boris? For a start, I do a few impersonations. Impersonations? Sure, once I got two years for impersonating officer. Well, who are you going to do first? Really silly character. Who's that? Bullwinkle Moose. Listen. Phone in your donations to the Bullwinkle and Rocky Telethon, friends. Hey, how'd you do that? This is my natural voice. This is funny accent. <laughs> hmm. Say, Natasha, how are the phone calls coming? Two wrong numbers. Four orders for a chop suit. Ten dollars for a show. Or ten dollars to show on Captain Red in fourth race. Dead chubbies. Rocky, how much money have we got? We're ten cents in the hole, Bullwinkle. In the hole? I gave Boris Badenoff a dime for the parking meter. Okay, okay, I give extra bonus impersonation. This time, Sonny Tofts. Sonny Tofts? <laughs> Chinook, a wind that blew through Canada in the fall of 1928, but the biggest Chinook of them all was Dudley Do-Right, who blew through Canada at the turn of the century. Farewell, Mother. I am off to the movies. Take care of yourself, son, and don't forget to write. Dudley spent the next three hours in a neighborhood theater without once seeing the picture. The reason for this was that he had fallen down a manhole and was sitting in a sewer. Oh, my. I am guilty of trespassing. The family code was a Do-Right must always do right. So the conscience-stricken lad turned himself in at the closest mounted police post which was 500 miles away in northern Alberta. This particular post was then under the able command of Inspector Ray K. Fenwick, a full-blooded Canadian born and raised in Bogota, Colombia. Ordinarily, I'd give you 20 years for your crime. You can have it for nothing if you wish. The inspector knew a comeback when he heard it. How would you like to be a mounted? I would rather live in Philadelphia. But when Dudley saw the official Monty uniform, particularly the string attached to the pistol, he was hooked. A Mountie I shall be. After about an hour and a half of basic training, he was ready for his first job. You see that jar of jelly? Read the label. Mother Whiplash's log jam. Right. Now spread some jam on a piece of bread and bite. The strapping young Canadian did as he was told. Anything happen? Yes, sir. I've just lost two teeth. That's because that so-called jam is in reality cement. Pointing to a map, the inspector filled our hero in on a hideous but ingenious crime. Timber is Canada's number two industry, but lately the timber hasn't been coming down the river. That's because a devil named Snidely Whiplash has taken this log jam, poured it over the logs, and created a log jam up at the river's mouth. Why do we not arrest him? With an alias like Mother Whiplash? Why, we'd antagonize every mother in Canada. Oh, no. The only way to solve this problem is to dynamite the log jam and break it up. You see that satchel on the floor? It has a time bomb in it. Now, you take the satchel and stick it into the log jam. To the mouth of the river, horse. We have a deed to do. Let us journey ahead to Mother Whiplash's log jam factory, for it is here that Snidely Whiplash faces a problem he never dreamed would come up. What do you mean my log jam is going over big in the supermarkets? I don't want to be in the jelly business. It's too legitimate. Uh, I wonder, Mr. Um... Whiplash, Snidely Whiplash. I wonder, Mr. Whiplash, if you could spare some water. My horse has a horse throat. For $4.18, the animal was permitted to quench its thirst at a nearby truck. I'm on a secret mission, you know, which is to blow up Snidely Whiplash's log jam, Mr. Um... Whiplash, Snidely Whiplash. What's in the satchel? A time bomb with which to blow up the log jam. Curses. This lout may put a crimp into my plans. I know. I'll stop him with Eloise. Eloise was a former manicurist who used to trim nails. Now she worked in one of Whiplash's gambling halls where she trimmed suckers. See if you can finagle that Mountie into a game of chance. By taking a longer route, Eloise was able to get ahead of Dudley. Hello, handsome. How about a game of poker? Dudley didn't play, but his horse did. 
They got involved in the game and never even noticed Whiplash, who made off with the satchel. Now, that's some horse you've got, Monty. So far, he's had four flushes and three inside straights. You should see him play domino. Do right. Where's the time bomb? Oh, gee, Winnickers, now where did I... Stop, you... you fink! The chase was on. Whiplash led our hero through the dense forest. Then up a huge mountain until, breathless, he paused at the edge of a lofty precipice. Gosh, this is some swell view up here. Listen, Mountie, have pity on me. If you were to take the time bomb in this satchel and blow up my log jam, I'd be destitute. Forced to live off social insecurity. <laughs> then, too, think of mother. Whose mother? Your mother, Whistler's mother, anybody's mother. Doesn't that bring a tear to your eye? It brought a lot of tears, which is what Whiplash wanted. <laughs> Poor Snidely. Of all places, that time bomb landed on his log jam. The timber flowed free, and Canada's number two industry was saved. Uh, pardon me, Inspector, but about that log jam... Not now, do right. Your horse has got me stuck. All right, I'll see your five horse, and I raise you 50. Well, the last we saw of Bullwinkle Moose may have been the last we saw of Bullwinkle Moose, for he had grabbed onto the mysterious ocean-going eye determined to bring the intruder to bay. Instead, he was brought into the bay, and the only sign of him was an ominous stream of bubbles from underwater. Hokey smoke! Break out the diving equipment, Captain! I'm going after him! And in just a few moments, Rocky was fitted out with a diver's rig and ready to go over the side. Captain, while I'm underwater, you keep going in circles. That's the one thing I do best, Rocky. Bye! And the plucky squirrel plunged into the sea in the almost hopeless hope of finding his friend. Down and down Rocky sank until he was on the sandy bottom far beneath the sea. Gee, it's sure gloomy down here. I'd better go back up and get a flashlight. It was then that Rocky made a horrifying discovery. The diving gear was so heavy he couldn't get off the bottom. <laughs> and yet if he took it off, he'd drown before he got to the top. Pokey smoke! Looks like Bullwinkle and I are here to stay. Nevertheless, the soggy squirrel began to look for his friend. Bullwinkle! Meanwhile, many fathoms overhead, Captain Peter Peach Fuzz radioed the news of our hero's plight all over the world. Flash! Rocky Squirrel and Bullwinkle have been lost at sea. Of course, everybody was shocked and dismayed at the tragic news. In England... Or say, Sir Digby, black toy with full dress. It's for Rocky and Bullwinkle, old chap. You mean... Yes. I am in evening morning. In France. Messieurs, we face a cabinet crisis. How comes this? We want to drink a farewell toast to Rocky and Bullwinkle. And? We can't find the key to the cabinet. In the United States. Hope is dwindling tonight for Rocky and Bullwinkle. Too bad. Yes, America's sweethearts seem definitely on the missing list. Tough. And now tonight's sports final. The Giants lost again today. No! No! <laughs> In Frostbite Falls, Rocky and Bullwinkle's hometown, even the railroad station was draped in black crepe. Black crepe? Heck, that's soot! <laughs> Meanwhile, back on the ocean floor, Rocky was still searching for his pal. Little did he know that someone or something was really searching for him. Yes, as Rocky moved through the murky gloom, a dark shape slithered behind him, a huge single eye glaring balefully. Then suddenly, two huge claws shot out and grabbed our hero. Well, help! Help! Rocky's cries for help rose upward swiftly in the form of bubbles, and then as they struck the surface... Help! 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 Well, it looks as if Captain Peach Fuzz might be the only good guy left alive on our program. Wouldn't that be something, though? I can see it now. Peter Peach Fuzz and his friends. But I digress. I must save my friend Rocky. And casting aside all fear as well as a chance for a show of his own, Captain Wrongway Peach Fuzz went overboard to the rescue. But of course, he had put his diving gear on the wrong way. As a result, when he turned on his air valve, the jet of compressed air blew him clear back on board ship again. He was very surprised. Yes, I've fallen into the water lots of times, but this is the first time I ever fell out. Undaunted, the brave captain adjusted his air tank and dived in once more. The SS Athabasco traveling in circles wide 
wider and wider circles, till finally the ship disappeared from sight entirely. So even if our heroes come up to the top, they're still sunk. Don't miss our next episode, Terror on the Seas, or we've only begun to fright. <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. It all started, you remember, with a reappearance after a hundred years of Maybe Dick the Wailing Whale. <coughs> Maybe Dick made a steady diet of ocean liners and, of course, threw the shipping industry into a panic. That's when the big shipping tycoon, Pericles Bonassas, sent Rocky and Bullwinkle off in their frail craft to capture the Leviathan of the Deep. The last we saw of Bullwinkle was a stream of bubbles from underwater, a stream that stopped ominously. Rocky leaped in to save Bullwinkle and instead found himself so weighed down by his diving equipment that he couldn't get back up. And Captain Peach Fuzz distinguished himself by being the only captain to go down ahead of his ship. Then, when everybody was underwater, the Athabasco, which had been left running by Captain Peach Fuzz, sailed out of sight. And on top of that, when we left Rocky last time, he had just been seized by a pair of sinister-looking claws. And now on with our laugh-packed adventure. You must laugh awful easy. Rocky found himself propelled swiftly along the ocean floor and straight toward a large underwater cliff. Hokey smoke, I want to be squashed. But just then a familiar figure came into sight. It's Captain Peach Fuzz. Stop. Unhand that squirrel. Oddly enough, the strange creature did let go of Rocky with one of his claws. Well, I guess you see now who's the boss. <laughs> You are, sir. And with both our friends in his grasp, the mysterious deep-sea dweller again dashed at the cliff. But let us return for a moment to a tall building on a big city waterfront. Inside it is the walnut-paneled office of Pericles Panassus. I paneled it in walnuts because I can't stand peanuts. <laughs> ha, 
How can you make jokes, however feeble, when we're on the verge of ruin? Because I send the Drakey Squirrel and Bullwinkle Moose to get maybe Dick, ain't it? But you know their ship will be swallowed like all the rest. That's right, sport. And inside of the ship is 20 tons TNT. When maybe Dick swallows it, poom! But, Monsieur Parnassus, what about Rocky and Bullwinkle? I got special plan for them. But what that plan was, we'll never know, for at that moment... Mr. Parnassus, sir, the Athabasco is coming back into port at full speed. They chickened out, huh? I can't tell, sir. There's no one aboard. No one aboard? Rocky and Bullwinkle are gone? Looks that way. What shall we do? I suggest we all stand for a moment of silence. I suggest we send a wreath. Not too large. What about you, Mr. Parnassus? I suggest we run for our lives. But why? Because if that ship hits the dock, it'll be kaboom for all of us. And when I say kaboom, I mean kaboom! Now, there's something you don't see every day, Chauncey. What's that, Edgar? A lot of ship owners flying through the air. Nonsense, Edgar. Everybody flies these days. Without an airplane? Probably one of those champagne flights. Yeah. And meanwhile, what of our heroes under the sea? Yeah, what? Held fast by the strange creature, they drew closer and closer to the cliff wall. What could they do? We could close our eyes. But at the last minute, a small door opened to the cliff, and our heroes vanished from sight into solid rock. And now, where do we stand? Bullwinkle has disappeared. Rocky and Captain Peach Fuzz have disappeared. Good heavens, there's nobody left. Be with me next time, anyway, for Blank Night or the age of nothing. Excuse me, little boy. Have you seen my son? Pop, I am your son. You, oh, that's ridiculous. You don't look anything but like Pop, my... Pop, it's me, it's Junior. Junior. Well, Plupiter's Juvius it is. Would you mind telling me, young man, how you got into this condition? Well, you see, Pop, me and the other kids were playing a game. What game? It's called Mud. You see... Never mind, never mind. I'd rather not hear about it. Uh, how many times have I told you, son, a happy home is a neat home? But I'm a boy, Dad, and not a home. The adage still applies. Perhaps if I related a fable illustrating it, you'd understand more clearly. Uh, you're sure you're my son? It's me. Yeah, well. well, many years ago, there was a hut in the forest. No one had lived in this hut for 20 years. Then one day, a tiger and his wife came along in search of a new abode. Well, uh, it ain't Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, but it'll do. Do what? Never mind, kitten. It's been a long day. And with that, they went inside and set up housekeeping. Like most tigers, they had good habits and bad habits. Telling you about their good habits would make a very uninteresting fable, so we shall dwell on their bad habits. The worst of which was eating a meal and then throwing the bones out of the window. You know what I want for Christmas, Tiger Baby? A garbage disposal. Well, what do you need a garbage disposal for when you got a window? Ah, but six months later, that question came up again. You know what I want for Christmas, Tiger Baby? A room with a view. Yes, by now the bones had piled so high they blocked the window. Here, take this shovel and go bury the bones. Ah, uh, I got a better idea. You take the shovel and go bury the bones. Yeah, that settled it. The bones stayed right where they were. Unable to throw them out the window, they were now forced to throw them out the door. And in less than a year, they were completely hemmed in. Tagger, baby, I got a bone to pick with you. You're bugged by our present existence, right? Right. Either the bones go or I go. Bye, sweetie. Gathering her few possessions, Mrs. Tiger prepared to bid her husband farewell. And that's when they heard the strange noise. 
cats being curious, he clawed his way out the window to investigate, and what he saw was a rare bone-eating porcupine. Unpack, kitten. Our problems are over. What do you mean? Well, like Aesop says, there's a rare bone-eating porcupine out there, and he'll have us deboned by morning. Greatly relieved, the two tigers retired, but not for long. Tiger baby, go tell that porcupine to chew softer. Here. All right, kitten. Yow! What'd he say? Well, he didn't say much, but I did get the point. Well, look, I'd rather be boned in than lose a night's sleep. Get rid of the porcupine. All right, kitten. In back of the grass hut was a high cliff, and on top of that cliff, the tiger found a heavy anvil. All I gotta do is push this anvil over the ledge and... Pow! Oh, no more porcupine. Taking careful aim, he summoned all his animal strength and... <laughs> over it went. That takes care of that. I guess that takes care of you. Oh, I must have missed. Honey, have you seen a... Where'd you get the new hat? I can see right now that if I want anything done, I have to do it myself. Pick up the cannonball. Yes, kitten. Put it into the cannon. Yes, kitten. By the way, uh, what are we doing? I'll get that porcupine into the cannon and we'll blast him clear out of the county. Lighting the fuse, she got the porcupine's attention by saying... Oh, look. Look at that big, juicy bone inside of the cannon. Where? There's only one thing left to do. You mean... We gotta move. With that, the tigers picked up the grass hut and months later set it down in the middle of the North Pole. You know something, baby? It's cold outside. Yeah, but at least we got rid of the porcupine. Ah, but days later, they were up to their old tricks. They lived on walrus steaks and, just as before, threw the bones outside the hut. Needless to say, it wasn't long before a rare bone-eating penguin picked up where the porcupine left off. And so the tigers lived unhappily ever after. Now you see, boy, why I always say a happy home is a neat home? Yeah, I can see that. But it seems to me it'd be better to say people who live in grass houses shouldn't throw bones. <laughs> Takes after his mother, he does. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody raise their right hands and repeat after me. I solemnly swear to be honest, loyal, brave, clean, and trustworthy. Just a minute, buddy. Something wrong? Wrong? Who, oh boy? What is this honest, brave, and loyal stuff? It's the new fan club oath. Maybe later on it mentions sly, nasty, and vile? Nope. Just honest, brave, clean, loyal, and trustworthy. What kind oath is that? You expect me to sell out, give up my way of life? I got low standards, you know. Come, Natasha, we start our own outfit. The Boris Bedenov fan club. Well, what do you think of the new clubhouse? It's real eyesore, Boris. You really think so? You're not just saying that to make me feel good. Oh, I wouldn't kid you, darling. With little work, it could be blight our whole community. Think big, Natasha. We'll have Boris Bedenov fan clubs blemishing whole country. New chapters festering up everywhere. How do we do this, Boris? How else? Advertise on television. Feeling grouchy, irritable, nasty, then Boris's fan club needs you. Modern day clean living got you down. Want to strike a blow for foul play? Then join Boris Bedenov Beast Corps. This was a paid fanatical announcement. Double your pleasure, double your fun. Join Boris's fan club and learn hit and run. Look, Natasha is working already. Look at those members. Yes, Boris, but can they be trusted? Trusted? Natasha, what a thing to say. Of course they can't be trusted. There are kind of people. <laughs> Peabody here. Sherman there. Say hello, Sherman. Hello, Sherman. <laughs> you may dispense with the levity, Sherman. Yes, Mr. Peabody. 
Today we shall journey back into time to reveal the true story behind one of history's greatest archers, William Tell. Set the way back for November 18th in the year 1307. Got it! The place, Switzerland, near the community of Uri. All set, let's go! In the twinkling of an eye, Sherman and I were whisked back in time to a small Swiss village. Keen way to travel, huh, Mr. Peabody? Now what? Well, today is the day the tyrannical Austrian governor, Gessler, has ordered William Tell to shoot an apple from the head of his son. Now we must find just where this event is to take place. I, I beg your pardon, young man, but could you tell us... Don't stop me now, mister. i got to get out of this country before I get killed. Get killed? My word, who would want to kill a little fellow like you? My papa, he's going to shoot me with an arrow. Arrow? Your father wouldn't happen to be William Tell, would he? Yeah, and he... You, Joey, where are you? Uh-oh, here he comes now. So, here you are, Joey, my son. I've been looking all over for you, kid. I happen to be Mr. Peabody. This is my boy, Sherman. Hi. And that is your little boy, Joey. And that is the reason I've got to leave the country. Papa broke his glasses and can't see a thing. Golly, if he can't see without his glasses, he could never hit an apple on Joey's head, Mr. Peabody. Oh, don't worry. I got it all figured out. Just how I'm going to do it. Come on, I'll show you. With that, William Tell directed us to a small orchard not far away, and... Now, you see this apple tree here? The tree is over there. Oh. Yes, we see it. Well, I put every kind of plant food known to man on that tree, and look what happened. Gosh, Mr. Peabody, the apples on that tree are as big as watermelons. That's right. With an apple as big as that on my Joey's head, I can't miss. Hmm, the theory seems correct, but I'm not too sure. Well, give me a hand, Sherman, and we shall see. Sherman and I lifted one of the huge apples and placed it upon the boy's head. But just as I had feared... The weighty wine sap squashed the poor boy flat to the ground. As you can see, the Big Apple might be a popular dance, but as a solution to our problem, it's a dismal failure. Come, we shall try another approach. Taking William Tell back 100 paces from the target, I decided to see if I could direct him into a true aim. Uh, talk him in, so to speak. A little more to your right. That's it. Now higher. Higher. A bit more. Steady. Fire! How did I do it? It's best you don't know, William. Uh-oh, here comes the tyrannical Austrian governor, Gessler. So, here you are, William Tell. Are you ready to start me to shooting? No, you don't have to call the whole thing off, tyrannical Austrian governor Gessler. You see... Quiet, Chairman. Uh, yes, Mr. Tell will be ready in, say, 15 minutes. Good, we're going to be waiting. Boy, I'm sure glad I ain't going to be in your shoes, kid. <laughs> but, Mr. Peabody... No, but, Chairman... History demands this event take place. But have no fear, for I, naturally, have a plan. What kind of a plan? No time to explain now, Sherman. I shall return directly. Moments later, I arrived on the scene bearing a very special apple that I had selected for the target, and I placed it upon Joey's head. Mr. Peabody, wh what's that? That, Sherman, is an apple. But it's so small. Perhaps, but the best I could do on such short notice. Ladies and gentlemen... You is now going to see William Tell, who is way over there, try to shoot an apple off the head of this scared little kid who is over here. For the time being, anyway. Is you ready, Willie? Yes, yeah, sure. Then let her rip. But you took an awful chance letting him try, Mr. Peabody. I leave nothing to chance, Sherman. You see, I took care to place this powerful little magnet inside the apple so the metal arrowhead would be attracted directly to it. He couldn't possibly have missed. Gosh, Mr. Peabody, that was brilliant. I know. So that's how William Tell became a famous Swiss hero. And because of his poor eyesight, a cause of eye trouble was named after him. A cause for eye trouble was named after William Tell? What's that, Mr. Peabody? Why... Television, of course, sure.
Well, since our friends started on their search for Maybe Dick the Wailing Whale, things have gone from bad to worse, which is tough for them, but makes a much better story. And last time, you remember, Rocky and Captain Peach Fuzz had been seized in the claws of a strange subterranean creature who dashed toward a sheer rock cliff. At the last possible second, a small door opened in the cliff, and our friends disappeared inside. Immediately, the door closed again. Now, there's something you don't see every day, Chauncey. What's that, Edgar? A TV program where all they show you is a picture of a stone. Oh, I don't know, Edgar. After all, it is called the Rocky Show. True, Chauncey, true. Meanwhile, inside the cliff, Rocky and the captain were startled to find themselves rising up and up. It's getting lighter. Pretty soon, we ought to be on the surface. But to our friend's surprise, they suddenly found themselves in very strange surroundings. Well, here we are on land, Rocky. Yeah, but what land? A good question, that, for this was a very odd-looking place indeed. Captain, I don't think this is even the United States. No, but it might be Southern California. Sure is pretty, though. I wonder how long we'll be able to enjoy it. What do you mean? Well, I don't want to be a sourball, Rocky, but have you forgotten our little friend back there? That's right. Hey, let us go. And surprisingly enough, the strange creature did let them go. All right, Rocky, we'll sell our lives dearly. Oh, let's not haggle about price, Captain. Rocky, it spoke to us. Yeah, and in Bullwinkle's voice. Doesn't look a thing like him, though. I'm afraid he's inside that monster. Don't worry, Bullwinkle, we'll save you. Rocky, if he's already been eaten, there's not much we can do. We can try. Hey, it sounds hollow. Do you suppose... Rocky, look there. You busted it. Hey, that thing isn't alive at all. Not now it isn't. It never was. It's some kind of a machine. That's absolutely right, Rocky. Pokey Smoke, who are you? Pompano's the name. Fiorello La Pompano. I'm the mayor. Mayor of what? Of all this. Rocky, welcome to Submerbia. Submerbia? You heard the man. Submerbia. Bowinkle, it's you. Or else a figment of the imagination. Who's a fake Newton? Bowinkle, what are you doing in there? Just standing here. You know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Just thought I'd make a funny. Well, it wasn't so very funny. Well, I've been away a long time. That's what I mean. Where? Well, leave us flash back a few episodes and I'll tell you. It all started... It all started when Bullwinkle grabbed hold of that mysterious eye in the middle of the sea. Sort of a sea and eye. Uh, do you want to make jokes or tell the story? Sorry. As soon as he grabbed it, the eye pulled him under. But Bullwinkle was not to be shaken loose so easily. He hung on grimly, and then as his eyes grew accustomed to being underwater, he saw that he actually held on to the periscope of a strange-looking undersea craft. Running out of breath and bravery at the same instant, he let go and started for the top. But a large nozzle emerged from the vessel, and acting like a vacuum cleaner, pulled him closer and closer. Bullwinkle's struggles were in vain, and he suddenly disappeared into the tube. Stay where you are, Drylander. The name is Bullwinkle. What are you doing here? Just standing here. You know what I mean. Just thought I'd make it funny. It wasn't so very funny. I guess nobody likes that joke. Now explain what your boat is doing around here, and it better be good. We're trying to catch maybe Dick. That's good, that's good. And the stranger embraced Bullwinkle fervently. Now, why in the world should he do that? <laughs> I guess I'm just the cuddly type. We'll find out the real reason next time as Bullwinkle continues his strange tale in Defective Story, or a muffled report. <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A uh, bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible.
Adventures of Ruffy and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel, and his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Likewise. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. In our last episode, you remember, Rocky and Captain Peach Fuzz had been whisked to the undersea land of Submerbia. Their transportation was a strange-looking beast that turned out to be a submarine vehicle containing the mayor of Submerbia, Fiorella La Pompano, and the long-lost Bullwinkle Moose. Bullwinkle, is it really you? It was when I got up this morning. And Bullwinkle started to tell his strange saga, how he had been in a rowboat when the mysterious eye surfaced beside him, how he had grabbed it and been pulled underwater, and how when he tried to get away, he had been drawn back by a big underwater vacuum. It's curtains for you, Drylander. The name is Bullwinkle. But you're a Drylander, aren't you? Drylander? I'm from Minnesota. So? The land of 10,000 lakes. Oh, well, what are you doing out here on the ocean? Trying to catch maybe Dick the Wailing Whale. Good friend, pal, chum, confrere, pretel. No, wait, wait. Amigo mio. Dear. Comrade Tavares. Hold it, hold it. Buddy boy. How come this slather of friendly all of a sudden? Because any enemy of maybe Dick's is a friend of mine. Well, then you ought to meet my pal, Rocky Squirrel. Love to, love to. Where is he? Oh, he's on board our ship, the... Fire Rock. The Athabasco, where he... Rocky! That's a squirrel. Do you ever see a fish with goggles? No, but then I never saw a squirrel with goggles either. He must be looking for me. Hang on, we'll pick him up and take him home with us. Home? Where's home? Submerbia, of course. Oh, of course, I should have known. And as we saw, the odd-shaped craft had grabbed hold of Rocky and Captain Peach Fuzz and taken them through a solid rock cliff to the city of Suburbia. You mean this whole city is underwater? Certainly, look there. Sure enough, fish were swimming by just a short distance from our friends. Boy, there goes the keen sea bass, Rock. I'll catch it for dinner. No way! But Bullwinkle made a lunch for the fish only to find... Oh! Boy, that's what I call hard water. It's not hard water. You hit the plastic dome. Yeah, and I think I'm getting a lump on it. Not your plastic dome, our plastic dome. Oh. You mean... Yes, a big dome covers our whole city. That's what keeps us warm and dry. It's sort of like a big sky. Yeah, but where does your light come from? Where else? From sunfish. And at night, I suppose it's covered with, uh... Starfish. Figures. But at that moment, our heroes were startled to feel the whole ground shake underneath their feet. Hey! What's happening, Mayor La Pompano? Oh, dear. We're having one of our sea quakes. Sea quakes? I never heard of sea quakes. You've heard of earthquakes, haven't you? Yeah, and hot quakes, too. A sea quake is an underwater earthquake. Hang on, Rocky. To what? To me. Maybe that'll keep me from rattling around. What causes sea quakes, Mayor La Pompano? You'll find out in a minute, Rocky. In less than that, actually, for in the next second, a dark shadow swept across them and an enormous shape made its way through the water above Submerbia. Hokey smoke, what is it? I can answer that, Rocky. It may be Dick. Yes, it was maybe Dick. And so huge was the Leviathan of the Deep that his very passing shook Submerbia violently. Oh, I do hope the dome doesn't crack. You had to open your big gills. Sure enough, water was pouring through a crack in the plastic dome. What are we going to do? How about two choruses of Bio Waterfalls? Bio Waterfalls. Oh, Winkle, can't you ever be serious? Believe me, when I sing, it's serious. It certainly is, and we'll find out just how serious next time in Leaky Lyrics, or Bullwinkle Plugs a Song.
Many years ago, in a humble but dirty cottage deep in the forest, there lived a dirty but humble mud maker. He labored from sun up to sundown making mud, but was very poor, for then as now, there weren't many people in the market for mud. When his day was done, he left the mud puddle and returned to the cottage where his wife always met him at the door with a hot meal. Why must you always throw my dinner at me, dearest? Why cannot we sit and quietly sup like other folk? Because, good husband, I am unhappy. How can that be? You've got a fine, muddy house, fine, muddy food, and fine, muddy me. True, but we have no son to keep me company, and I am lonesome. So saying, she served dessert and shuffled off to bed. This set the old mud maker to wondering, and he thought to himself, Being a mud maker is bad enough, but being a mud maker with an unhappy wife is too much. I must do something. Early the next morning, he awoke and quietly stole from the house. Crossing through the woods, he finally came to a tiny house made of cheese, where it was said a good fairy lived. Well, what do you want, you muddy little old man? Uh, are you the good fairy? Of course I'm the good fairy. Why ask a stupid question like that? Well, it, it's a little hard to tell. I suppose you want a favor. Yes, you see, my wife is unhappy. Big deal. But if we could have a son to keep her company... Okay, okay, I get the picture. With a tap of my wand, I grant your wish. <laughs> When his head cleared, the old man thanked the good fairy. Thanks, I think. And staggered home as fast as he could. You'll never guess what happened while you were away. The house being down. No, I found the baby boy on the doorstep. Hooray, it worked. Where is he? I put him to Thimble. You mean you put him to bed? No, I put him to Thimble. Look. See. And there, on the table inside a thimble, slept the tiny son. But he's so little. Yes, but he's all ours. And he will grow. Thirty years later. But he's so little. Why don't you go back to the good fairy and see if she'll give you something to make him grow? Sure, I can make him grow. Take this magic chickpea and put it under his bed. Thimble. Put it under his thimble, then. The mud maker followed the good fairy's instructions to a pea, and sure enough, within 24 hours... <laughs> Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Down there. Good heavens, he's seven feet tall. And so is his stomach. So they called him Thom Tum. And needless to say, the boy lived up to his name. More food. I'm hungry, hungry, hungry. Eat, eat, eat. Oh, keep it coming, Mama, honey. It wasn't long before Thom had eaten all there was in the house. Then he set off through the woods, gobbling up everything in his path. Good grief, I better get back to the good fairy and see what she can do about this. But when he found us... Say, good fairy, I... Hey, what happened to your little house made of cheese? Oh, some big fat kid ate it and then ran off down the road yelling, food, food! That's what I wanted to ask you about. If I ever find out who that brat's father is, I'll turn him into a toad. What was it you wanted to ask me? <clears throat> You think it'll rain? No. Me either. See ya. Now, it so happened that this was the king's birthday, and among the many fine presents he received was a beautiful fat duck. Perhaps it is an enchanted duck, your highness. Uh, you mean if I kiss it, it'll turn into a keen princess? Could be, but I was thinking more like maybe it lays golden eggs. They weren't golden, but they most certainly were eggs. The duck laid eggs by the dozens, the hundreds, the thousands. It seemed as though the duck would never stop, which she didn't. And before long, the castle was filled to overflowing with eggs. Desperate, the king sent out a proclamation. Hear ye, hear ye! The king offers a thousand pesos a reward to anyone who can rid the castle of eggs! Hearing this gave the old mud maker an answer to his problem, and he hurried to the king. Uh, you say that you'll give me your boy, Thom Tum, and he'll get rid of the eggs. Yes, sir, sire. Good, then here's your money. Now, give me the boy. Okay, dear, turn him loose. Thom ate like he never had before. Eggs disappeared as if by magic. He ate them scrambled, fried, boiled, raw. Then he ate the duck. <coughs> Tables vanished, chairs were missing, huge holes were chewed in the walls. Oh, we're lost. And calling for his fastest horse, the king sped to the cottage of the mud maker. You've got to take him back or we'll all starve. I couldn't be an Indian giver, sire. Oh, humor me. I'm the king. Sorry. Well, take him back, and, and, and I'll give you a kingdom of your very own. We'll take it. Dearest, what can you be thinking? There, there, Wallace, I have a plan. And so it was settled. Thom Tom was returned to the old mud maker, and he in turn was given a kingdom in a far-off land. His wife solved their problem of Thom by feeding him mud pies, which, as we all know, is enough to kill anyone's appetite.
and to make certain that they would never be troubled again, no food was allowed in the kingdom. The people were always famished, so the tiny country was called Hungary, and they all lived happily ever after. Someday for our fan club picnic, sunshine, blue skies. Sunshine, blue skies. Terrible, isn't it? But maybe we'll have a sudden storm later. Okay, here we are. Everybody set for the sack race? All set. Captain Peach Fuzz, you're supposed to use an empty sack. That would make it easier, Rocky. Hey, your feet are sticking out. That's not fair. Well, well, must be a moth hole. That had to be a pretty big moth. You got a pretty big moth yourself, buddy. This sack racing seems awful dangerous to me. Dangerous? Yeah, might run into a tree or something. Now, first one to the tree and back wins. Ready, set, go! <coughs> Gee, I didn't know you were so good at this, Bullwinkle. It's nothing. I spend a lot of my spare time in the sack, you know. Time for the Miss Bullwinkle and Rocky Fan Club Contest. All set, Dalek. A pretty girl is like a malady. That's melody. With Natasha in contest, it's melody. Uh, where are the other contestants? What other contestants? She's the only girl in the club. Sort of narrows down the competition, don't it? As head judge, Natasha, I'd like to give you this trophy. Pretty good, Natasha. Last thing you got from a judge was 90 days. Well, let's eat. Did everybody bring his favorite dish like we decided? Yep. yep. Bo Winkle, yours is empty. This is my favorite dish, Rocky. You didn't mention anything about bringing food. again, Peabody, and this, of course, is my boy, Sherman. Hi. Who are we going back into history to meet today, Mr. Peabody? I'll give you a little clue. Listen closely. I've got it. Admiral Byrd. Wrong, Sherman. Whistler. You mean Whistler, the famous painter? Correct. Now, if you will set the Wayback Machine for the year 1872... Right. Uh, ...and the place, the home of the famous American painter James Whistler in London, England, we shall be on our way. In an instant, Sherman and I were transported to the side of the great artist where we found him hard at work on his most famous painting. But, Mr. Peabody, I thought his most famous painting was of his mother. Whistler's mother. That's quite right, Sherman. But that's not what he's painting. Look! Hmm. Something is amiss here. I beg your pardon, sir. May I ask just what it is you're doing? I'm painting a picture of my mother's chair. Well, I can see that, but aren't you overlooking something? Like what? Like something in the chair? Like what? Like your mother? Oh, yes, mother. I tried to paint Mother sitting in the chair, but found that to be impossible. I'm afraid I'll just have to be content to paint her chair. He can't do that, Mr. Peabody. The painting of Whistler's mother will never be famous without his mother in it. That, Sherman, is a keen observation. Why, sir, may I ask, is it impossible to paint your mother sitting in the chair? <laughs> That's why. I'm afraid I don't understand. Come along, and I'll show you. We followed him out of the house into the backyard where suddenly and without warning, a most unusual thing happened. Now I've got you, you wrestler, you. Wait, that's not a rustler, it's Whistler. Mother, please, we have guests. <laughs> mother? You mean that's Whistler's mother? Uh, how do you do, ma'am? Pleased, I'm sure. Well, howdy, boys. What brings you around these parts? I'm afraid that Mother's hobby is the Old West. All she ever thinks about is cowboys. I've noticed that. And that's why I can't paint her. I can't get her to sit still long enough. Come on, fellas. Let's play cowboys and Indians. Yahoo! See what I mean? Golly, Mr. Peabody, this is a problem. Quite, Sherman, but I may have the answer. My first task was to lure Whistler's mother back into the house, which, of course, was really very simple. Whoa! Which way did they go? That away! Good! Follow me! Forming a posse, we all galloped into the house, where I quickly put the second part of my plan into action. Boy, 
that was a keen idea, Mr. Peabody. Now she's as still as can be. Right, Chairman. Pretending to be astride a horse will keep her perfectly happy. You have already painted the chair, sir. Now simply paint your mother sitting in it. I'll try. Hours later, the painting was completed. However, not with the exact results I had expected. Sorry, but I have to paint it like I see it. <sighs> Here she comes again, Mr. Peabody. Yoo-hoo! Bang, bang! Have you got any more ideas, Mr. Peabody? I always have more ideas, Sherman. I shall solve the problem with a contest of speed. Huh? Dressing the great artist in a cowboy suit, I once more confronted his mother. A word has it that you are the fastest gun in the West, ma'am. Is that true? That's right, boy. I'm just like Grease Lightning. Do you think you are faster than he is? <laughs> Land sakes, yes. Well, are you fast enough to say, uh, give him a slight edge? Sure. Just name it. All right, come with me. Moments later, the stage was set. Well... Sitting in your chair with your guns covered by your cloak and shawl is quite an edge. Are you certain you wish to go through with it? Yep, you just give the word. Placing Whistler in front of his easel, I carefully removed the gun from his holster and replaced it with his trusty paintbrush. Now all was in readiness, so I gave the signal, go! Realizing that he at last had his dear mother just where he wanted her, and that he had to be fast to capture her on canvas, Whistler whipped out his brush, and in the flick of an eye, he painted her portrait. Hooray, I did it! Bang! Shucks, he beat me. Guess I'd better go out and do some more practicing. Giddy up! Gee, it all worked out just right, Mr. Peabody. And this is the painting Whistler became most famous for. Yes, but for some years there was much confusion as to just who Whistler's mother was, due to an earlier painting of his, uh, this one to be exact. But that's a picture of a horse running through the rain. How could that cause confusion as to who his mother was? Because of what he called the painting. Mr. Peabody, you mean... Yes, Sherman. For you see, he called it Whistler's Mother. episode sprung a bad leak at the end, remember? For maybe Dick, the wailing whale, passed over the sunken city of Submerbia and cracked its plastic dome. Now water is flooding into the city and our friends are up to their necks in trouble. Nonsense, I'm only up to my knees. I'm up to my neck. And I'm up to my second row of medals. Then we gotta do something. But what? How about stuffing something in that hole? Good idea. Here, Captain, there's a cork in this bottle. Great. But Captain Peach Fuzz wasn't called wrong way for nothing. He threw away the cork and tried to hammer the bottle into the hole. Hey, I got it. Let's put a bucket under it and catch the water. What happens when it fills up? You empty it out and put it... Oh, sorry, Captain. That won't work either, Bullwinkle. You know, gentlemen, I've just come to an interesting conclusion. What's that? We're all coming to an interesting conclusion, and pretty soon, too. There must be an answer. Yeah, if we just use our head bones. Bullwinkle, that's it. You said it. No, you did. I did. What? Head bone. Use your head bone. You gotta narrow that down a little. My head's all bone. And a yard wide. Sure it is. Bullwinkle, you can plug up the hole with your antlers. Sure enough, through a coincidence that defied even the wildest stretch of the imagination, Bullwinkle's antler exactly fit the leak in the plastic dome. Submerbia is saved. I feel like what's his name at the dike? Rocky, you're a squirrel of infinite mental rectitude. He's pretty smart, too. In a little while, Submerbia workmen were repairing the dome around Bullwinkle's antlers. And shortly thereafter, Mayor Lapompano was taking our heroes on a tour of the city. And this is our main thoroughfare. We call it Shad Row. Very interesting, Mayor Lapompano, but we've really got to get going. Going? We just got here, Rock. Bullwinkle, did you forget we're supposed to be hunting for maybe Dick? No. I sure tried. And a short time later, our friends were on board one of those small suburban underwater scooters, prepared to resume their search for the whaling whale, only this time with torpedoes instead of a fish pole. Engine room, this is the captain. Captain, this is the engine. You mean you're the engineer. I mean I'm the engine. 
Well, full speed ahead, engine. Aye, aye, sir. And powered by Bullwinkle's mighty moose muscle, the strange craft moved through a submerbian escape hatch and into the strange undersea world outside. Oh, uh, this is the life, eh, Rocky? We're as snug as a bug in a sub. What do you see in the periscope, Captain? It must be bust, Rocky. All I can see is my own eye. Maybe it's just a reflection. Let me have a look. But what Rocky saw made his fur stand on end. That's an eye, all right, but it's not a reflection. No? My eyes are blue. That eye is brown. You mean somebody's looking into our periscope? Oh, boy, was somebody looking into their periscope. Captain, it's maybe Dick. He's right behind us. All hands on deck. Look the blade, batten the martin, jettison the supercargo. Why so many orders, Captain? One of them's bound to be right. Bowwinkle, let's get out of here. Right, Rock. And the mighty moose began to pedal faster and faster. Slowly, the tiny submarine drew away from the monster behind it, and it looked as if they might escape, when suddenly... I'll teach you, you wailing whale. Fire one! But missing the torpedo lever entirely, Captain Peach Fuzz hit the reverse gear control. Instantly, the tiny sub was swallowed up by the cavernous mouth of Maybe Dick. Then, for the first time in history, Maybe Dick actually smiled. Assuming there is one, don't miss our next episode, Follow the Swallow, or the Inside Story. <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say. A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. Well, last time, you remember, our heroes were being pursued by the very thing they were out to capture. Maybe Dick the Wailing Whale. Bullwinkle did his best to pedal them to safety, and it looked for a while as if he would succeed. But then Captain Peach Fuzz pulled the wrong lever and... Isn't that typical of me, though? You can stop pedaling now, Bullwinkle. Yeah. Sure got late early, didn't it? It's not late, Bullwinkle. Well, then how come it's so dark-like? Must be having an eclipse. 
Lukashenko? Well, try saying it in Czechoslovakian. You can understand Czechoslovakian. I'm always pretty good at picking up the Czech. <laughs> that's it, Bullwinkle. Go ahead and laugh. Okay. <laughs> hey, that's pretty hollow laughter. Light a light and you'll see why. And in the glow of a candle, Bullwinkle did see why. For high above them arched the interior of Maybe Dick. You mean we've been swallowed by Maybe Dick? Looks like. But just then, our heroes heard a strange sound above them. <laughs> Good heavens, what's that? Must be maybe Dick's stomach rumbling. Maybe something he ate to secrete with him. Yeah, us. <laughs> hey, where's that noise coming from, Bullwinkle? From the top of these stairs. Stairs? Bullwinkle! Certainly. See, they go right up stairs. In a whale? Maybe he's subletting to a flounder. Hey, now. Wait just a minute. And grabbing a nearby wrench, the plucky squirrel reached over and tapped one of maybe Dick's ribs. You won't get anywhere tickling him, Rocky. No, listen to that. Sounds like an ordinary steel beam to me. That's it. Maybe Dick is made out of steel. Boy, he's tougher than I thought. Don't you see? That means he isn't a whale at all. He's a ship, and I'll bet he's a pirate ship. Right you are, little busybody. And as our boys stared upward in terror, a menacing figure stalked to the top of the stairs. A menacing figure that somehow looked vaguely familiar. Who, who are you? <laughs> Yo, we know that, but what's your first name? Allow me to introduce myself. Captain Horatio Hornswoggle, at your service. Captain Horatio Hornswoggle? My cop. Haven't we met before, Captain Hornswoggle? I doubt it, you swab. I'm sure I've seen him somewhere, Bullwinkle. I know where. Where? That patch on his eye reminded me. I saw his picture in a magazine. He was selling shirts. No, that's somebody else. All right, you see, cooks, come up those stairs with your hands up. What are you going to do with us, Captain Hornswoggle? Yes, as one captain to another, why are we here? I just wanted somebody to play with Rollo. Rollo? Yes, he gets lonesome. Well, we'll be glad to cheer up the little fellow. Where is he? Come on now, Rollo. And around the corner came Rollo. Yikes! Rollo was not a little feller. He was a giant ape, eight feet tall in his sneakers. And he looked like eight feet of pure mean. I brought some people to play with Rallo last week, but they didn't work out. What happened? He broke them. We're pretty bustable ourselves, you know. No, I don't know. But I'll find out. Okay, Rallo! And the huge monster lumbered nearer and nearer to our friends. Don't miss our next spine-tingling episode. And that's my own personal spine he's talking about. Playtime for Rallo, or rest in pieces. Once upon a timeless night, a miller who lived in a cottage deep in the woods made a sudden discovery. Who are you? I am your daughter, dear Daddy Miller. A day or so later, the miller was again astounded. And who are you? I'm your other daughter, dear Father Miller. Yes, the miller had been so busy with his mill that he'd failed to notice his two little girls had grown up. They were named Slow White and Nose Red, and for a very good reason. Uh, is that the bucket of water I asked you to fetch last summer, Slow White? Indeed it is. Well, it's frozen over. Oh, my, but you're slow. As for Nose Red, she had an irresistible hunger for apples, and after consuming an orchard full, her nose turned red. Is that a basket full of apples you have there, Daddy? My, but you're nosy. The girls, despite their shortcomings, were as sweet and gentle as the days were long. Oh, look at that poor bear sleeping in the mud. Let us take him home and give him supper. You mean a lollipop? No, some aid and comfort. Don't bother to fix my dinner, children. I've been working hard down by the old mill stream, and I'm too tired to eat or sing it. We may be as sweet and gentle as the days are long, but we forgot to tell Father we put the bear in his bed. Well, he likes surprises. Not this one, he didn't. <laughs> That night, the miller slept in the mud, and at breakfast the following morning... Daddy, that mud did wonders for you. Yes, your acne is completely gone. So is my sense of humor. Daddy seems upset about something. 
Maybe it's the mold. It took a bit of doing, but the miller eventually became adjusted to his daughter's unconventional habits. That is, until one day... Slow and nose. You have made a lifelong friend out of every animal in the forest, and the 11 western states, too, I might add. Each day, they come to our door for food, and you give it to them. They've been doing this for three years, and now we're broke. But we must continue to feed the poor creatures. What with? We're out of food. Well, how about giving them sucker? Well, we're out of them, too, even though there is one born every minute. I'll tell you what. I'll make you a package deal. You girls get married, send me money, and I'll see to it the animals are fed. That's, That's a, a wonderful, wonderful idea, idea, dear Daddy Miller. Without any further ado, Slow White and Nose Red set off for the nearby village. But although the village was only a half a mile away, it took them a year and a half to get there, due to the fact that Slow White was so slow and Nose Red climbed every apple tree they passed. Then, too, the lights were against them. Everything worked out for the best, however, for when they did arrive, the annual bachelor's ball was in progress. Do my eyes deceive me? <laughs> Look at those two stunning creatures. Gad, they're beautiful. How true. <laughs> the most beautiful girls at the dance. They were the most beautiful girls at the dance, mainly because they were the only girls at the dance. And pardon us, fair maidens. <laughs> but would you care to trip the light fantastic? Mm, we'd rather dance. You have to give the girls credit. At least they tried, but in vain. For although Nose Red was light on her feet, the light of her red nose blinded her partner, causing him to crash to the wall. Slow White, on the other hand, was slower than usual, and by the time she lifted her foot to take the first step, the music was over, and so was the ball. <laughs> Don't cry, Slow White. We'll find husbands. That's not why I'm crying. <gasps> You're standing on my foot. But luck was with them, for the very next day was the day of the annual bachelor's picnic. Just as before, they were the most attractive girls at the gathering, and for the same reason as before. I shall do the cooking. Slow White turned on the gas stove and struck the match 45 minutes later. <laughs> well, your troubles are over. Go to this address. Inside the cottage, you will meet two brothers who are your perfect match. Oh, Mr. Marriage Counselor Hackett, we thank you. With money. Snow White and Nose Red scuttled off, their miller's daughter's hearts beating in wild anticipation. I hope this doesn't turn out to be another fiasco. You'll be happy to know that everything turned out perfectly. For you see, Slow White knocked on the door of the cottage, and it didn't open until two years later. <coughs> But you're slow. And you, fair maiden, are my true love. Yes, Slow White had met someone even slower than she. And Nose Red? Well, the other brother was a strapping, handsome brute. He had one slight blemish, a green nose. I'm Irish, you know. Oh, this too was a dream match, for when you get a green nose and a red nose, uh. well, <laughs> it's Christmas every day. Slow White and Nose Red lived happily ever after. I wish I could say the same for their father. I'm not a father, actually. Uh, I'm a mutter. I was wondering why they always call me Fathead. Hello there, friends. Today our subject is for my bestseller, How to Win Friends and Be Influential with People, I quote. Pick out something about a person that you admire, tell them about it, and they will surely be your friend. Pardon me kindly, sir, but I couldn't help admiring your hair. You certainly are fortunate to have such fine, sturdy, good-looking, healthy, well-groomed hair. <laughs> Mind if I take it home and admire it under a better light? Learn the interests and hobbies of those you would like to have as your friends. That's why I have thoroughly studied all the subjects that interest this man that's coming now. Hello there again, kindly sir. You may be interested to know that I am an expert on bowling, baseball, and croquet. Those are his favorites. From my best-selling page 35, I quote, Sometimes those you seek may seem standoffish. It's just that they are shy. Obviously the case here. It simply means you must bring them out by doing little favors for them. 
Let me carry your package, kindly, sir. Oh, I insist. Now you'll see the beginning of a real friendship. Gee, Mr. Know-it-all, can't you win any friends with that book of yours? Oh, sure, Rock. One man promised to be my friend for the rest of my life because of this book. Who was that? The publisher. I promised never to write another one. <laughs> Second city of Canada, and name of the masked man's Indian friend. And it is here in downtown Toronto at the corner of 4th and Kimo Sabe that the Royal Canadian Museum of Art is located. Inside this hallowed structure, some of the world's most priceless masterpieces hang on public display. For instance, Newton Figby's immortal self-portrait, Newt descending a staircase. And here is that villainous viper, Snidely Whiplash, whose black cape matches the color of his heart. You offend me, sir, and wrongly so, for you see, I have given up my nefarious ways for the guise of respectability. I am now a photographer. Photographer? Yes, I take pictures. A week went by during which the bare spot took first prize in an international art festival. Then a museum guard discovered the theft. One of our art craft is missing. A massive air and sea search was launched. Finally, that proud and noble force was called upon the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Do right, have you seen my desk? You are sitting behind it, sir. Oh, yes, there it is. The man with the coffee-stained moustache is Inspector Fenwick, who sold the Saturday evening post before he took this post over. Standing in the mounted uniform is our stalwart hero, Dudley Duright. You said you had a job for me, Inspector. What are you working on now, Duright? Well, you might say I am digging a hole behind the barracks. Are you digging a hole behind the barracks? Yes, sir. Well, I have a more important assignment for you. I want you to dig a hole in front of the barracks. Suddenly, an orderly dashed in and handed the inspector a copy of the Toronto Tribune. Oh, good grief, this is terrible. What is it, sir? Somebody's already done the crossword puzzle. The headline regarding the missing masterpiece eventually came to their attention. Good luck, do right. Good luck to you too, sir. Why are you wishing me good luck? But aren't you going with me? Oh, no, I can't stand Toronto. Dudley was well-schooled in the ways of the criminal mind. He knew that whomever stole the painting would try to sell it to a fence. Unfortunately, the only fence Dudley knew was of the picket variety. All right, fence, where is the stolen picture? So, you won't talk, eh? Very well. Dudley had ripped half of it out of the ground when his steel blue eyes noticed a post attack to the far end. Hmm, come to Niagara and wrestle. Two falls out of three. By George, there is a clue if ever I saw one. In those days, the only way to get to Niagara Falls was on a steamboat. We're extremely overcrowded, Constable, but if you don't mind sharing a stateroom with another gentleman... Not at all, Captain. And, oh, here, put this fence in the bridge. The gentleman who thought he had stateroom 202 all to himself was, of all people... Snidely whiplash. <laughs> Not only will I get out of Toronto, but in an hour or two, I'll be out of Canada. Hello there, sir. I'm your new roomie. All oh, right. Whiplash. Aha. So it was you. Unfortunately, next to the picture was an incomplete game of tic-tac-toe. Oh, say, look what we have here. Dudley finished the game, and Whiplash finished Dudley. <laughs> Grabbing the painting, Snidely dashed up to the main deck. Quick, stop the boat! There's a man overboard! Who? Me! And over he went. An hour later, he arrived at an airfield where he successfully took off in a plane. Seconds later, he was high over Toronto. I have never been high over Toronto. Unknown to the scallywag, Dudley wasn't far behind. He, too, had swum to shore and was at that very moment on Toronto's busiest street looking up at the fleeing airplane. I know that Immelman anywhere. Whiplash is in that plane. Acting without hesitation, he jumped into the nearest taxi Cab. Quick, follow that plane. But what he had gotten into was an automatic photo booth. He didn't go anywhere, but he did get a beautiful set of glossy 8 by 10s Faster, driver! It's hard to believe, but everything worked out just fine. For you see, Whiplash had borrowed a plane that was extremely low on fuel. He was forced down while flying directly over the mounty post. Matter of fact, he crashed right through the inspector's wall, just as Dudley walked in the door. Whiplash! Do right. Curses. You've done it again, Do right. You've captured Whiplash and recovered the paint. Let me tell you about the taxicabs in Toronto, sir. Later, my boy. All right, Whiplash, hand over the painting. You take one step and I'll set fire to it. He is bluffing, Inspector. And Dudley calmly took the painting. Do right, what a magnificent display of guts. Not really, sir. You see, this painting is coated with a non-combustible oil. It won't burn. 
Watch. The museum can't thank you enough for recovering Newt descending a staircase, Inspector. All in the line of duty, sir. Right, do right? If you say so, sir. Secret is out. Maybe Dick, the mysterious whaling whale, is nothing more or less than an enormous pirate ship run by that prince of schnooks, Boris Baden. Please, Captain Horatio Hornswago. Yes, the secret is out, but our heroes are in. Inside, maybe Dick. Sounds like a good name for a book. What's more, in our last episode, they received a pressing invitation to play patty cake with Rollo, an eight foot ape. Rollo likes to play with people, they bend so easy. There must be some mistake. I'm not a people. I'm more of a moose. And I'm a squirrel. You're a people. I've been thinking of resigning. Okay. Come on, Rollo. I'll play with you. Rocky, you flipped your goggles. He'll crush you like an egg, Rocky. Maybe not. Come on, Rollo. That's right. Get it over with quick. But as Rollo's huge paws reached for Rocky, the agile squirrel zoomed away from his grasp. You can't catch me! Rocky, this is no time to play tag! Along the high platform, the giant ape blundered following after the elusive Rocky. Come on, Rocky! Come on, Rollo! <laughs> then at the end of the platform, Rocky suddenly zoomed into the air, and as Rollo reached up for him, he went over the railing and into the bilgewater below. Now, Bullwinkle, run for it! The moose grabbed Captain Peach Fuzz and dashed through a doorway behind the pirate. But you won't get away, Squirrel. Sure enough, Boris aimed one of his flintlock pistols and fired. Nearly missing our hero. Next time for sure, kiddo. And Boris drew a bead on the frantically flying squirrel. It looked hopeless, but just then the first bullet that Boris had fired struck a steel beam, <coughs> angled off, <coughs> and headed back for him. Yikes! Pursued closely by his own bullet, the buccaneer had only one course open. Look out, Rallo! Golly, that means we've won. We're in command of the Maybe Dick. And in a little while, Rocky and his friends were in the wheelhouse, high in the superstructure of Maybe Dick. Now that things have slowed down a little, maybe you'll tell me something, Rock. What's that? What the ding-dong is going on, anyway? It's all right here in this log, Bullwinkle. Listen, dear log, today decided to become a pirate. What, what an, an idea. idea. I, I can, can see it now. First, I built huge boats shaped like whales. Then I christened it with bottle of prosic acid. I named the Maybe Dick. Then I install crazy whistle that goes. I adopt Rallo to help with the business. Then when sheep comes along, I blow whistle. Sheep stops. I open front of Maybe Dick, swallow whole sheep. Rallo and I rob everybody. Money, gold, jewels. Afterward, I let sheep sail out again. Halfway. No sheep, no evidence, just loot. Loot! <laughs> then that miserable squirrel has to come and ruins everything. Calm down, Boris, darling. Your neck is turning purple again. Natasha, I've lied, cheated, stolen, double cross. Yes, Boris. Tell me, where did I go wrong? Meanwhile, up on the bridge, our hero was jubilant. That's Rocky. Rocky. Little did he know that at that moment, not too far away, a squadron of land-based bomber planes was heading his way. Their mission, destroy Maybe Dick. Don't miss our next episode, A Whale of a Tale, or There She Blows Up. <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say. A uh, bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. Ooh. 
Go the way for me again. Well, see you next time. Ready, Bullwinkle? Allie! Oop! Adventures of Ruffy and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Likewise. We got some great things on the show today. Like what? Like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. Last time you remember, our heroes had captured Maybe Dick, the whaling whale, who turned out to be a huge pirate ship in disguise. <laughs> now they are gleefully steering Maybe Dick back to port, all unaware of the trouble that lies ahead, or rather, below. For deep in the hold of Maybe Dick, the defeated Boris Baden... Uh, Horatio Hornswoggle is preparing... Defeated? Who's defeated? We are, darling. You and me and Rollo here. <laughs> Nonsense. Just a little setback is all. Boris... If we were set back any further, we'd be out of story altogether. Don't be silly, Natasha. By the time we're through, those goody goods up there will be shaking in their goody good shoes. You mean... Yes. We have only begun to fry. And as if that weren't enough, high above our heroes, a squadron of British planes are searching for Maybe Dick in order to destroy him. I say, sir, there it is now. Good old Featherby. Well, sir, shouldn't we attack the blighter? Are you mad, Featherby? I haven't finished my tea. Oh, sorry, sir. Bad show, Featherby. But our heroes had no knowledge of the planes droning overhead. They only knew that they had taken command of the Maybe Dick. And we're heading for home. With Peter Peach for that the wheel. Hard apart the Lee stern, spin the wheel and watch it turn. Rocky, I don't want to be a snitch, but Captain Peachfuzz is steering in circles again. Don't worry, Bullwinkle. I disconnected the steering wheel. Round and round goes the Maybe Dick spinner, and when she stops, there's always a winner. Then he's not really in command of the ship? No, but why spoil his fun? Besides, we have other things to worry about. Well, as long as we got something to worry about. We do. I was a little worried about not having anything to worry about. Yeah, but... Not being worried worried me. Yeah, but... But now you say there is something to worry about. Yeah, but... So now I'm not worried. Yeah, but... Yeah, but what? I don't know. I forgot what I was going to say. Probably something about that pirate captain down below. What was his name? Hornswoggle. Horatio Hornswoggle. And sure enough, in the doorway stood the pirate chief himself. What's that in his hand, Rocky? Looks like a bomb with a burning fuse. It isn't an old day, sucker, sucker. What are you going to do with it? Absolutely nothing. Well, that's all right, then. Yeah, but if he does absolutely nothing, it'll go off in a minute. Well, don't just stand there. Do something. Okay, Moose. First I take over ship, then I feed you to fishes. But that's terrible. It's terrible for you. It's very nice for fishes. Yeah, we mustn't be selfish, Rock. Now, wait a minute, Bullwinkle. There's two of us. I wasn't only one of him. Oh, you are the sharp-eyed rascal. No, no. I mean, if we jump him, the odds are in our favor. Not for long, buddy. yoo hoo Rallo! Yes, the enormous ape was just outside the door, and at Boris's call, he plunged into the room. Unfortunately, the swinging door hit Boris's arm, and the bomb, with its splintering fuse, began to roll about the deck. Grab it, Bullwinkle! But as fate would have it, the maybe Dick was at that moment running into heavy seas, and as the deck tilted back and forth, the bomb rolled about crazily, its fuse growing shorter and shorter. I got it, 
Who got it? Who got it? You got it. No, he got it. Throw it, Rollo. Throw like this. Oh, what happened? You didn't tell him which way to throw it. Oh, foo foo. Look out! Here comes again. Uh. Throw it overboard, Bowwinkle. Right, Rocky. But as Bowwinkle dashed for the side, the deck tilted sharply, and he slid right back to where he started from. Short trip. But it looked like a longer one coming up. For at that moment. Don't miss our next episode, Fast and Moose, or Charlie's Antler. Ah, yes, Prince Hyacinth and the Dear Little Princess. Just about the longest title we've had yet. At any rate, in the Kingdom of Normandy, located near Third in La Brea, there lived a king named Dum the 73rd. You see, that's how King Dums get their names, from a king named Dum. <laughs> Funny? <laughs> oh, why am I laughing? I'm miserable. Yes, King Dum was in love with a beautiful queen. Beautiful, but mixed up. You know what I mean? Yes, the queen was mixed up, but she was under an enchantment. And I feel terrible, too. How's it going, sweetie? Well, I'd feel fine if I could just get out from under this enchantment. Yeah. It keeps hanging on. Yeah, I know, enchantment. Cry, aye, that stuff went out with a hula hoop. Next thing, she'll be telling me she sees fairies, like that one. Hey, this is ridiculous. Ridiculous? If it wasn't for our business agent, I'd turn you into a frog. Your business agent? Certainly. International Fairies Guild Local 42. Oh, of course. But my call sheet says I'm supposed to help you out instead. So, what's to help? Well, it's the queen, really. She thinks she's under some sort of enchantment. Now, did you ever... Mm -hmm. She got a cat? Hmm? A cat. Has she got a cat? Oh, yeah. It's about so big. Step on its tail. Step on its tail? You want to break the enchantment? Oh, yeah. So stomp already. Sign here, please. What's this? It's your receipt. That'll be 3250, please. I'll just sign for it. Fairy number 53. Mission completed. Over. Mary 53, this is Red Fox Leader. Go to third and spring. Woman with a hair problem. Ask for Rapunzel. Over and out. Roger. Step on the cat's tail. Hmm. Oh, how are you, dear? Enchanted. Gargling doesn't help, huh? Ooh, gargling aspirins, mustard plasters, nothing. Um, uh, maybe if I stepped on your cat's tail. Are you out of your mind? I didn't think it was a good idea. But as King Dumb turned to go. <laughs> Is this where I get changed into a frog? Worse than that, fella. Let me look. You will marry the queen and have a son with a nose like a cassava melon. And until he says to the world, I got a nose like a cassava melon, he'll have a nose like a cassava melon. You got that? Well, it seems a little hard. But if anybody tells him the magic words ahead of time, they shall perish, like, instantly. Understand? Is it over? Am I a frog? I don't think so, dear. No, he wasn't. And what's more, the queen was no longer under her enchantment. And so the king married the queen, and they lived happily ever after until their first son was born, at which time the king turned into a frog and was never heard from again. You know, I sort of expected this all along. All hail Prince Dumb the 74th! Not Dumb, Hyacinth! Prince Hyacinth the First! But your majesty... He's just like a sweet little Hyacinth with his two little eyes and his sweet little mouth and his sweet little button. Uh, this is a no. Looks more like a cassava melon. <laughs> <laughs> Silence! No one shall make fun of my little Hyacinth. And so the queen declared that everybody in the kingdom should wear a false nose just as big as the princess. And they did. All went smoothly until one day... Mother, dear, I'll be 35 years old tomorrow. Yes, dear. And you know, I've never had a girlfriend. Tomorrow, Hyacinth, you shall have the pick of every girl in the kingdom. And so the next day, every girl in the kingdom was lined up outside the castle wall, all wearing their false noses, all except one. How dare you? Where is your false nose? Oh, good gracious, I must have forgotten to put it on. False nose? I'll have your pretty head for this. False nose, mother? Oh, it's nothing. Move along, you freak. But I find her attractive. With a nose like that? Oh, come, come, mother. There's room for all of us in the world. Big noses, small noses. Kiss me, dear little princess. But no matter how the prince tried to kiss her, his nose was in the way. Oh, 
silly prince. Why didn't you take it off? Take it off? <laughs> witty, witty. <laughs> Very well, my pet. How do I take it off? Like this! Mother! You too? Oh, I've been living in a big-nosed fool's paradise. But, Your Highness, you said there's room for all kinds of noses. Small, big. Big? My nose is incredible. Oh, yeah, but you're much more than just a nose. Let's face it, dear little princess. I've got a nose like a cassava melon. <laughs> okay, okay, move over. What'd you just say? I've got a nose like a cassava melon. All right, sign here, please. Thank you. Kazam! I beg your pardon? I said Kazam, that ends the curse. But, but... Oh, forevermore, I forgot the wand. So rushed lately, I don't know if I'm fading in or fading out. Kazam! And so handsome Prince Hyacinth and dear little princess were married and... Fairy number 53 in service, go ahead. Fairy 53, go to 7th and Main. A happy ending isn't working out. Seems the frog wasn't really an enchanted prince after all. Over. Fairy 53, Roger, over and out. And now, here's that giant figure in the sports world, Mr. Know-It-All. Oh, I'm not a giant, Brock. It's just my uniform shrunk up on me. Hello there, friends. Today we take up the problem of being a successful baseball umpire. Oh, good. Here comes a player sliding into home plate now. <laughs> Now, there, friends, is a good example. If something in your voice and manner says, I'm fair and impartial even if you don't like the decision, <laughs> the player will always accept your decision in a sportsmanlike manner. Sometimes, however, a certain amount of flexibility is not only expedient, but more conducive to good health. Safe! <laughs> I meant to say safe all the time, but... Now, here we have an excellent lesson in calling the play quickly. If you call it fast enough, the player will not have time to take an emotional side. I will demonstrate. You're out! Steve! Out! Foul ball? Which brings us to the problem of wearing good protective covering to avoid injury, such as this face mask and stomach padding. Hey, Yomp, you mean to say you can't get hurt if you wear those? Let me try. Me too. Fine. Now, are you ready? We're, We're ready. ready. Again, Peabody here, and there is my boy Sherman, anxiously waiting beside the Wayback Machine. What fascinating date in history are we going back to today? The year 1519, where we will meet the famous navigator Ferdinand Magellan. Gee, swell. And the place? Spain, Sherman, to the seaport city of San Lucas. Got it, Mr. Peabody. Sherman and I entered the Wayback and were immediately whisked back through time, where we soon found ourselves in the presence of Magellan himself as he conferred with King Charles V of Spain. Let me get this straight. You want me to put up the money so you can be the first one to sail around the world? See, si. Pitchy idea, no? No! But, Your Highness, think what an expedition like this is going to mean to Spain. See, si, but think of the money it would cost. Sheesh! It would take my allowance for a whole week. Besides, I don't think it can be done. But it can. See, I got all the charts and everything. I even have all the maps from the auto club. I still don't think you can do it. I can't. Can't. I can't. Can. He can. Hmm? Who are you? I'm his boy Sherman, and he is Mr. Peabody. Mr. Peabody knows everything, don't you, Mr. Peabody? That is correct, Sherman. Ask him. He'll tell you the Magellan can sail around the world. Can he? He not only can, he will, I assure you. There, you see? Now, come on, sire. Be a good sport. All right. I will put up the pesos, but if you fail... Oh, don't worry. I'm gonna make it, or i tell you something. I'm gonna eat my sombrero. See, si. with sombrero like that, it will be very fitting punishment. Now go, prepare for the journey at once. Magellan, of course, was delighted. 
Five stout ships were fully supplied and completely outfitted, and he was ready to sail. At last, I am on my way. <laughs> Adios, Senor Peabody. Goodbye, Ferdinand. Smooth sailing. But as Magellan turned to leave... Not so fast. Where do you think you are going? Me. Me, I'm going to sail around the world. Boy, what some hombres won't do to get out of paying a butcher bill. I beg your pardon. Did you say butcher bill? See, si. He has owed me two dollars for a dozen weenies for over a month. Now, either he pays the bill or he goes to jail. I'm a man of honor. I'm going to get a job and pay you this very afternoon, butcher. All right. I give you till four o'clock. Then you pay the bill or else. Realizing there was very little time, Magellan hurried into town where he applied for work. But nobody seemed to be hiring anybody that day. <laughs> it's no use. It's almost four o'clock. Now I will have to go to jail instead of going around the world. Gosh, isn't there anything we can do to help Mr. Peabody? I've been working on it, Chairman, and I see the answer to the problem right over there. Bullfight today. Two dollar first prize to anyone who can stay in the ring with El Bruto for three minutes. Well, if you excuse me, I think I go over to the jail now and pick out a number. Adios. I assure you there's nothing to worry about, for I have a plan. We whisked Magellan into the bull ring, signed him up, and in a matter of minutes, he was ready to face the bull. Look! Here comes El Bruto! Good, and there goes Magellan. No, 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 no. The bull charged at Magellan with thundering fury, but Magellan, as I knew he would, nimbly jumped aside, and the bull missed him by a wide margin. Again and again the bull charged, and Magellan kept jumping and hopping so that never once did the bull touch him. Look at him wiggle and move! I had no idea Magellan could jump around like that. It's really quite easy when someone has poured ants into your trousers, as I did to him just before pushing him into the arena. Ants in his pants? Golly, no wonder! Thus Magellan easily eluded the bull for the required three minutes, won the two dollars, paid his weenie bill with the butcher, and at last was able to set sail. Well, there he goes. And that's how he became famous as the first explorer to sail around the world. Not only that, he also became famous as a great card player. You see, in order to pass the time on the long journey, he played poker with members of the crew and one day made history by getting 265 straight flushes in a row. Gosh, I never heard of that, Mr. Peabody. Well, of course you have, Sherman. Everybody's heard of the Straits of Magellan. <laughs> Last time, Captain Horatio Hornswoggle... Or, as we know him, Boris Badenov... ...made his bid to recapture command of the Maybe Dick. But things went amiss when Rollo the Ape accidentally knocked the bomb from his hand. Now's our chance. Let's get out of here. Bo Winkle, we can't run away like scared rabbits. Could we walk away like brave rabbits? No, we gotta throw that bomb overboard. Okay, but being a hero sure makes you look stupid sometimes. Sure enough, just then... However, that explosion hadn't come from the bomb at all, but from a squadron of British attack planes high above. And so when the smoke cleared... Hey, it didn't go off! Must be something wrong with the bomb! Sure is. Look, there's three holes in it. Three holes? Hey, I begin to smell a rat! You go. This isn't a bomb! It's a bowling ball! You made a counterfeit bomb! <laughs> what else? Go get him, Rollo! <laughs> Uh-oh! Here comes trouble with the capital trub! This way, Bo Winkle! <laughs> Through that door! <clears throat> No use, Rock. It won't open. Maybe it swings the other way. Of course, what a fox pet. But now all our troubles are all oh boy. And in a moment, our friends were dangling from the side of the ship while Rollo stumped gleefully on their fingers. Oh, oh, oh! Meanwhile, up on the bridge... Oh, Boris, you're such a no good Nick. You were born to be his. Well, darling, guess we won't need this anymore. And Natasha tossed the heavy bowling ball out of the porthole. As fate would have it, Rollo chose that moment to look over the rail at his hapless victims and... We're staying, Rock! Not quite. Look there. Sure enough, the planes were peeling off for their final attack on the ship. Natasha, do you see what I see? Very often, darling. 
Well, as the Bulgarians say, testi novas derotni. Meaning? The jig is up. Let's go. And in a few moments, the villains were in a small boat pulling away from the maybe dick. The leading all our loot, Boris. Silly girl. Everything we pirate is right here in these boxes. Oh, you so smart, Boris. Old Mr. Mind thinks of everything, Natasha. Except... Except what? With Rollo. A good question, for at that moment, Rollo was directly above them. And not wanting to be left behind, he leaped for Boris's boat. No, no, Rollo, go back. Go back. <laughs> and as the small boat capsized, Boris's boxes of loot were hurled through the air and right into Bullwinkle's hand. Ooh! Well, old mastermind, what you got to say for yourself now? Only one thing to say, Natasha. And that is? Shut up your mouth! Those British planes will be on us in a minute, Rock. Quick, hand me that paintbrush. And Rocky zoomed over the deck of maybe Dick, painting as he went. Three seconds to bomb point, sir. Two, one. Stop. Hold your fire. <sighs> what is it, Commander? Look there, Featherbear. Why, it's just a great big capital T, Commander. And what time is it? Exactly four o'clock. Which is? Good heavens. Tea time. time! By Jove, they must be British! And the planes waggled their wings in a friendly farewell and flew on. So a little while later, our friends sailed into port to a hero's welcome. Yay! A welcome marred only when Captain Peach Fuzz tried to blow the whistle and pull the wrong lever. <laughs> then maybe Dick sank like a stone, and to this day remains underwater, where it has been made into a rest home for retired skin divers. But tell me, Rock, how did you ever get the idea of painting a big T? Just between you and me, I didn't, Poor Winkle. Mm -hmm. I was trying to spell out something else. What was it? This. The end. Well, I'll be jiggered. So it is. <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A uh, bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Likewise. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started.
You know, things are usually pretty peaceful in Frostbite Falls, Minnesota. Most of the time, the citizens just sit around swapping yarn. You give me some red yarn, I'll give you some blue yarn. You throw in embroidery needle, it's a deal. You're on, Calvin. Some people play endless checker games. Aren't you gonna jump me, Clarence? Jump? Couldn't I just nudge you a little? Other Frostbite Fallsians play lazily at tiddlywinks as they, uh, 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 aren't you fellas gonna play? Brother, I'm just too tired to tittle. And you, sir? If he don't give a tittle, I don't give a wink. Charlie Parlor Car came dashing up the street like a madman. Look at old Charlie come, will you? Why, fur do you suppose he's gone so fast? Maybe he's running amok. Looks more like he's running a temperature. Maybe he's got the sunstroke. Sun isn't shining, Mark. Maybe he's got shade stroke. But no, what Charlie really had was a telegram addressed to Bullwinkle Moose. Telegram? We ain't had no telegram in this town since the war. Oh, I'll never forget what that one said. Remember Pearl Harbor? Nope. Remember the Maine. And finally, in a little cottage on the outskirts of town... <coughs> Bullwinkle! Bullwinkle! Where? Where? That's you. Oh, so it is. This here telegram's for you. Read it, will you, Rock? I don't have my glasses. Bullwinkle, I keep telling you, you don't wear glasses. Well, I said I didn't have any. Okay, here goes. Dear brother. Brother? You are invited to attend the annual convention of the Bam Bams. The Bam Bams? Certainly, that's my lodge, see? The Big American Moose's Benevolent Artistic and Marching Society. Right, the Bam Bams. Oh, boy. Read on. Anyway, they want you to attend the annual convention. Well, I don't know. They say they're going to elect you vice president. Well, They I... say they'll pay all expenses. Well... And you can bring your ukulele and sing. Let's pack! And so in just a little while, our heroes were at the ticket office with their suitcases in hand. Give us two tickets to a... Uh, uh... Where are we going, Bullwinkle? To the convention, Rock. Did you forget already? Yeah, but where's the convention? Oh, let's see. Oh, yeah, it's in Peaceful Valley, Missouri. Two tickets to Peaceful Valley. First, second, or third class? What's the difference? First class, you ride in a closed car. Second class, you ride in an open car. Gee, what's third class? You ride under the car. Now, how much can you afford to spend? Well, anything up to a dollar and a half is okay. Yeah, of course, that includes meals and tips. Well, the only thing I have for a dollar and a half is our Shank Smear excursion ticket. Sounds good. We'll take it. You got it. What is it? We've had it. Yes, the Shank Smear excursion ticket meant only that our heroes were allowed to walk the railroad tracks from Minnesota to Missouri. But that includes stopovers to shake the rocks out of your shoes. Little did our heroes know that at that moment they are the object of close scrutiny by an eye high in the sky. Yes, an orbiting satellite is broadcasting their positions across thousands of miles to where a sinister figure waits sinisterly. Well, Georgi, are they on their way? Yes, fearless leader. Good, that completes step one. And, Georgi? Yes? That first step is a Lulu. Well, why is this fearless leader keeping tab on our heroes? Maybe we'll find out next time. Over your dead body. And maybe we won't. But watch anyway for Landslide on the Rails or Bullwinkle Covers His Tracks. <laughs> Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> Ooh, don't know my own strength. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. I love to play horseshoes. I bet I get a ringer the first time. Whoops. <laughs> well, I'll get it this time. Oh, but what are you trying to do, son? Well, I'm trying to play horseshoes, Dad. Here, let me have those. <laughs> wow! How'd you ever learn to do that? Practice, Junior, practice. I smell a moral coming up. Correct. Practice makes perfect, which brings to mind a fable entitled The Coyote and the Jackrabbits. 
Most rabbits are so poor that they're forced to live in a hole in the ground. But Hasty J Rabbit is not most rabbits. Uh, Wallace? Yes, cold, sir. Yes. Did you take that truckload of money into the bank? I did, sir. Good. Now, bring a bottle of my finest carrot juice, vintage 69. I'm afraid there's no time for that, sir. You're due at the track. In case you're wondering, Hasty J Rabbit made his fortune at the races, not by betting, by running. <laughs> Seven days a week, Hasty outran the dogs, but years of this killing pace began to take its toll. Oh, I've had it. I can't run another step. <laughs> Without crossing the finish line, he was finished. Hasty, your racing days are over unless you go away for a nice long rest. It's either that or an operation. Come now, Doctor. Let's not be splitting hairs. So off they went, deciding that the peaceful quiet of the desert would be just the thing. Hey, Wallace, uh, my carrot juice. Sorry, sir, they don't grow carrots in the desert. But they did grow coyotes, big, mean ones. I'm your next-door neighbor. <laughs> Hasty considered this to be a rather strange way of greeting one's neighbor, and he became more convinced of this when, during his bath... Don't forget to wash behind the ears, neighbor. <laughs> and even that night when he went to bed... Night, neighbor! <laughs> This went on for three weeks until... The desert isn't agreeing with me, Wallace. It's that ruffian coyote, sir. He's making a nervous wreck of you. Well, we might as well pack our things and go back east. Oh, let's not be hasty, hasty. Suppose you engaged the coyote in a legitimate fight and thrashed him soundly. I'll wager he'd bother you no more. This sounded logical, so Hasty instructed his faithful servant to deliver the challenge. Tis done, sir. He agrees to meet you in the ring two weeks from today. Is that all he said? No, he told me to give you something. Then give it to me. Very well, sir. Early the next morning, training got underway. I'm afraid this is all a waste of time. I'll never be able to beat that coyote. You will with practice, sir. Just leave it to me. Now, this is called road work. When I fire this pistol, you take a brisk five-mile jaunt. Ready? Get set. <laughs> Sorry about that, sir. This time, I'll use a water pistol to start you off. Oh, good idea. On your mark, get set. <laughs> Hard water. All right, so road work is important. But be careful this time. Oh, no need to worry, sir. This time, I'll use my finger instead of a gun. Ready? Uh, no, no, but go ahead anyway. On your mark, get set. By this time, Hasty had progressed far enough to take on a sparring partner. All right, sir. Now get in there and... Don't point your finger. Oh, sorry, sir. I merely wish to instruct you to pretend that your sparring partner is the coyote. Now, oh, good idea. <laughs> Hiya, neighbor! <laughs> what do you mean, pretend? That was the coyote. My apologies, sir. He was the only partner I could get. Look, every time we try this roadwork bit, I get hurt. This time you do the running and I'll fire the gun. Oh, you can't do that, sir. The gun isn't loaded. Really? You're right. It isn't loaded. Now. Their training program completed, the fateful day of the big fight arrived. I think I'm overtrained, Wallace. I can't even lift my hand. You won't have to, sir. I'll take care of everything. At the sound of the bell, the faithful servant grabbed a section of a nearby cactus, swung, and launched his master into the fray with such force that... So you see, my boy, it's quite obvious that practice makes perfect. It seems more obvious to me, Pop, that in this case, cactus makes perfect. By golly, Junior, I do believe you got the point. poetry pals. I'm wearing this Old Mother Hubbard because today's poem is Old Mother Hubbard. Pretty slick, huh? Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to get her poor dog a bone. But when she got there, the cupboard was bare, and so the poor dog got none. Hold it, hold it. You mean after five years of watchdog and I don't get a bone? That's what the poem says. That does it. <laughs> 
I'm going on strike. On strike? I'll pull out every pooch from Pottsville or Paducah. Mother Hubbard, unfair to canine. But, but... She's anti-dog. No, oh, I'm Mother Hubbard. Unfair! Now, wait. I don't have a bone, but will something else do? Like such as what? So she went to the bread box to get him some bread, but as soon as he saw it... You kidding, he said? So she went to the ice box and hauled out a steak. And as soon as he saw it, he started to shake. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. That's okay, huh? Well, it's not a bone, mind you. Well, then... It'll do, it'll do. Now, here's your new watchdogging contract. How come it's all tattered on the edge? That? Those are the fringe benefits. Here. Where are we going this time, Mr. Peabody? Vienna, Austria, where we'll meet that brilliant composer and virtuoso Ludwig von Beethoven. Adjusting the Wayback Machine to the year 1799, Sherman and I were quickly on our way. In no time at all, we found ourselves in a small studio where Mr. Beethoven was hard at work. But instead of composing music, he seemed to be cooking something. Uh, may I ask, sir, just what it is you're doing? I'm baking a cake. Would you please pass the salt? I didn't know you could cook, Mr. Beethoven. I can't, but I'm learning. I'm going to become famous as the greatest cook in the world. Would you pass the pepper, please? Pepper? Golly, he'll never become a great cook if he puts pepper in a cake, Mr. Peabody. Uh, sir, why are you cooking instead of composing? Because I can't think of anything to compose. That's why. I've been sitting here for months and I can't get an inspiration. Work, 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 but nothing happens. So I forget the whole thing, I become a cook. Where's the mustard? We can't let him do this, Mr. Peabody. Think what the world would be missing. I am thinking, Sherman, and I have a thought. Uh, Mr. Beethoven, if you would place yourself in the environment of the theme on which you are working, perhaps you might create the mood needed for inspiration. Oh, you mean like if I am composing a symphony about the ocean, that I should go down to the ocean? Exactly. Well, that's a good idea. And so saying, <gasps> Beethoven grabbed his pen and paper and excitedly dashed from the room. Good work, Mr. Peabody. As usual, you solved the problem. I'm not too sure about that. What do you mean? Well, supposing Beethoven wanted to be inspired for his fifth symphony. Gee, that's right. Where would he go? There is only one place, and if it's where I'm thinking, come, Sherman, we must hurry. <laughs> he quickly dashed through town to one of the city's busiest corners, and there, just as I had feared, sat Ludwig von Beethoven in the middle of the street, corner of Fifth and Main. Mr. Peabody, he'll get killed out there. We've got to save him. Fortunately, at that moment, the signal changed, stopping the traffic long enough for us to race into the street and hustle Mr. Beethoven to safety, just in the nick of time, I might add. Phew, that was a close one. Are you all right, Mr. Beethoven? Oh, I'm better than all right. <laughs> Look, it worked. Being at Fifth and Main inspired me to write my fifth symphony. Now I'm going to go and get an inspiration for my fourth symphony. Where's he going? But unfortunately, today is the 4th of July. You don't suppose? I not only suppose, I am quite certain quickly, Sherman, there's not a second to lose. We immediately rush to the local fairgrounds where they were holding a huge 4th of July fireworks celebration. There he is, Mr. Peabody, right in the middle of everything. It reminded me very much of the Battle of Bunker Hill as Sherman and I darted onto the field amid the din of exploding rockets, flashing firecrackers, and fountains of fire. Fortunately, we managed to reach Mr. Beethoven and beat a hasty retreat over the back fence. Say, this inspiration stuff is a wonderful thing, gentlemen. <laughs> it works every time. Now I'm going to use this to help me write my greatest composition. Hey, he's got one of the rockets from the fireworks display. What are you going to do with that? I'm going to the moon so I can write my moonlight sonata. What else? Oh, no! Grab him, Sherman. But before we could get close to him, Mr. Beethoven lit the rocket and roared up into the sky. Needless to say, he didn't quite make it to the moon. Whee! I made it! Say, now! You aren't going to believe this, but you know there's two fellas back, I know they look just like you two gentlemen. I hate to say this, Ludwig, but this is the Earth, and we are those two fellows. You mean I didn't make it to the moon? Hardly. Oh, that's a shame. 
I don't think I could stand another trip like that. Oh, you won't have to, sir. I'm sure I can inspire you to write your Moonlight Sonata without your going to the moon. You can? How? Well, what do you think of when you think of the moon? Well, everybody says the moon is made of cheese, so I think of cheese. Good, good. That will do the trick. By simply surrounding the great master with cheeses, he was able to compose the beautiful Moonlight Sonata. I'll bet that made him happy. Oh, yes. So delighted, in fact, that he even named his first son after a cheese. A cheese, Mr. Peabody? Why, yes. He called him Kranz Beethoven. Naturally, he later on became an orchestra conductor known as, can I say it, Lieder Kranz. <laughs> Last time you remember, Bullwinkle was invited to attend the annual convention of the Bam Bam. The Big American Wolf's Benevolent Artistic and Marching Society. Yes. Incorporated. Yes, and... Uh, founded in 1820 on a raft in the North Woods. You mean founded in 1820? Nope, founded. The raft sank. Be that as it may. And it may. Our heroes are now traveling by rail to Peaceful Valley, Missouri, where the convention is to be held. They're going fourth class on the Frostbite Falls Main Line, which actually means they're walking on the railroad ties. Boy, this is sure a slow way to travel, Bullwinkle. Oh, it could be worse. How? If you go tourist class, you gotta walk in between the ties. But slow going isn't our hero's only problem, for high above them spins an orbiting satellite, an eye in the sky that is flashing their whereabouts to a sinister room thousands of miles away in Potsylvania. All is going according to plan, fearless leader. Good, good. Now it is time for our man in Minnesota to take over. Who is available, Georgi? Well, let's see. Anastasia got caught by FIB. You mean FBI. That's what I said. He told an FIB to the FBI and got 20 years. Go on. Engelbert is visiting his mother and can't get away. Can't get away? Where is his mother? In San Quentin. Oh, well, who does that leave us? I'm afraid to tell you, fearless leader. Afraid? Why? You'll have me liquidated for telling you bad news. Come, 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 Georgi. I'm your fearless leader. Don't you trust me? Of course. Then tell me. It's... it's Boris Badenow. Schweinhund! Take him away! But fearless leader! And let this be a lesson, Georgi. Don't trust anybody. Now, Dimitri, send message to that sniveling idiot in Minnesota. And at that moment, that sniveling idiot... Or as we know him, Boris Bedinov... ...was on a hill high above the railroad tracks rigging a fiendish device. Observe, Natasha. I dig away ground in front of huge boulder. Boulder rolls down dotted line, hits track right at crossing. Darling, what do we have against crossing? Nothing, Natasha. But when moose and squirrel are on the crossing... Then X marks spot. You said it, dull face. You got orders to do away with them? Who needs orders, Natasha? This one's on the house. And sure enough, as our heroes approached the crossing, Boris cut away the last bit of earth and the boulder roared on its way. But just then, a sinister-looking bird flapped his way to Boris's shoulder. Aha! A carrier pigeon. Carrier pigeon? Boris, that is a buzzard. Nonsense. This is a Pennsylvania pigeon, and he brings us orders. Moose and squirrel must arrive at Peaceful Valley safe and sound. Signed, Fearless Leader. Aha! You see, Natasha? I beat Fearless Leader to it. Already, Already I... Already you did what, darling? Already I cut my own throat. And quickly disguising himself as a track walker, Boris dashed down the hill. Soon he had passed the onrushing boulder. Don't come any further. Go back. What's that fella hollering? I don't know, but we better wait here on this crossing. Seems as good a place as any. You got to go back. Why? Because huge boulder is going to hit in that exact spot. See, that must be what this X is for. Yes, Bullwinkle was right for the first time. And it looked as if it might be the last time, too. For at that moment... Oh, don't miss our next flat episode, Rocky and the Rock, or Taken for Granite. <laughs> Well, 
I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say. A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. Yes, sir, there's nothing quite like going by rail. Unless, like Rocky and Bullwinkle, you go fourth class on the Frostbite Falls Main Line. For that means you walk where you're going on the railroad tide. But you get a free can of bunion cream with each ticket. Sure, a dull way to go, Bullwinkle. Nothing ever happens. Oh, little did Rocky know, for at that moment on a hillside above them, Boris Badenov had just released a huge boulder designed to hit them just as they reached the point where the railroad tracks made a big X. But when Boris got his orders from fearless leader via Pottsylvanian carrier pigeon, Says Moose and Squirrel must get there safe and sound. Oh, boy! So Boris had to disguise himself as a track walker and run ahead of the huge boulder, shouting to our heroes as he went. Stop! Luke, listen! Landslide! What do you see? What do you see? I can't understand a word. Sounds like his teeth are loose. Go back! The bridge is out! You were right, Rock. He says his bridge is out. You got to go back! But we just got here. If you don't go back, go forward, but don't just stand there. Why? Because Big Rock is going to hit on that exact spot. Say, how come you know all this? Because Look I... out! Yes, at that moment, the onrushing boulder bounded high into the air and landed right on the X. Or very near it, anyway. You know something? He was almost right. We gotta get him out from under there, Bullwinkle. And by using a tree trunk as a lever and Bullwinkle's mighty moose muscles for power, our heroes were able to move the huge rock. Gee, there's nothing here but his hat. But where's he? I'm on that hat. Hokey smoke! You were hammered into the ground just like a big nail, Mr. Um... What is your name, anyway? Why not call me Spike? How do we get him out, Bullwinkle? Well, if he was put in like a nail, he's got to come out like a nail. And so finding a tree branch shaped like a hammerhead, Bullwinkle hooked it into Boris's ears and pulled. <laughs> Easy, Bullwinkle. Let's get him out of here in one piece. That's it! 
But when Boris got out of the hole, he acted rather strangely. Does the cross town bus stop here, conductor? Bus? This is the railroad. Then let me off 125th Street and give me blue transfer. Rocky, maybe I pull too hard. How's that? I think I flipped his lid. Goodness, listen to all the birdies. Birdies? Come here, you little rascals, you. And Boris skipped off while our friends watched in amazement. Wake me early, mother dear, for I'm to be queen of the May. Boris, you have changed somehow. Changed? I'm still sweet, the lovable me. See, you have changed. Well, now what do we do? Let's start Cub Scout Troop around the privileged children. Boris, what a fearless leader should hear you. Fearless leader? Who is he? If you're listening, fearless leader, he's only kidding. Boris, you know who is fearless leader. Here is his picture. Ooh, he looks like it a meanie. A meanie? He is cruelest, meanest, evil, wicked snake in the grass in all Pennsylvania. Ooh. And he is your hero. Mine hero? Sure, look. Here is latest orders. Moose and squirrel must arrive at peaceful welly safe and sound. He's really a bad man? Darling, he's like the worst. That settles it. I do just the opposite from what he says. You mean? Certainty. I'll go to Nakov, Moose, and Squirrel. He's the only decent thing to do. Boris, you know what will happen. Of course. I'll get two gold stars and a brownie. And grabbing a nearby stick of TNT, the adult brain Boris began to dance after our friends. Don't miss our next Daffy episode, Trouble Upstairs, or Bats in the Boris. <laughs> You won't find it on a map because it isn't there anymore, but there was such a place known as Tootsie Lavender, which in French means feet of purple. Now, the reason it was called feet of purple is because all the people who lived there had purple feet. This was not an allergy, but was due to the fact that the entire countryside was covered with grape vines. And when you have that many grape vines, you have an abundance of grapes and grape stompers. Hence the name Tootsie Lavender. As the years went by, they produced not only all sorts of wines and grape juice, but a very tasty champagne. There was only one thing wrong with it. When you opened a bottle, the cork would not pop. The champagne is no good. It is flat. It wasn't flat. It just would not pop. The scientific minds of Tootsie Lavender immersed themselves in the problem and came up with all sorts of cures. Here we have a bottle containing a dash of nitroglycerin. This will make a pop. That didn't work too well. Then, one day... Go away. We are busy. Excuse me, gentlemen, but uh, <laughs> I believe I can help you. Before a protest could be lodged, the stranger stuck a finger in his mouth and... Sacre bleu! Do it again! For three weeks, the papa popped to the delight and the amazement of the scientists. Well, the upshot of it all was this. When you purchased a bottle of Tootsie Lavender champagne, you also received the services of the papa. Look, dear, I bought a bottle of champagne. And who is that? He comes with it. Ready, monsieur? Any time. The man pulled the cork, the papa popped. And everyone was happy. This went on for a year, with a popper appearing all over the land, popping his way into the hearts of everyone. And then, one day, the evil prince who ruled Tootsie Lavender decided to give a party. 3,000 bottles of champagne? We, oui, and you must guarantee that they make with the pop. Well, uh, <clears throat> where do I appear today? At the castle of the evil prince. You must pop 3,000 times, and without fail, or... Easy, easy, shopkeeper. <laughs> I shall do it easily. Ah, but this was the wet season, and the papa was forced to fight his way to the castle through a blinding downpour. What's more, wet cold rain can play odd tricks on a person, as you will soon see. The prince's party was a gay one. That is, until the time came to drink champagne. All right, Popper, do your work and do it well. And never fear, your evilness. The first bottle was brought out. The prince pulled out the cork, pointed to the papa. The papa went through his customary procedure and... 
No pop. You try to make the fool of me. I can't understand it. I'll try again. Though he tried and tried, not a pop could he make. The party was a dismal failure. Enough of this. Throw him in the dungeon. The popper was dumped unceremoniously inside the castle's deepest, dankest, darkest dungeon. Oh, well. Into each life, some rain must fall. Who said that? I believe it was the Mills Brothers. Who are you? There, in a corner, sat a bearded figure. I am the prince of Tootsie Lavender. Well, then who's the mean one upstairs? An imposter who overpowered me and usurped my throne. Alas, if only I could get out of here. I'd like to help you, but I have my own problems. A laryngitis of the papa. Well, time wore on, and eventually the wet season moved on to San Francisco. The clear, dry air returned, and so did the papa's papa. I did it. I got it back. Oh, these nuts they put in here. Ah, but the pops were to be the good prince's salvation. For the guards in the dungeon heard the sounds, believed them to be emanating from champagne bottles, and ran to the cell, glasses in hand. Vila Jacques! By three that afternoon, every guard in the castle was in that cell. But the papa and the prince weren't. They had escaped completely unnoticed. This way, mon ami. I have this score to settle. To a secret passageway they went. And where did it lead? To the great hall where the evil prince was cheating at Scrabble. Is that you, Pierre? No, you rotten imposter. It is me. You! Revenge is sweet. So is apple cider. Back and forth they fought, neither giving an inch. And then the good one happened to trip. Aha! The moment of truth. Oh, the good prince would have had it had it not been for the papa. He popped. Quick! Someone give me a glass. And that's when a fist knocked him real. Well, from that day forward, Tootsie Lavender was a much happier land. As for our friend the papa, he was made royal instructor. Every man in the kingdom went to school to learn how to make the popping noise. And it suddenly occurs to me that most of those men were married and were fathers. I wonder if that's how they got the name Pop. Thanks, Brock, but I'm not selling supers, I'm selling soap. So, sell. Hello, friends. Today we take up the problem of selling these here soap flakes. The best way is to cleverly disguise yourself as a washer repair man. Hello, kindly sir. Is the lady of the house in? Ah, oh, so it's you who's been bringing her those boxes of candy. No, no, hold it, King's X. I'm the washer repair man here to fix the washer. I didn't know it was broken. Now listen carefully to how cleverly I rouse his interest. Of course it's broken. It's clogged up due to ordinary wash day soaps that produce too much suds. So fix it. Oh. Let me know when you're finished. You see how I've roused his interest? These are suds from other wash day products aren't made for your washer. That's why the makers of over one leading washer recommend... Is the washer fixed? No, but sir, let me tell you why this soap... Soap, schmop, fix the machine! The essential thing to remember when you're selling soap is often the buyer merely wants to test your salesmanship abilities. Is it finished? You fixed the washer? The reason your washer is clogged, sir, is those thick suds. That's why the makers of over one leading wash... Oof! Gosh, Mr. Noro, what happened? The washer's still clogged up. Too much soap? Nope. Too much me. <laughs> there, Peabody here. And I'm Mr. Peabody's trusty boy, Sherman. Right, trusty boy. And now we'll be off for another exciting journey back into history. Ready, Mr. Peabody. What shall I set the way back for today? For the year 1874. Check. And the place? Deadwood, South Dakota, where we'll meet that colorfulness of the old west, Calamity Jane. The way back responded beautifully, and in less than an instant, we were teleported back through time, where we found ourselves standing in front of the Deadwood Overland Stage Company. Clear the streets! Calamity Jane is coming in with the noon stage in 
she's at it again. I beg your pardon, sir, but why all the excitement just because Calamity Jane is driving in the noon stage? That's just it. She ain't driving. She's sitting inside the stage with the passengers. Look out. Here she comes. We just managed to leap to the safety of the doorway when the driver of the stage roared through the center of town, narrowly missed a wagon loaded with dynamite, and came to a thudding halt in a pile of hay near the livery stable. End of the line! Everybody out! Is everybody all right? Yeah, cuss it! It certainly is fortunate that you missed the wagon load of dynamite, or it would have been a calamity. What do you mean, fortunate? I was hoping something like that would happen. That's why I was letting the stage run wild. Golly, what for? Because nothing ever happens to me, that's why. What's the use of having a swell name like Calamity if you can't have a calamity once in a while? Hmm, you do have a point there. Folks is beginning to talk. Watch, I'll show you what I mean. Before our startled eyes, Calamity walked over to the dynamite wagon and calmly lit a stick of dynamite. Now, you'd think that a lit stick of dynamite would cause an awful ruckus, wouldn't you? Well, yeah, yes, I would say that. Mr. Peabody, make her throw it away. It'll go off any second. Oh, don't fret, Sonny. With my luck, it won't go off. But, see, it's a dude. That's dud. And what a shame. You seem to have a nice little calamity going for you there. Oh, I've got to start having calamities pretty soon, or I'm afraid it's going to break my spirit. Curious to see what Jane's next attempt at having a calamity would be, we followed her to the stockyards, where she entered a corral containing the largest, meanest-looking bull I had ever seen. Uh-oh, she's going to get it this time. Look, the bull is charging. But Jane's unwanted luck still held, for the bull missed her by at least three feet through a fence and into a tree. That's incredible. He missed. He misses every day. The silly critter can't see a thing without his glasses. For the rest of that day, Calamity Jane tried everything imaginable to have a calamity. She even tried to sit on a tack, but was saved by a rivet in her jeans. Nah, it's no use. Guess I'll just have to change my name to Lucky Lucy. Forget the whole thing. She can't do that. Can't you think of something, Mr. Peabody? <laughs> I already have, Sherman. I suggest that instead of changing your name, you simply change your luck. How am I going to do that? Very simple. Wait here. Crossing the street to the general store, I made a purchase, then quickly returned and handed the package to Calamity. What am I supposed to do with this? Drop it. Drop it? Drop it. Well, it sounds a little cuckoo, but okay, if you say so. No, you done it. I broke something. You were supposed to. You see, there was a mirror in that package. I get it, Mr. Peabody. Now she's going to have seven years bad luck. That is correct. Shucks, and you look like such a smart little critter. I thought you had an ID, but that breaking a mirror business is the silliest thing I ever heard. Gosh, Mr. Peabody, she doesn't believe in it. She will. Any minute now, Sherman. What happened? Calamity Jane just had an awful calamity. Got run over by a wagon load of chicken. Chicken what? Just chicken. There was only one in the wagon. Well, that looks like the start of her bad luck. You did it again, Mr. Peabody. Quite. For in the next seven years, Calamity Jane had one calamity after another, the most famous of which was the time she was trying to light an old stove that exploded and covered the countryside for miles around with black soot. Really, Mr. Peabody? Really, Sherman. How do you think the Black Hills of South Dakota got black? are still on their way to the annual Big Moose Convention in Peaceful Valley, Missouri. I didn't know there were any moose in Missouri, Bullwinkle. Oh, certainly, Rock. Look, here's a picture of one. Boy, Missouri moose sure look different. Well, they are a little smaller. And they got shorter hair. And shorter noses, too. And their antlers aren't as big. And they give milk. Milk? This isn't a moose, Bullwinkle. It's a cow. All the same, it's the honorary moose. How can a cow be an honorary moose? Well, we 
had a big membership drive a while back. Guess we got carried away a little. Sure wish we could. Could what? Get carried away a little. I'm sure tired of walking. Then why not fly? And leave you, my old buddy, never. I knew you'd say that. Then why'd you ask? If I hadn't asked, you wouldn't have said it. Oh. But meanwhile, fate is preparing a cruel blow for our boys in the shape of Boris Badenov, who has suddenly reformed due to a crack on the head. I won't do a thing that nasty, fearless leader tells me. But why, darling? Because he's a meanie. Shh, Boris, he might hear you. So I disobey all his orders. What was last order? It said do not kill moose and squirrel. Then I do it anyway. And afterward, we pick flowers and send them to shot-ins everywhere. Everywhere? San Quentin, Alcatraz, Sing Sing. And grabbing a nearby stick of explosive, Boris danced after our friends. In a little while, he was lying in wait for them near an old watchman's shack. Hey, that looks like a keen place to rest. Leave me to it. I can't. You're ahead of me. Then follow me to it. And our heroes entered the abandoned shack and shut the door. Instantly, Boris grabbed a roll of wire and dashed round and round the tiny dwelling, wrapping it with loop after loop. Here we go, loopy loo. Here we go, loopy la. In a few moments, the shanty was completely hogtied. And inside, Bullwinkle was about to make a startling discovery. I'll get some wood and we'll start it. Start it. Hey, door must be swole up. Swole up my foot. Mine too. It's all that walking. No, sir. That door is wired shut and so are the windows. Now, who'd want to do a dizzy thing like that? That's easy. Dizzy Boris Badenov, who, thinking he was doing good deeds, lit the fuse on his stick of TNT. Law and order, law and order. Blow them up and then I cross the border. But at that moment, high above, the whizzing spy in the sky satellite was sending the whole scene back to Pottsylvania and its furious, fearless leader. Blood, cynical liver, geharnish the Merkel murder gestalt as Granka. Any orders, fearless leader? Yes, activate the satellite. You really mean? Don't argue, Dimitri. Do it. And with trembling finger, Dimitri pushed the activate button. Instantly, a door opened in the satellite and a hand emerged holding a large brick. It paused while complicated machinery figured distance, angle, speed, and windage, then launched the missile earthward. Just as Boris was about to lob the TNT through the window of the shanty, it was pretty close at that. But the explosion blew the wired-up shack right from over our hero's head, setting them free. Hooray! It also blew Boris Badenov into the next county where he was found a few days later by his partner in crime, Natasha. Okay, Boris, you want to start Cub Scout troop? We start Cub Scout troop. Cub Scouts, are you out of your mind? Boris, you mean... Oh, Natasha, shut up, you mouth! Oh, darling, you're back to abnormal. Yes, he certainly is, and what new peril does this hold for our friends? Be with us next time for Boris on a Broomstick or the Flying Sorcerer. <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A uh, bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, 
Glad to see you again. Likewise. We got some great things on the show today. Like what? Like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. A story about a convention, ours has been pretty unconventional so far. For our heroes are still walking the tracks on their way to Missouri, watched by a satellite high in the sky that is flashing pictures of them to Pottsylvania's fearless leader. Fearless leader, Moose and Squirrel are taking a long time to get to Peaceful Valley. Tut tut, it is all part of the plot. And remember the words of our great protector, Mr. Big. Whisper his name. A watched plot never thickens. Meanwhile, Boris Badenov, who was blown up by one of his own fiendish plans, is determined to be revenge. But Boris, fearless leader says Moose and Squirrel must arrive safe and sound. Fui to fearless leader. Fui. Fui, fui, and double fui. Boris, your language. It is a family show, remember? Fui to families, too. Oh. Boris, darling, what is it? It's a lump. But what made lump? This brick with a note on it. What does it say? The brick, it don't say nothing. The note, darling. Oh, it says, fearless leader is watching. Oh, boy. Yes, the Pottsylvanian satellite was now hovering high over Boris's head, keeping him under constant surveillance. Just kidding, fearless leader. <laughs> you know what they always call me? Million laughs bad enough. Bad enough, you nitwit. They call me that, too. Get to Peaceful Valley and carry out your instructions. Yes, fearless leader. But how? How? Use your special secret agent rocket kit. Build a rocket. Fly there. Yes, fearless leader. Signing off. You're Sarah Bossman, sir, you... Fearless leader, I didn't know there was a secret agent rocket kit. There isn't. I just made it up. <laughs> Natasha, did we got secret agent rocket kit? I don't know, darling. Let me look in pocketbook. Here is poison lipstick. What shade? Kiss of death pink. I prefer black widow black or vampire violet. Some booby pins for setting booby traps. Ah. Uh -huh. Autograph picture of Benedict Arnold. Good old Benny. And the membership card in PTA. PTA, like parents and teachers? No, darlings, like in pickpockets and thieves. That's better. But still no rocket kit? No rocket kit. Oh boy, here, let me take a look. Boris, don't turn it upside down! Nonsense, I got to. <laughs> What was that? My explosive perfume. Explosive perfume? I call it the boom. And meanwhile, our two heroes are still trudging slowly toward Peaceful Valley, Missouri. Boy, it sure is hot. Never mind, Bullwinkle. There's a tunnel up ahead. It'll be cooler in there. And our heroes plunged into the cool darkness of the tunnel, little realizing that the fast express was plunging into the other side. Bullwinkle, look out! In another instant, Rocky flashed out of the tunnel with the express close behind him. Bullwinkle, where are you? Right here, Rock! Well, get off that train. You don't have a ticket. I can't. My hoof is caught in the cow catcher. You mean moose catcher. Don't crack jokes during the action scenes. Nobody hears them anyway. Right. I'll go tell them to stop the train and stand. In a few minutes, the train was stopped and Bullwinkle was extracted from the front of the engine. Well, here we are, safe and sound. But where are we? Alas, they found out all too soon. Bullwinkle, it's 12 o'clock already and we're still in Frostbite Falls. You know what that means? Yep. Time for lunch. So our heroes are back where they started. Well, this is a pretty pickle. Not really. It's more of a kumquat. Be with us next time for Boris Lends a Hand or Count Your Fingers. <laughs> Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But that trick never worked. This time for sure. Resto! Well, I'm getting close. And now it's 
time for another special feature. Happy birthday, Pop. Well, thank you, Junior. Well, a jumping frog, just what I've always wanted. Yeah, me too, Pop. Sorry about the paper sack. I didn't have time to wrap it. It isn't the sack that's important, it's what's inside it. Remember, the plainest box often contains the best gift. I'll bet you got a fable to go with that, don't you, Dad? Oddly enough, no. Well, I do. It's called The Rooster and Five Hens. Once there was a handsome rooster, a happy handsome rooster. But unknown to him, his days were numbered. For one spring day, the five Leghorn sisters moved into the house next door. Girls, it's time you five thought of getting married. Now there's a fine young bachelor right next door, and one of you should catch him. The oldest went first, and she knew that the best way to a rooster's heart was through his stomach. Happy birthday! How did you know it was my birthday? I took a guess. And the rooster took a bite. Oh, marble cake. Marble cake. Made with real marbles. Oh, oh, never darken my door. The second oldest leghorn sister was a wizard housekeeping. One morning, bright and early, she snuck into the rooster's house and proceeded to get a thorough going over. She cleaned up the living room, the kitchen, the closets. She cleaned up the bedroom. She cleaned up everything. The third sister was not only the prettiest, she had a very special talent. Hey, you sure whistled pretty, huh? There followed a whirlwind courtship. He took her everywhere, to the races, to the pool hall, and everywhere she went. The lamb was sure to go? No, she whistled. You know, Dal, being on a picnic with you is really living. Whistle for me, baby. Unfortunately, what they both didn't know was that it was the opening day of chicken hunting season, and a whistling chicken is a dead giveaway. Honey, I could listen to your whistle all day. When he got out of the hospital, he vowed never to look at another woman again. You mean hen, Junior. Yeah. But if there was anything that impressed this rooster, it was strength. And the fourth leghorn sister had plenty of that. Rooster, I'm gonna bust you one. You do it, I'll bust you! You stay out of this, hen. I don't want anything to do with women. He means hens. Yeah. And besides, this guy's tough. Well, so am I! She went into action and really showed her strength. Say, baby, I could get to like you. Another whirlwind courtship followed. At night, instead of watching TV, he would watch her press 2,000 pounds and then all his suits. Hey, how about you and me getting married? That's a good idea, Fanny. Give us a hug. <laughs> it took six months to heal his broken ribs, and when it finally was done... Never, I repeat, never will I be attracted to the opposite sex. The fifth and last leghorn sister was the prettiest of them all. But not only was she pretty, she laid golden eggs. Hey, this is one of your eggs? Uh-huh, 20 carats. Boy, if I had a wife like you, I'd be rich. Well, then marry me. Of course, everybody wants a golden egg-laying hen, especially crook roosters. This is a stick-up. Hand over your eggs. Now, see here, buddy, this chick is my fiancée. Touch a hair of her head and I'll, I'll call her sister who can press 2,000 pounds and suits. But the crooks weren't to be scared. <laughs> this time, the rooster was finally cured. That's it, Pop. I don't believe it. I don't believe it myself. Well, how does that illustrate the moral the plainest box often contains the best gift? Well, it doesn't, unless we show what happened when the sixth Leghorn sister approached the rooster. The sixth? You said there were five of them. Poetic license, Dad. Yes, there was a sixth sister. Zelda was her name, and she was ugly. Hiya, baby. How come the mask? This ain't Halloween, you know. This is not a mask. This is me. Will you take me for your wife? I wouldn't take you for a walk. Sad but determined. Zelda sought out the services of an old owl who... Lived in a shoe? No, in a cave. Give the rooster this glass of magic liquid and he will fall in love with you. What's in here? Absinthe. Absinthe? Absinthe. Well, the very next day at a lemonade stand, Zelda substituted the absinthe for a hooker of lemonade. Wow! 
That's not bad. And you know what? What? I love you. And so they were wed. The handsomest rooster and the ugliest hen. Which goes to prove, Pop, the plainest box often contains the best gift. How come you said it straight, Junior? Usually you make a bad pun out of the closing moral. Well, seeing as how I told the fable, I thought you'd corn up the ending. Well, that's very kind of you. You got one? Uh-huh. Absinthe makes the heart grow fonder. <laughs> that's my pop. <laughs> Hi there, culture bugs. Today's epic is a poem about an English garden named of the cherry tree. Up into the cherry tree, who should climb but little me? I held the trunk with both my hands and looked abroad on foreign lands. I saw the dimpling river pass and be the sky's blue looking glass and dusty roads go up and down with... Hi there, Dusty. I say, Hatchet, I do believe there's a poacher in your cherry tree. A poacher? Confound the rascal. I saw the pleasant garden lie, adorned with signs before my eye. Hatchet Manor, keep out, this means you. Hey, that don't rhyme. I say, who's up there? Hey, nobody here but us cherries. Will you come down at once? <laughs> well, you asked for it. Good heavens, what's happened to Hatchet? I cannot tell a lie. I did it with my little cherry tree. That's a pretty strange-looking painting, Bullwinkle. I just paint what I see. Well, what do you see? This is what I see. Peabody here. Once again, it is time to take another revealing peek back into history. What famous date shall I set it to today, Mr. Peabody? October 19th, 1781. Got it. And the place? Yorktown, Virginia, where we shall witness that great moment of the American Revolution when Cornwallis surrendered to General Washington. And away we go! It was simply a matter of seconds when we found ourselves in the main camp of General Washington where the surrender was to take place. However, by the orders the general was issuing, I quickly suspected that something was amiss. Load your muskets, men. Position those cannon. Prepare to fire on my command. Hey, the battle is still on. I'm afraid there's more here than meets the eye. Stopping a passing soldier, I asked him if this wasn't the day that General Cornwallis was supposed to surrender. Yep, he was supposed to turn his sword over to General Washington this morning, but he ain't showed up. Now we gotta start the Battle of Yorktown all over again. Golly, Mr. Peabody, this is terrible. There must be some mistake. Quite so, Sherman, and I suggest we find out what it is immediately. Hurrying into Yorktown, we went directly to General Cornwallis's headquarters, where we found him frantically rummaging through a large trunk. Not here, not there, not here. Oh, drat the luck. Uh, you'll pardon the intrusion, sir, but by some oversight, have you forgotten you are to surrender to General Washington today? My good man, it isn't that I've forgotten it, simply that I can't. Can't surrender? Why not? I can't find my ruddy sword is why not. Isn't that jolly well depressing? But you've got to find it or the battle will start all over again. Yes, I know. Well, I'll have to do the next best thing and see if he'll accept this cricket bat instead. Cheer out, chaps. Needless to say, it was just a short time until Cornwallis returned with the cricket bat still in hand. No soap, huh? No, I'm afraid it must be a sword that I turn in upon my surrender. So be it. I shall go catch a sword. Catch a sword? What's he talking about? He could only mean one thing, Sherman. Follow me. My suspicions were, of course, correct. Lord Cornwallis hurried down to the coast where he set about the task of deep-sea fishing. In no time at all, he managed to hook a beauty and, after a savage battle, landed a whopping big swordfish. I say, smashing good luck, what? Wait a minute. You're not thinking of surrendering that to General Washington, are you? Of course, dear boy. It is a sword of sorts, you know. It might have worked out, but for the fact that it was such a long walk back to Washington's camp and being such a hot day, the swordfish was hardly in any condition to present to the general by the time he arrived. Out! 
That does it, chaps. There is simply no way to surrender a sword without a sword. I'm afraid the battle will just have to continue. Is it possible you forgot to bring your sword? Nonsense. I checked everything carefully before I left. I packed my toothbrush, an extra pair of socks, put my sword on the dra... Oh, by George, you're right. It's back in jolly old England. Then that is the answer. We shall go to England and get it. But that's impossible. There isn't time. Nothing, Sherman, is impossible. You go to General Washington and ask him to hold everything. We shall be back with the sword in no time at all. Okay, but I hope it works. Good luck. Luck was with us, for taking one of Cornwallis's fastest ships, we set sail immediately and just happened to get caught in a violent hurricane that blew us across the ocean to England in record time. Wasting no time, we hurried to the General's house. Mother! Mother! Why, Charles, what is it? Did you forget something? Yes, Mother, my sword. I say, have you seen it? Oh, yes, dear. I'm barbecuing a roast with it. Won't you and your friends stay for dinner? I'm afraid there's no time for that, ma'am. I'll take the sword and we'll eat the roast on the way. Awfully nice of you, Mother. Cheero. We rushed back to the ship and were fortunate enough to catch the hurricane, which just happened to be blowing the other way, and made the return crossing faster than before. I can't wait any longer. Ready? Don't shoot yet, General. If you could hold it just a little longer. Aim! I say, here I am. I'm here. Wait! Here they come! They made it! Don't fire, for pity's sake. King's X, I give up. Do you surrender, sir? I certainly do. Here, sir, is my sword. Phew! Good work, Mr. Peabody. Cornwallis was finally able to surrender, and that practically ended the revolution. Quite so, Sherman, and following his surrender, Cornwallis was able to return to England, where in 1794 he was made Marquis of the Piggyback Races for all of the royal picnics. Marquis of the Piggyback Races? How come? How else could they start the race? You know very well that before every race you must say, Get on your Marquis. Last time you remember, our heroes were well on their way to the Missouri Moose Convention when they entered a tunnel and started an argument with the Daylight Express, which was going the other way. As a result, by the time the train was stopped, they were clear back in Frostbite Falls. Looks like we'll miss meeting the Missouri Meese. What we need is a first-class travel agent. Oh, lucky, lucky you, you got one. Hey, who are you? Allow me to introduce myself. Trade Wind Latour, demon travel agent. Visit the famous garden spots of the world. The Bastille, Lubyanka Prison, Alcatraz, Wormwood Scrubs. Garden spots? Those are all jails. They can't be too much fun. No, but the stopover privileges are great. Yeah? You get to stay 20 years in each one. Well, then, maybe... No, we just want to go to Missouri, Mr. Latour. Of course you do. Now, here's your itinerary. Huh? Here's where you go. Oh. First to Lake Laos. That's Lake Louise. My mistook. Then on up the seaway to Greenland. Then Paris, Nome, Nairobi, Pismo Beach. Wait a minute. Couldn't we go straight to Missouri? Foolish boy. It's all the same price. What price? Only $10,000 each. Well, we don't have quite that much. Okay, cut out Pismo Beach and make it $99.50. As a matter of fact, we have just 38 cents. Like you say, you go straight to Missouri. But how? On board Mississippi River luxury liner, the SS Hawk Finn. A luxury liner. Sounds great. We'll take it. And in just a little while, Boris waved bye-bye to our heroes as they started downriver on the SS Huck Finn. This is a luxury liner? What do you want for 38 cents? The Queen Mary? Heavens no! There's hardly enough room for us. Well, Boris, they're on their way to Peaceful Valley. Yes, Natasha. Now we got to beat them there. Yeah, but how do we do it? Observe. Behind this conveniently placed bush... Boys, it's a rocket. You said it, kiddo, and I built it myself, personally by hand. How does it work? First, we get in seats. Right. Then we figure angle of fire. Right. Let's see. Two times two is four. Six times 13 is 78. Seven times eight is 54. Put down seven, carry two. Aha! 32 degrees. But Boris... Then we light fuse. But Boris... And we run. But Boris, seven times... 
1854. No. He's 56. Natasha, you know what that means? No. Now you know what that means. But the wily Boris was not to be defeated so easily and soon was reclining in cushioned ease. Faster, Natasha! Hop, two, three, four! Hop, two, three, four! Are you sure this is... This is good for the figure, Boris. Natasha, by the time we get to Missouri, you will have figure just like M.M.'s. Marilyn Monroe? No, Minnie Mouse. Well, old man River, don't say nothing, don't do nothing. He just keeps rolling along. And so in just a few days, our boys found their tiny raft floating right up to the shore of peaceful Valley, Missouri. Gee, Bullwinkle, it looks as if we were expected. I only have one question, Bullwinkle. Well, that's all we have time for anyway. Where's all the people? A good question, that, for there weren't any in sight. But though our heroes couldn't see anyone, it was soon apparent that somebody saw them. For from every window and doorway in town, sinister-looking weapons began to appear, all aimed right at our boys. Don't miss our next creepy episode... Featuring genuine creeps... Mud-munching moose or Bullwinkle bites the dust. Well, I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say. A uh, bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel, and his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. boys finally made it to Peaceful Valley, Missouri, and found it to be a lovely town, particularly with a public square all decorated like this. There's just one thing that bothers me, Bullwinkle. You're lucky I got dozens. Where's all the people? Hey, that's right. Oh, if Bullwinkle had only known... What do you think, Caleb? Be they floys or be not they floys? Well, my feuding guide don't list no floys with antlers, but we better not take chances. You mean we plug them anyways? You bet. What if we're wrong? We can always apologize. <laughs> Caleb, you ought to be with the United Nations. Who's feuding with them? Seems like they're near everybody. And meanwhile, on the other side of the square... 
Speak up, Ephraim. Be they hatfuls or beant they hatfuls? Well, that air big end looks like a hat rack. That's close enough. Ready, aim. Of course, our heroes were blissfully unaware of the danger that threatened them until the sharp-eyed squirrel suddenly remarked... Bullwinkle, these decorations aren't for the Bam Bams at all. They're not. No, sir. They're commemorating the 150th anniversary of the feud. The feud? You know, it's like a war between families. In Minnesota, we call that in-law trouble. No, look here. In memory of 150 years of bloodshed. Happy anniversary. Who's feuding? Says here it's the Hatfuls against the Floyds. Here's kind of a cute one, Rock. <laughs> There's no feud like an old feud. But our friends wouldn't have been so carefree if they had known that Peaceful Valley was in reality a kind of no man's land in the most ferocious feud ever feuded, uh, ever fought uh, or, uh... Try fit. <laughs> yes. Ever fit. While we're waiting, I'll take your picture, Bullwinkle. Okay. How's this pose? Great. Wait till I set the lens opening. Well, hurry up and shoot. I can't hold this all day. Let's see. F8 at 100th, or is it 150? Come on, shoot. What? I said shoot, shoot. No, that's what I call service. Bullwinkle, we're right in the middle of the feud. And what's more? What's more? I didn't get my picture took. We gotta get out of town, Bullwinkle. But we just got here. Yeah. I guess you're right. And our boys crawled under a hail of lead toward the outskirts of town. Right now, it, Caleb, didn't you hit them? Nope. Them fellers must have charmed lives. you think they was TV heroes. But just then, a messenger ran in. Hey, Pa, Pa. Speak up, Clive. Don't mumble. Uh, uh, the Floyds is shooting at them fellers, too. Well, then they must be on our side. Hold your fire. And at the same time, on the other side of the square... Hey, Ephraim, the half fools are shooting at those fellers, too. Then they must be on our side. Stop. Shooting. And so a deathly hush suddenly fell over Peaceful Valley. Couldn't you make it some other kind of hush? Now's our chance, Bullwinkle. We gotta make a dash for safety. And there it is now, Rock. The city limit. Careful, Bullwinkle. It may be a trap. A trap? Somebody may be hiding behind that sign. Nonsense. Who could hide behind that itty-bitty sign? We, we could. could. It's the hat. Didn't I see you fellers stuffed in a telephone booth one time? They're not on our side, Paul. Look at it. They ain't got no beards. But I'm growing a beard. When did you start? Just a minute ago. How about you? I'm a little young. Too bad we're feuding with the youngs, too. Take them away, Caleb. Why, too? Where else? Take them to Devil Dan Hatful himself. Oh, not Devil Dan. Couldn't we be easy on them and shoot him right here? Be with us next time when we'll see Devil Dan thinks it over or feud for thought. And if you happen to have a beard handy, Send it in! A young man should have three things, money, good looks, and a sense of humor, in that order. Alden Farquhar had the good looks and the sense of humor. Gosh, I'm handsome. <laughs> you see? See what I mean? But when it came to money, he was woefully lacking. Gosh, I'm poor. <laughs> ah, but money isn't everything. Alden was constantly besieged by a bevy of beautiful maidens, and he laughed easily at anything and everything. Ouch! <laughs> It was while he was strolling through the kingdom one day that his life took the wrong turn on the freeway, for up ahead, a dark figure was bent over pulling weeds, and pinned on the back of that dark figure was a sign that said, Kick me and get a surprise. Alden couldn't resist. He booted. Ow! Mother of pearl, I kicked a witch. You know what I do to young men who boot me? I cast a spell on them. But my name is Alden Farquhar. From this day on, you'll be as ugly as all get out. And you will remain ugly until the day that a fair maiden kisses you. <laughs> well, you couldn't get much more ugly than what Alden became. He was beastly looking. Oh, boy. Now what am I going to do? I lost my looks, my sense of humor. Ah, but that third commodity, the one he had always lacked, suddenly came his way. Oh, don't eat me, Ogre. Please don't eat me. What are you talking about? I just had lunch. If you don't eat me, Ogre, I will remunerate you. What does that mean? I'll give you money. Oh. 
And the poor, frightened man showered golden coins at Alden's beastly feet. By sundown, 43 passers-by had passed by Alden and donated to the cause. I'm rich. Now I can live in the manner to which I'm unaccustomed. The first thing on his list was an abode to dwell in. Yes, sir. Uh, that castle up on the hill, that's for sale. I'll, I'll tell you what, buddy. If, if you don't eat me, I'll let you have it for cheap. Well, uh, like for how cheap? Well, uh, how about for nothing? The price was right, so Alden moved in. Then he settled down to a life of luxury, and every hour on the hour he counted his money. Twenty-two million? It was the same old story. Whenever he wanted to bolster or replenish his monetary supply, he simply walked through the streets of a nearby village shouting, Yoo-hoo! It's me, Alden! I've come to eat you! Inside of a year, Alden was a millionaire ten times over. It was just about that time that the old witch whom Alden had kicked received a group of visitors. Ten beautiful maidens? What could you possibly want from me? Can you tell us what happened to Alden Farquhar? That name rang a bell. And sure enough, there on page 462 of her income tax report was the story of how she had changed Alden into a beast, which was deductible. Then the beast that lives in the castle is really our beloved Alden. Yes, and all you have to do is kiss him. That'll break the spell, and I'll no longer be able to claim him as a dependent. That evening, Alden sat before a fire, pasting thousand-dollar bills in a scrapbook, when suddenly... I have come to kiss you, Alden, and return you to your former handsome self. Then Alden realized that he would lose his livelihood if he were no longer a beast. Stop. Don't take another step. Let me take you away from all this. <laughs> he made faces guaranteed to frighten anyone, but the damsel was dedicated. He sought refuge in the castle basement. Kiss me, my fool. Off he went, seeking some place devoid of kissing females, but no matter in which room he ran, he always found a pucker damsel waiting. <laughs> Finally, on the castle roof... They've got me outnumbered, but they'll never find me up here. Let's play post office, Alden. How about spin the bottle? Halt and desist. Pursue me one step more, and I shall fling myself over the parapet. But, Alden, there's no water in the moat. Who cares? I can't swim anywhere. Well, we can't let you throw your life away. Then you'll leave me? We love you, Alden, but not enough to hurt you. Well, I'm glad you've come to your senses. Farewell. Farewell. Well, aren't you going to kiss us goodbye? Hmm. Yes, I suppose it's the least I can do. Ah, oh, the wiles of the female. What have I done? Or rather, what have you done? Thus Alden Farquhar once more became handsome. He also got back his sense of humor. <laughs> but the money ran out, and he also became penniless again. Yoo-hoo, it's me, Alden. I've come to eat you. As before, that call brought immediate response, only this time the villagers threw garbage, not money. I don't want to be handsome. I want to be ugly and rich. I want to be a beast again. And so, dear friends, if ever you're bending over pulling weeds and someone gives you a good solid pick, don't be too harsh on him. It may be Alden Farquhar. <laughs> How to be a top flight stock salesman. Well, I see here, conditions look very favorable for a upturn for Amalgamated Railroad. Okay, I buy it. But before I can safely recommend it, I owe it to my clients to inspect the equipment. Never mind, I'll buy it. Sir, I never sell a stock unless I am absolutely certain the value of the company is there. We have a stock I can stand behind 100%, Amalgamated Electronics. In fact, I can safely say this is the most attractive stock in electronics. What does it attract? Lightning. But wait kindly, sir. I can in good faith sell you Amalgamated Barrel Steve at 10 cents a share. I'll buy it. Oh, wonderful. It's already up to 50 cents. A dollar, five dollars, 30. 250! It's split! 4,000! 50,000! 200,000! I'm rich! I'm rich! Whoops! Back to five cents. Four, one, 
I'm sorry you're wiped out. You've lost everything you have. Well, only one thing to do. All these Wall Street traditions. Gee, Mr. Know-it-all, if one of your clients just jumped out the window of a tall building like this, how come you look so happy? I just remembered. Last week, I sold him amalgamated ambulance, and now it's sure to go up. Dog team, what most Canadians use in the winter and what some people call the Philadelphia Phillies. Here in the gold rush town of Skagway, dogs were used for other things beside teams. Take the annual sled pulling contest. All right, boys, the man who can get his pup to pull this heavy sled across the street wins $10,000. By nightfall, not one canine had been able to budge the sled. That's when a tall, dark mustache appeared with a man behind it. Yes, Snidely Whiplash Canada's Black Penny had turned up again. You in the contest, mister? No, but my dog is. Actually, it was a bull elephant, but Whiplash had taught it to scratch its ear, so no one knew the difference. All right, Spot, pull the sled. Unlike the others who yelled mush, Whiplash yelled... Sabu! And the contest was no contest. Snidely had the $10,000, and what's more, he and Spot returned to Skagway every year and continued their winning ways. Here's the $10,000, Mr. Whiplash. Hands up, the Spot hasn't pulled yet. Spot doesn't have to. No one's challenging. Of course, you can get away with something like that just so long, and then the mounted police are bound to hear about it. Did you hear about it, do right? Yes, Inspector, I, I heard about it. That's as far as it got until the following year. Citizens of Skagway, your climate is superb, your hospitality boundless. But as far as this sled pulling contest is concerned, Spot and I are fed up. How can you say that, Mr. Whiplash? In six different languages, but it all means the same. We are bored. We need some competition. And that's why an appeal was made to the Mounties. Send Do-Right in here. Do-Right is confined to barracks, sir. By whose orders? Do-Right's. Oh. Do-Right, come out of there. Take your dog up to Skagway and pull a sled across the street. No, to all three, sir. What do you mean, no to all three? My dog won't go up to Skagway, pull a sled across the street, or let me out of the barracks. Will you, dog? <laughs> Dudley's faithful dog, in reality a thoroughbred wolf, had turned on his master. He has a nasty disposition. Why don't you try muzzling him? I did, but he ate the muzzle. Then send him to a dog trainer. Same as the muzzle, sir. Roll over. Faithful dog obeyed his normal instinct. You certainly know how to handle animals, sir. There's only one way to handle a brute like that. Corporal Muggedugger, place Do-Right's dog under arrest. Before that afternoon, every man in the post had been driven into the barracks. Men, we have an odd situation on our hands. How's the foot, Muggedugger? The foot's okay, but I won't be going out for polo this year. Quick, Inspector. Nell is entering the post. Daddy, wherefore art thou, Daddy? Oh, she must have gone for her Shakespeare lesson again. Nell, Nell, darling. Where are you, Daddy? Nell, my dearest, beware of the dog, else he will tear you to ribbons. Too late. Faithful dog had spotted her. Ah, but Nell always carried a popcorn bag. She had the wolf eating out of her hands in no time. Well, Inspector, I guess we can follow those orders now. What orders were those? Don't you remember? No, do you? No. Why not take a vacation? A keen idea, sir. Faithful Dog and I shall journey up to Skagway and enter the sled-pulling race. Skagway? Dudley and his loyal companion made it to the bustling little gold rush town on the final day of competition. Mr. Whiplash and his dog Rover. Spot. Spot. I'm sorry. Anyway, they are the only ones to get the sled across the street. Now, before I hand over the 10,000, is there anyone else who'll try? Aye, Constable Do-Right of the Mounties will essay. Curses that numbskull might luck out. As a precautionary measure, Whiplash drove stakes into the earth and then roped the sled firmly to them. I don't care how strong his dog is, he'll never be able to move that sled. What Whiplash didn't know was that this was the earthquake season. Sure enough, a tremor began in the glacier regions and manifested itself directly on the street of Skagway. The entire gathering was catapulted to the opposite side of the road. But Dudley, Faithful Dog, and the sled got there first. A new world's record. Here's the money, Constable. 
And so you see, Inspector, my vacation was not in vain. No, it was in Skagway, wasn't it? With the prize money, I bought some gifts from Snidely Whiplash. A king-size pipe for you, sir. Wonderful. And a king-size monocle for you, Nell, for your bad eye. Oh, peachy. What about yourself, Dudley? For me? I bought a king-size dog. <laughs> Last time you remember, our heroes found themselves in the middle of an old Missouri feud between the Hatfuls and the Floyds. They were shot at by both sides, and when they tried to get out of town, were captured by a gang of Hatfuls. A Hatful of Hatfuls, you might say. If you were in a joking mood. Which we aren't. Now they're being taken before the leader of the Hatful clan, Devil Dan Hatful himself. <laughs> or you can take the easy way out and jump off in this here cliff. I think we'll see Mr. Dan instead. I was just trying to be helpful. Anything I don't trust, it's a... Helpful hustle, Hatful. I'm glad you said that. Why? I couldn't have. Where is this Devil Dan? Right through this here doorway. Sure enough, on the other side of the door, Devil Dan Hatful was... Say, you're not Devil Dan. You're... Carl Sanji, you varmint. Don't be for sneaking up on me daddy ways. But you're really... Really who, Flatlander? Really, uh... uh Devil Dan! Devil Dan! You better believe it, buddy. Who be that? It be Caleb, Devil Dan. I be bringing a couple of strangers. Who be ye bri be he ye Oh, boy, this cotton not dialect die like this stuff. Who be ye bringing? A moose and a squirrel. Moose and squirrel? Well, come in. And our heroes entered the shack to find themselves staring straight at the barrel of a long rifle. And what's worse, it's staring back. Are, are you Devil Dan? Couldn't you tell by the beard? Yeah, that's a real ugly mess of chin spinach, all right. Yeah, but that voice... I could swear. Better not, Rock. Well, it's been nice meeting you. Goodbye now. Goodbye? You mean you're going to stand us up against a wall outside and blast us? Of course not. No? I stand you against wall inside and blast you. Well, that's more like it. You're really going to do it? Of course. It's old mountain custom, you know. On top of old Smokey, you're covered with curls. I'm shooting with rifles at mooses and squirrels. With a one and a two and a... Oh, peace. The telephony machine. Devil Dan had pulled the mountain troubadour. I want to speak to that nincompoop, Boris Badenov. Nincompoop, nincompoop, who is this? Fearless leader, who's this? Nincompoop. Have you made contact with Moose and Squirrel yet? No, but I'm just about to. Remember, bad enough, they must be kept safe and sound until I arrive. Till you arrive? Jawohl. You didn't think I'd let you handle anything this big alone, did you? You mean I got to treat them, you pardon the expression, nice? Correct. And so when Boris turned to our heroes again... Okay, Mr. Hatful, we're ready. Never mind the blindfold. I'm nearsighted anyways. Todd, Todd, and dink my naps. Couldn't you fellas take a little mountain-type joke? Joke? Sure. See, the gun isn't even loaded. Now. And while our heroes ponder the sudden change in Devil Dan Hatful, many thousands of miles away, a sinister black missile is being raised to its launching pad. Beginning countdown, 30 seconds. Are you sure you want to make this trip, fearless leader? Of course, Professor. We mustn't leave bad enough alone a minute longer than we have to. Very well, but I didn't think you... You aren't supposed to think, Professor. Just get this thing off the ground, or else. Yes, fearless leader. Four, three, two, one. And with a roar, the sleek black missile zoomed upward. Its destination, a Rocky and Bullwinkle. Don't miss our next exciting episode, Calling Fearless Leader, or Whistle for the Missile. Well, I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A uh, bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first... Here are some of the people who made this show impossible. That's not all. The fingers get
you tired. of Ruffy and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. Our heroes are all tangled up in another plot. This one has to do with a feud between the Hatfuls and the Floyds. They've been captured by the leader of one of the clans, Devil Dan Hatful. Who looks remarkably like Boris Bedinov. The disguised Boris got a shock when a telephone call from fearless leader told him to keep our heroes safe and sound until he arrived. That's why we find the boys having lunch with their worst enemy. Have some more chicken. Plenty more where that came from. Yeah, where'd it come from? From an egg. No, from neighbor's chicken coop. But a few thousand miles away from this love feast, fearless leader was preparing to make the trip to Peaceful Valley in the fastest way possible by rocket. We mustn't leave bad enough in charge too long. Fire one. But fearless leader, I think... Don't think, just do what I tell you. Well, you're the boss. You're so right. And in a moment, the sleek black vessel was zooming skyward. Professor, it was a successful shot. Perfect, perfect. He's in orbit right now. In orbit? But that means he can't get down. It was true. The missile had gone into orbit and was circling the Earth at tremendous speed. Professor, what were you thinking of? Nothing. Fearless leader told me not to. Come along. But I obeyed orders of fearless leader. Congratulations. You will be the most loyal Potsylvanian we ever executed. But let's draw the curtain on this painful scene and... Return to Peaceful Valley, where Devil Dan is growing impatient. Also, whiskers. If you'll excuse me a second, I got to go slap the hogs. Gee, he's a peach. Well, I think he's a double cross and crooked killer. Yeah, but for a double cross and crooked killer, he's a peach. Meanwhile, in the other room... Boris, why you're beating your head against the wall? I'm not used to being nice to people. I got to hurt somebody. But why yourself? I was handy. But at that moment, Boris heard a familiar voice. Let me down from this contraption or I'll have the head of every man, woman, and child in the country. Natasha, did you hear what I hear? I hope not. Bullwinkle, did you see what I saw? No, my antlers don't fit through the window. Come on outside, Bullwinkle. Here it comes again. Yes, the missile containing Fearless Leader was orbiting over Peaceful Valley every few minutes. Said, right from here, the road from border to border and coast to coast, and you're going to be among the Bullwinkle, that's an orbiting satellite. Looks more like a feller in a rocket. It was, and he's stuck up there. Hmm? He'll keep going on forever. Well, maybe he likes to travel. Yeah, but he may starve up there. Well, that's different. Let's get a big cannon. You're not gonna shoot him down. Nope, I'm gonna shoot a chicken leg up to him. What? Sort of a guided drumstick. Well, I got a better idea. You usually do. I'm gonna fly up there and stop that missile. That's a better idea. Just a short distance away in a cold, clammy duck blind. Look, something's coming over now, Clem. I'll shoot it, Harlow. 
Sure don't look much like a duck. What do you mean? Ain't got no wings, got no feathers, and it's 50 feet long. But on the other hand... What? It's the first thing that's flew over today. You're right, Clem. Oh, better, you clumsy fools. I'll have you drawn in quarters. You know something, Clem. What's that, Harlow? Didn't sound like a duck, neither. Meanwhile, back at the shack... Ready, Bullwinkle? As ever! Ellie! Oop! And the plucky squirrel hurtled high into the air just as the missile came into view once again. But fearless leader, thinking Rocky was an American anti-missile missile, began to unlimber a fearsome weapon. Yeah, boy, this is my anti-anti-missile missile missile. Oh, boy, watch next time for Rocky Takes the High Road or Missile in the Thistle. that jolly juggler, Bullwinkle. Oh, dear. Three at once. One, two. And now here's a feature you're sure to like. Three. This is the way the story of Little Fred Riding Hood begins. Little Fred Riding Hood lived in a little woods in a little house with his little mother. As a lad, it could not be said that he was good looking. Nor very smart, for he could only count up to one. Um, one? And he did that badly. But the one thing that could be said about Little Fred Riding Hood was that he had a beautiful voice and could sing like a bird. La, 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 la. And one morning, his mother said to him, Freddy, dear. Yes, Ma? If you don't stop that off-key singing around the house, I'm gonna lay into you with this broom. But, Ma, Granny spent a fortune giving me singing lessons. Yes, I know she didn't. I think it's high time we got even with her. Now, here, take this basket of sheet music and go through the woods to Granny's house. Sing to her for a change and see how she likes it. And so, taking the basket, little Fred Riding Hood skipped merrily off into the woods. Skipping is a very hard way to travel, and Fred was out of condition anyway, so a short time later, he stopped to rest. I will take five by this hollow stump. But no sooner did Fred sit down than he heard an awful commotion within that stump. Oh, ow, ouch, 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 ouch. ouch. And there were two funny little men with high-pointed hats, and their long gray beards were tied firmly together. What are you two doing in there? We live in here. But our beards have become tangled, and I fear we'll have to go through life looking each other in the eye. Can you help us? Well, being a good lad, Fred agreed to try. Hold tight. I'll rip you apart. Will it hurt? <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Bidding them farewell, little Fred Riding Hood continued on his way to Granny's house. Oh, he was a good boy. I think we ought to reward him for being so kind to us. Good idea. Let's cast a spell that'll make him grow more handsome every minute. And so they did, and so he did. For unknown to Fred, with every step he took, he became better looking, better looking, and better looking until he was by far the handsomest man in the country. Ooh, what a handsome lad! How good looking! Yeah, he's beautiful! Hi, sweetie! What's the matter? You all nuts or something? But looking at his reflection in a meat market window, he saw that it was true. He was good looking. Well, <laughs> if that don't punch a hole in the boat. The young ladies of the city were unable to control themselves at the sight of little Fred Handsome Riding Hood, and the poor lad was mocked. <laughs> you two funny little men are pretty funny. Now, come on, make me unhandsome so I can get to Granny's. As this was his desire, they changed him back to plain old Fred. That's better. Now, I'll give you my lunch of cookie sandwiches to keep you busy. No more tricks now. And with that, Fred once more set off down the road for Granny's house. Wasn't that sweet of him to give us his lunch? It certainly was. Let's reward him. He looks awful thin. Let's cast a spell that will fatten him up. They did. And just as before, with every step little Fred Riding Hood took, he grew fatter, fatter, and fatter, until he weighed over 700 pounds. Needless to say that when he stepped onto the high bridge that crossed the river, it collapsed with a roar. They did it again. And Fred waddled back to the hollow stump as fast as his obese little legs could carry him. All right, you guys. Come knock it off. Hmm. 
He did get a little fatter than we figured. So be it. And Fred was returned to normal. Why do you two keep casting spells on to me? Because each time we've met, you have done a good deed for us. And that is our way of rewarding you. Some reward? Yeah. <laughs> It was now growing quite late, and Fred hurried off down the road, but this time he ducked behind a large tree a short distance away and waited until he was sure the two funny little men were fast asleep. I've got to do something to make them mad so they'll stop rewarding me, or I'll never get to Granny's. Knowing that the little men were very proud of their long gray beards, Fred stole up to the hollow stump, and with a snip of his scout knife, he cut them off. What happened? Someone cut off our beard. Who would do such a thing? I would do such a thing, and I did. So long, fellas. What a crazy kid, huh? Uh, what are you looking at? You. You're a... You're a girl. Uh, what are you looking at? You. You're a girl, too. How do you like that? We're a couple of little witches. And to think we'd never have known if that nice boy hadn't cut off our beards. We should reward him. That's a good idea. We'll cast a spell that will make a gold coin drop out of his mouth every time he opens it. And they did, so that when little Fred Riding Hood finally reached Granny's house and opened his mouth to sing, instead of a lovely song, a gold coin dropped out of his mouth. Then another, and another, and another. And he paid off happily ever after. Which you have probably already guessed is the way the story of Little Fred Riding Hood ends. Hi, poetry people. Today's poem is the saga of a singing waiter, Tommy Tucker. That's me. Little Tommy Tucker sings for his supper. What shall he have? Brown bread and butter. How shall he... Waiter? Sir? Uh, how's the Irish stew tonight? Oh, the taters are old and the meat is a fright. Everything is left over from Saturday night. We sweep it all up, put it into a pot, and tell you it's real Irish stew that we got. Uh, what about the chicken liver? Way down the farm, the small me river. Far, far away, two, three, four. There they embalm our chicken liver, and that's what you get today. Uh, maybe I'll just have salad with Russian dressing. Russian dressing? Tomatoes, beets, and ketchup. We used to make it red. Just put it on your salad, and you'll wish that you were dead. Hey! Oops. Tommy Tucker, I got something for you. What is it, boss? My brown bread and butter? No. This. How about that? Five minutes on the job, and already I got a raise. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But... See? <laughs> Nothing up must leave. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. And now it's time to meet Mr. Peabody. <laughs> There, Peabody, Sherman, and Wayback here. He's Mr. Peabody. He's Sherman, and if the Wayback could talk, it would tell you that it's uh, the Wayback. Today, Sherman and I are going to explore the five senses. You mean like taste, smell? Uh, no, 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 Sherman. The five senses as in nickel, specifically the Indian head nickel, and we shall be on hand to help in the engraving of the first coin of that kind. The year? 1869. The place. The plains of Wyoming. We entered the Wayback machine and were promptly transported to our destination, and there, standing behind his easel, stood the noted artist and engraver, Talbot Heffelfinger. Hi, Mr. Heffelfinger. How's the Indian head coming? See for yourself, son. You can imagine our surprise when we saw an excellent likeness of Mahatma Gandhi. That's wrong, Mr. Heffelfinger. He's an Indian, isn't he? Well, yes, but the wrong variety. Look, I've been commissioned by the government to paint a picture of an Indian head, and so far the only one I've seen was a fellow named Tonto who was on his way to Hollywood. Mr. Peabody can find an Indian for you to paint, can't you, Mr. Peabody? As usual, Sherman's faith in me was justified. We packed up Talbot Heffelfinger's equipment and adjourned to the nearest fort. I'd like to help you, but there ain't no Indians around here. Oh, yes, there are, and I'll show you how we can meet one. I built a small fire, borrowed an army blanket, and proceeded to send a column of smoke into the sky. I tell you, you're wasting your time. I never waste my time. Suddenly, the silence of the vast plains was split with the cries of war hoops. Indians! We're being attacked! Indeed, 
we were, but by one lone brave. I don't get it. How'd you force that engine into attacking us? The smoke signal. There in the sky, directly over the fort, were the words, Custer won. I knew that would make any Indian mad. All right, Mr. Heffelfinger, go out and ask him to pose. Unfortunately, however, this was to be a still life portrait, and the Indian was anything but still. I've got it! I've got it! All he got was the tail end of a horse. That isn't good enough? Hardly. Gee, Mr. Peabody, he'll never be able to paint with a horse running around like that. How can we get the horse to stop? Well, that's simple, Sherman. Just say, whoa. Whoa! <coughs> but although the horse desisted, the Indian didn't. Too bad there isn't something to make a human stop. Ah, but there is. In a matter of minutes, I had constructed a stoplight. <coughs> now, Mr. Heffelfinger, paint your subject. The highly elated artist threw himself into his work and one hour later returned with the finished product. It's the best thing I've ever done. It was quite good. That is, if you care for stoplights. You didn't paint the Indian. Indian? There was no other course but to try it over again, but by this time the Indian had tired of the attack. He's gone. But not forgotten. Sure enough, there were moccasin prints leading off into the wilderness. I think I'll just mail him the picture of Mahatma Gandhi and forget it. I'm afraid that won't do, Talbot. With me leading the way, naturally, the hunt was on. Shortly before sundown, we reached an embankment overlooking an Indian village. Indians! Hundreds and hundreds of Indians! Please, please, Mr. Heffelfinger, restrain yourself, or you'll get us <coughs> captured. You same pale face who try paint on my picture, you beginning to bug me. Uh, yes, but, Chief, your picture will be on every nickel in the United States. And in Canada, too. Tell them you what. You beat him strongest warrior in village, you get him paint my picture. I'll do it. Who is your strongest warrior? Standing Bear. He was standing all right, and he was a bear. Well, I, I can't fight a real bear. Of course you can, Talbot. Do as I say, and you're sure to win. And with that, the valiant artist entered into the fray. He was obviously outclassed. Uh, what now, Peabody? Uh, make it two out of three. Uh, make it three out of five. Five out of seven. Now make it seventy-five thousand out of four million two hundred ninety-eight. I can't do it. I can't go on any longer. You won't have to, sir. Look at your adversary. He won, Mr. Peabody. He didn't win me, Sherman. He won the fight. Curious thing about bears, after fighting one or two days, they seem to lose their stamina. Talbot Heffelfinger, on the other hand, was full of vim and vigor and proceeded to paint the head of the Indian chief. He's a chief, Mr. Peabody? Why, yes, the most famous of all the Hanka Indians. Don't tell me you've never heard of the Hankas. Oh, I've heard of them all right, but I never heard of him. You've never heard of Hanka, Chief? Well, last time, Bullwinkle had tossed Rocky high into the air in a desperate attempt to intercept the misguided missile which was carrying, of all people, fearless leader himself. But the evil-minded villain thought Rocky was an American anti-missile missile and so began to assemble his secret weapon, an anti-anti-missile missile missile. Let's see. Put tab C in slot A, bend flap G. Donovetta, this is the last secret weapon I ever got out of a cereal box. But the plucky squirrel, unaware of his danger, caught up with the speeding satellite and tried to slow it down. Boris, that is our fearless leader up there. You were expecting Werner von Braun? Oh, I hope he gets down all right. Me too, because if he doesn't get down, I'll be the fearless leader and I... Oh, boy! Boris, where are you going? I got to stop that squirrel. He's ruining my career. And Boris, anxious for promotion, dashed out of the house. If I can just keep fearless leader orbiting from now on, I get to wear monocle. High above, Rocky was pushing against the nose cone, trying to slow it down, but to no avail. And inside, fearless leader had finished assembling his anti-anti-missile-missile-missile -missile -missile and was aiming it directly at the unwitting squirrel. Fortunately, at that moment, Rocky happened to spot an old lady far below him who was trying to cross the street. Of course, for a real live
big TV hero, helping old ladies across the street comes before anything else in the world. So Rocky left his post just as Phyllis Leader pulled the trigger. Of course, he missed. But the recoil was enough to stop the forward motion of the satellite. And can any of you guess what that meant? Any Pennsylvanian school child could tell you. When the progressive inertial momentum of an orbiting vehicle is diminished, the gravitational declination increases as pi times the quantity V over H. Which means? I fall down. And indeed, the missile dropped like a stone. Meanwhile, Rocky had just finished helping the old lady across the street. Is this where you want to go, ma'am? You said it. I mean, yes, indeed, you do the deedy, little fellow. You sure got a deep voice for an old lady. I know. I've been feeling low for days. Oh, I'm sorry. You sure this is where you want to go? Believe me, I'm in exactly the right spot. And he was. Hokey smoke! We lose more old ladies that way. But to Rocky's surprise, when the door of the wrecked satellite opened, <gasps> who should come out but Devil Dan Hatful, followed closely by a sinister figure wearing a monocle. You know, I don't think that Devil Dan is ever going to stop feuding. Maybe we ought to go see the head of the other family. You mean Felonius Floyd? Yeah, maybe he'll stop the feud. Meanwhile, inside Devil Dan's shack... So, you were trying to get rid of me, eh, Badenov? Who, me, dear old boss man? Stop drooling on my insteps, Badenov. Me, trying to get rid of you, dear old chiefy boy? <laughs> I wouldn't dream of such a thing. Then take off that monocle! Now that I have arrived, we proceed with part two of my plan. You have moose and squirrel here? Of course, fearless leader. Where? Right there. Ooh, they were here a second ago. Boris, darling, there they go. Quick, bring them back here, Baranov. Dead or alive? I got a choice. And so it was that as our heroes were hurrying for the cabin of Felonius Floy, they suddenly heard an ominous sound. <laughs> Bowwinkle, those are bloodhounds. They picked up your scent. You know what that means? It means I got a hole in my pocket. And the great dogs came nearer and nearer, followed by Boris Baranov, who was loaded for bear. Or moose, as the case may be. Be sure to be with us next time for dollars and cents or putting on the dog. Well, I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Ruffy and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel, and his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started.
Let's see if we can make head or tail of our story so far. Chapter one, Bullwinkle was invited to a convention of the Missouri Moose, uh, uh, Mooses, uh, Meese. Uh, Meese. Thank you. Chapter two, when he and Rocky arrived, they found themselves in the middle of a feud between the Hatfuls and the Floys. <laughs> Sort of skip over this part. Chapter three, they were seized by the Hatfuls. Very painful, too. And taken to the head of the clan, Devil Dan Hatful, who looked a lot like you know who. Say the name. The Boris Badanov. You're sorry. And in chapter four, Boris's superior, fearless leader himself, showed up just as our heroes made their getaway. Huh. Everybody understand now? Yes. yes. Then explain it to me. But little or no explanation was needed when Rocky heard a mournful sound behind them. Uh oh, that sounds like trouble. And he's got a bad cold too. Bullwinkle, those are bloodhounds. But just then, the sharp-eyed squirrel saw a tiny house ahead with a sign in front that said, "Felonious Floy, revenuers and Republicans keep out." Bullwinkle, this is Felonious Floy's house. I heard the man rock. Well, maybe he can stop this terrible feud. And our heroes dashed up to the door. Who's there? Bullwinkle, that voice. Do you think... Not very often. Why? But just then, the door swung open. What will it be, strangers? You're felonious, Floy. Don't I look like felonious, Floy? You look more like a dry mop. We were running away from Devil Dan Hatful. Yeah, and come to think of it, you look an awful lot like him. Actually, we're cousins twice removed. Twice removed? Once to Sing Sing, once to Alcatraz. I don't like this a bit, Bullwinkle. I agree. He must have terrible writers. Um, sorry to have troubled you, Mr. Floyd, but uh, we better be going. It's all right. Drop in any time. Like when? Like right now. And as Boris pulled the lever... An instant later, the bloodhound showed up, dragging fearless leader with them. Welcome, old boss man, body boy. Bad enough. You are on both sides of the feud? Certainly. This way, I'm a hatful. This way, I'm a floy. Congratulations, bad enough. You win the Pottsylvania two-faced medal for double dealing. Oh, boy, that makes 94 medals. Wunderschön. Six more and I can trade them in for a second-hand yo-yo. Bad enough, you're a lucky, lucky spy. Meanwhile, our heroes were lying stunned in a vegetable cellar underneath the house. Where? Where am I? In a vegetable cellar. Didn't you hear the man? What? Speak up. You got carrots in your ears. What? I said you got carrots in your ears. I can't hear a thing. I got these carrots in my ears. But carrots in the ears was the least of Bullwinkle's problems. For at that moment, the house was being surrounded by hateful hatfuls. Mighty nice of them strangers to lead us right to the floor house. What are we fixing to do, Hadley? We're going to use little old Orvy on them. Oh, oh no. no. Not, Not little Orvy. I'm as mean as they come, Hadley, but that's gone a little too far. Newt, this is no time to get the collie wobbles. Bring up little Orvy. And with Hadley Hatful directing them, the clan wheeled up little Orvy, an enormous muzzle-loading Civil War cannon. What do we load it with, Hadley? Anything that's handy. And so the Hatfuls filled little Orvy with scrap iron, broken bottles, old shoes, red pepper, and carpet tack. I'll drop in this anvil just to give it a little body. In the short while, little Orvy was ready to be fired. The fuse was lit, the hatful scurried for cover, and then as the fuse burned its last quarter inch, Bullwinkle Moose stuck his head up out of the root cellar directly in front of the muzzle. Don't miss our next episode. One of our meese is missing, or heads you lose. <laughs> Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Button up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> no doubt about it. I gotta get another hat. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. So long, Pop. Where you off to, Junior? There's a circus going on at the Coliseum. Well, in your present position, you'll never get there to see it. What makes you say that, Pop? Well, look at you. Oh, my gosh. I put the pony in back of the chariot. That's what is known as putting the cart before the horse. And while you're getting straightened out, I'll relate a fable illustrating that adage. But, Pop, I'll miss the circus. No, you won't. I'll make it short. This is the story of the three bears. I've heard that one. Charlie Bear and his wife, Edna, lived in a modest little home on the edge of the forest. 
One day after taking in a movie, they returned to their abode and made a rather startling discovery. Hey, somebody's been eating my borscht. And somebody's been eating my borscht. I've heard this story, Pop. Quiet. Further investigation of the living room brought out another remarkable fact. Hey, somebody's been sitting in my Danish Type Chase lounge. Somebody's been sitting in my Danish Type Chase lounge, too. The mystery increased as they entered the upstairs bedroom. Pop. Hey, somebody's been sleeping in our Chinese modern Hollywood bed. Somebody is sleeping in our Chinese modern Hollywood bed. That someone turned out to be their rich Uncle Fabian. You heard this one before, Junior? Uh-uh. Uncle Fabian, what a pleasant surprise. Bah! You're only glad to see me because I'm rich. Oh, tut, 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 what a vile thought. Let me hold your wallet for you, dear Uncle Fabian, sir. I'll give you a wallet right on the head. Later that evening, over dinner, a surprise announcement was made. I have decided to put you two in my will. Oh, what a sweet thing to do. It sure is. Let me hold your wallet, huh? Uh, there's only one catch. All my life, you know, I've been grumpy and irritable. Oh, you've noticed that, have you? Well, before I go to bear heaven, I want to be happy. Well, Charlie can make you happy, can't you, Charlie? Sure can. Let me hold your wallet. Early the next morning, Charlie attempted to make his uncle happy. First of all, he took him to the edge of the cliff. Look at that view, Uncle Fabian. Doesn't that make you want to smile? Bah! And Uncle Fabian pushed Charlie over the cliff. Well, did you boys have fun today? I did, but Uncle Fabian didn't. Uh, I decided not to put you two in my will. Oh, you can't do that, Uncle Fabian. Why oh, of course not. Let me hold your wallet, huh? I'll tell you what. You've got all day tomorrow to make me happy. If you fail miserably, no legacy. The next morning rolled around, as mornings usually do. Now, this here is a golf club, Uncle Fabian, and that there is a golf ball. Now, you hit the ball with the club. Charlie fully expected that he would get hit instead of the ball, but incredibly enough. A hole in one! Oh, doesn't that make you happy? That's when Uncle Fabian took out his number two iron and beat his nephew unmercifully about paying. How's the head feel? Which one? Guess we're gonna finish out of the money, huh? Looks like, babe. Charles? Yes, Uncle Ebenezer. I mean, Uncle, Uncle Fabian. You almost made me happy today. Let's play golf again tomorrow. If you say so, Uncle Fabian. Oh, and, um, see what you can do about keeping the other golfers off the course. I want you and me to play alone. It was a strange request and not an easy one to fulfill. I'm sorry, Charlie, but I can't stop the other golfers from playing. In desperation, Charlie sought the services of an old owl who lived in a cave. Uh, you see this statue of a heart? And place it in front of the first tee and never look at it again. I guarantee you and your rich Uncle Fabian will have the cause to yourself. Hey, that's great, Owl. How much do I owe you? Eight cents. We got a special on statues of hearts this week. Charlie wasted no time in rushing to the first tee and placing the statue where the Owl had directed. The following morning, golfers from all over the land signed up to play golf, but ran into trouble. For on their way to the first tee, they casually glanced at the heart and were immediately frozen to the spot. Meanwhile, back at Charlie and Edna's house... No borscht for breakfast, Charlie? Oh, I ain't got time, Edna. Me and Uncle Fabian are due at the golf course. Well, you better hurry. Uncle Fabian left an hour ago. Oh, no! He doesn't know about the heart! Charlie dashed hell-mell through the streets and got to the course in record time. There, his worst fears were confirmed, for standing like a block of ice in front of the statue was Uncle Fabian. To make matters worse, Charlie, too, looked at the statue, and he, too, froze solid. Uncle Fabian was never to be happy, and Charlie and Edna remained penniless. And so, you see, son, never put the cart before the horse. I get you, Pop. Only there's a better way of saying it. Oh? Yeah. Never put the heart before the course. Never put the... Uh, let's go see that circus, Junior. Hi there. Today's poem is all about my grandfather's clock. Sure is a big one. Yep. My grandfather's clock was too large for the shelf, so it stood 90 years on the floor. How come it's not running? 
the sea it says always is treasure and pride it stopped short never to go again when the old moose died your grandfather's dead bullwinkle well exactly he just sort of disappeared but that doesn't rhyme so good and the clock hasn't run all these years huh what do you mean all these years he disappeared yesterday yesterday and the clock stopped hey you spoke uh oh let me open her up <coughs> Grandpa, it's you! You're expecting maybe John Cameron and Swayze? Well, if that don't beat all, how could anybody be so stupid as to get locked up in a clock? Stupid? Why, it's easy. Like this. Oh! Now there's something you don't see every day, Rocky. What's that, Grandpa? A clock with a face on both sides. Private Bullwinkle, sir, with a message. Just in time. Is it important? Is it? Just look. Hello out there, Peabody in here. Anything wrong with the Wayback Machine, Mr. Peabody? Merely changing the fan belt, Sherman. I guess we won't be going back into history then, huh? Oh, on the contrary, my boy, we're all set to invade the city of Paris in the year 1874. Who are we going to meet? The eminent French author, Jules Verne. I belted the fan belt into place, and in a twinkling, we were hurtled back through time and space. The streets of Paris in those days were filled with horse-drawn carriages. Most of them moved along in sprightly fashion, but one was obviously getting nowhere. Giddy up, Monsieur Hurst! That poor man is having trouble, Mr. Peabody. That poor man, Sherman, is Jules Verne. If you do not make me defeat, I shall be forced to deposit you in the nearest glue factory. Uh, trying to go somewhere, Monsieur Verne? You bet your boots, Monsieur. I am off to prove a theory. Chateau theory, Mr. Verne? Men or little one. I am trying to prove that one can go around the world in 80 days. <laughs> if it can be done, then I, I shall write a book about it. It's got to be done, Mr. Peabody. And it shall be done, Sherman, but not in a horse-drawn carriage. Under my direction, we walk to the nearest office of the French Foreign Legion. Bonjour, monsieur. You wish to enlist? Yes, but only if we can do duty in Switzerland. You are in luck, my friend. It just so happened that a detachment of legionnaires is being dispatched to the Alps to fight the Swiss Navy. By the way... How old is this little fellow? Six. Going on seven, though. Bone, you just get in under the edge limit. Five minutes later, we were on our way. But if we are in the Legion, how will we go around the world? We won't be in the Legion long, Monsieur Verne. And we weren't. For no sooner did we arrive in the Alps, the door was called off and we were dismissed from the service. Well, we got as far as Switzerland. Now what, Mr. Peabody? That flag over there, Sherman. Recognize it? The Olympics! Correct! Overriding Jules Verne's objections, we signed up for the downhill slalom run, the most thrilling of all skiing events. But I cannot ski! No matter, it's downhill all the way. The starter fired the gun, and the three of us took off. Three days later, we came to a stop in Venice, Italy. Can we get some pizza, Mr. Peabody? No time for that, Sherman. We have a schedule to adhere to. Our next stop, China. But how do we get there from here? Simple. We obtained positions as gondoliers and oared our way to the corner of 3rd and Venice. Luckily, the tide was ebb and we were carried out to sea. Seven days we have been adrift without food or water. You think we have it bad? What about our passengers? Hey, what's the matter for you? I'm telling my wife I bring home a spaghetti. You'll have to cable her that you'll bring home chop suey and lychee nuts instead. Land ho! I must congratulate you, Mr. Peabody. You have got us all the way to China, but I'm afraid we are stuck here. Mr. Vern is right. How are we going to get across the Pacific? To anyone but a genius, the problem would have been insurmountable. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. When in Shanghai, get shanghai <laughs> It was a beautiful crossing. Sherman worked as a cabin boy, Jules Verne wrote the captain's log for him, and I worked like a dog swabbing decks. With just 20 days left, we pulled into San Francisco Harbor and checked into the Golden Gate Gym. Do they have rooms for the night here? No, no, we're here seeking employment. See that sign? Wanted. Sparring partner for John L. Sullivan, leaving for New York tonight. What is a sparring partner? Jules Verne found out. It was a rough trip, to say the least. But eventually, we reached New York, none the worse for the experience. That is, except for Mr. Verne. I cannot take much more of this. How many days left? Exactly one. But gee, Mr. Peabody, it's impossible to go from New York to Paris in one day. Nothing is impossible. 
I wasted no time in rushing us to the shores of the Hudson River. Look, a rowing race is about to start. Yes, but not without us. I knew that Yale had the fastest shell in the country and were heavily favored to defeat all competition. It was in this boat that we sat ourselves. Just a moment, you guys can't sit here. Oh, no, how would it look if you threw away your mascot? The Yale mascot is a bulldog. Young man, there's a bit of bulldog in all of us. The race was fairly flew down the Hudson. That's when I took over as coxswain. Stroke, 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 stroke. 24 hours later, we rowed up the River Seine and walked ashore into the streets of Paris. We did it. We went around the world in 80 days. Boom, now I can go home and write the book. Jules Verne did write the book and earned the plaudits not only of France, but of England as well. In fact, they put him on display in the Tower of London. Really? Really. Day after day, he stood there with a crowd on his head. In the Tower of London, Mr. Peabody? Why, of course, Sherman. That's where they always keep the crown jewels. <laughs> Last time, we met Little Orvi, a huge Civil War cannon, which is now being used as a siege gun in the feud between the Hatfuls and the Floys. Little do the hateful Hatfuls know that there isn't a Floy within miles, for the only people in the house are Fearless Leader and our old nemesis, Boris Badanov, who has merely disguised himself as Felonious Floy. Or Devil then Hatful, as the case may be. But the two villains are unaware of the presence of Little Orvi, as Boris says. I don't want to pry, fearless leader, old superior baby boy, but how come I got to wear this thin fuzz and talk with Kornpon accent? Because at last, Pennsylvania is close to having the ultimate weapon with which we can rule the world. Sounds yummy. What is it? I have here a special high-level, top-secret, confidential sketch of the ultimate weapon. Can you be trusted, Badenov? Can I be trusted? I swear it! Then uncross your fingers! <laughs> Force of habit, boss man. Very well. Here is the <coughs> ultimate weapon. That's a weapon? That's the weapon. But that's just a derby hat! Not just a derby hat, Badenov. This is the Kerwood Derby. <laughs> The Curver Derby? Quiet, you fool! The Curver Derby? Yavol! And fearless leader told Boris the legend of the fabulous bowler. The Kerwood Derby had first been owned by a cave dweller many eons ago who put it on and said... Pardon me, my dear. I've got something to do. Like what? I'm going to invent the wheel. And he did. Later on, it was owned by a man named Aristotle who one day in his bath cried... Eureka! I have found it! You found Aristotle's law of displacement and specific gravity? No, you idiot. I found the soap. The Kerwood Derby was won by Philip of Macedonia when he conquered the world, and by Genghis Khan when he conquered the world, and by Julius Caesar when he conquered the world, and by Elvis Presley when he... Oh, never mind. It disappeared for a time, but its last known owner was a Princeton College professor who put it on and said... Of course, E equals MC squared. Why didn't I think of that before? Yes, the Kerwood Derby turns anyone who wears it into the smartest man in the world. So if we get Derby... I wear it. ...in Pennsylvania outsmarts everybody in the world. Correct. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go get it. There's just one little hitch. Uh -oh. It takes somebody special to find the Kerwood Derby. That's me, boss man. Somebody with a built-in talent. That's me. He must be the stupidest bubblehead in the world. That's me, Dick. Who that? This is who that. But that's Moose, that idiotic Moose Boo Winkle. Right, he is the dumbest creature in the world, so he is the only one who can lead us to the Kerwood Derby. That means he's, he's worth millions to us. Billions? Where is he, bad enough? He's right in the cellar, fearless leader. Then who is that about to get his head blown off? Yes, right outside the window, Bullwinkle had poked his head out of the root cellar, right in front of the gaping muzzle of little Orvi. If the moose dies, our plan dies. How about that? And if the plan dies, Potsylvania dies. How about that? And if Potsylvania dies, you die. How about that? And Boris grabbed a club, leaned out of the window, and swung hard at Bullwinkle's head, just as little Orvi went off with a roar. <laughs> When the smoke cleared, nothing was to be seen of the house or the villains or of our heroes either. Is this the end of everything? Nope, just this episode. Be with us next time for Bullwinkle Makes His Bid or Going, Going, Gun. <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky 
show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say. A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Ruffy and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. In our last episode, the hateful Hatfuls had just fired a cannon named Little Orby at the house belonging to Polonius Floyd. Now, if you've been watching that episode, you would have known the whole plot. But as it is, let's go back a little so you can catch up. Be careful, mister. This air's mighty hard on a cannon gun. Inside the house, before the cannon went off, Fearless Leader had just explained the whole foul plot to Boris Badanov, alias Devil Dan Hatful. Alias Felonius Floyd. What, you're the head of both families? Sure. But that way you can't possibly win. I always look on the bright side. Hmm? I can't possibly lose either. Achtung, Badenov! Yes, fearless leader. This is what we are after. A derby hat? But it wasn't just a derby hat. This was the legendary Kerwood Derby, whose wearer became the smartest man in the world. The Kerwood Derby had been worn by all the brilliant thinkers of history, men like Sir Isaac Newton. Say, that apple bashed my bowler. That proves the theory of gravitation. It had been worn by Galileo. Well, we all know the sun, she goes around the earth. Just like... Hey, what am I talk? The earth, she goes around the sun. And now Phyllis Leader was hot on the trail of the Kerwood Derby. There was only one hitch. It had to be found by the stupidest creature alive. You cold? Bad enough. The moose is right in front of that cannon. So Boris grabbed a club, smashed Bullwinkle, and drove him down into the cellar just as the gun went off. <clears throat> I say, just as the gun went off. All right, what's the matter? Little Harvey gets temperamental sometimes. Well, we can't go on with our story till it goes off again. Now keep your hair on, stranger. Zeke here will find the trouble. Go on, Zeke. Oh, here it is. The fuse isn't all the way in like it... And that's where we wound up last time. The gun fired. Me and Rocky still in the cellar.
and us up a tree. In the next county. Devil Dan, what be you doing here? I be keeping an eye on you, Ephraim. I'm Zeke. Don't argue about details. Mosey on back to next county and bring me that moose. Right. And Ephraim. Zeke. Bring back doctor, too. You bet. He'll have you cured the glanders in no time. Glanders? That is a disease of horses. Yep. That's the kind of doctor we got, too. But we got busted backs and sprained ankles. That may be what you got, but I know what he'll cure you of. Glanders. Glanders. Oh, boy. He's also good on split fetlocks and... Get out of here! Meanwhile, back at the root cellar... Is the coast clear, Bullwinkle? I can't see quite that far, Rock, but there's nothing around closer to hand. Good. Let's get out of here. Aren't we going to see Mr. Floyd? No, sir. I don't think we'll ever get those two families to stop feuding, Bullwinkle. And besides, he's gone. You mean he's not in his house? He may be, but it's gone, too. And our heroes dashed off. You know, I wonder whatever happened to that Missouri Meese convention. I, I think that convention was just a bit of jiggery pokery. They all are, but only after the business meetings are over. <laughs> Pretty good, Rock. I, I said, Rock? Rocky, where are you? Oh, my saint at Aunt Agnes. Rocky has disappeared. Well, now they've gone too far. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to... I'm going to disappear, too. <laughs> Be sure to see our next episode, The Vanishing American, or No Moose is Good Moose. And now it's time for... Time for the dancing fool, Bullwinkle. Again? And now for one of our special fairy tales. Yeah. Quite some time ago, a young bear, upon reaching his 21st birthday, said to his mother... Uh, I think uh, I'll take a walk in the rain. You go out in your bare feet and you'll catch cold. But he paid his mother no heed and took a three-hour constitutional in what amounted to a torrential downpour. Oddly enough, he didn't catch cold, but he did contract a severe case of up-and-down fever, which ran up and down the coast at that time of year. I feel awful. Where am I? Citrus of Lemon Hospital, I'm your nurse. And I shall watch over you until you're well healed again. The fever-wracked Bruin had a nasty time, and for a while it was doubtful whether he would ever pull through. And then, suddenly, instead of taking a turn for the worse, he took a turn for the nurse. Boy, what you do to me? The bear got his health, and the nurse got her husband. They were married in the little church around the corner, up the hill, across the tracks from Grandma's house. I now pronounce you husband and wife. Give the little lady a bear hug. We now move forward in our story some ten years later. Mr. and Mrs. Bear reside in this cozy cottage. They have a ten-year-old bear son. Well, <laughs> that is, he doesn't run around bear. He's a, a bear, a little bear. I mean, uh, well, you know what I mean. Daddy, where's my baseball glove? Don't ask me, kid. There's so much junk lying around here, I can't even find a front door. Oh, it's true. The house was a mess. And it was all because Mrs. Bear sat around all day watching television and munching chocolates. Ethel! Are you in this room? I'm over in the corner watching the radio. The narrator said you were watching television. Television's busted. I'm watching radio. Well, look, Ethel, this place is a mess. And it's about time we cleaned up around here. She cleaned up all right, and she started by mopping up the floor with Mr. Bear. Leave me alone when I'm watching radio! This deplorable situation existed for one year, and then, one day, Mr. Bear put his foot down. Ow! Ooh, I'm sorry, kid. I didn't see you. Ethel! Uh, I'm going to make a very important phone call, if I can find a phone. It took one full week, but by tracing the wire, he finally located the instrument. Hello? Home Economy Bureau? Say, uh, send over a home economist, will you? Why are you doing that? Because somebody's going to come over and see how we're living, that's what. You'll send one over? Keno lady. She's on her way. So is dinner. Porridge is on the table. Whereabouts is the table? It's in the dining room somewhere. We'll find it. Thanks to the steam emanating from the porridge bowls, they found the table and prepared to dine. Ooh, ooh, this porridge is too hot! Yeah, you're right. It is a trifle warm. It's too hot for me to eat. 
Come on, we'll take a walk in the woods and let it cool off. What about the home economist? Let her cool her own porridge. No, no, I mean, suppose she gets him and finds nobody home. So she'll wait. Well, as if you hadn't guessed by now, the home economist was named Goldilocks. Mmm, this place needs dusting. I don't know how she did it, but the next thing she saw was the porridge on the table. Better sample this and make out a consumer's report. Mmm. <laughs> Brand X is far superior to brand Y or Z. And it tastes just like the higher-priced mush. Next in line was the durability test on the furniture. They're all Danish modern. Making a note of it, she then went upstairs to examine the bedroom, which was a very difficult thing to do, as this was a one-story house. Three beds, leaping lizards. <laughs> yes. Goldilocks was once the voice of little orphan Annie before she had her eyes fixed. Anyway, our little home economist tested all three beds and eventually fell asleep on the smallest of the three. Well, we're home. Let's see. Hi. Somebody's been eating my porridge. Yeah, somebody's been eating mine. Whoever ate mine even ate part of the bowl. Mush burglars. Don't be silly. It was probably the home economist. Oh, my gosh. Look at my rocking chair. It's still rocking. We've been invaded. Calm down. I tell you, it's probably the home economist. It was then the Goldilocks snoring fell upon their ears. I hope it is no boys from UCLA looking for another mascot. I'll get my gun. It was a mighty concerned threesome that ascended the stairs. I thought this was a one-story house. Shh. The snoring's getting louder. Well, sir, they spotted Goldilocks sleeping in the little bear's bed. <laughs> well, that, that's better. You and the little bear's bed. Give your name, rank, and serial number. Hmm? Oh, hello. I'm Goldilocks, the home economist. Now, you see, Ethel, I told you. Say, uh, what do you think of our living conditions, Annie? Goldilocks, I think you're living in squalor. Isn't that near uh, Beverly Hills? By squalor, I mean that your living conditions are deplorable. Awful, real bad. That's what I've been telling Ethel for years. Uh, what can we do about it? Move. I shall see to it that you live in a nice, clean, modern apartment specifically designed for bears. Wonderful! And so the three bears moved, but they weren't happy. Nice, clean, modern apartment. Phooey! Well, at least it's got air conditioning. <laughs> Sailors and other poetry fans, today's salty yarn is a poem by that old ancient mariner, Alan Cunningham. Oh, a wet sheet and a flowing sea, a wind that follows fast and fills the white and rustling sail and bends the gallant mast. Bullwinkle! And bends the gallant mast, my boys, while... Bullwinkle, isn't your gallant mast bending a little too far? Mr. Cunningham says that's how it's got to be. What are you doing? I'm balancing the boat by you. Uh, uh, flipping the jib. Flipping the jib? Certainly, see? It's balanced. Yeah, but suppose the wind changes. Silly squirrel. Mr. Cunningham says it never changes this time of... <whistles> ...day. Moose overboard! Yeah. Oh, a wet seat and a flowing sea. Mr. Cunningham says it's a wet sheet. He knows what he's got. I know what I got. Today's lesson is mighty important, remember? Bullwinkle is a... Not that lesson. <laughs> this lesson. Nickname for the first transcontinental train and real name of an animal that ran dead last at Hialeah. But we are more concerned with the former, for Canada in the year 1903 was desperately striving to span the continent by rail. Due to the rugged terrain, however, the tracks had only got as far as that most awesome of natural barriers, Gorgeous Gorge. Well, Potter, you're an engineer. How do we get tracks over that? Engineer Potter finally came up with a solution. We'll float the tracks over on balloons. The balloon idea might have worked, except that Potter blew up one too many and forgot to let go. 
An emergency meeting was called. Montague thinks we should throw the tracks over. Harrigan thinks we should throw Montague over. Why don't you fellas build a bridge? They fired the janitor, but kept his idea. Now, in those days, bridge builders were practically non-existent. In fact, the only construction workers were house wreckers. And the biggest house wrecking firm was Edifice Rex. Edifice Rex had a foul reputation. And the same could be said for its general manager, the ever-unpopular Snidely Whiplash. Look, if the price is right, I'll build your bridge. We'll pay anything. That's a little low, but in this case, I'll make an exception. Construction began the next morning. Where do you want this case of dynamite, boss? Stick a 365-day fuse in it, light it, and put it on the bridge. 365 days later... Congratulations, Whiplash. I shall now christen the bridge with this champagne. Domestic champagne do it every time. The bridge went up 40 times and came down the same amount. It was a situation that only the Royal Canadian Mounted Police could handle, and they sent their best men, our valiant hero... Dudley Durant. I understand you're having trouble with your water heater. No, it's the bridge. Take a look at it quick. They don't stay up very long. See what I mean? Someone's engaged in sabotage. I know a couple engaged in Toronto. You must find the culprit. Actually, they're going to be married in Quebec. The first thing you should do is question the engineer. Hey, Gad Rollo, we've destroyed more bridges than a nearsighted dentist. Allow me to introduce myself, gentlemen. Constable Mounted Police of the Dudley Durants. Curses, it's the Pollyanna of the tall timber. What, uh, <coughs> what can I do for you, Constable? I understand that your bridges are falling down. There's another way of saying that, you know. Henceforth and forthwith, the next bridge that goes up shall stay up, and I shall stay up with it. Girder by girder, plank by plank, the bridge began to take shape. Dudley was like a man possessed. He stayed on the job 24 hours a day, never sleeping, never eating. I have insomnia, and I'm on a diet. Ah, but Whiplash was a man to be reckoned with. What is that you are setting on this bridge, sir? There's a birthday cake. Those are singularly strange candles on that birthday cake. Pray tell, what do those letters TNT stand for? Well, those are the initials of the man whose birthday it is. TNT. Typical and Tyler. Shouldn't that be Tippecanoe and Tyler, too? He won't be two till tomorrow. The final nail was driven home, and the bridge stretched itself majestically across the yawning chasm. That's when Whiplash lit the candles. Shh. Now you wait right here on the bridge while I go find Tippecanoe and Tyler. Not one to be a party pooper, Dudley obeyed the request. Whiplash, on the other hand, wasted no time in getting off the ill-fated structure. That is, he almost got off. Sorry, sir, but this is a toll bridge. You can't cross unless you can pay the toll. Well, quick, you dunderhead, how much is it? $83.42. But even if you paid, I couldn't let you cross. This is a train bridge. And you're not a train, are you? Knowing that it would explode momentarily, Whiplash dashed back to the cake. Out of my way, do right. I must blow out the candles. You cannot do that, sir. That privilege is reserved for Tippecanoe and Tyler. Mother of pearl, I'm enmeshed in my own cesspool. But fate was about to step in, for over the railing climbed a pathetic little man who said, I understand you're throwing a party for me up here. Don't tell me your name is... Uh-huh, Tippy Canoe and Tyler. <laughs> Blow out the candles, I implore you. Just a moment, there is something amiss here. You said Tippy Canoe was going to be two today. This man looks more like six. And Dudley threw the cake over the side. You're sure the trouble is over? Positive, Inspector. In fact, I collected all these spare sticks of dynamite, brought them back here to the post, and put them in your file cabinet. What file cabinet? That file cabinet. That's a pot belly stove. Hurry, see if the fire is still burning. <laughs> I think it's out now, sir. Sir? Oh, sir! Yoo-hoo, Inspector! It's a well-known fact that the hat makes the man, be he rich man, poor man, spaceman, thief, soldier, sailor, or Indian chief. It's the hat that does it. Just imagine what would happen if an admiral looked like this, or an astronaut like this, or a poor man like this. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Yes, hats are important, all right, but no hat in history ever caused the controversy that this one did, for this is the Kerwood Derby, which makes anyone who wears it the smartest person in the world. And it's being eagerly sought by Boris Badenov and his fearless leader. 
Once my head is under that hat, bad enough. You'll be smart. What? I, I mean smarter, dear old chiefy boy, honey pot, superior officer Dow. Mm. Bad enough, you're making my cuffs soggy. Sorry. And what happens when your fearless leader is all powerful? Pottsylvania rules the world. Hail Pottsylvania. Hail to the black and the blue. Hail Pottsylvania. Sneaky and crooked, through and through. Down with the good guys, up with the boss. Under the sign of the Triple Cross. Oh, hail Pottsylvania. Hail, hail, hail. Himmelwerfer, was ist los? What else? It's hail. And you ask for it. There's only one hitch in the villain's plan to find the lost derby. It must be found by the stupidest creature alive, which up to our last episode was Bullwinkle Moose. But then his hero, Rocky Squirrel, suddenly disappeared, and a moment later, so did Bullwinkle. Well, it seems there's nothing left to do but start another series. You wouldn't dare! Rocky, what's up? I am, and so is Bullwinkle! Yes, our two heroes were dangling from trees high above the ground, where they had been snatched by a couple of cunning traps laid in their path. Yeah, but who'd want to trap us? Especially upside down! We uns would, Moose! Who, you uns? We uns is hatfuls, that's who uns! But why trap us uns? Uh, us! Cause we gotta take y'all to Devil Dan. Both of us? No, not y'all, just y'all. And one of the hatfuls leveled his gun upward. Look out, Bowinkle! <laughs> he got me! No, he didn't, Bowinkle. It was your rope. Your rope! I know, and I'm at the end of it too, Rock. Grab him, boys! And the jubilant hatfuls lugged the dazed Bowinkle into the woods while Rocky fumed helplessly high above. Hey, hey, I, I can't get the trap off my foot! Well, there's only one thing to do. And the plucky squirrel zoomed straight upward to the end of his rope. The cord drew tighter and tighter. And finally, a tree limb snapped and Rocky was free. Except for a ten-foot branch trailing behind him. Hang on, Bo Winkle, I'm coming! Down the aerial speedster flashed lower and lower. Run, Zeke, run. Here comes that pesky squirrel. Well, I got just a thing for pesky squirrel. What's that? My pesky squirrel gun. I'll stay here, and when he goes past, I'll let him have it. Sure enough, when Rocky flashed by, Zeke rose to his feet and leveled his rifle. Unfortunately for him, Zeke had forgotten about the trailing tree branch. Well, the branch saved Rocky that time, but then as he approached Bullwinkle's captors... Hey, you guys, drop that moose! The branch caught in the fork of another tree, and Rocky was snapped down and out of sight. Well, that takes care of him, Alfred. Let's go. I could sure use a squirrel tail for my car aerial. There's no time. Let's go. And the Hatfuls hurried through the woods, bearing the bewildered Bullwinkle toward a sinister hut, where a rather unpleasant reception committee awaited him. Don't miss our next episode, Hello, My Booby, or Pleased to Beat You. Well, I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say. A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel, and his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi! 
Hi, glad to see you again. Likewise. We got some great things on the show today. Like what? Like what? Well, you ought to know, Boo You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. <laughs> In our last episode, Bullwinkle had been moosenapped by a band of hateful hatfuls. Rocky tried to follow him, but ran into a little trouble with a tree. Now Bullwinkle is being carried into a sinister hut deep in the woods where a rather unpleasant reception committee awaits him. Okay, fearless leader, there is Moose. How do we get him to lead us to Curver Derby? Very simple, bad enough. We simply brainwash him. Sure enough, a hapless moose was taken into a small room and left there with three expert brainwashers. Hours went by, and finally the door swung open. Moose is brainwashed. Yes? Moose is brainwashed? No. Why is this? Not enough brain to wash. I sure feel clean-headed, though. Bad enough, we must get Moose under our control. Easy, boss man. Looky here. What's that? Beautiful dreamer hypnotism kid. How does it work? First, I use little Daisy Buzzer to get his attention. Then I use Whirling Disc to focus his eyes. <laughs> then he's put on special Goo Goo Glasses. Look deep into his eyes and say, Sleep, you are going to sleep. Pretty good, huh, boss? Boss, boss, fearless leader. Hey, wake up! Hmm, hmm. What were you saying? It's my hypnotism. It will never work. Oh, boy. Let me give it a try, fearless leader. What have we got to lose? Billions of dollars and world domination. I mean, aside from that. Oh, very well. Go ahead. And Boris slipped into the room with Bullwinkle. Hey, it's Mr. Devil Dan. Oop. You kidding, Moose? I be felonious Floy, I be. I would have swore you had a beer just a second ago. No, no. I was just looking on you upside down like this. Oh. Now, attention. Watch the... Hey, Moose. Moose, watch the disc. But it was too late. Bullwinkle was already in a deep trance. You couldn't do this to me. I paid two ninety eight for this thing. You got to watch the whirling disc like this. You got to look at the glasses when I say sleep. Sleep. You, you are you are going to... And so an hour later, when an impatient, fearless leader opened the door of the room, he saw two figures sitting in a trance. Hells and donut. Bad enough. Wake up. Wake up. Please, Mama. Not in the head. Did you... Oh, it's you, fearless leader. Get to work on that moose. Right away, boss man. You are going to look for a derby. You are going to look for a derby. Yeah, yeah, derby. Meanwhile, back in the woods, Rocky had finally succeeded in getting the trap off his foot. There! Now I'm free to follow Bullwinkle. But how? The sharp-eyed squirrel noticed that the bark had been knocked off several trees. Aha! Uh -huh. That's where Bullwinkle's antlers must have scraped against him. And with an eye like an eagle, the plucky squirrel went from tree to tree until he reached the end of the trail. Whoop! Looking for somebody, stranger? Was that you making these marks on the trees? I cannot tell a lie. I did it with my little hatchet. Say, what's your name? Washington. I bet your first name is George. No, Martha. Well, my mistake. I was looking for a moose. Oh, him? He's in there. Fearlessly, he zoomed through the window of the sinister cottage, only to find it empty. Where can he be? Where, indeed. For at that moment, Bullwinkle was walking in a trance just ahead of Boris and Fearless Leader. Derby. I must find a derby. It's working, Fearless Leader. And there's the derby now. Now? Already? So soon? Has Bullwinkle really ended his quest? We'll find out next time in Under Bullwinkle's Bowler or the Wide Open Spaces.
Fish biting, son? Nary a nibble all day, Pop. Well, it's no wonder you can't catch a fish using a donut for bait. I know, but I've been digging for worms all afternoon, and I couldn't find a single one. Besides, the donut's chocolate. That's true, but you can't expect to find worms in the afternoon. You have to get up early. Remember the old saying? It's, it's the, the early, early bird, bird that, that catches, catches the, the worm. worm. Uh -huh. Now, you take the fable of the robin, the pelican, and the angleworm. It was a great day for the kingdom of Camelittle, which, needed to say, was a great deal smaller than Camelot. For on this day, King Leo I was to be crowned absolute monarch of all he surveyed. But I can't see a thing. This bucket is clear down over my eyes. I am sorry, Your Grace. It's the only thing we could find for a crown. Good King Leo I refused to go through with the coronation. It was then the loyal Camelittle Lillians took matters into their own hands. Working in the jewel mines night and day, they succeeded in unearthing ten fabulous gems which they presented to his highness. Now we are getting someplace. The gems were given to the royal crown maker, who, grabbing the first thing at hand, set them into a large beer mug. How about that? I'm the only king in the world who has a crown that sparkles and has a head on it. So King Leo was crowned, and all went well for a fortnight. Then one morning, as he sat on the throne... Hey, your highness, hey! You lost one of your rocks! Sure enough, where once a gleaming ruby had nestled, naught but a hole remained. Summoning the royal private eye, the king demanded an explanation. After much consideration and perusal of the facts, I have reached a definite conclusion. I know who did it. Who? A thief. Oh. It was decided that a more drastic measure be taken. We shall lock the crown in the royal safe! And as an added precaution, the king went with it. Unfortunately, when the safe was eventually opened... Good Lord! It's incredible! Yes, the amethyst was back in the crown, but the king was gone. There in his highness's place was a ransom note. Leave five million finsters inside the refrigerator by midnight or the king dies. There was nothing left to do but comply with the fiendish request. Five million finsters were placed inside the refrigerator, but on the outside, an elaborate alarm system was installed. The clock in the tower will strike four at midnight. The door of the refrigerator will swing open, the light will come on, and we'll have the villain. At exactly 12 o'clock midnight, the clock in the tower struck four, the refrigerator door opened, and the light did come on. And there on the top shelf counting the finsters was, of all things, a worm. 200 finsters, 201 finsters. Seize him! You've got to get up early in the morning to catch me. And with that, he swooped up his ill-gotten finsters and made good his escape. The fox was no fool. In order to get the king, he had to catch the worm. But foxes are not worm catchers. Birds are. Birds like robins and pelicans. The fate of the king is in your hands. Get that worm. So they began their pursuit immediately, following the worm's trail, which led to a tiny hole in the ground. That's his owl, all right. How can you tell? Listen. One million and eight finsters, one million and nine. We'll smoke him out. Taking a bit of incense and a dash of myrrh, the robin opened a tiny box, placed the mixture inside, lit it, closed the box, and dropped it into the hole. Immediately, the box popped back up. Open before Christmas. Now, isn't that nice? Right, Al. For a worm, that's a pretty sweet gesture. I thought worm catching was for the birds. Oh, it is. We tried every afternoon for a week to catch that little rascal. Afternoon? No wonder. Even I know it's the early bird that catches the worm. By golly, he's right. So the next morning, in the chill early dawn, they resumed the hunt. <clears throat> Man, it's colder than a well digger's ankles. You can say that again. It's colder than a well... Never mind. Look, in the road ahead. There stood the worm, counting the last of his finsters. Four million, nine hundred thousand and ninety-nine, five million. It's all here. So are we. Mm. The worm soon found himself behind bars. The king was returned to his throne. The worm got ten years, and the robin and the pelican each got a severe cold. <laughs> yes, although they'd caught the worm, the chill of the early morning laid them both up with a case of double pneumonia. And so you see, Junior, that's why I always say it's the early bird that gets the worm. True? True. However, Pop, you got the last word wrong. How so? The way you told it, it's the early bird that gets the germ. <laughs> And now, 
Here's that master of all trades with Jack from Nun, Mr. Know-It-All. Hello there, friends. Today we benefit from my highly successful book, How to Teach a Mean Bully a Lesson at the Beach. First, it is essential to find a lovely young girl in front of whom you can show off by defending her honor. Pardon me, lovely lady, but I wish to defend your honor should a big, rough, mean, loathsome bully kick sand in your eyes and... Which brings us to point two. Always be careful in selecting a real lady to defend. Ah, here's a real one. Now, we wait for a bully to come by and kick sand. Notice how I allow him to build up a false sense of security by pretending to ignore him. Now comes the really meaty part. See, for three months I study my book, How to Teach a Mean Bully a Lesson at the Beach. And now I'm ready. Pardon me, young lady, but should a bully come along, I am prepared to defend your honor. Notice that a bully is approaching. Pardon me, sir, but you are a cad. You threw sand at us, and I am prepared to teach you a lesson you will never forget. Ooh. Well, I lost the battle, but I've gained a friend. Right, little lady? Gosh, Mr. Know-It-All, looks like your book was a failure. No, Rock, it was a brilliant success. Success? Sure, look, that's the book she's been reading. Hello again, Peabody here. All through with your spaghetti, Sherman? Couldn't take another bite, Mr. Peabody. Good, then we're off to Italy. For more spaghetti? No, for a meeting with that illustrious Italian adventurer, Casanova. I instructed Sherman to set the Wayback Controls for 1755. Behaving in its customary magnificent fashion, the Wayback Machine took us to the main gate of Italia Catraz prison. What are we doing here, Mr. Peabody? We're waiting for Casanova. Who's he visiting? Himself. He's been in prison for 10 years. What for? Uh, for 10 years. No, no, I mean on what charge? Impersonating a Russian spy. Ah, ah, here he comes now. Even as I spoke, the gate opened and out came Casanova. In one hand was a large stone, which he proceeded to hurl through the warden's window. What did he do that for, Mr. Peabody? Offhand, I'd say, for another 10 years. The guards quickly apprehended him, and he was quickly swallowed up behind the large gray walls. Luckily, it was visiting day, and we were allowed to see him in his cell. Well, Cass, what's going on? Go away. I'm in no need of mouthpiece. I'm a very happy where I am. But, Mr. Casanova, you've got to go home. Yes, you're supposed to write your memoirs, you know. Judge, just to give me another ten years. Hey, ain't that a wonderful? It was hard to understand why the legendary romanticist was ecstatic over being in prison. Then I saw the reason. So did Sherman. Wow! Look, Mr. Peabody, female guards. Hmm. I wouldn't mind doing one to ten myself. It's time for your exercise, Cass. Hot lasagna. Now, usually, a prisoner goes to the exercise yard and plays a little handball. But in this prison, it was different. Exercise consisted of one hour of cha-cha-cha. Not only that, but dinner consisted of not a tin plate shoved through a slot in the cell door, but a sumptuous banquet in the Escoffier room next to the torture chamber. Pheasant or squab? Eh, uh, pizza. No wonder he doesn't want to leave. Yes, but he's going to. We wasted no time in seeking out the warden. Sure, it's all right to buy me if a Casanova goes home. I've been trying to get rid of him for 15 years. Then we must make him want to leave. Ah, uh, don't you worry about that. The warden had a definite plan in mind. First, he cut out Casanova's cha-cha-cha exercises and sent him to work on the rock pile. But Casanova was more than equal to the occasion. He converted the rocks into beautifully sculptured statues. Boy, I'm a love my wake. Golly, Mr. Warden, he still doesn't want to leave. Oh, no, I got a way to make him go. Attention, convict number 8269, otherwise known as Casanova. You have a visitor in the yard. Quick to obey, Casanova left his cell and adjourned to the large prison yard. Now we fix him. I pull this lever that locks all of the cells and a Casanova can't get back in. He got to go home. The wily warden pulled the lever. The cells closed, and indeed, Casanova was locked out. Hey, that's a dirty pool. Let me back in. Casanova, go home! It looked as if the warden's plan had succeeded. To celebrate, we accepted the warden's invitation to stay for dinner, and it was during the minestrone that the trouble began. 
Quick, Warden, it's a break. In a matter of minutes, searchlights were flooding the walls, but there was no sign of an escaped prisoner. That's a funny. Not really. You see, this isn't a break out, it's a break in. Sure enough, a check of the cells revealed that convict number 8269 was back. Look who's a here, Warden. You bad penny. <laughs> I give up. You may, but I don't. Casanova will leave this prison within 60 seconds or my name isn't... Mr. Peabody. Correct. I took the liberty of transferring all of the Italia Catraz guards to another prison. Ah, here come the new ones. But those ain't the lady guards. Precisely. The only reason Casanova stays here is because he's surrounded by beautiful women. Watch how he reacts to this. Hey, Sally, how come are you growing a beard? I ain't a Sally, I'm a Max. Maxine? Maximilian. Maximilian? That's a no fair. Let me out of here. Jail was no longer jail to Casanova. He quickly departed. Looks like he'll write his memoirs now, right, Mr. Peabody? Oh, definitely, Sherman. And in his account of his sojourn at this prison, I hope he mentions the warden. Yeah, the warden's a nice guy. Uh -huh. So nice that he paroled every prisoner in his prison. And barrels, too. Barrels, Sherman? Sure, all those barrels have parole stickers on them. Well, there's nothing unusual about that. We've all heard of parole out the barrel. Last time it looked as if the search for the Kerwood Derby had ended. For in one of his better fiendish plans, Boris hypnotized Bullwinkle and sent him off to look for the fabulous bowler. You must look for a derby. A derby. A derby. A derby. And in just a little while, Bullwinkle stopped and shouted, Where's the derby? No! See, fearless leader, when I fiendish plan them, they stay fiendish plan. But look what derby he's pointing at. Roller derby. Uh-oh. Try again, Moose. And the hypnotized Bullwinkle tried his best. After a long hike, he pointed out the Kentucky Derby. And after a still longer hike, he pointed out the Brown Derby. But when the trio returned to Peaceful Valley, he still hadn't found the Kerward Derby. And what's more, look who's coming. Sure enough, high above them, Rocky Squirrel was blazing a streak in the sky as he sought his pal. Bullwinkle, where are you? Did somebody call? Quick, he's coming out of it. Listen, Moose. When you wake up, you will look for the Curveword Derby. The Curveword Derby. Do you understand? No, but I'll do it anyways. Good. Now let's go before that nosy squirrel shows up. No sooner had the villains hidden themselves than Rocky zoomed into the scene. Bowinkle! Bowinkle, it's you! It is? Don't you recognize me? I don't even recognize me. I'm Rocky. You sure are. Don't you know me? The voice is familiar, but I don't place the goggles. I'm Rocky, your pal. We've been buddies for years. What have you done for me lately? Oh, come out of it, Bullwinkle. Rocky, it's you. Boy, you look like you're in a trance. Yeah, but don't I always? Something awful funny's going on in Peaceful Valley, Bullwinkle. Really? I haven't heard a laugh yet. What do you think? I think I ought to get a derby. I don't know what it is. I just gotta have a derby. It's working, fearless leader. You can always count on hotshot bad enough. This is no time to buy a hat, Bullwinkle. I can't help it, Rock. I got to find me a derby. And Bullwinkle, still under Boris's control, began to hunt for a hat. And the first place he went to, of course, was a hat store. So that's where we find the Kerwood Derby, eh, bad enough? But dozens of our smartest secret agents have combed the world for that derby. What chance do you think a stupid moose has of finding it in an ordinary hat store? Not very good, eh? No chance at all, Mr. Not-So-Hot-Shot Badenov. Fearless leader. What? Give us a little smile. Fang hunt! Forget it. You know, I think we shorten your name, Badenov, from Hot Shot to just Shot. Meanwhile, inside the store, Bullwinkle was trying on hat after hat. None of them fit very well. I can't understand it, sir. I've tried every size derby we have. What size do you usually take, Bullwinkle? Regular moose size. What's that? Seven and five thirty seconds. Seven and five thirty seconds? Unless I just got a haircut, then it's seven and three thirty seconds. But nobody carries that size hat. It's ridiculous. No derby, huh? Now, wait. Uh, just a minute. Now, there's one hat that's been on our shelves for years and years, 
Maybe. And the clerk climbed a high ladder and from a dusty shelf took down a hat box covered with cobwebs. Does it have the size marked on it? Let's see. <coughs> nope, nope, just the name of it. What's that? As far as I can make out, it says the Kerwood Derby. Kerwood Derby? The Kerwood Derby? You notice kind of an echo in here? Oh, don't miss the next episode if you can. Or, or can't. Or uh, anyway, it's called Million Dollar Carton or mm -hmm. Jack in the Box. Well, I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. Well, there it is. Within that dusty box lies the fabulous Kerwood Derby, whose wearer becomes the smartest person in the whole world. And who's about to buy the Kerwood Derby? None other than Bullwinkle Moose himself. And do you know who's the happiest man in the world about it? Boris Badenov. Don't shoot, fearless leader. Moose has found the Kerwood Derby for us. Well, Badenov, you locked in again. Sure. As soon as Moose gets Derby, we take it from him. Then we rule the world. We? You! You rule the world, old boss fella, baby doll. Meanwhile, inside the hat shop... Are you sure that's the right size, Bullwinkle? It says right here, seven and five thirty seconds. That's it. Now I'll just... One moment, sir. That'll be eight dollars even. Eight dollars? Even. We don't have eight dollars even. If we had eight dollars, it'd be odd. Then I'm sorry. This box goes back on the shelf. Bad enough, the moose must get that hat. Leave it to me, fearless leader. Gee, I sure wanted that derby, too. Well, hello, 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 hello. Are you ready for your question on our moose on the street quiz? Hmm? Who are you? Allow me to introduce myself. I'm your genial radio quiz master, Art Later. Now, for $8 cash even, answer this one question. Who is buried in Grant's tomb? Uh, gee, I was reading about that just the other day. Uh, do you know, Rock? Sure, but I can't tell you. That'd be cheating. Go ahead. I'm not listening. Sorry, Bullwinkle. Okay, I ask another question. 
for eight dollars even. Tell me, do you know Planck's constant of quantum mathematics? No. That's right. No, you don't. Congratulations. Here's the eight dollars even. Gee, thanks, Mr. Look Leader. Think nothing. Happy hat. So clutching Boris's eight dollars even in his hot little glove, Bullwinkle re-entered the hat shop and walked out with a hat box which, unbeknownst to our heroes, contained the fabulous Kerber Derby. You haven't tried your new hat on, Bullwinkle. See, that's right. And the mighty moose removed the baffling bowler from the box and put it on his head. Say, it fits like a dream. Yeah, and the square of the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the two sides. What? I said the orbits of periodic comets have an aphelion at a distance of 77 AU from the sun. Bowenka, what are you saying? I don't know. It's just that la plume de Martin is sur le bureau de mon oncle. Bowenka, you're talking French. Oui. But you don't know French. No, je ne parle pas français. It was then that Rocky noticed thin trails of smoke coming out from underneath the bowler. Pokey smoke, your head's on fire. And Rocky snatched the Kerwood Derby off Bullwinkle's smoldering scout and fanned his brow with it. What happened, oh fearless leader? It's obvious, bad enough. The most simply was not used to thinking. His brain overheated. Do we grab the Derby now? As we say in Pottsylvania, why not? But suppose they snitch on us to the police. Dead men tell no tales. What about dead mooses? Also. Ha, diggity. You mean I get to steal derby and knock off moose and squirrel? Bad enough, be my guest. You know, oh fearless leader, you're really a fun villain. And Boris whipped out a large battle axe and began to creep up on our unsuspecting friends. Meanwhile, back at the moose... There, you've stopped smoldering. I was pretty hot stuff for a while there, though. I wonder what happened. I don't know. I just put this hat on and said, I just figured there's a fiendish plot against us, Rocky, and somebody's hiding behind that bush right now. Well, Bullwinkle was smart enough, but was he soon enough? We'll find out next time in Two at One Blow or The Devil Beheader. <laughs> Here's what it was supposed to look like. The Yangtze River, which flows through northern China, not only provided the inspiration for the song Yangtze with a Laughing Face, but gives us the setting for our story. Centuries and centuries ago, the Yangtze was nothing more than a small pond that sat beside a palace belonging to a wealthy Chinese emperor. Well, Honorable Cook, what have we for breakfast today? Well, I can fix a scrambled egg roll. You like it? No, no, I have a hot yen for almond duck. That's all he ever ate, almond duck, morning, noon, and night. And that's why the pond was always well stocked with almond-eyed ducklings. You hear the big news, Foucault? Emperor gonna have almond duck this morning. Oh, hot dog. I hope the cook picks me. These almond ducklings live for one thing and one thing only, to have the honor of being fed to their beloved emperor. Yeah. We're sort of like a duck kamikaze squadron. <laughs> yeah. All right, handsome up, you birds. Here comes the cook. The cook came to the edge of the pond and surveyed the ducks with a keen eye. That's when the ducks went into their act. Lock up by my ducky, what a ducky melody. If you know ducky like I know ducky. All the time, same old corny imitations. So he simply selected what he thought was a good-looking duck. How furry. Uh, maybe we'll get lucky at lunchtime. Yes, they all stood a chance of making good at the next meal, all but one. He was the ugliest almond duckling China ever spawned. Boy, if this keeps up, I'm going to live to be 104. And another duck got the honors. Boy, I'm getting desperate. I gotta use the old Chinese noodle. Dinner time rolled around. The cook reappeared, and this time, the ugly almond duckling floated into view, wearing a banner proclaiming that he was Miss America of 1922. Say, if that duck is good enough to win Miss America title, he's good enough to be served to emperor. Well, it seemed as though the ruse would work. The ugly one was placed on a tray and set on the emperor's table. But wouldn't you know, that day the emperor was entertaining a guest. Something is rotten here besides the leader crowns. Guest of Emperor also wearing banner saying she is Miss America of 1922. Now, you won't believe this, baby, but it was a tie that year. That night, shortly before midnight, the ducks held a council. The ugly duck is giving the pond a very bad reputation. 
If this keeps up, the Emperor might develop a taste for chickens. So he took up a collection and paddled over to the object of their discourse. Here's a sack containing 3,000 yen. Uh, roughly how much is that in, uh, in American moolah? Well, roughly speaking, I would say like a buck and a half. Oh, boy. Uh, what do I do with all this loot? Why don't you get talented so the cook will take you out of the pond? Dawn found our hero flying into the nearby city of Paiping, where he enrolled at the Rock and Egg Roll Conservatory of Music. Sure, I can teach you how to play music, but you're going to be the ugliest duck ever to graduate from here. He studied <laughs> night and day, and a few other Cole Porter songs, too, in the hopes that musical talents would counterbalance his ugliness. Finally, after one year of diligent practice on every instrument known to man, he headed back to the pond. Handsome up, you guys. Here comes the cook to get the emperor's breakfast. The cook was amazed, for instead of the usual varied array of imitations, the ducks merely lined up and gave the floor to... Holy mackerel! Never had he witnessed such musical virtuosity. And at the conclusion, not only the ducks, but the birds and the fishes broke into a rousing ovation. The cook had no alternative but to pluck the exhausted duck from the water. <sighs> now I get the orange sauce treatment, huh? Oh, no, no, no. I'm gonna mail you to Phil Spitalny. He can use a duck like you. Failure again. In a sense, that is. The duck within two years playing for Mr. Spitalny and then decided to form his own band. He did very well and even received an offer to play the palace. But the only palace that he really wanted to make good in was the Emperor's back home. Hello, MCA. Cancel my road tour. Notify the trades. I'm giving up showbiz. Back to the pond he flew and what he viewed upon arrival startled him. Oh, for the cry eye. The pond is still stocked with ducks who are prettier than me. Oh, I'm going to remain from here to eternity. Suddenly, a Chinese frog leaped onto a lily pad. What you got tears in your almond eyes for? I'm as ugly as four days of bad weather, that's why. Yeah, well, a lot of people are ugly. I was ugly once myself. I can't believe it. How come you're not ugly now? Well, I believe that's why. I believe you believe, but uh, what do you believe? I believe that I'm good looking. Well, this was something he hadn't tried. So for 24 hours, he believed he was no longer ugly. And you know something? It worked. By morning, he was the best-looking duck in the pond. Oh, you got it made, kid. Oh, you're sure to get picked from the pond. He was, but not by the cook. The cook selected someone else. Ah, oh, but don't feel too sorry for the poor little duck. You see, his name was Donald, and he was taken by a man named Walt... Well, uh, never mind. That's right, and now I go... Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy! Hi there, sports fans. Time to... Hmm, wrong script. Hello, poetry lovers. Time for another bout with the bards. Today featuring that famous recipe in rhyme, pat a cake <clears throat> pat a cake pat a cake baker's man. Bake Hold me... it, Bullwinkle. What's up? That's a chocolate cream cake you got. So? You know what happens when you pat a chocolate cream cake? No, what happens? That happens. It's sort of flat, don't it? Now what? Well, the recipe says I roll it and pat it and mark it with a B and put it in the oven for baby and me. You're going to give that to a baby? What's a pat of cake taste like, bro? Mmm, sort of like chocolate cream pizza. Yeah, well... Hi there, sports fans! Time to... And now... Hey, Rocky! Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up must leave. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. I take a seven and a half. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. <laughs> Meshy foul foof out there. Peabody here. Meshy foul foof, Mr. Peabody? That's Arabic for hello, Sherman. For our destination today is the Arabian Desert, the time 1917, and the man we're going to meet, the legendary Lawrence of Arabia. We set the way back controls and were immediately teleported back through time and space. 
All of a sudden, there we were, inside British Secret Service headquarters at Cairo. Gentlemen, I have two reasons for believing that Turkey is going to declare war on us. One, they've cut off our supply of Thanksgiving turkeys. Oh, that's oh, terrible. That's Bad show. Sure. Sure. And two, they've sent a nasty letter to Parliament. Oh, the oh, devil, you say. They were not drunk. Now, we must send someone to steal the Turkish plans. Do I have any volunteers? <laughs> For some strange reason, the room emptied. Dash it all. Every time I ask for volunteers, they chicken out. I wish they'd turkey out this time. Uh, begging the Colonel's pardon, but you have a clerk in the outside office who can do the job. His name is Lawrence. The Colonel promptly called him in. So, you think you can work undercover for us, eh, Lawrence? I should jolly well like to try, sir. Capital. By the way, what do you intend wearing as a disguise? Instead of answering, Lawrence dashed from the room and quickly returned clad in a Santa Claus suit. I thought I'd wear this Arab costume, sir. Perhaps we'd better send someone else. Mr. Peabody and I'll go with him. Are you any good at Secret Service work, Peabody? Colonel, I invented Secret Service. Convinced the matter was in capable pause, the Colonel bid farewell. That night, Sherman and I bought Arab outfits and went to Lawrence's hotel room. I hope he's ready to go. I hope he's wearing the proper disguise. But instead of being dressed like an Arab, he was dressed like a pilgrim. How do you like it? It's stunning, stunningly wrong. Grabbing a sheet from the bed and some mattress stuffing, we soon had him properly disguised. The next thing we did was to join a caravan heading into the desert. Is the Turkish army out there, Mr. Peabody? Indeed it is, and I must caution you both, don't do anything that would give us away. This caravan is undoubtedly crawling with spies. Oh, you can count on me. I was hoping I could, but the following morning when we paused at an oasis... Tea time, chaps. Anyone for crumpets? That was all it took before we were all bound hand and foot. Did I say something wrong? You are all English spies. I, the Sultan, have ways of dealing with English spies. We were tied to stakes under the broiling desert sun. And to show you how devilish that Sultan was, he put bottles of suntan lotion just out of arm's reach. How will we ever get out of this, Mr. Peabody? How, Sherman? It's simple. You always have a candy bar in your pocket, don't you? Yes. Good. Reach in, grab it, and wipe the chocolate off on my ropes. And that's the boy. Now, if I know my camels, sure enough, the odor of chocolate attracted the nearest beast, and in no time at all, he was dining on the ropes. Before long, we were all free. Sherman, you and Lawrence wait here while I sneak into the Sultan's tent and get the secret plans. I made my way carefully past the Turkish guards and into the tent where the Sultan was resting. <laughs> Inside a pouch labeled Secret Plans, I found what I was after. Unfortunately... I say, Peabody, old chap, whilst you're looking for the Secret Plans, see if you can find a tea cozy. Naturally, the Sultan awoke and immediately sounded the alarm. Quick, Lawrence, this way! We ducked out a rear exit while the guards began a frantic search. I'll go get Sherman. You saddle up a camel. You can count on me. Yes. I found Sherman where I had left him. Peabody, Sherman, over here. I had instructed Lawrence to saddle a camel. Instead, he had saddled the Sultan. Guards, come here, quick. The English dogs are here. Before we could move, we were hopelessly surrounded. That's when I reached into Lawrence's pocket and pulled out a hand grenade. Stop. One more step and I'll blow us right off the rocky show. But I say, Peabody, old thing, that's not a grenade. Later, Lawrence, later. The threat of an explosion did the trick. One week later, the entire Turkish army turned itself over to the British. Now, what about that grenade, Lawrence? I was trying to tell you that's an apple. If you had pulled the stem out and thrown the ruddy thing, nothing would have happened. Watch. <laughs> got 60 days for destroying Secret Service headquarters. As for the Sultan and his army, they were put inside large barns containing hay. I don't get it, Mr. Peabody. How come they're in there? Well, apparently, Sherman, somebody likes a turkey in the straw.
Last time, you remember, our heroes actually got hold of the Kerwood Derby, which just happened to be the right size for Bullwinkle. Seven and five thirty seconds. And sure enough, when Bullwinkle put it on, he became an absolutely brilliant thinker. In the Paleozoic era, the Cambrian period was followed by the Ordovician, Silurian, and Devonian. What are you talking about? Don't ask me. Unfortunately, his brain wasn't used to it and began to overheat. So Rocky snatched off the derby and began to fan Bullwinkle's brow. Tell me some more about the Paleozoic era, Bullwinkle. Okay, but first, what is it? Our boys didn't know that they were merely pawns in the fiendish game played by Boris and his fearless leader. A game called Rule the World. Any number can play. Boris tried to sneak up on our friends carrying a battle axe. We call it the Pottsylvanian Equalizer. But just as he was ready to swing at our heroes, Bullwinkle put the derby on and said... The laws of probability indicate that we are pawns in a fiendish plot and that somebody's behind that bush right now. Boris swung all right, but Bullwinkle's lightning brain allowed him to judge accurately just how far he'd have to duck. And Boris <laughs> felled a tree instead. A tree which dropped right on Fearless Leader. The horrified Boris ran to his side. Fearless leader, what have I done? First, you have goofed another job. Second, you have shortened your life expectancy greatly. No, no, wait, fearless leader. I'll get the derby. Double cross my heart. Very well, Madanoff. Your life is spared. Because you are so kind-hearted and generous? No, because my gun is jammed. And Boris once more set off after our heroes. Gee, Bullwinkle, how come you're so smart all of a sudden? I just figured it out, Rocket Old Chap. This is the legendary Kerber Derby I'm wearing. It departs a vast amount of knowledge to its wearer. Then you must be the smartest moose in the world. Would you like me to explain Einstein's theory to you? Sure. Well... But at that moment, a strong gust of wind blew the bowler off Bullwinkle's bean. Go ahead, Bullwinkle. Go ahead and what? Explain Einstein's theory to me. Well, I'd be glad to. Just one question. Huh? Who's Einstein? Bullwinkle, your hat's gone. Uh-oh. And our heroes dashed after the disappearing derby. There it is, Bullwinkle. Sure enough, a derby lay in the middle of the path, but when Bullwinkle put it on... It looks smaller somehow. Hmm. Does fit a little soon, don't it? Maybe it shrunk. Oh, little did Bullwinkle know, for he had actually put on a counterfeit derby, and inside that hat, a small but powerful time bomb was ticking away the seconds. Oh, who could have done such a... Uh, oh, don't tell me. I got to. He's in the script. Me, Boris Bedenov. Yes, the... Ta-da! <laughs> yes, the villain had switched hats with Bullwinkle and now had possession of the fabulous Kerwood Derby. And now I put it on and I rule the world. You and who else, Bedenov? Fearless leader. Say, did you ever get that gun fixed? Yes. That's what I was afraid of. Yes, things really looked bad for Boris until a familiar female figure crept out of the bushes on hands and knees and took up a position behind Phyllis Leader. Welcome, Natasha, baby. Am I glad to see you? Oh, no, bad enough. You don't trick me into looking around. That was all right with Boris, for he pushed Phyllis Leader over the kneeling Natasha and leaped on top of him, biting and scratching. Oh, Boris, you are so brave. When it's two against one, I'm always brave. And the two villains fought fiercely for possession of the all-powerful Kerwood Derby. Oh, which which one will win? What does, does it, it matter? matter? We're, We're both bad, bad guys. guys. Gee, that's right. Well, be with us next time for Flower in the Hat or the Rose Bowler. <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible.
adventures of Ruffy and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel, and his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. Last time you remember, Boris Badenov had got hold of the Kerwer Derby, whose wearer becomes the smartest man on earth. At last, the world is mine! But there was one other claimant for the diabolical derby in the person of fearless leader. He had the drop on Boris until Natasha crept up behind him and... <laughs> but as the two villains pummeled each other furiously, one of them happened to kick the Kerwer Derby, and unbeknownst to them, it rolled blithely downhill to where our friends sat dejectedly trying to get results from a bogus bowler. You sure you don't feel smart, Bullwinkle? Ask me something. Oh, Okay. How many states in the United States? I mean something easy. Um, spell Mississippi. Fifty. M I S T S I S T S I S T S I S T S I. Oh, Winkle. It's a long river, you know. Something's wrong with your magic hat. Oh, if Rocky only knew, for Boris had switched derbies with Bullwinkle and given him one that contained a small but effective time bomb. Doesn't the hat say anything to you at all? Just tick, tick, tick. Well, that's no help. Sure not. But at that moment, a real Kerwood Derby rolled past them. In a twinkling, Rocky had caught up with a hopping headpiece and brought it back to Bullwinkle. Try me now, Rock. Um, what's the longest word in the English language? Anti-disestablishmentarianism, what else? That's it! On the other hand, the longest word in Latin is honorific ability natatibus. Wow! You better take it off, Bullwinkle. How come? Your head's beginning to smoke again. Yeah. Well, I guess we don't need this one anymore. And Rocky lightly tossed away the bomb-filled bowler. By chance, it skimmed through the air and landed right at the feet of Natasha Fatal. I wear the derby. No, I wear the derby. Natasha, are you a loyal Pennsylvanian? You know it, fearless leader. Then your duty is clear. Naturally, darling. And Natasha picked up a nearby tree branch and clouted fearless leader. Honey, fun, you did it. But I thought you were loyal Pennsylvania. Right, Boris. And first duty of any Pennsylvanian is... Double-cross double cross everybody. everybody! And now, for my moment of triumph, I put on Derby and become smartest man in world. Well, Dalek. Well, I'm waiting. Something's bound to happen soon. And it did. Boris! It... it exploded! Good guess! What we do now? You know, I've been thinking of applying for civil service job. Boris, what civil service job could you do? I could start civil wars. And it looks like you're beginning already. Mm. Sure enough, it seemed that Phyllis Leader had recovered from his blow on the noggin. Well, bad enough, I'm glad to find out at last what a renegade you are. What a what? Renegade, darling, is nice way of saying you're a pink. Me? But you won't be for long. You are going to liquidate me after I saved your life? Another trick, Badenov? No, look at Derby. It was really a bomb. Hmm, so that is why you wanted to put it on first. Of course, old boss man lover pumpkin lamby pie. I didn't want anything to happen to my beloved superior. Stop drooling on my knuckles, Badenov. You're giving me rheumatism. So you wouldn't knock off loyal old me, would you? Bad enough, are you really loyal? If I'm not, may lightning strike me this minute. <laughs> See, it missed me. Very well, Badenov. I give you one more chance to get the Kerwood Derby. That's all I need. I got new plan. What is it, darling? I can't tell you. It's too terrible to mention, yes? No. Then why can't you tell me? Because episode is over. So it is. Be with us next time for a snitch in time or the thinking man's filter. <laughs> Thank you.
There was once a handsome young prince named John. And where one finds a handsome young prince, one is most certain to find a beautiful young princess. Her name was Tinsel, and they were very much in love. I love you, John. <laughs> I love you, Tinsel. They were never happy unless they were together. Oh, I'm so unhappy. Peekaboo, guess who? Oh, no, I'm happy. <laughs> day after day, they went out hunting or fishing. Night after night, they went to balls at the funny house at the beach. They sang and danced and ate sugar plums out of the same dish. They shared delicate secrets together. How much money do you have? Oh, a hundred million grinkles. You know, give or take a thousand or so. va va voom That's a lot of grinkles. You can say that again. va va voom That's a lot of grinkles. Then finally, as everyone knew they would, they were married. And they moved into a beautiful white castle high on a green hill. They were so full of joy that everybody called it the happy house. Yeah. Oh, I'm so happy! <laughs> <laughs> that is everybody but one, an evil old witch named Grumpyra who hated happiness. It's disgusting! I'll put a stop to it if it's the last thing I do! Then, taking a basket of poison apples, she hurried off to the castle. Who is it, dear? It's an old hag with mussed up hair selling apples. Apples? Yes, you know. The poison kind that you take a bite of and they put you to sleep for a million years. Oh, well, tell her we don't want any. We don't want any. With that, the witch was roughly thrown from the castle. And once again, happiness echoed from within. <laughs> <laughs> By now, Grumpyra was near the breaking point, and storming back to her cave, she took a huge black kettle and set herself to the task of concocting a mysterious, evil-smelling brew. <laughs> now, where did I put the gruffy dust? Oh, yes, here it is. A pinch of this and a pinch of that. A dewy button and a French fried bat. <laughs> oh, all these witches' brews are murder, but what are you going to do? A short time later, she had finished and hurried off to the castle where she stole into the garden and sprayed every rose with a strange mixture. It's done. Now when the princess comes into the garden to pick roses... Oh, the garden is beautiful today. I shall pick some roses for my prince. She will pick her finger... Ouch! ...and turn into an ogre! And when the beautiful young princess, who was now an ugly old ogre, went into the castle... Hello, dear. <laughs> Wearing your hair a little differently, aren't you? It's worse than that. I turned into an ogre. A closer look told the prince that what she said was true, and this made him very unhappy. The old witch's plan had worked, for the castle was now the saddest place on earth. Now the story would have ended right there, but for one thing. Ogres love to cook. And that night, when John's ogre wife set his evening meal in front of him, it was the most magnificent food he had ever tasted. Dear, uh, I mean uh, it, uh, that was the best meal I ever had. So pleased was the wife by the compliment that she went right back into the kitchen and cooked some more. And before long, being so full of fine food made the prince happy. This, of course, made the ogre happy, and once again, happiness rang from the castle. <laughs> <laughs> Grumpyra, of course, wasted no time in flying back to the castle to see what had gone wrong. Say, laughing boy, how can you possibly be happy with an ogre for a wife? Well, it's the food it cooks. Have a bite? Say, that is tasty. Join me? Love to. They both dug in and ate all John's ogre wife could cook, and she cooked all they could eat. The food was so good that even Grumpyra, for the first time in her life, was happy. You know, she's such a good cook that uh, I could kiss her. Oh, no, no, no! Never do that, boy. All right, but why not? Because if a handsome prince kisses her, it will break the spell, and she will turn back into a beautiful princess who can't cook for sour apples. She? Oh, I'm glad you told me. As a precaution against ever kissing the ogre by mistake, the prince let his beard grow and wore a gag over his mouth whenever he wasn't eating. Things were well and happy for a score of years until one day when John's ogre wife was giving some scraps to their pet dog, he affectionately licked her face and she instantly turned back into the beautiful princess. Ah, what happened? The dog kissed her. You don't mean... I'm afraid so. His name is Prince. That meant an end to the good cooking and the prince and the witch were frantic. Doesn't it make you happy that I'm beautiful again, John? Quiet, quiet, quiet. <laughs> Do you remember what you did? I think so. Come on. 
Now, having an ogre for a wife has its drawbacks, but John was happy that way. And very soon thereafter... A, a pinch, pinch of this, a pinch, pinch of that, a dewy button and, and a french fry cat. John was to be very happy once again. Thinkers, you. Today's lecture is entitled Falling Asleep on the Job Can Lead to a Rude Awakening or Don't Be a Sonambulist Chaser. Let us suppose first that you are an admiral in the army doing sentry duty. The condition is red and so are your eyeballs from lack of sleep. Falling asleep here would mean you'd lose your good conduct ribbon. The best way to stay awake is rush inside the nearest shack and light a cigarette. <laughs> Preferably a candy cigarette. Next, we shall take a situation often faced by test pilots. You find yourself in the latest model, with your speedometer reading half full. You are ready to go into a screaming dive. After you land, right now it is your job to break the sound barrier. Or at least bend it a little. You turn on your radio and contact the tower. This is Red Letter Day, calling disabled Baker Charlie. Mayday, over. You discover to your disgust that disabled Baker Charlie has gone into a screaming dive to wait for you. Anxious to get this over with, you throw the ship into a screaming dive. <laughs> Hiya, fellas. Now I ask you, who could sleep in here? Thank you, Mr. Nodo, for showing us how to stay awake. <laughs> Today's lesson is mighty important, remember? Boo Winkle is a. Not that lesson! <coughs> this lesson! <laughs> Falls and sometimes it doesn't. One of the times it didn't was back in the year 1901. There it was pouring itself all over the place and then suddenly, without warning, honeymoon couples from all over the world stood transfixed. Who was responsible for this black deed? Who turned the tap on this great natural wonder? The little old fall maker, me. Yes, Snidely Whiplash. <laughs> and they said Kansas was dry. Whiplash had concocted a diabolical scheme to undermine Canada's economy. From a travel booth at the bottom of the now dry falls. Honeymooners, listen to me. Don't spend your money in Canada. Come to beautiful Oki Vanoki Swamp in the lush Florida Everglades. Don't let old acquaintance be for cotton mouths. Scores of couples disappointed by Niagara's inactivity rush to the charlatan. No pushing. Steady there. No, sir, I'm only selling one-way tickets. Sooner or later, word of this was bound to reach the mounted police. Do right. All the honeymooners are going to Florida. Tell me you are joshing, Inspector. Oh, wish I were. We must do something. Right. You and Nell get married and leave for Florida in the morning. This is too good a deal to pass up. Nell who, sir? Nell, my daughter, that's who. Send Nell in here. You call, Daddy dear? You don't have to salute Nell. Just stand at attention. Ah, Nell, you grow fairer each day. This is Nell, do right. I'm the inspector. Well, you grow fairer too, sir. Nell, how would you like to marry Dudley? Dudley who? Dudley Do-Right. Send Do-Right in here. I am in here. Oh, I think it would be fun, Daddy, especially if we honeymoon in Niagara. How about Florida? No, my Canadian heart is set on Niagara. That settles it, Do-Right. Go to Niagara and undam the river. Once the falls start falling, you and Nell can be married. Nell who? Constable Do-Right wasted no time in getting to Niagara. He arrived just as Snidely Whiplash was making the dam even more secure than ever. You up there, drop that rock! When our hero 
all awoke, he found himself tied to a railroad track. And the 1202 was on its way. Whiplash, you black-hearted scoundrel. What are you up to besides no good? It's a new game called Eraser, in which I get to rub you out. When I said the 1202 was on its way, I meant on its way to Alaska. You see, it had already passed the spot where Dudley was tied. I don't understand it. You should have been run over by now. Cheer up. Another one will come along. The next train's due at 1945. Is that an hour? No, it's a year. Dudley was all for waiting, but Snidely wasn't one for taking things lying down. He picked up his victim and set off for the St. Lawrence River. Once there, he promptly booked passage on the first steamboat leaving for Alaska. What's you going to Alaska for? To catch a train. Oh, and if any messages come for Constable Do-Right, tell him he's all tied up. The steamboat eventually dropped anchor in the harbor of Nome. Well, Do-Right, according to my calculations, the 1202 from Quebec will be pulling into Nome any second. Come, we must find a deserted stretch of track. How about this, Snidely? This looks good. Now, you make the choice. After all, you're going to be tied to it. Oh, this will do fine, then. You know something? I could like you if it weren't for your sense of justice and fair play. Why don't you rotten up like me? Oh, I could never do that. Hark, better stand back or I'll miss my train. This was it, then. This was our valiant hero's swan song. His future would all be past. Nevermore would his innate goodness roam the Canadian wilds. Nevermore. Thank God, methinks I feel a twinge of pity. Goodbye, Mr. Whiplash. Some foreign feeling beats within my heart and breast. Do I feel the pangs of guilt? Tell Mumsy how I went. I can't do it! I can't! I can't! I can't! And with that, Whiplash pulled the switch, and the speeding train swerved onto another track. You couldn't kill me, could you? No. I suppose I'm just an old softy. Thank you, Mr. Whiplash. Say no more, just go. I want to be left alone to think, ponder, reflect. I can hardly believe my ears, Inspector. It's true. The city of Niagara condemned the dam and had it destroyed. Niagara Falls are falling. That means Nell and I can be married. Nell who? Well, fortune in the form of a strong breeze smiled once again on our heroes as it practically blew the Kerwood Derby into their laps. Now Bullwinkle is once more a mental marble, the smartest moose in the world. Or even in the U.S. of A., which is bigger. That is, when he's wearing the derby. The energy factors in electromagnetic quanta are proportionate to the wavelength of radiation. But there's one drawback to wearing the derby. My brains keep overheating. In the meantime, Boris and Natasha had been given one last chance to get the fabulous bowler back. You see this box bad enough? Yes, fearless leader. At noon, I send it to Potsylvania with Kerwood Derby inside. Suppose I don't get Derby. I send it back with you inside. But I wouldn't be able to breathe in there. Believe me, that will be the least of your problems. You mean? Jawohl, you won't be breathing. Oh, boy. Boris, he's not kidding. You're not kidding, he's not kidding. Come on. And the two villains set off on their last desperate attempt to thwart our heroes, who were at that moment wondering what to do with the Derby. Bowinkle, there's only one place that hat should be. On a hat rack. We gotta take it to Washington. He never wears a derby. No, I mean... Usually he wears a wig. Bowinkle! Besides, he's not with us anymore, you know. Bowinkle! He's gone to the big cherry orchard in the sky. I don't mean George Washington. I mean Washington, D.C. Oh, him! That derby should be worn by the heads of government. See, that's right. Now, how do we get to Washington from here? We're broke. It's me. Put on the hat and see if you can get an idea. Okay, let's see. Well, obviously, the best way to get to Washington is run for office and be elected. Bowinkle, it worked! It did? What'd I say? We're gonna run as candidates. All the way to Washington? No. Come on, I'll show you. Rocky and Bowinkle started their campaign. First, they held a rally of the Hatful clan. And if I'm elected, I'll drive every Floy out of the county. <laughs> Next, they held a rally for the Floy clan. And if I'm elected, I promise to drive every Hatful out of the county. <laughs> around here after the election. As a result, before the day was over, Rocky had been unanimously elected as a representative from Peaceful Valley, Missouri, and was on his way to Washington. Traveling first class, too. Yep, first class freight. 
forest. They are getting away. Of course, but the derby won't. Yes, at that moment, Rocky asked... When will we arrive in Washington, Boenko? Wait, I'll put on my demon derby and come up with the answer. Boris prepared to hurl a strange weapon. He's a boomerang, Natasha. Darling, you can throw a boomerang. In a perfect cycle, Natasha. Watch. And just as Bullwinkle began to speak... We'll arrive in Washington on the... The boomerang neatly lifted the derby from his head. Go on, Bullwinkle. Go on where? When do we get there? Why, well, ask me. Because you're wearing the Kerwood Derby on your head and... <gasps> Hokey smoke, it's gone! My head? The hat! Oh, I'm glad it wasn't my head. I wouldn't have nothing to hang my antlers on. The wind must have blown it off. Stop the train! Well, here it comes, darling. Oh, Boris, you're such a dirty crook. You're just saying this because you know it's true. Where did you learn to throw boomerang? Where else? Australia, where I spent two years living with the kangaroos. You were a naturalist? No, a pickpocket. Well, it looks as if our bad guys have won at last. But anyway, watch our next gloomy episode, Boomerang Bowler, or Boris Makes a Comeback. <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A uh, Bullwinkle, time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. The Kerwood Derby has really been an on-again, off-again proposition. The latest on was when Rocky said... Put it on, Bullwinkle. Maybe you can tell us what time we'll arrive in Washington. Easy. We'll figure the circumference of the standard wheel disk times the rate of speed computed sigma times the inverse square of the logarithm of the cosine and tangent. Sure we will. And the latest off was when Boris hurled a boomerang which neatly lifted the derby from Bullwinkle's dome and began to return it to the villains. Darling, it's working. Of course. When I throw boomerang, it always goes in perfect circles. Careful, darling. Nobody's perfect. Go ahead, Boenko. Go ahead and what? Sigma, your inverse cosigner. Uh-oh, your derby's gone again. The wind must have blew it all. Stop the train! 
Well, here it comes, Natasha. Now I just... But the boomerang was just a little too high for Boris to reach, and as a result, it went past him in a wide arc and headed right back toward our heroes. Derby was deposited neatly on his head again. And we'll be in Washington at 7.32 and a half p.m. Oh, when it's back again. Me, certainement, mon ami. But the steam is coming out of your ears. You better take it off. Well, Boris, you were right. Boomerang goes in perfect circle. First to them. Then to us. Then back to them. Then, hey, I just figured out. What? It should be coming back to us again. If... Congratulations, darling. You are right again. Who needs it? Well, just as Bullwinkle had predicted, their freight train rolled into Washington at 7.32 and a half, and our boys dashed into town to deliver the Kerwood Derby to a responsible government agency. Unfortunately, by now, it was 7.40 p.m. Go away, we're closed for the day. But this is important. What is? What we got in this hat box is... Let me ask you, will it explode before 10 a.m.? No, but it... Will it melt? No. Will it go flat? No, then but... Then come back in the morning. Will somebody see us? I don't know, but I'll be off duty then. Golly, what are we going to do? Say, I don't want to be a nosy park of, but aren't you Rocky and Boobinkle? That's right, who are you? Allow me to introduce myself. Hail fellow Jay Beckslap, official Washington greeter. Greeter? Listen. Welcome, welcome, welcome! Oh, that yeah, 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 come, come, come! Say, that's a pretty good greeting, all right. Sounds like his welcome is wagon. But haven't we met before, Mr. Backslap? I'd know you if we did, stranger. I'm terrible on faces, but I never forget a pair of antlers. Well, maybe you could help us get a room, Mr. Backslap. Can I help you get a room? Can I help you get a room? You know, there's kind of an echo around here. How would you like to spend the night in the little White House? What's the little White House? It's where the special friends of the president stay. You mean we're special friends of the president? Why not, Rock? I've been voting the straight bull moose ticket for years. Jeez, well, lead us to it. And hail fellow Jay Backslap led them down a dimly lit street to a house that was shabby, run down, and very sinister. But it is white, sort of. Golly, is this where the president's special friends stay? Yes, and what's more, he's inside waiting for you. He is? Oh, he shouldn't have done it. Just a phone call would have been enough. Well, for once, Boris wasn't lying. The president was waiting inside, but it was the president of the Liquidate Rocky and Bullwinkle Club, fearless leader himself. And the meeting will come to order. Be with us next time for All in Fever, Say I, or The Emotion is Carried. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> Ooh, don't know my own strength. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. <laughs> Once in a kingdom there was a king who was such a great king that he was fit for a king. He was handsome and brave, his castle was paid for, and he had the pink slip to the royal carriage. He even had a swimming pool shaped like a swimming pool. But for all this, he did have one little fault. Oh, honey, dearest. Whom is it you wish, sire? My wife, the queen, that's whom. But, sire, you're not married. Oh? Maybe that's why I can't find her. Yes, the king was absent-minded and couldn't seem to remember anything. He had forgotten to ever marry. Knowing that every king should have a queen, he discussed the matter with his prime minister. What shall I do? Get married! If I'm ever going to have a queen, I'll have to have some help. So saying, he took a wishbone from his pocket that he had been saving for just such an emergency, snapped it, got the biggest half, and said his wish. Help! With that, there was a tinkling of tiny bells... A blinding flash of light, and a beautiful blue fairy appeared. I'm a magic blue fairy, and I can help you get a queen. I am all ears. I know, but I can still help you get a queen. Taking the king to a golden chariot, they soared up into the sky, raced among the clouds, and finally came to rest in a deep forest. 
Well, it's a nice way to travel, but you'll have to admit, those landings are a little rough. Yeah, I noticed that. Now, where is this beautiful princess who is to be my queen? She's a lovely princess, and she's in that castle on yon mountain. Good. Let's go get her. Well, first you must slay the terrible giant who lives in the woods. Bye. Hey, wait! With this magic sword, you can defeat him easily. Well, that was encouraging, and the king bravely entered the woods where he soon came face to face with the giant. Rawr! Rawr! Yourself! Now stick him up! The king could have simply slain the giant on the spot, but for one thing, he had forgotten the magic sword. The giant gave the hapless king a terrible beating. He threw you nearer the castle, so you've passed that obstacle. You were lucky. Yeah, lucky. Now let's go get the princess. Hey, not so fast. Next, you must pass through the huge, vicious thorn bush that surrounds the castle. I can never get through there. You can when I tell you the secret, and that's to be brave, for the thorns will part to let a brave man pass. Oh, yeah. Well, then, uh, that sounds easy enough. Stand back. He ran headlong toward the vicious thorns, but also running true to form, he forgot to be brave, chickened out, and... <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. Did it again, eh? Yeah, looks like. Well, never you mind. I'll just wave my magic <laughs> wand and make those old vicious thorns disappear. There we go. Hey, why didn't you tell me you could do that before? Well, you didn't ask me. Well, anyway, now we can go on the castle and get the princess to be my queen. No, not quite yet. First, you must do away with a wicked witch that guards her. Problems, problems. Why so many problems? It's the breaks, boy. Beautiful princesses just don't come easy in these fairy tales. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, okay, what's the gimmick with a wicked witch? I'll give you a magic word that'll make her disappear. And that is? Thundervogel. Wouldn't you know it? Me with a lousy memory. So, armed with the magic word, the king ran into the castle and... Ha-ha! Now, you wicked witch. Hold it. I'm the beautiful princess. That's the wicked witch over there. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Ha-ha! Now, you wicked witch. So, a handsome king who dares to enter my castle, eh? Well, just for that, I'll turn you into a toad. <laughs> higgledy piggledy, my black head. Stop! What for? For I have a magic word that'll make you disappear. And it is, uh, uh... Then we'll get on with it. Uh, uh, uh... Thunderball! It was a miracle. The king had remembered the word, and the wicked witch disappeared in a cloud of green smoke. But so happy was the king by the fact that he finally remembered something, he completely forgot why he was there. Yippee! I remembered! I remembered! Weeks went by, and of course, the absent-minded king did not return to his kingdom, for he was unable to remember which kingdom was his. Finally, he chanced to pass a lovely young girl from whom he asked directions, and when she put her dainty finger to her chin to think over the question... Pardon me, but uh, I can't help noticing that you have a string tied around your finger. Uh, what's it for? To help me remember. Remember what? I don't know. I forgot. The girl, it seemed, was as absent-minded as the king. And needless to say, there was such a common bond, they fell in love. And so it was that, um, 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 uh, what's his name, married, uh, what's her name in, uh, who's it? And they lived, uh, oh, what you might call it, uh, uh, life happily ever after. Cat fanciers. Today's poem is that soul stirring classic, I Love Little Pussy. Uh, where's the pussycat, Rock? Over there, but it's not really. <clears throat> poem I love little pussy, her coat is so warm, and if I don't hurt her, <coughs> she, she, she'll do. <coughs> no, Rock, this is a tiger. I know, the pet store made a mistake. So, so I'll not pull her tail or d d drive her away. But Pussy and I very gently will play. Bullwinkle, what are you doing up here? Uh, I'm looking from a poetry book. Why look up here? You lost it down there. Yeah, but uh, up here the light's better. <laughs> Private 
Garrett Bullwinkle, sir, with a message. Just in time. Is it important? Is it? Just look. <laughs> Peabody, Sherman, and Wayback here. Sherman is the one opening the package. Gee, Mr. Peabody, just what I've always wanted. A skirt? Those are kilts. I bought them for today's journey. That must mean we're going to Scotland, right? Right. We kilted ourselves, set the Wayback Machine for the year 1745, and we're on our way. Before you could say, Brobricht nicht, we were standing outside the thatched cottage in the city of Aberdeen. We were about to enter when suddenly a detachment of British soldiers burst out of the night and broke down the cottage door. <laughs> Hands on, everyone! You got no right coming in here that way. Hold on to your tongue now. We know you're riding him. Hand him over. Hand who over? Him. Who's him? I, I mean him. Bonnie Pritch Charlie. He's under arrest. Well, you'll not find him here. This is Scottish soil, and you got no right to persecute the poor lad. But the soldier paid no heed and ordered his men to search the cottage. <laughs> After creating a shambles, they left. <laughs> That was a close one. You mean Bonnie Prince Charlie was here all the time? Aye, laddie. And unless we smuggle him down to the sea, I'm afraid he's doomed. Mr. Peabody will see that he gets away, won't you, Mr. Peabody? Sherman, I'd much rather shop for bagpipes than go... It's a deal. You sell bagpipes? No, I mean about you escorting the Bonnie Prince to the sea. Uh, there was no way out. The old Scotsman went to a closet in which Bonnie Prince Charlie was undoubtedly hiding. This should be easy, Mr. Peabody. All we have to do is disguise him. What as? A tree? For Bonnie Prince Charlie stood nine feet tall. Jeepers! He's big! So is our task. I don't know how you'll do it, but smuggle him out of Aberdeen and head for the ocean. There'll be a boat there waiting to take him to France. We left the cottage and, with our charge in tow, made a beeline for the road leading out of Aberdeen. Oh, my gosh! Look, Mr. Peabody! There's a British sentry guarding the road. Hmm. How does one get a nine-foot-tall prince past a sentry? I gave the problem one second of thought, and moments later, wearing a sweater with the word coach on it, I approached the sentry. Halt! Who goes there? I go there. Coach Peabody of the Aberdeen basketball team. Ah, here comes my team now. <laughs> Sentry was practically mesmerized. Out of the fog, dribbling their way, came Sherman and Charlie. And needless to say, the plan worked. We're out of Aberdeen, Mr. Peabody. Now what? Now we... Ch Charlie? Uh, Charlie, are you up there, Charlie? Golly, Mr. Peabody, where is he? The fog cleared momentarily, and we got the answer. Charlie had dribbled his way back into Aberdeen. Uh, let me see, Sherman. What would a nine-foot prince do with a basketball? Of course, he'd look for a basket. Wasting no time, he ran to Aberdeen Square Garden, bought two tickets to the game, and dashed inside. There on the court, blissfully dribbling his freedom away, was Charlie. This place is packed with English soldiers. But due to the fact that all basketball players are tall, Charlie went undiscovered. That is, until he made the game-winning basket. And that's when he put on a sweatshirt, one with his name emblazoned on the back, of course. Oh, it's him! Grab him! Grab him there! It's, it's the prince it is! Things looked black, and I made them blacker. The resultant confusion enabled us to sneak away. A short time later... Well, we reached the coast, Mr. Peabody. Our job is over. Not quite. We're supposed to turn the prince here over to a waiting boat. I don't see any boat. I don't either. All I see are British soldiers. And they're heading this way. I knew we had to hide Charlie and hide him fast. But he's too tall to hide. Then we'll cut him down to size. Do you dig? You bet I dig, Big Daddy. Like, I'm hip. No, no, no. I, I mean dig as in excavation. Oh! Sherman promptly fell to his knees and began scooping sand. Uh, you'd better let me do that, Sherman. After all, I've, I've had more experience. I dug in and dug out. In no time at all, I had a six-foot hole into which I put Bonnie Prince Charlie. Gee, now he looks three feet tall. The soldiers quickly converged upon us. Oi! You bloke seen anything of a nine-foot-tall prince? Sorry, sir, but we haven't. We seemed to have fooled them until one sharp-eyed grenadier spotted a ring on Bonnie Prince Charlie's finger. Them initials BPC, what do they stand for? Uh, uh, buy Peabody's chestnuts. My name is Peabody, and I sell chestnuts. The trooper was satisfied and left. A half hour later, a ship appeared and ran a plank to the shore. Goodbye, Mr. Prince, Your Majesty. Bonnie Prince Charlie went aboard. As a token of his appreciation, Sherman and I received one of his horses. He sure is beautiful. That he is, and I'm surprised to say he doesn't even hurt. You expected him to hurt you? Well, Charlie horses usually do.
Last time you remember, our heroes weren't able to turn the Kerwood Derby over to a responsible government agency due to the fact that they showed up in Washington after closing hours. But this is a crisis! In this town, Buster, everything's a crisis. And as if that weren't enough, they were flim flammed by Boris Badenov, who pretended to be an official greeter. Hello, hello, my friends, hello. With my guitar, I sing to you. You don't have a guitar. I don't have an entertainment license either. It's okay, that wasn't entertainment. Come on, wise guy, I mean, oh, wise one. And Boris had taken them to the little White House, which happened to be neither little nor particularly white. But it is a house, and inside is the president. The president? Oh, boy. Yes, the president of the Let's Liquidate Rocky and Bullwinkle Club. Gee, we can give him the Kerwood Derby. I don't know if it'll fit over all that hair. And Rocky reached for the handle of the door just as, oh, I can't watch. Tell me what happened. All righty. Suddenly, a mysterious voice comes from nowhere. Who said that? Don't look at me. Thanks. And then two round eyes appeared out of nothing. And a scooch gun, too. Aimed right at you know who. Me? That's who? Bullwinkle, do you know who that is? Sure, it's Mr. Backslap. No, those two voices. Uh, the Invisible Man plus one? No, it's Cloyd and Gidney, the Moon Man. Oh, boy. So it is. How come you fellas to be here? Oh, we've been on your trail for days, Bullwinkle. Ever since you left the convention. The Moose Convention? Moose, moose convention. convention? I thought you said Moon Convention, Clyde. I thought it was Moon Convention, Gidney. Well, anyway, here we are. Hand it over. Hand what over? The Kerwood Derby. We came to take it back. Never. Never. You said it. Because it makes anyone who wears it the smartest person in the world. That's right, and that's why we need it. Yeah, but so do we. And so do I. But we need it more than you need it. How come that? You tell him, Cloyd. No, you. All, All right, right, I will. will. We, we really, really need it for King Nosmo. And the two moon men told our heroes the fabulous story of their moon king, Nosmo the One Half. Nosmo was the only child of King Ugbert the Ugly and Queen Ethelred the Unready. He was raised in the lap of lunar luxury and sent to the moon's finest schools. But at his final examinations... Very well, Your Highness. How much is two and two? Uh, about, uh, what, 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 two? How do you spell catalog? C-A-T. C-A-T, that's cat. Come, come, my boy. What follows cat? The O-G, dog. Let's face it, Your Majesty, Nosmo's just one of those misfits. Nevertheless, Lyndon, he is a prince. Okay, he's one of those misprints. Better. And someday he's going to rule the moon. That is going to rule the moon? Uh, this little piggy went to market. Uh, this little piggy, yet uh, 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 Don't tell me, don't tell me. One day under his rule and we're doomed. You're right, Lyndon. <clears throat> Very well. Summon the wizard. Summon the wizard. Summon the wizard. Summon the wizard. Hey, whiz! Yeah, 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 right away, right away. What'll it be, fellas? What'll it be? Card trick? Magic flowers? Genie out of the bottle? You call? No, no, no. Nothing like that. All right, cool it, Gene. What's the problem? We need something to make Nosmo smart. How about a good belt right now? No, 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 no. Not that kind of smart. We want to make him intelligent. Oh, you're kidding, aren't you? I can't do anything for you today. Why not? It's the end of the episode. My goodness, so it is. Be with us again when we'll see Too Much, Too Moon, or What Makes Luna Tick. Well, I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. That's not all. The fingers get tired.
adventures of Ruffy and Bullwinkle and friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel, and his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Likewise. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. Well, it seems the Kerwood Derby is probably the most wanted hat that ever was. First of all, Rocky and Bullwinkle want it. We want it so we can help our country. Fearless Leader wants it. I want it so I can rule the world. Boris wants it. I want it so I can rule Fearless Leader. And the Moon Men, Gidney and Cloyd, want it. We, we want it because it's ours. Yours! And while our friends listened open-mouthed and Boris listened gnashing his teeth and Fearless Leader listened patting his machine gun, the Moon Men told their loony story. That's loony story. Uh, sorry, the light's bad. It seems that on the moon there was once a very stupid, ignorant prince named Nosmo. Not me, you idiot! Him! Daddy, play hide-and-go-seek with me. All right, Nosmo. I'll hide and you count to five. I always get the hard part. One... Two, uh, right here's where it gets tough. Two. I've got to do something, Lyndon. Why not call for the wizard? Good idea. Oh, Mr. Kerward! Sorry to be late. The lights was against me. Oh, wizard, you must do something about my son. It's a little late now, isn't it? Hmm? I mean, he's kind of big to get rid of now. People would talk. No, no, no. I just want Nosmo to be a good ruler. Oh, why don't you say so? I just say the magic word, Menominee, Michigan, and there you are. He's a good ruler. Not that kind of a ruler. Oh. Put him back. He makes more sense this way. Come on. Oh, very well. Sacramento, California. Three. Uh, Try four. Gee, thanks. Four, two, three. Uh, Mr. Kerwood, I want you to make Nosmo intelligent. You must be joking. No, no, no. He's going to be king someday. He must be smart. Why don't you make him a magic crown or something? Sorry, I can't help you. Guards! But I'll try. Good. But it's going to take a lot out of me. And so the wizard worked day and night readying his magic spell, designing the crown, preparing the magical elements until finally late one night. Ten seconds to midnight. Nine, eight. Will it work, Mr. Kerwood? It's better. Seven, six, five. That's the number proper five. Now let's play hide and go seek. Keep away from the table, Nosmo. Two, one. <laughs> Well, when the smoke cleared away, everybody seemed unharmed except Mr. Kerwood, who said... I told you this was going to take a lot out of me. But instead of a crown, on the table was the Kerwood Derby. Not much for looks, is it? No, but put it on anyway, Nosmo. That, all right. Now, can you count up to five? Of course, Peter, but I'd rather discuss electron distribution and spectroheliac magnetic field. Kerwood, you did it! He's smart! Yeah. Name your price, you can have anything. Anything? Anything! Okay. You know where I can get some lifts for these shoes? And so, King Nosmo has worn the Kerwood Derby ever since. Yeah, but what's it doing down here? King Nosmo lent it to us to make our first trip here. And Cloyd forgot it. I left it under a theater seat in St. Louis. Oh, come! We were watching an out-of-town tryout. It was so bad... We had to leave quickly. Well, it's finders keepers, I always say. Right, boys? All together, right. But our heroes remain silent. What's the matter? You don't believe in togetherness? No, because it's really their hat. Details, always details. Now, let's go in and see the president. But as Rocky reached for the doorknob, fearless leader reached for the trigger. Oh, don't miss our next episode, Flying Bullets or a Cartridge in a Pear Tree. <laughs> Hey, Rocky.
monkey. Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But that trick never worked. This time for sure. Resto! Well, I'm getting close. And now it's time for another special feature. Back in the days when everyone was on the Snow White kick, scallywags and roustabouts had an easy time of it. Your money or your life? Oh, that's easy. You can take my wife. Not your wife, your life. It's funny you're my way, but take my purse. Statistics showed that crime was rampant, especially in a tiny kingdom known as Easy Pickens. The people there used to set their watches by the number of robberies that occurred. What time do you have? Uh, let me see. The blacksmith is being held up, so it must be 11.15. This might have gone on indefinitely had it not been for the arrival of a jolly gentleman on a black donkey whose name was Mule. His name was Skylar Sugg, and his hobby was preventing crime. Your money or your wife? The lady appeared as if by magic, and the robber was thwarted. What's more, Mr. Sugg spent the next seven days in wielding his shillelagh in the cause of justice. Citizens of Easy Pickens, we owe a great deal to Skylar Sugg. It comes to $43.12. He has not only cleaned out the town, but he's cleaned out the town treasury. Sug opened a tiny but adequate detective agency and proceeded to solve any and all mysteries. I lost my pet cow, Mr. Sug. You'll find him inside the counter at the butcher's store at 89 cents a pound. He's on special, too. Somebody's been stealing eggs from our chicken house, Mr. Sug. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you eating your breakfast. Be with you as soon as I finish these coddled eggs. And there's no doubt of it, fellow villagers. Skylar Sugg is our man of the year. Yay! I don't know what to say, Mr. Mayor. Yay! That's when the trouble started. It was one of the coldest winters on record. And a massive fog bank sprang up out of the lower valleys and blanketed the area. It didn't stay very long, but it left behind something. For there, in the middle of a once vacant meadow, stood a black castle. Must be one of those prefab jobs. It was then he noticed that not a door or a window was to be seen. You in there! Lower the drawbridge! No answer. Just the cold, clammy wind whistling through the turrets. Better send a wire to Alfred Hitchcock. The news spread through the town like wildfire, and by noon, everyone was standing before the huge castle. It's black magic, that's what it is. Nonsense, Mr. Mayor. Here, boys, take these torches and set fire to the place. But suppose there's a witch in there. We'll smoke her out. Under Sugg's direction, the villagers set the castle on fire. Or at least they tried to. The castle won't burn, Mr. Sugg. What do you mean it won't burn? You can smell the smoke. Well, the smoke was coming from a nearby forest. Why, it's supernatural, that's what it is. We set the castle on fire and the forest burns up. Poppycock and Balderdash and all those other reindeer. The others were too frightened to move. Not Skylar Sugg, though. He carried a huge sack of gunpowder to the edge of the moat, lit a fuse, and then swung the sack around and around and finally flung it high over the castle wall. Watch. Any second now. Boom! They watched in breathless silence, waiting for the blast. And they got what they were waiting for. Unfortunately, it wasn't the castle that blew up. It was half the village. Sugg was in for a fight. Why? We better keep an eye on this castle. You'd better get some sleep, Skyler. You've got an awful lot of work to do tomorrow. I have got an awful lot of work to do right now. Extracting a magnifying glass from his pocket, Skyler left the warm fire to probe the back side of the castle. I'll take over while you're sleuthing. Nothing happened for about 10 or 15 minutes. Then, suddenly, the drawbridge of the castle slowly came down. What'll we do, Mr. Mayor? Only one thing to do. We've got to go inside. Brave words indeed. Thus the mayor, in fact, the remainder of the village, went slowly across the drawbridge and into the black castle. No sooner did they enter than the drawbridge mysteriously went up, sealing one and all inside. Dawn was late in coming, and so was Skylar Sugg, who had gotten lost in the pitch darkness and spent most of the night home in bed. Good morning, every... <gasps> A chill ran through him. There was no one left. 
And there were such wonderful folks. They were always trying to do something for me. His hair, what was left of it, stood on end. As once more, the drawbridge came down. Would he be able to summon enough courage to go in alone and uncover the secret? Heavens no! I am not going in there! Oh, go on, Mr. Sugg. We'll be right behind you. Go ahead now. Open the door. <sighs> surprise! Surprise! <laughs> Happy birthday, Skyler! Them's my kind of people. Concern them! part of our program, we bring you Bullwinkle's Corner with that Moose of Letters, Bullwinkle. Hello there. Today's poem is from Mother Moose. Mother Goose. Goose? Must be a misprint. Anyways, the poem is Little Miss Muffet. Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet. What's a tuffet? Hmm? What's a tuffet? It's what I'm sitting on, eating her curds and whey. Boy, this stuff is terrible. Along come a spider at... You have a spider? He couldn't make it. But you ain't scary. You're supposed to scare me. Okay, fellas. Up. Take two. Along come a spider and sat down beside her and... Ah! A spider! A spider! Hey! Hey, Ruff. Hey, Miss Muffet. Your curds and whey are on your head. Let me tell you something. I'd rather wear them than eat them. <laughs> That's a pretty strange-looking painting, Bullwinkle. I just paint what I see. Well, what do you see? This is what I see. of the Royal Canadian Mounties was feeling fit as a fiddle and ready for love. I'm feeling fit as a fiddle and ready for love, Nell. <laughs> you look terrible. What's that, Nell? I said you look terrible. Your posture's all slumped, your eyes have lost their sparkle, and your complexion is bad. Frankly, Dudley, you look kind of puny. Puny? But, Nell, I'm in the best of shape. Otherwise, what would I be doing in the Mounties? Puny, puny, puny. Here, I'll prove it to you. Let's arm wrestle. Oh, Nell, that's just being silly. You know you're no match for a Mountie. Just put your muscle where your mouth is, Dudley. Two out of three, Nell? I saw that, Dudley. I'm not going to have a Mountie of mine lose an arm wrestling contest with a mere slip of a girl. But, Inspector, you look terrible. Well, look at that posture. Dudley, you go and build yourself up and don't come back until you learn to stand up straight. It wasn't just coincidence that prompted Snidely Whiplash to open his Vic Whiplash gym. It was money. And knowing that Dudley Do-Right wanted to build himself up, who better than Snidely Whiplash could help Dudley Do-Right build himself down? I'd like to enroll in your gym. Fine, fine. Now, the swimming pool is over there, bowling alley's over there. We have ice skating rink, golf course, pool hall, bingo room, shooting gallery, race track. I, I, I was thinking of a couple of dumbbells and maybe some sitting up exercises, you know. Do you have a gym? Follow me. There. Where are the dumbbells? Oh, that's old-fashioned. Nobody uses dumbbells anymore. All exercise is done by machines. Actually, you don't have to do a thing. The machines will do it all. So Dudley Durite took the Vic Whiplash six-month course, and sure enough, upon completing the course, Dudley had built himself down. What happened to you, Dudley? You look terrible. What has happened now is that I have completed the Vic Whiplash bodybuilding course, and I'm as strong as an ox. Let's arm wrestle. Dudley, you have been cheated. Snidely Whiplash has not built you up. He has built you down. Goodbye, Nell. I'm leaving the Mounties. There is no place for a chicken-hearted, puny man. But what will you do? How will you live? I guess I'll just have to take a <laughs> civilian job. Maybe someone has use for a puny man like me. Good luck, Dudley. Oh, 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 
Oh, don't squeeze so hard already. Oh, you did that on purpose, Nell. So Dudley Do-Right was forced to look for a job. For weeks, he was turned down because... You're too puny. Sorry we don't hire puny people here. You're so puny. Such a puny. Then I don't get the job? He, I never saw such a puny. Then all at once, Dudley's luck changed. Dudley Do-Right, eh? All right, Do-Right, the job's yours. You know our quota, 20 trees a day. Think you can handle it? Oh, yes, sir. When Dudley was finally able to get the axe off the ground, he started to work with enthusiasm. And in four weeks' time, Dudley's muscles turned to steel. Dudley Do-Right was building himself a timber! Why, you're as strong as an ox! No, ma'am, I'm puny. But Dudley didn't realize that he was building himself up. He still thought of himself as puny. Then one day, by mere accident, Dudley happened to run into Nell Fenwick. Don't touch me, you brute. Just because you have all those muscles, don't think you can have your way with a girl like me. Why, Dudley, is that you? Yes, Dudley do write your faithful puny friend. Look out! It's a runaway horse! Run for your lives! I know I did the right thing when I left the RCMP, because there's no room for a puny Mountie in the RCMP. Dudley, you lifted that horse up with one hand. No puny man could do that. You don't have to put me on. I've learned to live with the fact that I am puny. Some people are just puny. Dudley, do right. You are not puny. If I could only believe you know. Dudley, it is all in your mind. Just keep saying, I am not puny. I am not puny. Then then you can get your money back from Snidely Whiplash. I'm not puny. 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 It's good to have you back, Dudley. I can't for the life of me think why I thought you were puny. It's understandable, sir. It all started when Nell and I were arm wrestling like this. Here, you see, we both gripped hands and... I saw that, Dudley. I'm not puny. I'm not puny. I'm not puny. Last time you remember, our heroes listened open-mouthed... ...with heads to match... ...while the moon men told them about their king, Nosmo the One Hat. While wearing his crown, which we know is the Kerwood Derby, he was a wise and just ruler. Off the moon men, by the moon men, and for the moon men. But without the derby, he was a dreadful lame brain. Go on, your majesty. There, uh, well, it was a great fight. I'll be right home, Mom. Unfortunately, Gidney and Cloyd were allowed to wear the hat on their first Earth trip. And we lost it. But we found it. And finders keepers losers weepers, right? Right. Wrong. Wrong. Bowinkle, it's really their hat. Well, why don't we just ask the president about it? He's just inside. And he was. Only this was the president of the Liquidate Rocky and Bowinkle Club, fearless leader. We can't go wrong asking the prayers, Rocky. I guess not. Let's go in. But as Rocky's hand reached for the doorknob... The president? Oh, Cloyd, let's us go in first. First? How? Simple. We just fade out here and fade in here. Say, you're not the president. I can tell. But you won't. And fearless leader swung his weapon toward Gidney and fired. <laughs> Gidney dropped to the... Now, wait a minute. You're not hurt. I wasn't hit, that's why. But somebody fired. <laughs> it was me. Fastest scrooge gun in the West. Yes, fearless leader was now frozen into position and couldn't move a muscle. Hey, fade out. They're coming in. And so our heroes entered. Okay, let them have it. Let us have what? Shoot, shoot. Let us have what, Mr. Backslap? Well, uh, 21 gun salute. What else? You fellas are big time, you know. Uh, now they're not going to do it, huh? Well, it's part of the economy drive. Those 21 gun salutes cost a pretty penny, you know. Anybody ever see an ugly penny? But who's this? He's, he's the president's special guard. Boy, he sure is well trained. He doesn't move a muscle. Not till 10 o'clock, anyway. <laughs> Should we tell him now, Gidney? No use worrying them, Cloyd. Let's just keep an eye on that backslap fellow. Through here is president's office. Oh, boy! Now, when I open the door, you bow real low like this. Like this? No, no, your package is in the way. Here, let me hold it for you. That's mighty thoughty. Ready now? Ready! Ready. And Boris swung the door wide. Ta-da! Howdy, Mr. Blue! And our heroes plummeted downward. 
You know, for a president, he's quite a prankster. Bullwinkle! Maybe he is a little young for the job. Bullwinkle, we have been hoodwinked. Yeah, he sure winks a mean hood, too. Bullwinkle, the president wasn't even there. Oh, that's all right, then. Not quite, for at that moment, our heroes plunged into the murky waters of the Potomac River. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the house above them, Boris was triumphant. I got it, I got it. It's all mine, the Kerwood Dorby. Natasha, come out, come out, wherever you are. Here I am, darling. I was just hanging up these new cobwebs. Natasha, I got the Corvo Derby. Boris, how? How else? By stealing, lying, cheating, and double-crossing. Like I always say, Natasha. Yes? It matters not the final score, but how you played the game. Oh, put it on, darling. Do I let him have it now, Gidney? No, Cloyd, not now. But he's gonna put the Kerwood Derby on. I know. That'll make that crook the smartest man in the world. I know. And you're just letting him do it? I know. Gidney, that's downright unmoon. And we'll find out just how unmoon in our next episode, The Crepe Hangers, or Brighten the Coroner Where You Are. <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say. A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Likewise. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. Last time was a black letter day for our friends. Not only did Boris kick them through a doorway into the Potomac River, but they made off with the first prize for this whole sequence, the Kerwood Derby. Natasha, guess what? We won once. Hardly seems possible, darling. Hey, maybe they got new writers on the show. Thanks, fellows. Put on hat, Boris. Find out how we rule the world. Fortunately, the two villains were being watched by those two kooky moon men, Gidney and Cloyd. I scrooge him now, huh? One, two... No, Cloyd, not now. But he's gonna put on the care with Derby. That's right. How can you do this, Gidney? It's downright unmoon. Not really. Just watch. And while the moon men watched, all eyes... And little else... Boris placed the Kerwood Derby on his head. I got notebook, darling. Speak up. Ah, it's all coming clear. Yes, darling. 
How do we rule the world? But something remarkable seemed to be happening to Boris. What is it, darling? What are you thinking? I can see it now. Go ahead. Being a villain is such a waste of time. What? Nobody likes me, not even other villains. If everybody was like me, what a terrible world it would be. The wise thing to do is learn a trade, like making apple boxes, raise family, gain the respect of neighbors, have friends, because, Natasha, crime really doesn't pay. And fui fui. Boris, you're not going to wear Kurwood Derby? You said it. If that's being smart, you can have it. He threw it away, Gidney. Yep. You see, Cloyd, some people just can't stand being smart. How come? Because they can't admit they were ever dumb. Meanwhile, what of our friends Rocky and Bullwinkle? We're floating down the Potomac, that's what of. Hey, you're doing pretty well, Bullwinkle. What do you mean? I mean, considering that you can't swim, you're doing... <laughs> Pokey Smokey Sane! And the plucky squirrel dived under and hauled Bullwinkle up by the antlers. I wish you hadn't said that, Rock. I stand clear to the bottom. I didn't think the water was that deep here, Bullwinkle. Well, I'll just show you. The water's clear up to here. Come on, Bullwinkle. And our friends walked up on the shore and right into the outskirts of a large crowd. Wonder what they're waiting for. Maybe waiting for the president to throw out the first cherry blossom. What's a big crowd for, mister? New congressman coming to town today. Really? Who's that? Feller from a small town in Missouri. I thought they already had one of those once. Nope, he went back home again. Too bad. He played a mean piano. This one's name is Squirrel, Rocket J. Squirrel. Oh, sure, I've heard of him. He... Rocky, that's you! And it was. Our boys were cheered by the enthusiastic crowd. Red! And then Rocky was installed in his new office. Now, there's something you don't see every day, Edgar. What's that, Chauncey? A squirrel in Congress. Oh, I don't know, Chauncey. Just a matter of time. How's that? They've had so many nuts in Congress, a squirrel was bound to show up someday. True. Gee, it's like a dream come true, Bullwinkle. But when the mail began to arrive, it was more like a bad dream, for half of it was from the backwoods clan called the Hatfuls. They demand I get rid of the cloys. And the other half was from the cloys. They demand I get rid of the Hatfuls. Boy, it's pretty tough being a congressman. It certainly was, particularly since a member of each of the clans was at that moment in the outer office armed to the teeth. And, and if, if he, he don't, don't get rid, rid of him... him I'm gonna blast him. You said it, cousin. Well, be with us next time for Double Trouble or Two's a Crowd. And now it's time for... Four, five, or six baritone solos in the key of E. But... If not... Ooh. Features. Should have tried E flat. The title of today's fable, Junior, is The Eagle and the Beetle. I have a feeling this fable is really gonna bug me. <laughs> Get it, Pop? Beetle? Bug me? Rather good, huh, Pop? As a matter of fact, Junior, that's exactly what this fable is about. An eagle that was beetled by a bug. You mean bugged by a beetle, Pop? At any rate, let's get on with the story. Ah, it's that scroll over there. Now, uh, let's see. This form must be filed on or before April 16th. Oh, Junior, you've handed me the income tax form. Oh, I'm sorry, Pop. Oh, yes, this is it. The Eagle and the Tax Dodger. Uh, but, uh, the Eagle and the Beetle. Well, our story starts out on a mountaintop where they lived a fierce eagle. You see all that down there? It's mine, all mine, because I am the king. Everything that moves down there is mine. I see a critter moving and zoom, zoom, zoom. Aha! There's something moving down there right now. What? You've heard the expression eagle-eyed. Well, this particular eagle wasn't eagle-eyed at all. Matter of fact, he was terribly nearsighted, to say the least. Poor old eagle couldn't distinguish windmills from rabbits. Well, maybe not. But I know a chipmunk when I see one. What's the matter? You're some kind of a feathered nut. But still the eagle persisted. Oh, a field mouse. Hmm. You know, 
I don't think that is a field mouse. I hey, see, I was right. It wasn't a field mouse. Oop! Now, don't tell me that's not a rabbit. <laughs> Boy, that was close. That big eagle almost got me. Whew. Well, sit down, rabbit. He can't stay out there forever. Just stay here a while, then you can split. And so the rabbit stayed inside for an hour. Uh, do you think it's safe to go out now? Well, wait a minute. I'll check for you. <laughs> I think this answers your question. Well, this is pretty ridiculous when a grown rabbit can't even go off for a walk. It's, it's, it's... It's lucky. Lucky? It's lucky that Bugsy from Chicago was in town, and he's coming to visit with me. Bugsy? From Chicago. Oh, Bugsy from Chicago. Uh, who's Bugsy from Chicago? Who is Bugsy from Chicago? Who is Bugsy from Chicago? Come in, Bugsy from Chicago! I do not see nobody. For goodness sakes, rabbit, watch your mouth. Bugsy is very sensitive about his size. That's him standing by that wall plug. Well, that's nothing but a beetle. Ah, just a beetle, eh, punk? You heard of the St. Swithin's Day Massacre, hmm? Who do you think pulled that caper off? Me, Bugsy. Yeah. Oh, that was beautiful. Yeah. How did you pull it off, huh? Ah, how did you pull it off? How did you pull it off? Get this creep away from me. Time's money, Mouse. Watch the caper. Uh, well, Bugsy, uh, there's this eagle, see? And he's got rabbit here cornered in my house. And this eagle is out there now, right? I show him, Mouse. <laughs> there, you see? There's no way out of this mess. Ah, put another hat on a stick. It's no use. The same thing will happen again. Only this time, we put a brick in the hat. <laughs> ah, let's go out, you guys. Very funny, very, very funny, that brick bit. Well, you're really gonna get yours. But it wasn't me, really, it wasn't. It was Bugsy's idea. Ah, not only are you a rabbit-hearted rabbit, rabbit, but you are also a fink. That's right, Eagle. Bugsy did it, see? Who said that? I did. I don't see nobody. Over here, stupid. Oh, there you are. Well, listen, don't try and get tough with me. What's the matter with him? He's some kind of a feathered nut? I heard that. Ah, tell me, Eagle, how long you been nearsighted? All my life. When all the other eagles were swooping down on chickens, I had to fake it. I had to swoop down on goodness knows what. If I told you the things I've swooped down on, you wouldn't believe it. Well, how come you don't wear glasses? And be the laughing stock of the eagles? Well, listen to Bugsy Eagle. I got a proposition to make to you. We could take over this whole town, see? Now, this is what I got in mind. All we have to do is talk about this car. Navigator to pilot. Three degrees to the left. That's right. Easy there. Easy now. Two degrees to the right. Roger. Yes, with Bugsy as his navigator, the eagle could fly beautifully. And he became one of the keepers anyway. Ah, boy, this is better than the St. Swithin's Day Massacre. Ah. So the eagle regained much of his confidence. Too much of his confidence, really. Hey, Bugsy, let's swoop down on that sparrow. Sparrow? That's no sparrow. Don't be ridiculous. I guess I know a sparrow when I see one. No, 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 wait a minute. No, that's not a sparrow. It's a... And so the partnership between the eagle and the beetle was dissolved, along with the eagle and the beetle. Which brings us to our moral, Junior. Moral. You cannot fly like an eagle if you're blind as a bat. Blind as a bat? Oh, that Junior really beetles me. Poetry lovers, today's poem is a saga of the Old West called Little Bo Peep. Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and can't tell where to find them. Leave them alone and they'll come home. Okay, stranger, git. Git? This cowboy for scram. Scram? How come? You on my range, sheep herder. Sheep herder? I'm Little Bo Peep and those are my sheep. Your sheep? You got brand on them? Brand? I wouldn't brand them. They're my little buddies. Ah, <laughs> buddies. What kind of sheep are buddies? Friend sheep. Oh. You got to prove to me they're yours. Okay, you asked for it. <whistles> Oops. Hey, where you going? Can't you tell? I'm taking it on the lamb. Ready, Rock? You sure you know how to work that thing? No. Anyways, here's what it was supposed to look like.
Hello out there. I am Peabody. The one with the newspaper in his mouth is my boy, Sherman. It's a new trick I just learned, Mr. Peabody. My heartiest felicitation, Sherman, but in the future, when you fetch my paper, don't grasp it with your molars. You've perforated the stock market quotations. Shall I run out and get another one? You won't have time. You see, we are overdue at Aachen, Germany. Who are we going to visit? The man who founded the first news agency, Paul Julian Reuter. After setting the time indicator for the year 1849, we enter the Wayback Machine, patent pending, and were immediately ushered to a small hamlet in western Germany. This was Aachen. And look, there's Mr. Reuter's news agency. Suddenly, from an upstairs window, a paper airplane sailed out and fluttered its way down to our feet. Gee, what a keen airplane. Yes, but a miserable news dispatch. I flattened the paper out, and there was a United Press story about a man biting a dog. The dispatch was supposed to be on its way to London, England. Hey, what's the big idea slowing down the dispatch? Uh, really, Mr. Reuter, do you honestly intend this paper airplane to get to London? Well, if the wind keeps blowing, yes. Is this the way you send your news? Samari, you got a better way? Before we could answer, a loud bell began to peal. And the good citizens of Aachen started running to the other end of town. Quick, grab a bucket and come. What is it, a cow milking contest? Worse than that, it's a fire. Sure enough, we arrived just in time to watch a two-story building go up in smoke. Why doesn't someone call the fire department? That is the fire department. There was nothing left to do but to toast marshmallows. If we had had marshmallows... Oh, what a terrible catastrophe. Cheer up, Mr. Reuter. You've lost a fire department, but you've gained a story. Mr. Peabody's right. Why not send a dispatch to London? Because my competition beating me to it. Reuter pointed to a gentleman who was busily setting down the details of the recent conflagration. That's Fritz Grimmelshausen. He always gets his dispatches to London before me. How does he do it? Watch, you see? He stuffs the dispatch into the bottle and sticks it in the water. Then he waits for the tide to go out. Herr Reuter, I don't like to brag. Too often, that is. But I am definitely most positive that with my aid, your communique will reach London before Mr. Uh... Grimmelshausen. <clears throat> yes. The tide was already going on, so we had no time to lose. Seconds later, we were inside Reuters News Agency. There! It's all set to go. Stand back! We watched in horror as Reuter deftly fashioned another paper airplane and let it fly. <whistles> this one got as far as the window, then nosedived to the floor. Oh, conditions are no good for flying. I'm afraid it's hopeless. Herr Reuter, air mailing your dispatches is the right idea. It's the manner in which you do it that's wrong. What's the matter? You think I should put a pilot in the plane? No, no, no. You need a different type of aircraft. I led the way to the roof, and there, perched on a shingle, was a pigeon. It was a simple matter to tie the dispatch to his leg. Okay, pigeon, fly to London. He's off! Congratulations, Mr. Reuter. You'll beat Mr. Grimmelshausen for sure. Sherman was a trifle premature, for the aforementioned Mr. Grimmelshausen had spotted the pigeon and quickly mounting a horse took chase. In one hand, a pigeon gun. Ooh, that stinker's gonna shoot down my dispatch. Oh, no, he's not. We hailed a taxi and gave chase. He hasn't fired a shot. What's he waiting for, Mr. Peabody? He's waiting for the bird to come down and rest. But in the meantime, there's work to do. Quickly, take this piece of paper and make an airplane. Even as I spoke, our feathered friend glided into view and came to a halt on the left shoulder of the town statue. He looks bushed. Never fear, he'll regain his strength in a moment. Oh, but it'll be too late. Look, there's that rascal Grimmelshaw. And he's aiming the gun. The paper airplane, Herr Reuter, I'll take it now. I quickly calculated the wind direction, velocity, and then let fly. <laughs> The airplane took off, executed four perfect Immelmanns, and landed directly in the barrel of Grimmelshausen's gun. The trigger was pulled, but the bullet had no way out, so... Two days later, the pigeon reached London, and Reuter was firmly established as a news agency. No more paper airplanes. From now on, I make them out of cardboard. But he should stick with pigeons. He will in time, Sherman. What about Fritz Grimmelshausen? Well, as you can see, he converted his news agency into a fix-it shop. He claims he can repair anything. Unfortunately, anything he repairs doesn't work. Is that how we got the expression, on the Fritz? Yes. And it's also how we got the expression, on the Grimmelshausen. <laughs>
Politics, they say, makes strange bedfellows. But even hardened politicians were a little surprised at having to snuggle up with a squirrel. Yes, Rocky was the new congressman from Peaceful Valley, and already he had his problems. Them hatfuls gotta go. Them floors gotta go. This is a tough problem, Bullwinkle. Yeah, and they expect you to pull an answer right out of your hat. Well, then I will. Hmm? I'll put on the Kerwood Derby and become the smartest guy in the world. For a minute. But we don't have the Kerber Derby. But we do. Sort of spooky to watch a hat creeping up on you, isn't it? I had the same trouble with some long underwear ones. But the hat was really being carried by those two now you see them, now you don't <laughs> moon men. Jenny and Chloe. And Rocky carefully put on the Kerwood Derby. It was a little big. What's the answer, Rock? Mm -hmm. That's what I thought, but it's illegal. <laughs> What's he saying, Gidney? I'm not sure, but I think it's take the hat off. Oh, of course. Phew. Gee, that's better. Well, what's the answer, Rocky? It's easy. We're going to evacuate both families. And so within the hour, busloads of hatfuls started leaving the state heading east, while busloads of ploys were leaving the state heading west. Oddly enough, they all seemed delighted at the idea. Uh, say, don't you know what evacuation means? Evacuation? Dag nab, I thought that word was vacation. But where will they all wind up, Rock? Well, I don't know, Bullwinkle, but once they're over the state line, they're somebody else's problem. Say, he did learn fast, didn't he? We better get that hat back to the moon. And so as our friends wave bye-bye, the moon men took off in their flying saucers. Have a good orbit. Give my regards to Broadway. Yeah! <laughs> Why so sad, Cloyd? We were in six episodes, and I only got to scooch one bad guy. Cheer up. Maybe we'll find another one. How about that one? Yes, just below them was Boris Badenov pleading for his life. Now, let's not be hasty, fearless leader, old body boy, sweetie pie. I can make it all up to you. How? I turn back all my medals. Junk jewelry. Give you genuine 14 karat gold brick. Chicken feed. My mortgage on the Pentagon. A scrap of paper. And last but not least, my autographed picture of Sonny Tofts. Sonny Tufts, you, you found the chink in my armor, Baranov. I... No, I, on second thought shoot, I'd rather die than part with it. A deal, a deal, you promise. Phew, that was close, Natasha. But as Boris took off his hat and wiped his brow... Get it, Cloyd? Direct hit. Yes, Boris had been frozen solid by Cloyd's Scrooge gun, and what's more, he was standing next to a flagpole. In his frozen position, he appeared to be perpetually saluting the American flag. And believe me, darling, for him, that's a fate worse than death. You said. Meanwhile, inside the Capitol building... Uh, gentlemen, as you know, this is the last day of this session of Congress. Yeah. 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 But I think it only fair that we hear the maiden speech of our new colleague. Go ahead, Rocky. Where's my speech, Bullwinkle? Here it is. But unfortunately, Bullwinkle gave Rocky the last page instead of the first page. So his first words were... And so, Mr. Speaker, I move, we adjourn. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Adjourned. Marvelous speech. Best of the year. But you didn't make your speech, Rock. Bullwinkle, sometimes you can say the smartest things by keeping your mouth shut. Hmm, little moral there. Sounds like a tagline of the whole story. And it is, too. But be with us next time for the further adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle! <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A uh, bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible.
adventures of Ruffy and Bullwinkle and friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel, and his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Likewise. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. Our story opens today in the beautiful little village of Frostbite Falls, Minnesota, where the... That's Frostbite Falls? Uh, where our heroes, Rocky and Bullwinkle, are... Uh... Which way to go, Black Eagle? Go on that way. Come on, Sheriff. We'll head him off at Eagle Pass. Now, wait a minute. That isn't the Rocky show. It... C can we do something? Check the monitor, will you, Jim? I, I got it. We're all clear here. Well, you got the uh, crossover main? Yeah, I, I can't think why it's... Well, look, uh... see if you can trace it on line 12. Right, right. One moment, ladies and gentlemen, please. We seem to have a Western on in place of the Rocky show. Hey, somebody's hooked up number 27 here. Uh, well, you better pull it, Jim. Okay. Uh, that's better now. Now, who could have done... I cannot tell a lie. Boys, the pity. I did it. You did it? But why, Bullwinkle? Because I'm just crazy about westerns. You're just crazy, period. Can I help it if I'm a cowboy at heart? But you're already a big television hero type. Yeah, but why don't I ever get to wear a big hat like Tugum Twombly? Well, there's a good reason. I'm not a U.S. Marshal? No, your antlers are in the way. Yeah, that's right. Well, it looked as if the nearest Bullwinkle would ever get to the Wild West was on his television set. You aim to draw, stranger? You, you said, said it, Trampus. Then make your play. All, All right, right I just... Oh, he got me! Bullwinkle, what's the matter? That's the third time this season he outdrew me. Yeah, but that's... Just... I must be slipping. You're just what? Bottom gun, that's me. Yes, Bullwinkle was cowboy happy, all right. Every morning, he'd rope the milk in off the front porch. Every evening, he watched the television from his saddle, and at night, he even took to wearing his spurs to bed. Ow! That does it! No more westerns for a week, Bullwinkle. No more westerns. I can't kick the habit cold like this. Come, come, Bullwinkle. Are you a moose or a mouse? I've been awful afraid of cats lately. Well... Oh, come on, Rocky. Just one itsy bitsy teeny weeny peek at two gun twombly rides again. Well, just this once. You gonna draw, stranger? I, I was, was fixing, fixing to. to. Then make your play. All, All right, right, I just... Well, now you've done it. I sure have. I beat him. But Bullwinkle... Cop film again. Fastest in the West. We're in the North. The Northwest. But look at the TV. I can't. It's bust and I... Bust? Oh, what have I done? Yes, a TV that was bust meant a whole new life for Bullwinkle. For after only a week of staring at the silent set, he began to read raunchy ranch tales... Cowhand comics, side saddle stories, the evening paper. How'd that get in there? Bullwinkle, you got to get your mind on something besides westerns. Well, okay, I'll read the want ads instead. Thank goodness. But even that seemed to be a bad idea, for Bullwinkle's eye immediately lit on a very interesting ad indeed. Look at this, Rocky. For sale, Lazy J Ranch, 1,000 acres of top bottom land. Your chance to go west fast. Box 1313 Squaw's Ankle, Wyoming. Full price, $28. Solid question. $28. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Now, we don't know anything about ranching. Yeah. On the other hand, it is a new adventure. Yeah. And the rating on our show's been slipping a little. Yeah. So let's do it. I figured if I waited long enough, you'd be back. Let's go. But if only our boys had looked at the front page of the paper as well, they would have seen that they were headed directly for trouble, real trouble. Don't miss our next episode, Fast and Moose, or The Quick and the Dead.
You probably never heard of the Clinker family. They lived in Holland many, many years ago. That's their little house right under the windmill. In fact, windmills are Papa Clinker's specialty. He repairs them. But not very well. Papa, the windmill just fell down. Is it still turning around? Yeah, but it's turning around on the ground. Who cares so long as it's still turning? Papa and Mama Clinker had two lovely children, a girl with blonde hair and blue eyes and a little boy with blue hair and blonde eyes. The girl's name was Brunhilde, which in Dutch means she who steps on tulips. The little boy, oddly enough, had no name at all until one day... Brunhilde! Yeah, Mama? Go wash your hands! Brunhilde promptly dunked her brother in the wash tub, and that's how Hans Klinker got his name. Hans, today you are three years old, and it's time you got a job. Okay, my papa. I will deliver papers. Unfortunately, the papers Hans delivered belonged to his father, and they were of the legal variety, such as mortgage on the house, insurance policies, liberty bonds. Hans, baby, this morning you were three years old, and I think already it's time you changed jobs. So, little Hans went to work down at the waterfront. Yeah, that's right, little boy. All you gotta do is keep your finger stuck in the hole in the dam. But why, sir? Well, uh, if there is no finger in the dam, the water will pour through and flood the country. A job as a dam plugger didn't pay very much, but you did go home with a very clean finger. But alas, a tourist came by seeking the whereabouts of the nearest Traveler's Aid Society. Hans pointed. Hans, this morning you were three years old and you got your first job. This afternoon you were three years old and you changed jobs. Tonight you are still three years old and you're going into retirement. But my papa, I am too young to be idle. The boy is right, papa. He needs a vacation. Vocation, mama. All right, already. What would you like to do, Hans? I want to be a tuba phone player. And what's a tuba phone? It's a tuba with a phone inside it. Listen. The sounds that filled the air had a strange, soothing effect, not only on Papa, Mama, and Brunhilde, but also on the cows and the chickens. Hans Klinker was a born musician. Of course. I could only play a few notes. But if I could study at the Amsterdam Conservatory of Music... How much would that cost? Fifty million clunkles. That astronomical figure caused Papa Klinker to take a fast nap in the center of the living room. Why doesn't Hans try and win 50 million clunkles in the Zyder Z skating contest? Yes. Once each year, the icy blasts of winter transform the Zyder Z into a sheet of ice. Youngsters from all over the Netherlands put on their skates and entered the big race, a race which netted the victor 50 million clunkles. Good luck, Hans. You can win, Hans. Oh, dear. It grieves me sorely to relate that Hans Klinker finished dead last. This was due to two things. One, he lacked the speed of most Dutch boys his age, and two, he lacked a pair of skates. Don't worry, Hans Pupchen, there's always next year. But again, it was the same story. Last in a field of 3,000. <laughs> I don't understand it, Papa. Even with a new pair of skates, I couldn't win. Perhaps if you was to wear them on your feet instead of your elbows. Hans tried that the following year, and it did help a little. He came in next to last, barely beating out an octogenarian who had fallen through a hole in the ice. It's no use. I never got to study at the Amsterdam Conservatory. And off he trudged into the snow-covered forest. Winter turned to spring, spring turned to summer, and still Hans walked. I am worried about our boy, Papa. Which boy is that, Mama? You know, Hans. Oh, yeah, Hans. Whatever happened to him? What happened to him was this. Hans walked walked right out of Holland into Denmark. Now, you've all heard the saying, something is rotten in Denmark? Well, the something that was rotten was an old castle that had been sitting on top of a hill for centuries and centuries. And inside, there was a sleeping giant. And just above the giant, hung a pair of skates. Why, why, there are silver skates. If I had those skates, I know I could win the Zyra Z race. Ah, but how do you make off with a pair of skates that are guarded by a sleeping giant? This is how. 
seconds later, Hans and the skates were on their way back to Holland. Well, all fairy tales have happy endings, and this one is no exception. Hans and the silver-plated skates won the next Zyder Z race, and with the 50 million clunkles, Hans entered the Amsterdam Conservatory of Music, where he played tubaphone in the symphony orchestra. And oh, how grand the conductor led his musicians. Oh, he did hit a clinker every once in a while. Oh, dear. What's the trouble, Bullwinkle? I can't get any newspapers to run stories about the fan club. Hmm. Why don't we publish our own newspaper, then? That's it, Rock. Did I hear newspaper? Permit me to introducing myself. William Randolph Hearst. William Randolph Hearst? That's my pen name. I used to write obituary column. Later, I won Bulletzer Prize. Oh, Biff. What do we name the paper? How about the Bullwinkle and Rocky Fan Club Weekly Gazette and Star Express? Well, that takes care of the front page. He's right, Bullwinkle. Why don't we just call it the news? That's catchy. I didn't know you knew how to type, Bullwinkle. Nothing to it. Clee booty fergles up, pretty eagle? Of course, that's just the first draft. Look, Chief, hot scoops. Mysterious bomber demolishes warehouse. Mad fiend burns old folks' home. Express train derailed. Great reporting, Boris. When did these happen? Any time now. <laughs> I'm working on it. Rocky Bullwinkle, I just got some ads for the paper. Gee, that's great, Captain. How much money did you take in? Take in? You mean they're supposed to pay us? Well, staff, here's our first edition. Now, what are we going to do about circulation? We could rub our hands together. That might help. What we need is a good, hard-working, ambitious sales manager. That sounds just like you, Bullwinkle. Well, uh... All those in favor of making Bullwinkle sales manager say aye. Aye! aye. This isn't exactly what I had in mind. Private Bullwinkle, sir, with a message. Just in time. Is it important? Is it? Just look. mountainous region of northwest Canada at the close of the 19th century, perched on a particular mountain overlooking a gorge, Snidely, Whiplash, and Homer sat waiting. What are we doing here, Snidely? You see this particular rock, Homer? Yeah? Well, this is called Flicker Rock, because it is so delicately balanced that with a flick of your finger, you can send it hurtling to the ground below. So? Well, I happen to know that Dudley Do-Right always rides under this rock at exactly 4.33 CMT, Canadian Mountain Time. So when he passes under the rock, I give it a flick and no more Do-Right. <laughs> Gee, Snidely, that's an unpleasant thing to do. 4.32, 4.33, flick! Will happen today, do right? No, Inspector. Except after I rolled out of the gorge, I had a very peculiar ringing in my head. I. I... How did you do that, Inspector? Do what? That thing you did with the birds and the bells. Birds and bells? Are you feeling all right, Dudley? We'll all be killed! Look out for the train, Inspector! Certainly are a cool one, Inspector. You just sat there and let that train whiz right by you. Dudley! Yes, Inspector? There was no train in this room. No train, but I saw it. There was this chugga 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 you know. Dudley, there was no train, there were no birds, there were no bells. Well, how about that horrible creature sitting on top of your head right now? Where? What? 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 what Don't worry, Inspector. Kill. I'll kill it! Ready? Guards! Guards, arrest him! Wait, wait. Look out! Here comes another train! come out from under that table and take this nut away? That engineer must be mad. What was that all about, Father? I can't understand it. It was his old zippy do-right self this morning. Oh, look out there. Here they come again, there. 
Dudley, what happened to you? Why, nothing, Nell. I was just riding home by my usual route, and I felt a slight tingling sensation on my head. Look out! <laughs> it's a mouse! Nope, it's a 16-foot polar bear. Strange, polar bears this time of year, but it's all right, Nell. It walked on by. Polar bear? Oh, Dudley, you're sick. I'm going to find out how this horrible thing happened to you. All right, Nell, but wait till these buffaloes go by. So Nell set out retracing Dudley Do-Right's route to camp, hoping to find the reason for Dudley's strange behavior. That's odd. Flicker Rock is missing. But wait a minute. There it is, with a tremendous dent in its side. It was flicked. And I'll bet the flicker who flicked Flicker Rock was you, Snidely Whiplash. But Nell, I only meant to flatten them. I didn't mean him any real harm. Well, you did him harm. Homer, this is terrible. What's so terrible? Do right's a kook. But it was bad enough being chased by a sane do right, but to be chased by some nuts. I must confess, I did flick flick a rock. But after I flicked flick a rock, I had a moment of regret. You don't know how relieved I was when Dudley Do right of the Mounties rode on, head up, body erect, and now. <laughs> a hopeless nut. A dangerous maniac. <laughs> We've got to help him, Homer. We've got to help that boy. Is he muzzled? Nell, what are you doing with that six-foot weasel? You see, Homer, he doesn't like me. And that gopher in the baggy pants. He ain't exactly in love with me, neither. But that's all right, Nell, because the birds are taking over the world. Soon there won't be another living thing, just these horrible birds. Oh, for goodness sake. So you see, Nell, if we take him back here to the scene of the crime... Watch your mouth! Uh, so to speak. Perhaps we'll all come back to him. Oh, my head, such a head. Wow, wee, what a headache. Say, it's all coming back. Somebody bounced a rock off my head. And that somebody could only be you, Snidely Whiplash. Come on, Doctor. He's cured. Oh, I'm sorry, Dudley. Nell, you mean I'm completely cured? I'll never see those birds again? Yes, Dudley. As soon as you realized it was Snidely who pushed the rock, you were cured. Oh, the birds are back! The birds are back! Can I help it? I've decided to become a pigeon fancier. Every man has a right to a hobby. urge to go west was pretty serious, all right. Particularly when he shot out the TV tube, trying to outdraw two-gun Twombly. Where's this gun in the west? Unfortunately, he was the slowest TV repairman and not too bright. Ooh, he looked pretty bright to me. And so our boys were reduced to ugh, reading in the evening. Dick and Jane see the dog. Wild. But then Bullwinkle came across a want ad that changed his whole life. For sale, ranch-style ranch, 1,000 acres, $28 full price. Low down payment. And in less time than it takes to tell, our boys were on their way to Squaw's Ankle, Wyoming. Alas, if they had only glanced at the front page, they might have changed their minds, for at that moment, a fearful monster was ravaging Squaw's Ankle. But little knowing the fate that awaited them, our heroes slumbered fitfully on a speeding cross-country train. Rocky in an upper and Bullwinkle in a lower. Gee, I just can't sleep, Rock. You that excited, Bullwinkle? No, my torso keeps dragging on the ties. Ooh! The train roared on through the night and next day arrived at Squaw's Ankle, Wyoming. Well, here's where we get off, Bullwinkle. Right, Rock. <laughs> Bullwinkle, are you hurt? Yeah, I think I got eternal injuries. You mean internal injuries. I mean eternal injuries. I'm always getting hurt. Howdy, strangers. Give you a lift to town? Yeah, but first give me a lift into the wagon. And so a little while later, our heroes found themselves in the friendly western town of Squaw's Ankle. You fellas fixing to stay on a piece? On a piece of what? Bullwinkle, he means are we here to stay. None of us are here to stay, Rock. I mean... We all got to go sometime. Mighty glad to have you with us, Rocky. Aren't we, folks? You yes, 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 yes. Well, thanks, Mr. Mayor. You too, Bullwinkle. Likewise. Just where are you figuring on staying while you're here? Well, we bought a ranch just outside of town. Why, that's wonderful. Ain't it, folks? You he said it. Yes, sir. 
What ranch did you buy? It's called the Lazy J. The Lazy J? Oh! That's great, ain't it, folks? Uh, folks? Gee, Bullwinkle, everybody left. Not everybody, Rocky. Look there. Sure enough, a lone figure still remained, holding a pencil and paper. I bet you want our autograph, don't you? No, I just like your measurements. Measurements? Must be one of those tailor fellas. My card, gentlemen. Uh-oh. Dudley Digg, licensed undertaker. Uh-huh. Six foot two inches overall. No, no, not overhauls. Something a little sportier. Waist 36. I'd like a little padding in the shoulders, too. Oh, you'll <laughs> get padding from head to toe. Uh, how about a belt in the back? Bullwinkle, he's an undertaker. I don't want to tell you how to run your business, mister, but aren't you a little early with that tape measure? Just a few hours. A few hours? See you a little later. Yeah. Though, of course, you won't see me. Gee, the sun must be down, Bullwinkle. All of a sudden, I feel a little chilly. How about you? Just my feet, Buck. We better go find our ranch before it gets dark. I'm with you. Stick close to me, Bullwinkle. If I was any closer, I'd be on the other side of you. And our boys began to move through the deserted town on their way to the Lazy J Ranch. Little did they know that stark terror awaits them there. Funny, he said he'd meet us at the train. Be with us next time for Buzzard Bait or the Carrion Call. Well, I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel, and his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. Last time, you remember, our heroes started out west to see the ranch they had just bought for $28. When they arrived in Squaw's Echo, Wyoming, everyone seemed very friendly. Until... Where'd you say you fellas were gonna live? On our ranch. Well, ain't that just James Dandy? What's the name of it? The Lazy J. Sure got lonesome all of a sudden, didn't it? Nobody left but us and one stray dog. Just because we said Lazy J. <laughs> 
must be hard to hear him. Yeah. Maybe we ought to leave, too, whilst we are able. Oh, Bullwinkle, you're not going to let them scare you away, are you? I was toying with the idea, yes. Well, come on. And so undaunted... Well, only slightly daunted... Our friends set out for the Lazy J Ranch. Where does the ad say the ranch is? Just outside the town. Bound to be around here somewhere. How right you are, as usual. Looky there. Lazy J Ranch entrance. Wild West, here we are. Look out, Bullwinkle. <laughs> My nerves must be going bad. How come? I feel like I'm on pins and needles. Well, you are. That's a cactus. You see, you fell on a cactus. Okay, when okay. You... I get the point. And in a few minutes, our boys were picking their way down a steep, steep hill. Suddenly, without warning. Duck, Bowie, If I was any lower, I'd be looking up to see down. Somebody's shooting at us from that little house on the mesa. Uh oh. We better go back to our place and get some help. We can't. This is our place. You're right. Let's not go there. Boy, that was close. Close? Bullwinkle, that cactus is clear on the other side of the valley. That's close enough. I'm going to see who it is at such a terrible shot. Okay, but don't help him any, hmm? And the plucky squirrel zoomed right toward the house and into a window. He pulled to a halt as a voice said, Hold it, fella. I know you're there. Well, how do you know I'm here? I hear you breathing. Now, mosey on out of here, you hear? Yeah, but I'm the new owner of the Lazy J. In that case, mosey on in. And our Rocky entered the bedroom of the small shack. In the bed was a huddled figure. Gee, who are you? I'm the old owner of the Lazy J. Yeah, what's your name? What else? I'm Lazy J himself. Was that you shooting at us? That's right. Thought y'all was rustlers. But we're over this way. You're shooting in the opposite direction. Uh-huh. But if I was facing that way, I'd sure give you what for. Well, why don't you? Frankly, I'm too lazy. But in a little while, our heroes had propped Lazy Jay up to a standing position, and he began to show them the points of interest of the ranch. Over there is Dead Man Swamp. That way you'll run into Grizzly Gulch, and over yonder is the Burning Bad Land. Isn't there any good land on the ranch, Lazy J? Oh, sure. The South 40's got some of the best land in these here parts. And it did, too. There was only one problem. The South 40 ran straight up and down. Oh, cows must be mountain climbers. Cows? What cows? Moo cows. Nary a hoof, hiding her hair. Well, what do you raise on this ranch, anyway? I'd better whisper it to you. And as Lazy J whispered just one word into Bullwinkle's ear, the mighty moose's hair turned completely white all over. Be sure to see our next colorful episode. Except for me. Rocky Rides Again or Small in the Saddle. Once upon a time, there was a witch named Griselka who chalked up a very enviable record when it came to witchery. I hereby cast a spell upon you, and henceforth, you shall be known as Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> I hereby cast a spell upon you, and forevermore, you shall remain a frog. Naturally, when it came time to give out the award for the best witch of the year... I shall treasure this gold-plated skull the rest of my unnatural life. Well, sir, Griselka's stock soared sky high after that, and every night was Halloween, as far as she was concerned. Grizz, you're due to fly to London tonight to touch off the year of the plague. We'll cancel that until Monday. I have to lock a damsel named Rapunzel in a tower. I'm dancing! <laughs> This went on for months, and Griselka was just about the most popular witch of all time. That's when it happened. There she was, concocting a vile brew in a cauldron, when suddenly the door opened, and there stood the most handsome prince in the world. Ah, fair lady. Could I trouble you for a flagon of water? That was tantamount to committing Harry Carey. Instead of water, try a sip of this. Here's looking at you, sweet damsel. Cheers. Ah, but witches, too, have hearts. And it was there that Griselka was struck by Cupid's timely arrow. Don't drink that! The liquid burned a hole three feet deep. 
finished. I say, that must be carbonated. You know, I must have that print. But Griselka was so ugly that she could look in a mirror and crack it. But it's a poisoned apple you're supposed to send to Snow White. You sure it isn't a poisoned watermelon? Look, Grizz, yesterday you changed a bat into a bunny rabbit. You better go see a doctor. There's no doubt of it, madam. You have an acute case of amoritis. Is that anything like the three-year itch? Madam, you are in love. L-U-F, love. Mirror, mirror on the wall. And don't you dare crack on me. How can I win the prince's love? You must cast a spell on yourself. And now I must go before I crack up. Of course, the mirror is right. If I change myself into a beautiful princess, the prince will fall in love with me. This was the biggest job she ever faced. For two weeks, she boiled wolfbane, mice wings, and gruffy powder in the old reliable cauldron. And finally... Through the mouth and through the gums. Look out, stomach! Here it comes! The age-old incantation never failed. Where once there was a witch, stood an enchanting princess. Well, my son, how are you enjoying the ball? I'm having a ball, Dad. I know that, but how are you enjoying it? Before the prince could answer, his eyes spied what to oh. him was the most beautiful maiden he had ever seen. You're beautiful, you're lovely, you're engaged to me. A whirlwind courtship ensued, during which the prince and his inamorata were seen everywhere. Ah, but they were not alone. I say, sweetheart, have you noticed that broom that seems to follow us wherever we go? Broom? <gasps> There was no mistaking it. This was the very same broom Griselka had ridden on her nightly forays. Quick, dearest, lock the broom in the cellar. Even though the request was a strange one, the prince complied. But that night, at the opera... Now, don't look now, but isn't that the same broom sitting next to you? Oh, quick, my love, take me home. Alas, there was no running away from her past. No matter where the princess went, the broom was sure to go. So, you used to be Grisel Kodovich, eh? Oh, yes, Doctor. Amazing. We wondered where you'd got to. Now, tell me your problem. And the princess unfolded the bizarre happenings of the past week. Well, this is all psychological, my dear. You see, that broom... This broom? Oh, yes. Anyway, that broom has a dust complex. You see, it's lonely. It misses its former owner. It undoubtedly still thinks that you are a witch. Well, what can I do, Doctor? What can I do? Next time, take the train. The desperate princess returned to the hut where she had once lived as a witch, followed closely by the broom. Oh, if there was only someone to help me. There is, there is. Oh, mirror, mirror on the wall, reflecting all this gloom. How in the world does one get rid of an old but faithful broom? The answer is simple. Get a gride. Now, in those days, dustpans weren't called dustpans. They were called grides. And so it was that the princess immediately purchased a small but attractive gride and set it beside the lonesome broom in the broom closet. The rest happened naturally. And do you, prince, take this princess for your wife? Oh, I do. Yes, it turned out to be a double wedding ceremony. Not only was there a bride and a groom, but there was also a... <laughs> a gride and a broom. <laughs> with helpful hints for everyone in the land, Mr. Know-it-all. Hello there, hinterlanders everywhere. Today we take up the problem of how to become a successful member of the U.S. Peace Corps. When you are sent into primitive country to help your fellow man, the first important thing is to find a fellow man. Then show them that your country has a new approach. The people back home really care. Offer them beads and trinkets. Primitive people like this appreciate that kind of thing. If, however, you find their state of industrial or scientific development farther along than you had supposed, the Peace Corps workers should offer assistance by showing the foreign friend how to repair or improve whatever devices they have. Kindly brother, I have fixed your machine, so it is quieter now. Courtesy, U.S. Peace Corps! 
next most important thing is to work along with them. That nothing too difficult for them is too difficult for you. And there you have it. The end product inspired by cooperation, friendship, and brotherhood. Gosh, Mr. Know-it-all, it looks to me like you've just inspired this friendly friend from another land to build a rocket ship. Yeah. Happens every time. Is it for defense? No. Space travel? No. Then what? It's their way of getting me out of the country faster. Peabody here. And I'm Sherman, huh, Mr. Peabody? Yes, you are Sherman, Sherman. Now, if you'll take your place beside the Wayback Machine, we shall be on our way. Where to today? Today we're traveling back in time to the year 1455 and the place Strasbourg, Germany, where we shall meet the inventor of the first practical printing press, Johannes Gutenberg. All set, Mr. Peabody. Sherman and I enter the Wayback, and in less time than it takes to twitch an eye, we were transported back and into the small printing shop of Herr Gutenberg, where we found the great man hard at work with his new press. Hi, Mr. Gutenberg. I'm Sherman, and this is... Don't buy out of me, kid. I got a newspaper to get out here, and I can't waste any time if I expect to make the five o'clock edition. Gutenberg continued his work at a feverish pitch. However, when he finally finished... Good at last I'm done. Mr. Peabody, do you see what I see? I'm afraid so, Sherman. It seems as though Johannes Gutenberg has made a slight mistake. Mistake? What mistake? Where? You have printed the five-star final on pants instead of paper. That's no mistake. It was a calculated decision on papers because I couldn't find paper. But it will never do to have the news printed on a pair of trousers. Why not? See, back here I have printed all of the latest word about the county seat. And down here I put the advertisements because they is on the cuff anyway. All well and good, but Sherman is right. A newspaper should be printed on paper. I already told you I can't find any paper. And there's no time to look for some. Because if I don't meet the five o'clock deadline, the bank is going to foreclose on the mortgage. Hmm, it's three o'clock now. That doesn't give us much time. But I think we can make it if we hurry. Come, Sherman, we will get some paper. Sherman and I dashed out of the print shop and into a butcher shop, which fortunately was right next door. Uh, six pounds of weenies, please. Weenies? But I thought we were after paper. What does the butcher usually wrap weenies in, Sherman? Butcher paper? Yes, but nonetheless, it is paper. Paying for the weenies, we quickly took the package and hurried back to Herr Gutenberg. Oh, that's good. This is just what I've been waiting for. He had been gone for quite some time when suddenly I noticed something very peculiar. Do you hear something, Sherman? Not a thing, Mr. Peabody. Should I? Yes, we should be hearing the sound of Gutenberg's printing press. Something is wrong, Sherman. Hurrying into the back room, we immediately saw that something was wrong indeed. For there sat Johannes Gutenberg eating weenies. Herr Gutenberg, what are you doing? Why, I'm eating the lunch you brought me. What else? I'm afraid that's your second mistake, my friend. That wasn't your lunch. You were to use that paper for your five o'clock edition. Oh, I forgot, and it's 4.15 already. Stand back, I got printing to do. Gutenberg flew into his work like a demon, and in record time, he had the job done. I done it! Now I can go out to a corner and sell my very first newspaper. It looked very much like success was his, but suddenly... Egad, what's happening, Mr. Peabody? It sounds like a riot. It is a riot, Chairman, and Herr Gutenberg is just two jumps ahead of it. What happened, Mr. Gutenberg? Didn't the people like your paper? Oh, they liked the paper all right, but what they didn't like was there was no printing on it. It was true. The newspaper he had just printed was completely blank on both sides. For his third mistake of the day, Herr Gutenberg had used the wrong bottle of ink in his press. Invisible ink, that is. 20 minutes to five, there's still a chance you can make it. It's no use, I can't do it. Why not? I'm all mixed up from my troubles. I can't think of anything to print. Pardon me. Hello? What? What, 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 what? Really? Quick, give me the address. Okay, got it. Oh, am I in luck? There's a fire, and that's big news. It gives me just what I need to write about. Good, we can be reporters and cover the story for you. Yes, but we must hurry. Get the address, Sherman. Sherman and I raced across town and made excellent time, for the signals were with us. However, when we arrived... Hey, this can't be right. There's nothing here but a lake. Let me see that slip of paper. Hmm. Just as I suspected, Sherman, you had the paper upside down. You brought us to 666 instead of 999 Schnitzel Street. Gee, I'm sorry, Mr. Peabody. Just where is 999 Schnitzel Street? I'm afraid that's the address of Gutenberg's printing shop. Oh, the fire really wiped me out this time. The only thing I saved was the clock and the press. And it's five minutes to five. I guess there's nothing else you can do, Mr. Peabody. There is always something I can do, Sherman. 
Gutenberg's five o'clock edition will hit the street right on schedule. Give me a hand. Gosh, you did it, Mr. Peabody, without a minute to spare. Yes, and that is the first true printing of Johannes Gutenberg. Extra, extra! Read all about me. On me. Extra! But tell me, Mr. Peabody, why did you print such big letters on his forehead? That, Sherman, should be quite obvious. Every newspaper has to have a headline. <laughs> Bullwinkle arrived at their new ranch, the Lazy J, they found that it wasn't the choicest piece of real estate in the world. As a matter of fact, the only good piece of land on it ran straight up and down. Must have some mighty acrobatic cows on this ranch. Acrobatic? Or maybe they got suction cups on their hoofs. <laughs> you plumb loco? No, I'm plumb Bullwinkle. There's no cows on this ranch. No cows? Well, it's not so bad being a sheep herder, Rock. Sometimes they're the good guys, too. No sheep, neither. Hogs, maybe? Nope. Muskrats? Nope. Horses? Nope. Chinchillas? Nope. Mink? Nope. Plenty pussies? Nope. Hold it. I'm plumb tuckered out, waggling my head back and forth. Well, what do you raise on this ranch? I better whisper. Very What? Bullwinkle! Gee, he fainted. What did you say to him? I better whisper. <laughs> Good heavens, both of our heroes have fainted. Well, what did you say to them? Just told them what we raise on this ranch. Well, what is it? I better whisper. Worms. Worms? Well, I bet dog. He fainted, too. Did, did I hear you right? This is a worm ranch? A worm ranch? A worm ranch? Say, if you fellas could get together, you'd make a fine trio. A, a worm, worm ranch. ranch? See? I told you. Yes, it turned out to be all too true. The boys had traveled a thousand miles and spent $28 of their hard-earned money to buy a worm ranch. Yep, it's the biggest herd in these here parts. But where is it? Where else? Underground. Sure enough, the boys had taken on the job of herding a bunch of critters they couldn't even see. But for the next few weeks, they were too busy to worry about it. First, there was the big spring roundup. What's this contraption got to do with the roundup? Only way we know where the little rascals are. What do I do? You jump up and down on this pogo stick. Sort of drive me ahead of you. Good luck. And so our friends started out to round up their herd. Whoopee! Hi, hi, yo, yo, get along, little doggy. Poor Winkle, we aren't rounding up doggies. I know, but I just can't bring myself to sing Get Along, Little Worm. And, uh-oh. What is it? A stray is cut loose from the herd. After him, Bo Winkle. Get back in there. No, no, not the other way. And, uh-oh, I lost him. Oh, that does it. No early worm can give me the bird. Uh-oh, now you've done it. What, what, what I done it? You spoke the herd. They're stampeding. Well, it certainly looked that way, for the ground began to tremble as if there were an earthquake. Jumping gee, horse that must be millions of them. Stampede! Underground stampede! bravely tried to turn the leaders. Come on, turn! Get him turned around, Bullwinkle! I sure would if I could see him! But eventually the trembling stopped. Except for my knees. And our boys knew the herd had quieted down. But their troubles weren't over, not by a long shot. For watching our boys from a nearby hill was a sinister figure, wearing, of all things, a cowboy hat and kilts. Who can this mysterious stranger be? We'll find out next time in The Last Angry Angus or Hot Scotch. <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. Get 
Kyle. Away from me again. Well, see you next time. Ready, Bullwinkle?